This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Today's reading by Daniel Harris. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Prelude who that cares much to know the history of man and how the mysterious mixture behaves under the varying experiments of time has not dwelt at least briefly on the life of saint theresa has not smiled with some gentleness at the thought of the little girl walking forth one morning hand in hand with her still smaller brother to go and seek martyrdom in the country of the moors out they toddled from rugged villa wide-eyed and helpless-looking as two fawns but with human hearts already beating to a national idea until domestic reality met them in the shape of uncles and turned them back from their great resolve that child pilgrimage was a fit beginning theresa's passionate ideal nature demanded an epic life what were many volumed romances of chivalry and the social conquest of a brilliant girl to her her flame quickly burned up that light fuel, and, fed from within, soared after some illimitable satisfaction, some object which would never justify weariness, which would reconcile self-despair with the rapturous consciousness of life beyond self. She found her epos in the reform of a religious order. That Spanish woman who lived three hundred years ago was certainly not the last of her kind. Many Thereses have been born who found for themselves no epic life wherein there was a constant unfolding of far resonant action, perhaps only a life of mistakes, the offspring of a certain spiritual grandeur ill-matched with the meanness of opportunity, perhaps a tragic failure which found no sacred poet and sank unwept into oblivion. With dim lights and tangled circumstance they tried to shape their thought and deed in noble agreement, but, after all, to common eyes their struggle seemed mere inconsistency and formlessness, for these later-born Theresas were helped by no coherent social faith and order which could perform the function of knowledge for the ardently willing soul. Their ardor alternated between a vague ideal and the common yearning of womanhood, so that the one was disapproved as extravagance, and the other condemned as a lapse. Some have felt that these blundering lives are due to the inconvenient indefiniteness with which the supreme power has fashioned the natures of women. If there were one level of feminine incompetence as strict as the ability to count to three and no more, the social lot of women might be treated with scientific certitude. Meanwhile, the indefiniteness remains, and the limits of variation are really much wider than any one would imagine from the sameness of women's coiffure and the favorite love stories in prose and verse. Here and there a signet is reared uneasily among the ducklings in the brown pond, and never finds the living stream in fellowship with its own ori-footed kind. Here and there is born a Saint Theresa, foundress of nothing, whose loving heart beats and sobs after an unattained goodness tremble off and are dispersed among hindrances instead of centering in some long recognizable deed. Book One Miss Brook Chapter One Since I can do no good because a woman, reach constantly at something that is near it. The Maid's Tragedy Beaumont and Fletcher Miss Brooke had that kind of beauty which seems to be thrown into relief by poor dress. Her hand and wrist were so finely formed that she could wear sleeves not less bare of style than those in which the Blessed Virgin appeared to Italian painters, and her profile as well as her stature and bearing seemed to gain the more dignity from her plain garments, which by the side of provincial fashion gave her the impressiveness of a fine quotation from the Bible, or from one of her elder poets, in a paragraph of today's newspaper. She was usually spoken of of being re remarkably clever, but with the addition that her sister Celia had more common sense. Nevertheless, 
Celia wore scarcely more trimmings, and it was only to close observers that her dress differed from her sister's, and had a shade of coquetry in its arrangements. For Miss Brooks' plain dressing was due to mixed conditions, in most of which her sister shared. The pride of being ladies had something to do with it. The Brooke connections, though not exactly aristocratic, were unquestionably good. If you inquired backward for a generation or two, you would not find any yard-measuring or parcel-tying forefathers, anything lower than an admiral or a clergyman, and there was even an ancestor discernible as a Puritan gentleman who served under Cromwell, but afterwards conformed, and managed to come out of all political tumbles as the proprietor of a respectable family estate. Young women of such birth, living in a quiet country house, and attending a village church hardly larger than a parlour, naturally regarded frippery as the ambition of a huckster's daughter. Then there was well-bred economy, which in those days made show and dress the first item to be deducted from, when any margin was required for expenses more distinctive of rank. Such reasons would have been enough to account for plain dress, quite apart from religious feeling, but in Miss Brooke's case religion alone would have determined it, and Celia mildly acquiesced in all her sister's sentiments, only infusing them with that common sense which is able to accept momentous doctrines without any eccentric agitation. Dorothea knew many passages of Pascal's Pensée and of Jeremy Taylor by heart, and her the destinies of mankind, seen by the light of Christianity, made the solicitudes of feminine fashion appear an occupation for bedlam. She could not reconcile the anxieties of a spiritual life involving eternal consequences with a keen interest in gimp and artificial protrusions of drapery. Her mind was theoretic, and yearned by its nature after some lofty conception of the world which might frankly include the parish of Tipton and her own rule of conduct there. She was enamoured of intensity and greatness, and rash in embracing whatever seemed to her to have those aspects, likely to seek martyrdom, to make retractions, and then to incur martyrdom after all in a quarter where she had not sought it. Certainly such elements in the character of a marriageable girl tended to interfere with her lot, and hinder it from being decided according to custom, by good looks, vanity, and merely canine affection. With all this, she, the elder of the sisters, was not yet twenty, and they had both been educated since they were about twelve years old and, and had lost their parents, on plans at once narrow and promiscuous, first in an English family and afterwards in a Swiss family at Lausanne, their bachelor uncle and guardian trying in this way to remedy the disadvantages of their orphan condition. It was hardly a year since they had come to live at Tipton Grange with her uncle, a man nearly sixty, of acquiescent temper, miscellaneous opinions, and uncertain vote. He had travelled in his younger years, and was held in this part of the country to have contracted a too rambling habit of mind. Mr. Brooks' conclusions were as difficult to predict as the weather. It was only safe to say that he would act with benevolent intentions, and that he would spend as little money as possible in carrying them out. For the most gluttonously indefinite minds enclose some hard grains of habit, and a man has been seen lax about all his own interests except the retention of his snuff-box, concerning which he was watchful, suspicious, and greedy of clutch. In Mr. Brooke the hereditary strain of Puritan energy was clearly in abeyance, but in his niece Dorothea it glowed alike through faults and virtues, turning sometimes into impatience of her uncle's talk or his way of letting things be on the estate, and making her long all the more for the time when she would be of age and have some command of money for generous schemes. She was regarded as an heiress, for not only had the sisters of seven hundred a year each from their parents, but if Dorothea married and had a son, that son would inherit Mr. Brooks' estate, presumably worth about three thousand a year, a rental which seemed wealth to provincial families, still discussing Mr. Peel's laced conduct on the Catholic question, innocent of future goldfields, 
and of that generous plutocracy which has so nobly exalted the necessities of genteel life. And how should Dorothea not marry, a girl so handsome and with such prospects? Nothing could hinder it but her love of extremes, and her insistence on regulating life according to notions which might cause a wary man to hesitate before he made her an offer, or even might lead her, at last, to refuse all offers. A young lady of some birth and fortune, who knelt suddenly down on a brick floor by the side of a sick labor and prayed fervently as if she thought herself living in the time of the apostles, who had strange whims of fasting like a papist, and sitting up at night to read old theological books. Such a wife might awaken you some fine morning with a new scheme for the application of her income which would interfere with political economy and the keeping of saddle-horses. A man would naturally think twice before he risked himself in such a fellowship. Women were expected to have weak opinions, but the great safeguard of society and of domestic life was that opinions were not acted on. Sane people did what their neighbors did, so that if any lunatics were at large, one might know and avoid them. The rural opinion about the new young ladies, even amongst the cottagers, was generally in favour of Celia as being so amiable and innocent-looking, while Miss Brooke's large eyes seemed, like her religion, too unusual and striking. Poor Dorothea! Compared with her, the innocent-looking Celia was knowing and worldly-wise. So much subtler is a human mind than the outside tissues which make a sort of blazonry or clock-face for it. Yet those who approached Dorothea, though prejudiced against her by this alarming hearsay, found that she had a charm unaccountably reconcilable with it. Most men thought her bewitching when she was on horseback. She loved the fresh air and the various aspects of the country, and when her eyes and cheeks glowed with mingled pleasure, she looked very little like a devotee. Riding was an indulgence with which she allowed herself in spite of conscientious qualms. She felt that she enjoyed it in a pagan, sensuous way, and always looked forward to renouncing it. She was open, ardent, and not in the least self-admiring. Indeed, it was pretty to see how her imagination adorned her little sister Celia with attractions altogether superior to her own, and if any gentleman appeared to come to the Grange from some other motive than that of seeing Mr. Brooke, she concluded that he must have been in love with Celia. Sir James Chetham, for example, whom she constantly considered from Celia's point of view, inwardly debating whether it would be good for Celia to accept him that he should be regarded as a suitor to herself, would have seemed to her a ridiculous irrelevance. Dorothea, with all her eagerness to know the truths of life, retained very childlike ideas about marriage. She felt sure that she would have accepted the judicious hooker if she had been born in time to save him from that wretched mistake he made in matrimony, or John Milton when his blindness had come on, or any of the other great men whose odd habits it would have been glorious piety to endure, but an amiable handsome baronet, who said exactly to her remarks even when she expressed uncertainty, how could he affect her as a lover? The really delightful marriage must be that where your husband was a sort of father, and could teach you even Hebrew, if you wished it. These peculiarities of Dorothea's character caused Mr. Brooke to be all the more blamed in neighboring families for not securing some middle-aged lady as guide and companion to his nieces. But he himself dreaded so much the sort of superior woman likely to be available for such a position that he allowed himself to be dissuaded by Dorothea's objections, and was in this case brave enough to defy the world that is to say, Mrs. Cadwaller, the rector's wife, and the small group of gentry with whom he visited in the northeast corner of Loamshire. So Miss Brooke presided in her uncle's household, and did not at all dislike her new authority, with the homage that belonged to it. Sir James Chetham was going to dine at the Grange today with another gentleman, whom the girls had never seen, and about whom Dorothea felt some venerating expectation. This was the Reverend Edward Cossabon, noted in the country as a man of profound learning, understood for many years to be engaged on a great work concerning religious history, 
also a man of wealth enough to give lustre to his piety, and having views of his own which were to be more clearly ascertained on the publication of his book. His very name carried an impressiveness hardly to be measured without a precise chronology of scholarship. Early in the day Dorothea had returned from the infant school which she had set going in the village, and was taking her usual place in the pretty sitting-room which divided the bedrooms of her sisters, bent on finishing a plan for some buildings, a kind of work which she delighted in, when Celia, who had been watching her with a hesitating desire to propose something, said, "'Dorothea, dear, if you don't mind, if you're not very busy, suppose we looked at Mamma's jewels to-day and divided them?' It is exactly six months to-day since Uncle gave them to you, and you have not looked at them yet. Celia's face had the shadow of a pouting expression in it, the full presence of the pout being kept back in the habitual awe of Dorothea in principle, two associated facts which might show a mysterious electricity if you touch them incautiously. To her relief, Dorothea's eyes were full of laughter when she looked up. "'What a wonderful little almanac you are, Celia! Is it six calendar or six lunar months?' "'It is the last day of September now, and it was the first of April when Uncle gave them to you. You know, he said that he had forgotten them till then. I believe you have never thought of them since you locked them up in the cabinet here.' "'Well, dear, we should never wear them, you know.' Dorothea spoke in a full cordial tone, half caressing, half explanatory. She had her pencil in her hand, and was making tiny side-plans on a margin. Celia colored, and looked very grave. "'I think, dear, we are wanting in respect to Mamma's memory to put them by and take no notice of them. And,' she added, after hesitating a little with a rising sob of mortification, "'Nicholas are quite usual now, and Madame Poincon, who is stricter in some things even than you are, used to wear ornaments.' and christians generally surely there are women in heaven now who wore jewels celia was conscious of some mental strength when she really applied herself to argument you would like to wear them exclaimed dorothea an air of astonished discovery animating her whole person with the dramatic action which she had caught from that very madame poincon who wore the ornaments of course then let us have them out why did you not tell me before but the keys the keys she pressed her hands against the sides of her head and seemed to despair of her memory they are here said celia with whom this explanation had been long meditated and prearranged pray open the large drawer of the cabinet and get out the jewel box the casket was soon opened before them and the various jewels spread out making a bright parterre on the table it was no great collection, but a few of the ornaments were really of remarkable beauty. The finest that was obvious at first being a necklace of purple amethysts set in exquisite gold work, and a pearled cross with five brilliants in it. Dorothea immediately took up the necklace and fastened it round her sister's neck, where it fitted almost as closely as a bracelet but the circle suited the Henrietta Maria style of Cecilia's head and neck, and she could see that it did in the pier-glass opposite. "'There, Celia, you can wear that with your Indian muslin, but this cross you must wear with your dark dresses.' Celia was trying not to smile with pleasure. "'Oh, Dodo, you must keep the cross yourself.' "'No, dear, no,' said Dorothea, putting up her hand with careless depreciation. "'Yes, indeed, you must. It would suit you. In your black dress now,' said Celia insistingly, "'you might wear that.' "'Not for the world, not for the world. A cross is the last thing I would wear as a trinket.' Dorothea shuddered slightly. "'Then you will think it wicked in me to wear it,' said Celia uneasingly. "'No, dear, no,' said Dorothea, stroking her sister's cheek. "'Souls have complexions, too.' What will suit one will not suit another. But you might like to keep it, for Mamma's sake. No, I have other things of Mamma's. Her sandalwood box, which I am so fond of. Plenty of things. In fact, they are all yours, dear. We need discuss them no longer. There. 
take away your property. Celia felt a little hurt. There was a strong assumption of superiority in this puritanic toleration, hardly less trying to the blonde flesh of an unenthusiastic sister than a puritanic persecution. But how can I wear ornaments if you, who are the elder sister, will never wear them? Nay, Celia, that is too much to ask, that I should wear trinkets to keep you in countenance. If I were to put on such a necklace as that, I should feel as if I had been pirouetting. The world would go round with me, and I should not know how to walk. Celia had unclasped the necklace and drawn it off. It would be a little tight for your neck. Something to lie down and hang would suit you better, she said with some satisfaction. The complete unfitness of the necklace from all points of view for Dorothea made Celia happier in taking it. She was opening some ring-boxes, which disclosed a fine emerald with diamonds, and just then the sun passing beyond a cloud sent a bright gleam over the table. "'How very beautiful these gems are!' said Dorothea, under a new current of feeling as sudden as the gleam. "'It is strange how deeply colours seem to penetrate one, like scent. I suppose that is the reason why gems are used as spiritual emblems in the revelation of St. John.' They look like fragments of heaven. I think that emerald is more beautiful than any of them. And there is a bracelet to match it, said Celia. We did not notice this at first. They are lovely, said Dorothea, slipping the ring and bracelet on her finely turned finger and wrist, and holding them towards the window on a level with her eyes. All the while her thought was trying to justify her delight in the colors by merging them in her mystic religious joy. "'You would like those, Dorothea,' said Celia, rather falteringly, beginning to think with wonder that her sister showed some weakness, and also that emeralds would suit her own complexion even better than purple amethysts. "'You must keep the ring and bracelet, if nothing else. But see, these agates are very pretty and quiet.' "'Yes, I will keep these.' "'This ring and bracelet,' said Dorothea. Then, letting her hand fall on the table, she said in another tone, "'Yet what miserable men find such things, and work at them, and sell them!' She paused again, and Celia thought that her sister was going to renounce the ornaments, as in consistency she ought to do. "'Yes, dear, I will keep these,' said Dorothea decidedly. "'But take all the rest away, and the casket.' She took up her pencil without removing the jewels, and still looking at them. She thought of often having them by her, to feed her eye at those little fountains of pure color. "'Shall you wear them in company?' said Celia, who was watching her with real curiosity as to what she would do. Dorothea quickly glanced at her sister. Across all her imaginative adornment of those whom she loved, there darted now and then a keen discernment, which was not without a scorching quality. If Miss Brooke ever attained perfect meetness, it would not be for lack of inward fire. Perhaps, she said rather haughtily, I cannot tell to what level I may sink. Celia blushed and was unhappy. She saw that she had offended her sister, and dared not say even anything pretty about the gift of the ornaments which she put back into the box and carried away. Dorothea, too, was unhappy, as she went on with her plan drawing, questioning the purity of her own feeling and speech in the scene which had ended with that little explosion. Celia's consciousness told her that she had not been in the wrong at all. It was quite natural and justifiable that she should have asked that question, and she repeated to herself that Dorothea was inconsistent. Either she should have taken her full share of the jewels, or, after what she had said, she should have renounced them altogether. "'I am sure, at least I trust,' thought Celia, "'that the wearing of a necklace will not interfere with my prayers.' and I do not see that I should be bound by Dorothea's opinions now we are going into society, though of course she herself ought to be bound by them. But Dorothea is not always consistent. Thus 
Celia, mutely bending over her tapestry, until she heard her sister calling her. "'Here, Kitty, come and look at my plan. I shall think I am a great architect, if I have not got incompatible stairs and fireplaces.' As Celia bent over the paper, Dorothea put her cheek against her sister's arm caressingly. Celia understood the action. Dorothea saw that she had been in the wrong, and Celia pardoned her. Since they could remember, there had been a mixture of criticism and awe in the attitude of Celia's mind toward her elder sister. The younger had always worn a yoke, but is there any yoke creature without its private opinions? End of chapter 1「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Today's reading by Daniel Harris. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter 2 Dime, no va quel cabello que hacia nostros vien sobre un cabello usio rodado que te puesto en la cabeza un yelmo de oro? Lo que veo y combo, respondito Sancho, no es sino un hombre sobre un asno pardo como el mío que te sobre la cabeza una cosa que relumbra. Who es es el yelmo de Mambimbro, dijo Don Quixote? Cervantes Seest thou not yon cavalier who cometh toward us on a dapple grey steed, and weareth a golden helmet? What I see, answered Sancho, is nothing but a man on a grey ass like my own, who carries something shiny on his head. Just so, answered Don Quixote, and that resplendent object is the helmet of Mambrino. Sir Humphrey Davy, said Mr. Brooke over the soup in his easy, smiling way, taking up Sir James Chetham's remark that he was studying Davy's agricultural chemistry. Well, now, Sir Humphrey Davy, I dined with him years ago at Cartwright's, and Wordsworth was there, too, the poet Wordsworth, you know. Now there was something singular. I was at Cambridge with when Wordsworth was there, and I never met him, and I dined with him twenty years afterwards at Cartwright's. There is an oddity in things now. But Davy was there. He was a poet, too. Or, as I may say, Wordsworth was poet one, and Davy was poet two. That was true in every sense, you know. Dorothea felt a little more uneasy than usual. In the beginning of dinner, the party being small and the room still, these motes from the mass of a magistrate's mind fell too noticeably. She wondered how a man like Mr. Casabon would support such triviality. His manners, she thought, were very dignified. The set of his iron-gray hair and his deep eye-sockets made him resemble the portrait of Locke. He had the spare form and the pale complexion which became a student as different as possible from the blooming Englishman of the red-whiskered type represented by Sir James Chetham. "'I am reading the agricultural chemistry,' said this excellent baronet, "'because I am going to take one of the farms into my own hands, and see if something cannot be done in setting a good pattern of farming among my tenants. Do you approve of that, Miss Brooke?' "'A great mistake, Chetham,' interposed Mr. Brooke, "'going into electrifying your land and that kind of thing, "'and making a parlour of your cow-house. "'It won't do. "'I went into science a great deal myself at one time, "'but I saw it would not do. "'It leads to everything. "'You can let nothing alone. "'No, no. See that your tenants don't sell their straw and that kind of thing, and give them draining tiles, you know. But your fancying farming will not do. The most expensive sort of whistle you can buy, you may as well keep a pack of hounds. 
"'Surely,' said Dorothea, "'it is better to spend money in finding out how men can make the most of the land which supports them all, than in keeping dogs and horses only to gallop over it. It is not a sin to make yourself poor in performing experiments for the good of all.' She spoke with more energy than is expected of so young a lady, but Sir James had appealed to her. He was accustomed to do so, and she had often thought that she could urge him to many good actions when she was her brother-in-law. Mr. Casaubon turned his eyes very markedly on Dorothea while she was speaking, and seemed to observe her newly. "'Young ladies don't understand political economy, you know,' said Mr. Brooks, smiling towards Mr. Casaubon. "'I remember when we were all reading Adam Smith. There is a book now!' I took in all the new ideas at one time. Human perfectibility, now. But some say history moves in circles, and that may be very well argued. I have argued it myself. The fact is, human reason may carry you a little too far, over the hedge, in fact. It carried me a good way at one time, but I saw it would not do. I pulled up. I pulled up in time, but not too hard. I have always been in favour of a little theory. We must have thought, else we shall be landed back in the dark ages. But talking of books, there is Southey's Peninsular War. I am reading that of a morning. Do you know Southey? No, said Mr. Casaubon not keeping pace with Mr. Brooke's impetuous reason, and thinking of the book only. I have little leisure for such literature just now. I have been using up my eyesight on old characters lately. The fact is, I want a reader for my evenings, but I am fastidious in voices, and I cannot endure listening to an imperfect reader. It is a misfortune in some senses. I feed too much on the inward sources. I live too much with the dead. My mind is something like a ghost of an ancient, wandering about the world and trying mentally to construct it as it used to be, in spite of ruin and confusing changes. But I find it necessary to use the utmost caution about my eyesight." This was the first time Mr. Casaubon had spoken at any length. He delivered himself with precision, as if he had been called upon to make a public statement, and the balanced sing-song neatness of his speech, occasionally corresponded to by a movement of his head, was the more conspicuous from its contrast with good Mr. Brooke's scrappy slovenliness. Dorothea said to herself that Mr. Casaubon was the most interesting man she had ever seen, not excepting even Monsieur Liret the Vaudois clergyman who had given conferences on the history of the Waldenses. To reconstruct a past world, doubtless with a view to the highest purposes of truth, what a work to be in any way present at, to assist in, though only as a lamp-holder! This elevating thought lifted her above her annoyance at being twitted with her ignorance of political economy, that never-explained science which was thrust as an extinguisher over all her lights. "'But you are fond of riding, Miss Brooke,' Sir James presently took an opportunity of saying. "'I should have thought that you would enter a little into the pleasures of hunting. I wish you would let me send over a chestnut horse for you to try. It has been trained for a lady. I saw you on Saturday cantering over the hill on a nag not worthy of you. My groom shall bring Corydon for you every day, if you will only mention the time.' "'Thank you. You are very good.' I mean to give up riding. I shall not ride any more, said Dorothea, urged to this brusque resolution by a little annoyance that Sir James would be soliciting her attention when she wanted to give it all to Mr. Casaubon. No, that is too hard, said Sir James, in a tone of reproach that showed strong interest. Your sister is given to self-mortification, is she not? He continued, turning to Celia, who sat at his right hand. "'I think she is,' said Celia, feeling afraid lest she should say something that would not please her sister, and blushing as prettily as possible above her necklace. "'She likes giving up.' 
If that were true, Celia, my giving up would be a self-indulgence, not self-mortification. But there may be good reasons for choosing not to do what is very agreeable, said Dorothea. Mr. Brooke was speaking at the same time, but it was evident that Mr. Cossabon was observing Dorothea, and she was aware of it. Exactly, said Sir James. You give up from some high, generous motive. No, indeed, not exactly. I did not say that myself, answered Dorothea, reddening. Unlike Celia, she rarely blushed, and only from high delight or anger. At this moment she felt angry with the perverse Sir James. Why did he not pay attention to Celia, and leave her to listen to Mr. Cossabon? If that learned man would only talk, instead of allowing himself to be talked to by Mr. Brooke, who was just then informing him that the Reformation either meant something or it did not, that he himself was a Protestant to the core, but that Catholicism was a fact, and as to refusing an acre of your ground for a Romanist chapel, all men needed the bridle of religion, which, properly speaking, was the dread of a hereafter. I made a great study of theology at one time, said Mr. Brooke, as if to explain the insight just manifested. I know something of all schools. I knew Wilberforce in his best days. Do you know Wilberforce? Mr. Cossabon said, No. Well, Wilberforce was perhaps not enough of a thinker, but if I went into Parliament, as I have been asked to do, I should sit on the independent bench, as Wilberforce did, and work at philanthropy. Mr. Cosbon bowed, and observed that it was a wide field. Yes, said Mr. Brooke, with an easy smile, but I have documents. I began a long while ago to collect documents. They want arranging, but when a question has struck me, I have written to somebody and got an answer. I have documents at my back. But now, how do you arrange your documents? In pigeonholes, partly, said Mr. Cossabon, with rather a startled air of effort. Ah, pigeonholes will not do. I have tried pigeonholes, but everything gets mixed in pigeonholes. I never know whether a paper is an A or Z. I wish you would let me sort your papers for you, uncle, said Dorothea. I would letter them all, and make a list of subjects under each letter. Mr. Cossabon gravely smiled approval, and said to Mr. Brooke, You have an excellent secretary at hand, you perceive. No, no, said Mr. Brooke, shaking his head. I cannot let young ladies meddle with my documents. Young ladies are too flighty. Dorothea felt hurt. Mr. Cossabon would think that her uncle had some special reason for delivering this opinion, whereas the remark lay in his mind as lightly as the broken wing of an insect among all the other fragments there, and a chance current had sent it alighting on her. When the two girls were in the drawing-room alone, Celia said, "'How very ugly Mr. Cossabon is!' Celia. He is one of the most distinguished-looking men I ever saw. He is remarkably like the portrait of Locke. He has the same deep eye-sockets. Had Locke those two white moles with hairs on them? Oh, I dare say! When people of a certain sort looked at him, said Dorothea, walking away a little, Mr. Cossabon is so sallow. All the better. I suppose you admire a man with the complexion of a couchon de lait. Dodo! exclaimed Celia, looking after her in surprise. I never heard you make such a comparison before. Why should I make it before the occasion came? It is a good comparison. The match is perfect. Miss Brooke was clearly forgetting herself, and Celia thought so. I wonder you show temper, Dorothea. It is so painful in you, Celia, that you will look at human beings as if they were merely animals with a toilet, and never see the great soul in a man's face. Has Mr. Cossabon a great soul? Celia was not without a touch of naive malice. 
"'Yes, I believe he has,' said Dorothea, with the full voice of decision. "'Everything I see in him corresponds to his pamphlet on biblical cosmology.' "'He talks very little,' said Celia. "'There is no one for him to talk to.' Celia thought privately, "'Dorothea quite despises Sir James Chetham. I believe she would not accept him.' Celia felt that this was a pity. She had never been deceived as to the object of the baronet's interest. Sometimes, indeed, she had reflected that Dodo would perhaps not make a husband happy who had not her way of looking at things, and stifled in the depths of her heart was the feeling that her sister was too religious for family comfort. Notions and scruples were like split needles, making one afraid of treading, or sitting down, or even eating." When Miss Brooke was at the tea-table, Sir James came to sit down by her, not having felt her mode of answering him at all offensive. Why should he? He thought it probable that Miss Brooks liked him, and manners must be very marked indeed before they cease to be interpreted by preconceptions either confident or distrustful. She was thoroughly charming to him, but of course he theorized a little about his attachment. He was made of excellent human dough, and had the rare merit of knowing that his talents, even if let loose, would not set the smallest stream in the country on fire. Hence he liked the prospect of a wife to whom he could say, "'What shall we do?' about this or that, who could help her husband out with reasons, and would also have the proper qualification for doing so. As to the excessive religiousness alleged against Miss Brooke, he had a very indefinite notion of what it consisted in, and thought that it would die out with marriage. In short, he felt himself to be in love in the right place, and was ready to endure a great deal of predominance, which, after all, a man could always put down when he liked. Sir James had no idea that he should ever like to put down the predominance of his ha this handsome girl, in whose cleverness he delighted. Why not? A man's mind, what there is of it, has always the advantage of being masculine, as the smallest birch tree is of a higher kind than the most soaring palm, and even his ignorance is of a sounder quality. Sir James might not have originated this estimate, but a kind providence furnishes the limpest personality with a little gunk or starch in the form of tradition. "'Let me hope that you will rescind that resolution about the horse, Miss Brooke,' said the persevering admirer. "'I assure you, riding is the most healthy of exercises.' "'I am aware of it,' said Dorothea coldly. "'I think it would do Celia good, if she would take to it.' "'But you are such a perfect horsewoman.' "'Excuse me, I have had very little practice, and I should be easily thrown.' "'Then that is a reason for more practice. Every lady ought to be a perfect horsewoman, that she may accompany her husband.' "'You see how widely we differ, Sir James? I have made up my mind that I ought not to be a perfect horsewoman, and so I should never correspond to your pattern of a lady.' Dorothea looked straight before her, and spoke with cold brusquerie, very much with the air of a handsome boy, in amusing contrast with the solicitous amiability of her admirer. "'I should like to know your reasons for this cruel resolution. It is not possible that you should think horsemanship wrong.' "'It is quite possible that I should think it wrong for me.' "'Oh, why?' said Sir James, in a tender tone of remonstrance. Mr. Cossabon had come up to the table, teacup in hand, and was listening. "'We must not inquire too curiously into motives,' he interposed in his measured way. "'Miss Brooke knows that they are apt to become feeble in the utterance. The aroma is mixed with the grosser air. We must keep the germinating grain away from the light.' Dorothea colored with pleasure, and looked up gratefully to the speaker. Here was a man who could understand the higher inward life, and with whom there could be some spiritual communion, nay, who could illuminate principle with the widest knowledge, a man whose learning almost amounted to a proof of whatever he believed. 
Dorothea's inferences may seem large, but really life could never have gone on at any period but for this liberal allowance of conclusions, which has facilitated marriage under the difficulties of civilization. Has any one ever pinched into its pilious smallness the cobweb of pre-matrimonial acquaintanceship? Certainly, said good Sir James. Miss Brooke shall not be urged to tell reasons she would rather be silent upon. I am sure her reasons would do her honour. He was not in the least jealous of the interest with which Dorothea had looked up at Mr. Cossabon. It never occurred to him that a girl to whom he was meditating an offer of marriage could care for a dried bookworm towards fifty, except, indeed, in a religious sort of way, as for a clergyman of some distinction. However, since Miss Brooke had become engaged in a conversation with Mr. Cosbon about the Vaudois clergy, Sir James betook himself to Celia, and talked to her to, about her sister, spoke of a house in town, and asked whether Miss Brooke disliked London. Away from her sister, Celia talked quite easily, and Sir James said to himself that the second Miss Brooke was certainly very agreeable as well as pretty, though not, as some people pretended, more clever and sensible than the elder sister. He felt that he had chosen the one who was in all respects the superior, and a man naturally likes to look forward to having the best. He would be the very mawworm of bachelors, who pretended not to expect it. End of chapter 2「Three of Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter Three. Say, goddess, what ensued when Raphael, the affable archangel, Eve, the story heard attentive, and was filled with admiration and deep muse to hear of things so high and strange. Paradise Lost B. 7 If it had really occurred to Mr. Kasaubin to think of Miss Brooke as a suitable wife for him, the reasons that might induce her to accept him were already planted in her mind, and by the evening of the next day the reasons had budded and bloomed, for they had had a long conversation in the morning, while Celia, who did not like the company of Mr. Kasaubin's moles and sallowness, had escaped to the vicarage to play with the curate's ill-shod but merry children. Dorothea, by this time, had looked deep into the ungauged reservoir of Mr. Kasaubin's mind, seeing reflected there in vague labyrinthine extension every quality she herself brought, had opened much of her own experience to him, and had understood from him the scope of his great work, also of attractively labyrinthine extent. For he had been as instructive as Milton's affable archangel, and with something of the archangelic manner he told her how he had undertaken to show, what indeed had been attempted before, but not with that thoroughness, justice of comparison, and effectiveness of arrangement at which Mr. Cossabon aimed, that all the mythical systems or erratic mythical fragments in the world were corruptions of a tradition originally revealed. Having once mastered the true position and taken a firm footing there, the vast field of mythical constructions became intelligible, nay, luminous, with the reflected light of correspondences but to gather in this great harvest of truth was no light or speedy work. His notes already made a formidable range of volumes, but the crowning task would be to condense these voluminous, still-accumulating results and bring them, like the earlier vintage of Hippocratic books, to fit a little shelf. In explaining this to Dorothea, Mr. Kasaubin expressed himself nearly as he would have done to a fellow student, for he had not two styles of talking at command. It is true that when he used a Greek or Latin phrase he always gave the English with scrupulous care, but he would probably have done this in any case. A learned provincial clergyman is accustomed to think of his acquaintances as of lords, knights, and other noble and worthy men, that con Latin but little. Dorothea was altogether captivated by the wide embrace of this conception. Here was something beyond the shallows of ladies' school literature. Here was a living Bossuet whose work would reconcile complete knowledge with devoted piety. Here was a modern Augustine, who united the glories of doctor and saint. The sanctity seemed no less clearly marked than the learning. For when Dorothea 
was impelled to open her mind on certain themes which she could speak of to no one whom she had before seen at Tipton, especially on the secondary importance of ecclesiastical forms and articles of belief, compared with that spiritual religion, that submergence of self in communion with divine perfection, which seemed to her to be expressed in the best Christian books of widely distant ages, she found in Mr. Kasabin a listener who understood her at once, who could assure her of his own agreement with that view, when duly tempered with wise conformity, and could mention historical examples before unknown to her. "'He thinks with me,' said Dorothea to herself, "'or rather, he thinks a whole world of which my thought is but a poor two-penny mirror. And his feelings, too, his whole experience, what a lake compared to my little pool!' Miss Brooke argued from words and dispositions not less unhesitatingly than other young ladies of her age. Signs are small, measurable things, but interpretations are illimitable, and in girls of sweet, ardent nature every sign is apt to conjure up wonder, hope, belief, vast as the sky, and coloured by a diffused thimbleful of matter in the shape of knowledge. They are not always too grossly deceived, for Sinbad himself may have fallen by good luck on a true description, and wrong reasoning sometimes lands poor mortals in right conclusions, starting a long way off the true point, and proceeding by loops and zigzags, we now and then arrive just where we ought to be. Because Miss Brooke was hasty in her trust, it is not therefore clear that Mr. Kasabin was unworthy of it. He stayed a little longer than he had intended, on a slight pressure of invitation from Mr. Brooke, who offered no bait except his own documents on machine-breaking and rick-burning. Mr. Kasabin was called into the library to look at these in a heap, while his host picked up first one and then the other to read aloud from, in a skipping and uncertain way passing from one unfinished passage to another with a yes now but here and finally pushing them all aside to open the journal of his youthful continental travels look here here it is all about greece ramnus the ruins of ramnus you are a great grecian now i don't know whether you have given much study to the topography i spent no end of time in making out these things helicon now here now we started the next morning for parnassus the double peaked parnassus all this volume is about greece you know Mr. Brooke wound up, rubbing his thumb transversely along the edges of the leaves as he held the book forward. Mr. Kasabin made a dignified, though somewhat sad, audience, bowed in the right place, and avoided looking at anything documentary as far as possible, without showing disregard or impatience, mindful that this desultoriness was associated with the institutions of the country, and that the man who took him on this severe mental scamper was not only an amiable host, but a landholder and custis rotulorum, was his endurance aided also by the reflection that Mr. Brooke was the uncle of Dorothea? Certainly he seemed more and more bent on making her talk to him, on drawing her out, as Celia remarked to herself, and in looking at her his face was often lit up by a smile like pale wintry sunshine. Before he left the next morning, while taking a pleasant walk with Miss Brooke along the gravel terrace, he had mentioned to her that he felt the disadvantage of loneliness, the need of that cheerful companionship with which the presence of youth can lighten or vary the serious toils of maturity. And he delivered this statement with as much careful precision as if he had been a diplomatic envoy whose words would be attended with results. Indeed, Mr. Kasabin was not used to expect that he should have to repeat or revise his communications of a practical or personal kind. The inclinations which he deliberately stated on the 2nd of October he would think it enough to refer to by the mention of that date, judging by the standard of his own memory, which was a volume where a vide supra would serve instead of repetitions, and not the ordinary long-used blotting-book which only tells of forgotten writing. But in this case Mr. Kasabin's confidence was not likely to be falsified, for Dorothea heard and retained what he said with the eager interest of a fresh young nature to which every variety in experience is an epoch. It was three o'clock in the beautiful breezy autumn day when Mr. Kasabin drove off to his rectory at Lowick, only five miles from Tipton, and Dorothea, who had on her bonnet and shawl, hurried along the shrubbery and across the park that she might wander through the bordering wood, with no other visible companionship than that of Monk, the great St. Bernard dog, who always took care of the young ladies in their walks. There had risen before her the girl's vision of a possible future for herself, to which she looked forward with trembling hope, and she wanted to wander on in that visionary future without interruption. She walked briskly in the brisk air, the colour rose in her cheeks, and her straw bonnet, which our contemporaries might look at with conjectural curiosity as an obsolete form of basket, fell a little backward. 
she would perhaps be hardly characterized enough if it were omitted that she wore her brown hair flatly braided and coiled behind so as to expose the outline of her head in a daring manner at a time when public feeling required the meagreness of nature to be dissimulated by tall barricades of frizz curls and bows never surpassed by any great race except the phrygian this was a trait of miss brooks asceticism but there was nothing of an aesthetic's expression in her bright full eyes as she looked before her not consciously seeing but absorbing into the intensity of her mood the solemn glory of the afternoon with its long swaths of light between the far-off rows of limes whose shadows touched each other all people young or old that is all people in those anti-reform times would have thought her an interesting object if they had referred the glow in her eyes and cheeks to the newly awakened ordinary images of young love the illusions of chloe about strephon have been sufficiently consecrated in poetry as the pathetic loveliness of all spontaneous trust ought to be miss pippin adoring young pumpkin and dreaming along endless vistas of unwearying companionship was a little drama which never tired our fathers and mothers and had been put into all costumes let but pumpkin have a figure which would sustain the disadvantages of the short-waisted swallow-tail and everybody felt it not only natural but necessary to the perfection of womanhood that a sweet girl should be at once convinced of his virtue his exceptional ability and above all his perfect sincerity but perhaps no persons then living certainly none in the neighbourhood of tipton would have had a sympathetic understanding for the dreams of a girl whose notions about marriage took their colour entirely from an exalted enthusiasm about the ends of life an enthusiasm which was lit chiefly by its own fire and included neither the niceties of the trousseau the pattern of plate nor even the honours and sweet joys of the blooming matron it had now entered dorothea's mind that mr Kasabin might wish to make her his wife and the idea that he would do so touched her with a sort of reverential gratitude how good of him nay it would be almost as if a winged messenger had suddenly stood beside her path and held out his hand towards her for a long while she had been oppressed by the indefiniteness which hung in her mind like a thick summer haze over her desire to make her life greatly effective what could she do what ought she to do she hardly more than a budding woman but yet with an active conscience and a great mental need not to be satisfied by a girlish instruction comparable to the nibblings and judgment of a discursive mouse with some endowment of stupidity and conceit she might have thought that a christian young lady of fortune should find her ideal of life in village charities patronage of the humbler clergy and perusal of the female scripture characters unfolding the private experience of sarah under the old dispensation and dorcas under the new and the care of her soul over her embroidery in her own boudoir with a background of prospective marriage to a man who if less strict than herself as being involved in affairs religiously inexplicable might be prayed for and seasonably exhorted from such contentment poor dorothea was shut out the intensity of her religious disposition the coercion it exercised over her life was but one aspect of a nature altogether ardent theoretic and intellectually consequent and with such a nature struggling in the hands of a narrow teaching hemmed in by a social life which seemed nothing but a labyrinth of petty courses a walled-in maze of small paths that led no whither the outcome was sure to strike others as at once exaggeration and inconsistency the thing which seemed to her best she wanted to justify by the completest knowledge and not to live in a pretended admission of rules which were never acted upon into this soul hunger as yet all her youthful passion was poured the union which attracted her was one that would deliver her from her girlish subjection to her own ignorance and give her the freedom of voluntary submission to a guide who would take her along the grandest path i should learn everything then she said to herself still walking quickly along the bridle road through the wood it would be my duty to study that i might help him the better in his great works there would be nothing trivial about our lives everyday things with us would mean the greatest things it would be like marrying pascal i should learn to see the truth by the same light as great men have seen it by and then i should know what to do when i got older i should see how it was possible to lead a grand life here now in england i don't feel sure about doing good in any way now everything seems like going on a mission to a people whose language i don't know unless it were building good cottages there can be no doubt about that oh i hope i should be able to get the people well housed in lowick i shall draw plenty of plans while i have time dorothea checked herself suddenly with self-rebuke for the presumptuous way in which she was reckoning on uncertain events 
but she was spared any inward effort to change the direction of her thoughts by the appearance of a cantering horseman round a turning of the road. The well-groomed chestnut horse and two beautiful setters could leave no doubt that the rider was Sir James Chetham. He discerned Dorothea, jumped off his horse at once, and having delivered it to his groom, advanced towards her with something white on his arm, at which the two setters were barking in an excited manner. "'How delightful to see you, Miss Brooke,' he said, raising his hat and showing his sleekly waving blond hair. "'It has hastened the pleasure I was looking forward to.' Miss Brooke was annoyed at the interruption. This amiable baronet, really a suitable husband for Celia, exaggerated the necessity of making himself agreeable to the elder sister. Even a prospective brother-in-law may be an oppression, if he will always be presupposing too good an understanding with you, and agreeing with you even when you contradict him. The thought that he had made the mistake of paying his addresses to herself could not take shape. All her mental activity was used up in persuasions of another kind. But he was positively obtrusive at this moment, and his dimpled hands were quite disagreeable. Her roused temper made her colour deeply, as she returned his greeting with some haughtiness. Sir James interpreted the heightened colour in the way most gratifying to himself, and thought he never saw Miss Brooke looking so handsome. "'I have brought a little petitioner,' he said, or rather, I have brought him to see if he will be approved before his petition is offered. He showed the white object under his arm, which was a tiny Maltese puppy, one of nature's most naive toys. "'It is painful for me to see these creatures that are bred merely as pets,' said Dorothea, whose opinion was forming itself that very moment, as opinions will, under the heat of irritation. "'Oh, why?' said Sir James, as they walked forward. "'I believe all the petting that is given them does not make them happy. They are too helpless. Their lives are too frail. A weasel or a mouse that gets its own living is more interesting. I like to think that the animals about us have souls, something like our own, and either carry on their own little affairs or can be companions to us, like Monk here. Those creatures are parasitic.' "'I am so glad I know you do not like them,' said good Sir James. "'I should never keep them for myself, but ladies usually are fond of these Maltese dogs. Here, John, take this dog, will you?' The objectionable puppy, whose nose and eyes were equally black and expressive, was thus got rid of, since Miss Brooke decided that it had better not have been born. But she felt it necessary to explain. "'You must not judge of Celia's feeling from mine. I think she likes those small pets. She had a tiny terrier once which she was very fond of. It made me unhappy, because I was afraid of treading on it. I am rather short-sighted. You have your own good opinion about everything, Miss Brooke, and it is always a good opinion. What answer was possible to such stupid complimenting? Do you know I envy you that, Sir James said, as they continued walking, at the rather brisk pace set by Dorothea. I don't quite understand what you mean. Your power of forming an opinion. I can form an opinion of persons. I know when I like people. But about other matters, do you know, I have often a difficulty in deciding. One hears very sensible things said on opposite sides. Or that seem sensible. Perhaps we don't always discriminate between sense and nonsense. Dorothea felt that she was rather rude. Exactly, said Sir James, but you seem to have the power of discrimination. On the contrary, I am often unable to decide. But that is from ignorance. The right conclusion is there all the same, though I am unable to see it. I think there are few who would see it more readily. Do you know, Lovegood was telling me yesterday that you had the best notion in the world for a plan for cottages. Quite wonderful for a young lady, he thought. You had a real genius, to use his expression. He said you wanted Mr. Brooke to build a new set of cottages, but he seemed to think it hardly probable that your uncle would consent. Do you know, that is one of the things I wish to do, I mean, on my own estate. I should be glad to carry out that plan of yours, if you would let me see it. Of course, it is sinking money." that is why people object to it. Laborers can never pay rent to make it answer, but, after all, it is worth doing. Worth doing? Yes, indeed, said Dorothea energetically, forgetting her previous small vexations. I think we deserve to be beaten out of our beautiful houses, with a scourge of small cords. All of us who let tenants live in such styes as we see round us. Life in cottages might be happier than ours, if they were real houses fit for human beings, from whom we expect duties and affections. Will you show me your plan? "'Yes, certainly. I dare say it is very faulty, but I have been examining all the plans for cottages in Loudon's book, and picked out what seemed the best things. Oh, what a happiness it would be to see the pattern about here! I think, instead of Lazarus at the gate, we should put the pigsty cottages outside the park gate.' Dorothea was in the best temper now. Sir James, as brother-in-law, building model cottages on his estate, 
and then perhaps others being built at Lowick, and more and more elsewhere in imitation, it would be as if the spirit of Oberlin had passed over the parishes to make the life of poverty beautiful. Sir James saw all the plans, and took one away to consult upon with Lovegood. He also took away a complacent sense that he was making great progress in Miss Brooke's good opinion. The Maltese puppy was not offered to Celia, an omission which Dorothea afterwards thought of with surprise, but she blamed herself for it. She had been engrossing Sir James. After all, it was a relief that there was no puppy to tread upon. Celia was present while the plans were being examined, and observed Sir James' allusion. "'He thinks that Dodo cares about him, and she only cares about her plans. Yet I am not certain that she would refuse him if she thought he would let her manage everything and carry out all her notions. And how very uncomfortable Sir James would be! I cannot bear notions!' It was Celia's private luxury to indulge in this dislike. She dared not confess it to her sister in any direct statement, for that would be laying herself open to a demonstration that she was somehow or other at war with all goodness. But on safe opportunity she had an indirect mode of making her negative wisdom tell upon Dorothea, and calling her down from her rhapsodic mood by reminding her that people were staring, not listening. Celia was not impulsive. What she had to say could wait, and came from her always with the same quiet staccato evenness. When people talked with energy and emphasis, she watched their faces and features merely. She never could understand how well-bred persons consented to sing, and open their mouths in the ridiculous manner requisite for that vocal exercise. It was not many days before Mr. Cassaubin paid a morning visit, on which he was invited again for the following week to dine and stay the night. Thus Dorothea had three more conversations with him, and was convinced that her first impressions had been just. He was all that she had at first imagined him to be. Almost everything he had said seemed like a specimen from a mine, or the inscription on the door of a museum which might open on the treasures of past ages, and this trust in his mental wealth was all the deeper and more effective on her inclination, because it was now obvious that his visits were made for her sake. This accomplished man condescended to think of a young girl, and take the pains to talk to her, not with absurd compliment, but with an appeal to her understanding, and sometimes with instructive correction. What delightful companionship! Mr. Cossaubin seemed even unconscious that trivialities existed, and never handed round that small talk of heavy men which is as acceptable as stale bride-cake brought forth with an odour of cupboard. He talked of what he was interested in, or else he was silent and bowed with sad civility. To Dorothea this was adorable genuineness, and religious abstinence from that artificiality which uses up the soul in the efforts of pretense. For she looked as reverently at Mr. Cassaubin's religious elevation above herself as she did at his intellect and learning. He assented to her expressions of devout feeling, and usually with an appropriate quotation. He allowed himself to say that he had gone through some spiritual conflicts in his youth. In short, Dorothea saw that here she might reckon on understanding, sympathy, and guidance. On one, only one of her favorite themes, she was disappointed. Mr. Cassaubin apparently did not care about building cottages, and diverted the talk to the extremely narrow accommodation which was to be had in the dwellings of the ancient Egyptians, as if to check a too high standard. After he was gone, Dorothea dwelt with some agitation on this indifference of his, and her mind was much exercised with arguments drawn from the varying conditions of climate which modify human needs, and from the admitted wickedness of pagan despots. Could she not urge these arguments on Mr. Cassaubin when he came again? But further reflection told her that she was presumptuous in demanding his attention to such a subject. He would not disapprove of her occupying herself with it in leisure moments, as other women expected to occupy themselves with their dress and embroidery, would not forbid it when Dorothea felt rather ashamed as she detected herself in these speculations. But her uncle had been invited to go to Lowick to stay a couple of days. Was it reasonable to suppose that Mr. Cassaubin delighted in Mr. Brooke's society for its own sake, either with or without documents? Meanwhile that little disappointment made her delight the more in Sir James Chetham's readiness to set on foot the desired improvements. He came much oftener than Mr. Cassaubin, and Dorothea ceased to find him disagreeable, since he showed himself so entirely in earnest, for he had already entered with much practical ability into Lovegood's estimates, and was charmingly docile. She proposed to build a couple of cottages, and transfer two families from their old cabins, which could then be pulled down so that new ones could be built on the old sites. Sir James said, Exactly, and she bore the word remarkably well. Certainly these men who had so few spontaneous ideas might be very useful members of society under good feminine direction, 
if they were fortunate in choosing their sisters-in-law. It is difficult to say whether there was or was not a little willfulness in her continuing blind to the possibility that another sort of choice was in question in relation to her. But her life was just now full of hope and action. She was not only thinking of her plans, but getting down learned books from the library and reading many things hastily, that she might be a little less ignorant in talking to Mr. Kasabin, all the while being visited with conscientious questionings whether she were not exalting these poor doings above measure and contemplating them with that self-satisfaction which was the last doom of ignorance and folly. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett, Houston, Texas, January 2008. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter Four. First Gentlemen, our deeds are fetters that we forge ourselves. Second gentleman. Aye, truly, but I think it is the world that brings the iron. Sir James seems determined to do everything you wish, said Celia, as they were driving home from an inspection of the new building site. He is a good creature, and more sensible than any one would imagine, said Dorothea inconsiderately. You mean that he appears silly? No, no said Dorothea, recollecting herself, and laying her hand on her sister's a moment. But he does not talk equally well on all subjects. "'I should think none but disagreeable people do,' said Celia, in her usual purring way. "'They must be very dreadful to live with. Only think! At breakfast and always?' Dorothea laughed. "'Oh, Kitty, you are a wonderful creature!' She pinched Celia's chin, being in the mood now to think her very winning and lovely, fit hereafter to be an eternal cherub, and if it were not doctrinally wrong to say so, hardly more in need of salvation than a squirrel. Of course, people need not be always talking well. Only one tells the quality of their minds when they try to talk well. You mean that Sir James tries and fails. I was speaking generally. Why do you catechize me about Sir James? It is not the object of his life to please me. Now, Dodo, can you really believe that? Certainly. He thinks of me as a future sister. That is all. Dorothea had never hinted this before, waiting from a certain shyness on such subjects which was mutual between the sisters, until it should be introduced by some decisive event. Celia blushed, but said at once, Pray do not make that mistake any longer, Dodo. When Tantrip was brushing my hair the other day, she said that Sir James's man knew from Mrs. Cadwallader's maid that Sir James was to marry the eldest Miss Brooke. "'How can you let Tantrip talk such gossip to you, Celia?' said Dorothea indignantly, not the less angry because details asleep in her memory were now awakened to confirm the unwelcome revelation. "'You must have asked her questions. It is degrading. I see no harm at all in Tantrip's talking to me. It is better to hear what people say. You see what mistakes you make by taking up notions. I am quite sure that Sir James means to make you an offer, and he believes that you will accept him, especially since you have been so pleased with him about the plans. And Uncle, too. I know he expects it. Every one can see that Sir James is very much in love with you." The revulsion was so strong and painful in Dorothea's mind that the tears welled up and flowed abundantly. All her dear plans were embittered, and she thought with disgust of Sir James's conceiving that she recognized him as her lover. There was vexation, too, on account of Celia. "'How could he expect it?' she burst forth in her most impetuous manner. "'I have never agreed with him about anything but the cottages. I was barely polite to him before.' But you have been so pleased with him since then. He has begun to feel quite sure that you are fond of him." "'Fond of him, Celia! How can you choose such odious expressions?' said Dorothea, passionately. "'Dear me, Dorothea, I suppose it would be right for you to be fond of a man whom you accepted for a husband. It is offensive to me to say that Sir James could think I was fond of him. Besides, it is not the right word for the feeling I must have towards the man I would accept as a husband. 
Well, I am sorry for Sir James. I thought it right to tell you, because you went on as you always do, never looking just where you are, and treading in the wrong place. You always see what nobody else sees. It is impossible to satisfy you. Yet you never see what is quite plain. That's your way, Dodo." Something certainly gave Celia unusual courage, and she was not sparing the sister of whom she was occasionally in awe. Who can tell what just criticisms Murr the Cat may be passing on us beings of wider speculation? "'It is very painful,' said Dorothea, feeling scourged. I can have no more to do with the cottages. I must be uncivil to him. I must tell him I will have nothing to do with them. It is very painful." Her eyes filled again with tears. "'Wait a little. Think about it. You know he is going away for a day or two to see his sister. There will be nobody besides Lovegood." Celia could not help relenting. "'Poor Dodo,' she went on, in an amiable staccato. "'It is very hard. It is your favourite fad to draw plans." "'Fad to draw plans! Do you think I only care about my fellow-creatures' houses in that childish way? I may well make mistakes. How can one ever do anything nobly Christian, living among people with such petty thoughts?" No more was said. Dorothea was too much jarred to recover her temper and behave so as to show that she admitted any error in herself. She was disposed, rather, to accuse the intolerable narrowness and the purblind conscience of the society around her, and Celia was no longer the eternal cherub, but a thorn in her spirit, a pink-and-white nullifidian, worse than any discouraging presence in the pilgrim's progress. The fad of drawing plans! What was life worth? What great faith was possible when the whole effect of one's actions could be withered up into such parched rubbish as that? When she got out of the carriage, her cheeks were pale and her eyelids red. She was an image of sorrow, and her uncle who met her in the hall would have been alarmed, if Celia had not been close to her looking so pretty and composed, that he had once concluded Dorothea's tears to have their origin in her excessive religiousness. He had returned, during their absence, from a journey to the county town, about a petition for the pardon of some criminal. "'Well, my dears,' he said kindly, as they went up to kiss him. I hope nothing disagreeable has happened while I have been away." "'No, uncle,' said Celia. We have been to Freshet to look at the cottages. We thought you would have been at home to lunch." "'I came by Lowick to lunch. You didn't know I came by Lowick. And I have brought a couple of pamphlets for you, Dorothea. In the library, you know. They lie on the table in the library." It seemed as if an electric stream went through Dorothea, thrilling her from despair into expectation. They were pamphlets about the early church. The oppression of Celia, Tantrip, and Sir James was shaken off, and she walked straight to the library. Celia went upstairs. Mr. Brooke was detained by a message, but when he re-entered the library he found Dorothea seated, and already deep in one of the pamphlets which had some marginal manuscript of Mr. Casaubon's, taking it in as eagerly as she might have taken in the scent of a fresh bouquet after a dry, hot, dreary walk. She was getting away from Tipton and Freshet, and her own sad liability to tread in the wrong places on her way to the new Jerusalem. Mr. Brooke sat down in his armchair, stretched his legs toward the wood fire, which had fallen into a wondrous mass of glowing dice between the dogs, and rubbed his hands gently, looking very mildly towards Dorothea, but with a neutral leisurely air, as if he had nothing particular to say. Dorothea closed her pamphlet as soon as she was aware of her uncle's presence and rose as if to go. Usually she would have been interested about her uncle's merciful errand on behalf of the criminal, but her late agitation had made her absent-minded. "'I came back by Lowick, you know,' said Mr. Brooke, not as if with any intention to arrest her departure, but apparently from his usual tendency to say what he had said before. This fundamental principle of human speech was markedly exhibited in Mr. Brooke. "'I lunched there and saw Casaubon's library, and that kind of thing. There's a sharp air driving. Won't you sit down, my dear? You look cold." Dorothea felt quite inclined to accept the invitation. Sometimes, when her uncle's easy way of taking things did not happen to be exasperating, it was rather soothing. She threw off her mantle and bonnet and sat down opposite to him, enjoying the glow, but lifting up her beautiful hands for a screen. They were not thin hands, or small hands 
but powerful, feminine, maternal hands. She seemed to be holding them up in propitiation for her passionate desire to know and to think, which in the unfriendly mediums of Tipton and Freshet had issued in crying and red eyelids. She bethought herself now of the condemned criminal. "'What news have you brought about the sheep-stealer, uncle?' "'What? Poor Bunch! Well, it seems we can't get him off. He is to be hanged.' Dorothea's brow took an expression of reprobation and pity. "'Hanged, you know,' said Mr. Brooke, with a quiet nod. "'Poor Romilly! He would have helped us. I knew Romilly. Casaubon didn't know Romilly. He is a little buried in books, you know, Casaubon is." "'When a man has great studies and is writing a great work, he must of course give up seeing much of the world. How can he go about making acquaintances?' "'That's true. But a man mopes, you know. I have always been a bachelor, too, but I have that sort of disposition that I never moped. It was my way to go about everywhere and take in everything. I never moped. But I can see that Casaubon does, you know. He wants a companion. A companion, you know." "'It would be a great honour to any one to be his companion,' said Dorothea energetically. "'You like him, eh?' said Mr. Brooke, without showing any surprise or other emotion. "'Well, now, I've known Casaubon ten years, ever since he came to Lowick. But I never got anything out of him, any ideas, you know. However, he is a tip-top man and may be a bishop, that kind of thing, you know, if Peel stays in. And he has a very high opinion of you, my dear.' Dorothea could not speak. "'The fact is, he has a very high opinion indeed of you. And he speaks uncommonly well, does Casaubon. He has deferred to me, you not being of age. In short, I have promised to speak to you, though I told him I thought there was not much chance. I was bound to tell him that. I said my niece is very young, and that kind of thing. But I didn't think it necessary to go into everything. However, the long and the short of it is, that he has asked my permission to make you an offer of marriage. Of marriage, you know," said Mr. Brooke, with his explanatory nod. I thought it better to tell you, my dear." No one could have detected any anxiety in Mr. Brooke's manner, but he did really wish to know something of his niece's mind, that, if there were any need for advice, he might give it in time. What feeling he, as a magistrate who had taken in so many ideas, could make room for, was unmixedly kind. Since Dorothea did not speak immediately, he repeated, "'I thought it better to tell you, my dear.' "'Thank you, uncle,' said Dorothea, in a clear, unwavering tone. "'I am very grateful to Mr. Casaubon. If he makes me an offer, I shall accept him. I admire and honour him more than any man I ever saw.' Mr. Brooke paused a little, and then said in a lingering low tone, "'Ah?' Well, he is a good match in some respects. But now Chetham is a good match, and our land lies together. I shall never interfere against your wishes, my dear. People should have their own way in marriage and that sort of thing, up to a certain point, you know. I have always said that, up to a certain point. I wish you to marry well, and I have good reason to believe that Chetham wishes to marry you. I mention it, you know. It is impossible that I should ever marry Sir James Chetham said Dorothea. If he thinks of marrying me, he has made a great mistake." "'That is it, you see. One never knows. I should have thought Chetham was just the sort of man a woman would like now." "'Pray do not mention him in that light again, uncle,' said Dorothea, feeling some of her late irritation revive. Mr. Brooke wondered and felt that women were an inexhaustible subject of study, since even he at his age was not in a perfect state of scientific prediction about them. Here was a fellow like Chetham with no chance at all. "'Well, but Casaubon, now! There is no hurry. I mean, for you. It's true every year will tell upon him. He is over five and forty, you know. I should say a good seven and twenty years older than you. To be sure, if you like learning and standing and that sort of thing, we can't have everything. And his income is good. He has a handsome property independent of the church. His income is good. Still, he is not young, and I must not conceal from you, my dear, that I think his health is not over-strong. I know nothing else against him." "'I should not wish to have a husband very near my own age,' said Dorothea, with grave decision. I should wish to have a husband who was above me in judgment and in all knowledge." Mr. Brooke repeated his subdued, "'Ah? I thought you had more of your own opinion than most girls. I thought you liked your own opinion, 
liked it, you know. I cannot imagine myself living without some opinions, but I should wish to have good reasons for them, and a wise man could help me to see which opinions had the best foundation, and would help me to live according to them. Very true. You couldn't put the thing better. Couldn't put it better beforehand, you know. But there are oddities in things," continued Mr. Brooke, whose conscience was really roused to do the best he could for his niece on this occasion. Life isn't cast in a mould, not cut out by rule and line and that sort of thing. I never married myself, and it will be the better for you and yours. The fact is, I never loved any one well enough to put myself into a noose for them. It is a noose, you know. Temper now, there is temper, and a husband likes to be master. I know that I must expect trials, uncle. Marriage is a state of higher duties. I never thought of it as mere personal ease," said poor Dorothea. Well, you are not fond of show, a great establishment, balls, dinners, that kind of thing. I can see that Casaubon's ways might suit you better than Shetham's. And you shall do as you like, my dear. I would not hinder Casaubon. I said so at once, for there is no knowing how anything may turn out. You have not the same tastes as every young lady, and a clergyman and scholar, who may be a bishop, that kind of thing, may suit you better than Chetham. Chetham is a good fellow, a good, sound-hearted fellow, you know. But he doesn't go much into ideas. I did when I was his age. But Casaubon's eyes, now! I think he has hurt them a little with too much reading." "'I should be all the happier, uncle, the more room there was for me to help him,' said Dorothea ardently. You have quite made up your mind, I see. Well, my dear, the fact is, I have a letter for you in my pocket." Mr. Brooke handed the letter to Dorothea, but as she rose to go away, he added, "'There is not too much hurry, my dear. Think about it, you know.' When Dorothea had left him, he reflected that he had certainly spoken strongly. He had put the risks of marriage before her in a striking manner. It was his duty to do so. But as to pretending to be wise for young people, no uncle, however much he had travelled in his youth, absorbed the new ideas and dined with celebrities now deceased, could pretend to judge what sort of marriage would turn out well for a young girl who preferred Casaubon to Chetham. In short, woman was a problem which, since Mr. Brooke's mind felt blank before it, could be hardly less complicated than the revolutions of an irregular solid. End of chapter 4 Chapter Five of Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett, Houston, Texas, January two thousand eight. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter Five. Hard students are commonly troubled with gouts, catars, rooms. Cachexia, bradypepsia, bad eyes, stone, and colic, crudities, oppilations, vertigo, winds, consumptions, and all such diseases as come by overmuch sitting. They are most part lean, dry, ill-coloured, and all through immoderate pains and extraordinary studies. If you will not believe the truth of this, look upon great Tostatus and Thomas Aquinas's works, and tell me whether those men took pains. Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy, P. 1, S. 2. This was Mr. Casaubon's letter. My dear Miss Brooke, I have your guardian's permission to address you on a subject than which I have none more at heart. I am not, I trust, mistaken in the recognition of some deeper correspondence than that of date in the fact that a consciousness of need in my own life had arisen contemporaneously with the possibility of my becoming acquainted with you. For in the first hour of meeting you, I had an impression of your eminent and perhaps exclusive fitness to supply that need, connected, I may say, with such activity of the affections as even the preoccupations of a work too special to be abdicated, could not uninterruptedly dissimulate. And each succeeding opportunity for observation has given the impression an added depth, by convincing me more emphatically of that fitness which I had preconceived and thus evoking more decisively those affections to which I have but now referred. Our conversations have, I think, 
made sufficiently clear to you the tenor of my life and purposes, a tenor unsuited, I am aware, to the commoner order of minds. But I have discerned in you an elevation of thought, and a capability of devotedness, which I had hitherto not conceived to be compatible, either with the early bloom of youth, or with those graces of sex that may be set at once to win, and to confer distinction when combined, as they notably are in you, with the mental qualities above indicated. It was, I confess, beyond my hope to meet with this rare combination of elements both solid and attractive, adapted to supply aid in graver labours, and to cast a charm over vacant hours. And but for the event of my introduction to you, which, let me say again, I trust not to be superficially coincident with foreshadowing needs, but providentially related thereto as stages towards the completion of a life's plan, I should presumably have gone on to the last without any attempt to lighten my solitariness by a matrimonial union. Such, my dear Miss Brooke, is the accurate statement of my feelings, and I rely on your kind indulgence in venturing now to ask you how far your own are of a nature to confirm my happy presentiment. To be accepted by you as your husband, and the earthly guardian of your welfare, I should regard as the highest of providential gifts. In return, I can at least offer you an affection hitherto unwasted, and the faithful consecration of a life which, however short in the sequel, has no backward pages whereon, if you choose to turn them, you will find records such as might justly cause you either bitterness or shame. I await the expression of your sentiments with an anxiety, which it would be the part of wisdom, were it possible, to divert by a more arduous labour than usual. But in this order of experience I am still young, and in looking forward to an unfavourable possibility, I cannot but feel that resignation to solitude will be more difficult after the temporary illumination of hope. In any case, I shall remain yours with sincere devotion, Edward Casabon. Dorothea trembled while she read this letter. Then she fell on her knees, buried her face, and sobbed. She could not pray. Under the rush of solemn emotion in which thoughts became vague and images floated uncertainly, she could but cast herself, with a childlike sense of reclining, in the lap of a divine consciousness which sustained her own. She remained in that attitude till it was time to dress for dinner. How could it occur to her to examine the letter? to look at it critically as a profession of love. Her whole soul was possessed by the fact that a fuller life was opening before her. She was a neophyte about to enter on a higher grade of initiation. She was going to have room for the energies which stirred uneasily under the dimness and pressure of her own ignorance, and the petty peremptoriness of the world's habits. Now she would be able to devote herself to large yet definite duties. Now she would be allowed to live continually in the light of a mind that she could reverence. This hope was not unmixed with the glow of proud delight, the joyous maiden's surprise that she was chosen by the man whom her admiration had chosen. All Dorothea's passion was transfused through a mind struggling towards an ideal life. The radiance of her transfigured girlhood fell on the first object that came within its level. The impetus with which inclination became resolution was heightened by those little events of the day which had roused her discontent with the actual conditions of her life. After dinner, when Celia was playing an air with variations, a small kind of tinkling which symbolized the aesthetic part of the young lady's education, Dorothea went up to her room to answer Mr. Casaubon's letter. Why should she defer the answer? She wrote it over three times, not because she wished to change the wording, but because her hand was unusually uncertain, and she could not bear that Mr. Casaubon should think her handwriting bad and illegible. She piqued herself on writing a hand in which each letter was distinguishable, without any large range of conjecture, and she meant to make much use of this accomplishment, to save Mr. Casaubon's eyes. Three times she wrote, "'My dear Mr. Casaubon, I am very grateful to you for loving me, and thinking me worthy to be your wife. I can look forward to no better happiness than that which would be won with yours. If I said more, it would only be the same thing written out at greater length for I cannot now dwell on any other thought than that I may be through life, yours devotedly, Dorothea Brooke." Later in the evening she followed her uncle into the library to give him the letter, that he might send it in the morning. He was surprised, but his surprise only issued in a few moments' silence, during which he pushed about various objects on his writing-table, and finally stood with his back to the fire, 
his glasses on his nose, looking at the address of Dorothea's letter. "'Have you thought enough about this, my dear?' he said at last. "'There was no need to think long, uncle. I know of nothing to make me vacillate. If I changed my mind, it must be because of something important and entirely new to me.' "'Ah! Then you have accepted him. Then Chetham has no chance. Has Chetham offended you? Offended you, you know? What is it you don't like in Chetham? "'There is nothing that I like in him,' said Dorothea, rather impetuously. Mr. Brooke threw his head and shoulders backward, as if some one had thrown a light missile at him. Dorothea immediately felt some self-rebuke, and said, "'I mean in the light of a husband. He is very kind, I think, really very good about the cottages, a well-meaning man.' "'But you must have a scholar, and that sort of thing. Well, it lies a little in our family. I had it myself, that love of knowledge and going into everything, a little too much. It took me too far. Though that sort of thing doesn't often run in the female line, or it runs underground, like the rivers in Greece, you know, it comes out in the sons. Clever sons, clever mothers. I went a good deal into that at one time. However, my dear, I have always said that people should do as they like in these things, up to a certain point. I couldn't, as your guardian, have consented to a bad match. But Casabon stands well, his position is good. I am afraid Chetham will be hurt, though, and Mrs. Cadwallader will blame me." That evening, of course, Celia knew nothing of what had happened. She attributed Dorothea's distracted manner, and the evidence of further crying since they had got home, to the temper she had been in about Sir James Chetham and the buildings, and was careful not to give further offence. Having once said what she wanted to say, Celia had no disposition to recur to disagreeable subjects. It had been her nature, when a child, never to quarrel with any one, only to observe with wonder that they quarrelled with her, and looked like turkey-cocks. Whereupon she was ready to play at cat's cradle with them whenever they recovered themselves. And as to Dorothea, it had always been her way to find something wrong in her sister's words, though Celia inwardly protested that she always said just how things were, and nothing else. She never did and never could put words together out of her own head. But the best of Dodo was, that she did not keep angry for long together. Now, though they had hardly spoken to each other all the evening, yet when Celia put by her work, intending to go to bed, a proceeding in which she was always much the earlier, Dorothea, who was seated on a low stool, unable to occupy herself except in meditation, said, with the musical intonation which in moments of deep but quiet feeling made her speech like a fine bit of recitative, "'Celia, dear, come and kiss me.' holding her arms open as she spoke. Celia knelt down to get the right level, and gave her little butterfly kiss, while Dorothea encircled her with gentle arms and pressed her lips gravely on each cheek in turn. "'Don't sit up, Dodo. You are so pale to-night. Go to bed soon,' said Celia, in a comfortable way, without any touch of pathos. "'No, dear. I am very, very happy,' said Dorothea fervently. "'So much the better,' thought Celia. But how strangely Dodo goes from one extreme to the other!" The next day at luncheon, the butler, handing something to Mr. Brooke, said, "'Jonas has come back, sir, and has brought this letter.' Mr. Brooke read the letter, and then, nodding toward Dorothea, said, "'Casabon, my dear, he will be here to dinner. He didn't wait to write more. Didn't wait, you know.' It could not seem remarkable to Celia that a dinner-guest should be announced to her sister beforehand, but— her eyes following the same direction as her uncle's. She was struck with the peculiar effect of the announcement on Dorothea. It seemed as if something like the reflection of a white, sunlit wing had passed across her features, ending in one of her rare blushes. For the first time it entered into Celia's mind that there might be something more between Mr. Casabon and her sister than his delight in bookish talk and her delight in listening. Hitherto she had classed the admiration for this ugly and learned acquaintance with the admiration for Monsieur Leray at Lausanne, also ugly and learned. Dorothea had never been tired of listening to old Monsieur Leray, when Celia's feet were as cold as possible, and when it had really become dreadful to see the skin of his bald head moving about. Why, then, should her enthusiasm not extend to Mr. Casabon, simply in the same way as to Monsieur Leray? And it seemed probable that all learned men had a sort of schoolmaster's view of young people. But now Celia was really startled at the suspicion which had darted into her mind. She was seldom taken by surprise in this way, 
her marvellous quickness in observing a certain order of signs generally preparing her to expect such outward events as she had an interest in. Not that she now imagined Mr. Casaubon to be already an accepted lover. She had only begun to feel disgust at the possibility that anything in Dorothea's mind could tend towards such an issue. Here was something really to vex her about Dodo. It was all very well not to accept Sir James Chetham, but the idea of marrying Mr. Casaubon! Celia felt a sort of shame mingled with a sense of the ludicrous. But perhaps Dodo, if she were really bordering on such an extravagance, might be turned away from it. Experience had often shown that her impressibility might be calculated on. The day was damp, and they were not going to walk out, so they both went up to their sitting-room, and there Celia observed that Dorothea, instead of settling down with her usual diligent interest to some occupation, simply leaned her elbow on an open book, and looked out of the window at the great cedar silvered with the damp. She herself had taken up the making of a toy for the curate's children, and was not going to enter on a subject too precipitately. Dorothea was, in fact, thinking that it was desirable for Celia to know of the momentous change in Mr. Casaubon's position, since he had last been in the house. It did not seem fair to leave her in ignorance of what would necessarily affect her attitude towards him. But it was impossible not to shrink from telling her. Dorothea accused herself of some meanness in this timidity. It was always odious to her to have any small fears or contrivances about her actions. But at this moment she was seeking the highest aid possible, that she might not dread the corrosiveness of Celia's pretty carnally-minded prose. Her reverie was broken, and the difficulty of decision banished, by Celia's small and rather guttural voice speaking in its usual tone, of a remark aside or a by-the-by. "'Is any one else coming to dine beside Mr. Casaubon?' "'Not that I know of.' "'I hope there is some one else. Then I shall not hear him eat his soup so.' What is there remarkable about his soup-eating? Really, Dodo, can't you hear how he scrapes his spoon? And he always blinks before he speaks. I don't know whether Locke blinked, but I'm sure I am sorry for those who sat opposite to him if he did." "'Celia,' said Dorothea, with emphatic gravity, "'pray don't make any more observations of that kind.' "'Why not? They are quite true,' returned Celia who had her reasons for persevering, though she was beginning to be a little afraid. "'Many things are true which only the commonest minds observe.' "'Then I think the commonest minds must be rather useful. I think it is a pity Mr. Casaubon's mother had not a commoner mind. She might have taught him better.' Celia was inwardly frightened, and ready to run away, now that she had hurled this light javelin. Dorothea's feelings had gathered to an avalanche, and there could be no further preparation. It is right to tell you, Celia, that I am engaged to marry Mr. Casaubon." Perhaps Celia had never turned so pale before. The paper man she was making would have had his leg injured, but for her habitual care of whatever she held in her hands. She laid the fragile figure down at once, and sat perfectly still for a few moments. When she spoke, there was a tear gathering. "'Oh, Dodo, I hope you will be happy.' Her sisterly tenderness could not but surmount other feelings at this moment, and her fears were the fears of affection. Dorothea was still hurt and agitated. "'It is quite decided, then,' said Celia, in an awed undertone, "'and Uncle knows.' "'I have accepted Mr. Casaubon's offer. My uncle brought me the letter that contained it. He knew about it beforehand.' "'I beg your pardon. If I have said anything to hurt you, Dodo—' said Celia, with a slight sob. She never could have thought that she should feel as she did. There was something funereal in the whole affair, and Mr. Casaubon seemed to be the officiating clergyman, about whom it would be indecent to make remarks. "'Never mind, Kitty. Do not grieve. We should never admire the same people. I often offend in something of the same way. I am apt to speak too strongly of those who don't please me.' In spite of this magnanimity, Dorothea was still smarting perhaps as much from Celia's subdued astonishment as from her small criticisms. Of course all the world round Tipton would be out of sympathy with this marriage. Dorothea knew of no one who thought as she did about life and its best objects. Nevertheless, before the evening was at an end, she was very happy. In an hour's tête-à-tête -tête with Mr. Casaubon, she talked to him with more freedom than she had ever felt before, even pouring out her joy at the thought of devoting herself to him, and of learning how she might best share and further all his great ends. 
Mr. Casaubon was touched with an unknown delight, what man would not have been, at this childlike unrestrained ardour. He was not surprised, what lover would have been, that he should be the object of it. "'My dear young lady, Miss Brooke, Dorothea,' he said, pressing her hand between his hands, "'this is a happiness greater than I had ever imagined to be in reserve for me, that I should ever meet with a mind and person so rich in the mingled graces which could render marriage desirable, was far indeed from my conception. You have all, nay, more than all, those qualities which I have ever regarded as the characteristic excellencies of womanhood. The great charm of your sex is its capability of an ardent self-sacrificing affection, and herein we see its fitness to round and complete the existence of our own. Hitherto I have known few pleasures, save of the severer kind. My satisfactions have been those of the solitary student. I have been little disposed to gather flowers that would wither in my hand, but now I shall pluck them with eagerness, to place them in your bosom." No speech could have been more thoroughly honest in its intention. The frigid rhetoric at the end was as sincere as the bark of a dog, or the cawing of an amorous rook. Would it not be rash to conclude that there was no passion behind those sonnets to Delia, which strike us as the thin music of a mandolin? Dorothea's faith supplied all that Mr. Casaubon's words seemed to leave unsaid. What believer sees a disturbing omission or infelicity? The text, whether of prophet or of poet, expands for whatever we can put into it, and even his bad grammar is sublime. "'I am very ignorant. You will quite wonder at my ignorance,' said Dorothea. "'I have so many thoughts that may be quite mistaken, and now I shall be able to tell them all to you, and ask you about them. But,' she added with rapid imagination of Mr. Casaubon's probable feeling, "'I will not trouble you too much, only when you are inclined to listen to me. You must often be weary with the pursuit of subjects in your own track. I shall gain enough if you will take me with you there." "'How should I be able now to persevere in any path without your companionship?' said Mr. Casaubon, kissing her candid brow, and feeling that heaven had vouchsafed him a blessing in every way suited to his peculiar wants. He was being unconsciously wrought up by the charms of a nature which was entirely without hidden calculations, either for immediate effects or for remoter ends. It was this which made Dorothea so childlike, and, according to some judges, so stupid, with all her reputed cleverness, as, for example, in the present case of throwing herself, metaphorically speaking, at Mr. Casaubon's feet, and kissing his unfashionable shoe-ties as if he were a Protestant pope. She was not in the least teaching Mr. Casaubon to ask if he were good enough for her, but merely asking herself anxiously how she could be good enough for Mr. Casaubon. Before he left the next day it had been decided that the marriage should take place within six weeks. Why not? Mr. Casaubon's house was ready. It was not a parsonage, but a considerable mansion, with much land attached to it. The parsonage was inhabited by the curate, who did all the duty except preaching the morning sermon. End of chapter 5Chapter Six of Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Middlemarch, by George Eliot. Chapter Six. My lady's tongue is like the meadow blades that cut you, stroking them with idle hand. Nice cutting is her function. She divides with spiritual edge the millet-seed, and makes intangible savings." As Mr. Casaubon's carriage was passing out of the gateway, it arrested the entrance of a pony phaeton driven by a lady with a servant seated behind. It was doubtful whether the recognition had been mutual, for Mr. Casaubon was looking absently before him, but the lady was quick-eyed, and threw a nod and a, "'How do you do?' in the nick of time. In spite of her shabby bonnet and very old Indian shawl, it was plain that the lodge-keeper regarded her as an important personage, from the low curtsey which was dropped on the entrance of the small phaeton. "'Well, Mrs. Fitchett, how are your fowls laying now?' said the high-coloured, dark-eyed lady with the clearest chiselled utterance. "'Pretty well for laying, madam, but they've ta'en to eating their eggs. I've no peace of mind with them at all.' "'Oh, the cannibals! Better sell them cheap at once. What will you sell them a couple? 
One can't eat fowls of a bad character at a high price. Well, madam, half a crown. I couldn't let him go, not under. Half a crown, these times? Come now, for the rector's chicken broth on a Sunday. He has consumed all hours that I can spare. You are half paid with the sermon, Mrs. Fitchett, remember that. Take a pair of tumbler pigeons for them, little beauties. You must come and see them. You have no tumblers among your pigeons. Well, madam, Master Fitchett shall go and see him after work. He's very hot on new sorts. To oblige you. Oblige me! It will be the best bargain he ever made. A pair of church pigeons for a couple of wicked Spanish fowls that eat their own eggs. Don't you and Fitchett boast too much, that is all. The phaeton was driven onwards with the last words, leaving Mrs. Fitchett laughing and shaking her head slowly, with an interjectional, "'Surely, surely!' from which it might be inferred that she would have found the countryside somewhat duller if the rector's lady had been less free-spoken, and less of a skinflint. Indeed, both the farmers and labourers in the parishes of Freshet and Tipton would have felt a sad lack of conversation, but for the stories about what Mrs. Cadwallader said and did. A lady of immeasurably high birth, descended, as it were, from unknown earls, dim as the crowd of heroic shades, who pleaded poverty, pared down prices, and cut jokes in the most companionable manner, though with a turn of tongue that let you know who she was. Such a lady gave a neighbourliness to both rank and religion, and mitigated the bitterness of uncommuted tithe. A much more exemplary character with an infusion of sour dignity would not have furthered their comprehension of the thirty-nine articles, and would have been less socially uniting. Mr. Brooke, seeing Mrs. Cadwallader's merits from a different point of view, winced a little when her name was announced in the library, where he was sitting alone. "'I see you have had our Loic Cicero here,' she said, seating herself comfortably, throwing back her wraps, and showing a thin but well-built figure. "'I suspect you and he are brewing some bad polities, else you would not be seeing so much of the lively man. I shall inform against you. Remember you are both suspicious characters, since you took Peel's side about the Catholic bill. I shall tell everybody that you are going to put up for Middlemarch on the Whig side when old Pinkerton resigns, and that Casabon is going to help you in an underhand manner, going to bribe the voters with pamphlets, and throw open the public houses to distribute them. Come, confess! Nothing of the sort, said Mr. Brooke, smiling and rubbing his eyeglasses, but really blushing a little at the impeachment. Casabon and I don't talk politics much. He doesn't care much about the philanthropic side of things punishments, and that kind of thing. He only cares about church questions. That is not my line of action, you know." "'Rather too much, my friend. I have heard of your doings. Who was it that sold his bit of land to the Papists at Middlemarch? I believe you bought it on purpose. You are a perfect Guy Fox. See if you are not burnt an effigy this fifth of November coming. Humphrey would not come to quarrel with you about it, so I am come." "'Very good. I was prepared to be persecuted for not persecuting. Not persecuting, you know." "'There you go. That is a piece of claptrap you have got ready for the hustings. Now do not let them lure you to the hustings, my dear Mr. Brooke. A man always makes a fool of himself speechifying. There's no excuse but being on the right side, so that you can ask a blessing on your humming and hawing. You will lose yourself, I forewarn you. You will make a Saturday pie of all parties' opinions, and be pelted by everybody." "'That is what I expect, you know,' said Mr. Brooke, not wishing to betray how little he enjoyed this prophetic sketch. "'What I expect as an independent man. As to the Whigs, a man who goes with the thinkers is not likely to be hooked on by any party. He may go with them up to a certain point—up to a certain point, you know. But that is what you ladies never understand." "'Where your certain point is? No. I should like to be told how a man can have any certain point when he belongs to no party, leading a roving life and never letting his friends know his address. Nobody knows where Brooke will be. There's no counting on Brooke. That is what people say of you, to be quite frank. Now do turn respectable. How will you like going to sessions with everybody looking shy on you, and you with a bad conscience and an empty pocket?" "'I don't pretend to argue with a lady on politics said Mr. Brooke, with an air of smiling indifference, but feeling rather unpleasantly conscious that this attack of Mrs. Cadwallader's had opened the defensive campaign to which certain rash steps had exposed him. 
"'Your sex are not thinkers, you know. Varium et mutilabe semper, that kind of thing. You don't know, Virgil. I knew—' Mr. Brooke reflected in time that he had not had the personal acquaintance of the Augustan poet. I was going to say, poor Stoddart, you know. That was what he said. You ladies are always against an independent attitude, a man's caring for nothing but truth, and that sort of thing. And there is no part of the county where opinion is narrower than it is here. I don't mean to throw stones, you know, but somebody has wanted to take the independent line, and if I don't take it, who will?" "'Who? Why, any upstart who has got neither blood nor position. People of standing should consume their independent nonsense at home, not hawk it about. And you, who are going to marry your niece, as good as your daughter, to one of our best men? Sir James would be cruelly annoyed. It will be too hard on him if you turn round now and make yourself a Whig signboard." Mr. Brooke again winced inwardly, for Dorothea's engagement had no sooner been decided than he had thought of Mrs. Cadwallader's prospective taunts. It might have been easy for ignorant observers to say, quarrel with Mrs. Cadwallader, but where is a country gentleman to go who quarrels with his oldest neighbours? Who could taste the fine flavour in the name of Brooke if it were delivered casually, like wine without a seal? Certainly a man can only be cosmopolitan up to a certain point. I hope Chetham and I shall always be good friends, but I am sorry to say there is no prospect of his marrying my niece," said Mr. Brooke, much relieved to see through the window that Celia was coming in. "'Why not?' said Mrs. Cadwallader, with a sharp note of surprise. "'It is hardly a fortnight since you and I were talking about it.' "'My niece has chosen another suitor. Has chosen him, you know. I have had nothing to do with it. I should have preferred Chetham, and I should have said Chetham was the man any girl would have chosen. But there is no accounting for these things. Your sex is capricious, you know." "'Why, whom do you mean to say that you are going to let her marry?' Mrs. Cadwallader's mind was rapidly surveying the possibilities of choice for Dorothea. But here Celia entered, blooming from a walk in the garden, and the greeting with her delivered Mr. Brooke from the necessity of answering immediately. He got up hastily, and saying, "'By the way, I must speak to Wright about the horses,' shuffled quickly out of the room. "'My dear child, what is this? This about your sister's engagement?' said Mrs. Cadwallader. "'She is engaged to marry Mr. Casabon," said Celia, resorting as usual to the simplest statement of fact, and enjoying this opportunity of speaking to the rector's wife alone. "'This is frightful! How long has it been going on?' "'I only knew of it yesterday. They are to be married in six weeks.' "'Well, my dear, I wish you joy of your brother-in-law.' I am so sorry for Dorothea." "'Sorry? It is her doing, I suppose?' "'Yes. She says Mr. Casabon has a great soul.' "'With all my heart.' "'Oh, Mrs. Cadwallader, I don't think it can be nice to marry a man with a great soul.' "'Well, my dear, take warning. You know the look of one now. When the next comes and wants to marry you, don't you accept him?' "'I'm sure I never should.' "'No. One such in a family is enough. So your sister never cared about Sir James Chetham. What would you have said to him for a brother-in-law?" "'I should have liked that very much. I am sure he would have been a good husband. Only,' Celia added, with a slight blush—she sometimes seemed to blush as she breathed—'I don't think he would have suited Dorothea.' "'Not high-flown enough?' "'Dodo is very strict. She thinks so much about everything, and is so particular about what one says. Sir James never seemed to please her. She must have encouraged him, I am sure. That is not very creditable. Please don't be angry with Dodo. She does not see things. She thought so much about the cottages, and she was rude to Sir James sometimes. But he is so kind, he never noticed it." Well, said Mrs. Cadwallader, putting on her shawl and rising as if in haste, I must go straight to Sir James and break this to him. He will have brought his mother back by this time, and I must call. Your uncle will never tell him. We are all disappointed, my dear. Young people should think of their families in marrying. I set a bad example, married a poor clergyman, and made myself a pitiable object among the de Bracys, obliged to get my coals by stratagem, and pray to heaven for my salad oil. However, Casabon has money enough. I must do him that justice. As to his blood, I suppose the family quarterings are three cuttlefish sable, and a commentator rampant. By the by, before I go, my dear, I must speak to your Mrs. Carter about pastry. I want to send my young cook to learn of her. 
Poor people with four children like us, you know, can't afford to keep a good cook. I have no doubt Mrs. Carter will oblige me. Sir James's cook is a perfect dragon." In less than an hour Mrs. Cadwallader had circumvented Mrs. Carter and driven to Freshet Hall, which was not far from her own parsonage, her husband being resident in Freshet and keeping a curate in Tipton. Sir James Chetham had returned from the short journey which had kept him absent for a couple of days, and had changed his dress, intending to ride over to Tipton Grange. His horse was standing at the door when Mrs. Cadwallader drove up, and he immediately appeared there himself, whip in hand. Lady Chetham had not yet returned, but Mrs. Cadwallader's errand could not be dispatched in the presence of grooms, so she asked to be taken into the conservatory close by, to look at the new plants, and on coming to a contemplative stand she said, "'I have a great shock for you. I hope you are not so far gone in love as you pretended to be.' It was of no use protesting, against Mrs. Cadwallader's way of putting things. But Sir James's countenance changed a little. He felt a vague alarm. "'I do believe Brooke is going to expose himself after all. I accused him of meaning to stand for Middlemarch on the Liberal side, and he looked silly and never denied it, talked about the independent line and the usual nonsense.' "'Is that all?' said Sir James, much relieved. "'Why?' rejoined Mrs. Cadwallader, with a sharper note. "'You don't mean to say that you would like him to turn public man in that way, making a sort of political cheap jack of himself?' "'He might be dissuaded, I should think. He would not like the expense.' "'That is what I told him. He is vulnerable to reason there, always a few grains of common sense and an ounce of miserliness. Miserliness is a capital quality to run in families. It's the safe side for madness to dip on. And there must be a little crack in the Brook family, else we should not see what we are to see." "'What? Brook standing for Middlemarch?' "'Worse than that. I really feel a little responsible. I always told you Miss Brook would be such a fine match. I knew there was a great deal of nonsense in her, a flighty sort of methodistical stuff. But these things were out of girls. However, I am taken by surprise for once." "'What do you mean, Mrs. Cadwallader?" said Sir James. His fear lest Miss Brooke should have run away to join the Moravian Brethren, or some preposterous sect unknown to good society, was a little allayed by the knowledge that Mrs. Cadwallader always made the worst of things. "'What has happened to Miss Brooke? Pray speak out.' "'Very well. She is engaged to be married.' Mrs. Cadwallader paused a few moments, observing the deeply hurt expression in her friend's face, which he was trying to conceal by a nervous smile, while he whipped his boot. But she soon added, "'Engaged to Casabon.' Sir James let his whip fall and stooped to pick it up. Perhaps his face had never before gathered so much concentrated disgust as when he turned to Mrs. Cadwallader and repeated, "'Casabon?' "'Even so. You know my errand now.' "'Good God! It is horrible! He is no better than a mummy!' This point of view has to be allowed for, as that of a blooming and disappointed rival. "'She says he is a great soul. A great bladder for dried peas to rattle in,' said Mrs. Cadwallader. "'What business has an old bachelor like that to marry?' said Sir James. "'He has one foot in the grave.' "'He means to draw it out again, I suppose.' "'Brooke ought not to allow it. He should insist on its being put off till she is of age. She would think better of it then. What is a guardian for?" "'As if you could ever squeeze a resolution out of Brooke.' "'Cadwallader might talk to him.' <laughs> "'Not he. Humphrey finds everybody charming. I never can get him to abuse Casabon. He will even speak well of the bishop, though I tell him it is unnatural in a beneficed clergyman. What can one do with a husband who attends so little to the decencies? I hide it as well as I can by abusing everybody myself." "'Come, come, cheer up. You are well rid of Miss Brooke. A girl who would have been requiring you to see the stars by daylight. And between ourselves, little Celia is worth two of her, and likely after all to be the better match, for this marriage to Casbon is as good as going to a nunnery. Oh, on my own account! It is for Miss Brooke's sake I think her friends should try to use their influence. Well, Humphrey doesn't know yet. But when I tell him you may depend upon it, he will say, Why not? Casabon is a good fellow, and young, young enough." These charitable people never know vinegar from wine till they have swallowed it and got the colic. However, if I were a man, I should prefer Celia, especially when Dorothea was gone. The truth is, you have been courting one, 
and have won the other. I can see that she admires you almost as much as a man expects to be admired. If it were any one but me who said so, you might think an exaggeration. Good-bye." Sir James handed Mrs. Cadwallader to the phaeton, and then jumped on his horse. He was not going to renounce his ride because of his friend's unpleasant news, only to ride the faster in some other direction than that of Tipton Grange. Now why on earth should Mrs. Cadwallader have been at all busy about Miss Brooke's marriage, and why, when one match that she liked to think that she had a hand in was frustrated, should she have straightway contrived the preliminaries of another? Was there any ingenious plot, any hide-and-seek course of action, which might be detected by a careful telescopic watch? Not at all. A telescope might have swept the parishes of Tipton and Freshet, the whole area visited by Mrs. Cadwallader and her phaeton, without witnessing any interview that could excite suspicion, or any scene from which she did not return, with the same unperturbed keenness of eye, and the same high natural colour. In fact, if that convenient vehicle had existed in the days of the Seven Sages, one of them would doubtless have remarked that you can know little of women by following them about in their pony phaetons. Even with a microscope directed on a water-drop, we find ourselves making interpretations which turn out to be rather coarse. For whereas under a weak lens you may seem to see a creature exhibiting an act of veracity, into which other smaller creatures actively play, as if they were so many animated tax-pennies, a stronger lens reveals to you certain tiniest harlots, which make vortices for these victims, while the swallower waits passively at his receipt of custom. In this way, metaphorically speaking, a strong lens applied to Mrs. Cadwallader's matchmaking will show a play of minute causes, producing what may be called thought and speech vortices, to bring her the sort of food she needed. Her life was rurally simple, quite free from secrets either foul, dangerous, or otherwise important, and not consciously affected by the great affairs of the world. All the more did the affairs of the great world interest her, when communicated in the letters of high-born relations. The way in which fascinating younger sons had gone to the dogs by marrying their mistresses, the fine old-blooded idiocy of young Lord Tapir, and the furious gouty humours of old Lord Megatherium. The exact crossing of genealogies which had brought a coronet into a new branch, and widened the relations of a scandal. These were topics of which she retained details with the utmost accuracy, and reproduced them in an excellent pickle of epigrams, which she herself enjoyed the more, because she believed as unquestionably in birth and no birth, as she did in game and vermin. She would never have disowned any one on the ground of poverty. A de Bracy reduced to take his dinner in a basin would have seemed to her an example of pathos worth exaggerating, and I fear his aristocratic vices would not have horrified her. But her feeling towards the vulgar rich was a sort of religious hatred. They had probably made all their money out of high retail prices, and Mrs. Cadwallader detested high prices, for everything that was not paid in kind at the rectory. Such people were no part of God's design in making the world, and their accent was an affliction to the ears. A town where such monsters abounded was hardly more than a sort of low comedy, which could not be taken account of in a well-bred scheme of the universe. Let any lady who was inclined to be hard on Mrs. Cadwallader inquire into the comprehensiveness of her own beautiful views, and be quite sure that they afford accommodation for all the lives which have the honour to coexist with hers. With such a mind, active as phosphorus, biting everything that came near it into the form that suited it. How could Mrs. Cadwallader feel that the Miss Brooks, and their matrimonial prospects, were alien to her? Especially as it had been the habit of years for her to scold Mr. Brooke with the friendliest frankness, and let him know in confidence that she thought him a poor creature. From the first arrival of the young ladies in Tipton, she had prearranged Dorothea's marriage with Sir James, and if it had taken place, would have been quite sure that it was her doing, that it should not take place after she had preconceived it, caused her an irritation which every thinker will sympathize with. She was the diplomatist of Tipton and Freshett, and for anything to happen in spite of her was an offensive irregularity. As to freaks like this of Miss Brooks, Mrs. Cadwallader had no patience with them, and now saw that her opinion of this girl had been infected with some of her husband's weak charitableness. Those methodistical whims, that air of being more religious than the rector and curate together, came from a deeper and more constitutional disease than she had been willing to believe. However, said Mrs. Cadwallader, first to herself and afterwards to her husband, I throw her over. There was a chance, if she had married Sir James, of her becoming a sane, sensible woman. He would never have contradicted her, and when a woman is not contradicted, she has no motive for obstinacy in her absurdities. But now I wish her joy of her hair-shirt. 
It followed that Mrs. Cadwallader must decide on another match for Sir James, and having made up her mind that it was to be the younger Miss Brooke, there could not have been a more skilful move towards the success of her plan than her hint to the baronet that he had made an impression on Celia's heart. For he was not one of those gentlemen who languish after the unattainable Sappho's apple that laughs from the topmost bough, the charms which smile like the knot of cowslips on the cliff, not to be come at by the willing hand. He had no sonnets to write, and it could not strike him agreeably that he was not an object of preference to the woman whom he had preferred. Already the knowledge that Dorothea had chosen Mr. Casaubon had bruised his attachment and relaxed its hold. Although Sir James was a sportsman, he had some other feelings towards women than towards grouse and foxes, and did not regard his future wife in the light of prey, valuable chiefly for the excitements of the chase. Neither was he so well acquainted with the habits of primitive races as to feel that an ideal combat for her, tomahawk in hand, so to speak, was necessary to the historical continuity of the marriage tie. On the contrary, having the amiable vanity which knits us to those who are fond of us, and disinclines us to those who are indifferent, and also a good grateful nature, the mere idea that a woman had a kindness towards him, spun little threads of tenderness from out his heart towards hers. Thus it happened, that after Sir James had ridden rather fast for half an hour in a direction away from Tipton Grange, he slackened his pace, and at last turned into a road which would lead him back by a shorter cut. Various feelings wrought in him the determination, after all, to go to the Grange to-day, as if nothing new had happened. He could not help rejoicing that he had never made the offer, and been rejected. Mere friendly politeness required that he should call to see Dorothea about the cottages, and now happily Mrs. Cadwallader had prepared him to offer his congratulations, if necessary, without showing too much awkwardness. He really did not like it. Giving up Dorothea was very painful to him. But there was something in the resolve to make this visit forthwith, and conquer all show of feeling, which was a sort of file-biting and counter-irritant. And without his distinctly recognizing the impulse, there certainly was, present in him, the sense that Celia would be there, and that he should pay her more attention than he had done before. We mortals, men and women, devour many a disappointment between breakfast and dinner-time, keep back the tears and look a little pale about the lips, and in answer to inquiries say, Oh, nothing. Pride helps us, and pride is not a bad thing, when it only urges us to hide our own hurts, not to hurt others. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter Seven. Piacere popone, voilà la sua stagione. Italian proverb. Mr. Casaubon, as might be expected, spent a great deal of his time at the Grange in these weeks, and the hindrance which courtship occasioned to the progress of his great work, the key to all mythologies, naturally made him look forward the more eagerly to the happy termination of courtship. But he had deliberately incurred the hindrance, having made up his mind that it was now time for him to adorn his life with the graces of female companionship, to irradiate the gloom which fatigue was apt to hang over the intervals of studious labour, with the play of female fancy, and to secure in this, his culminating age, the solace of female tendance for his declining years. Hence he determined to abandon himself to the stream of feeling, and perhaps was surprised to find what an exceedingly shallow rill it was. As in droughty regions baptism by immersion could only be performed symbolically, Mr. Casaubon found that sprinkling was the utmost approach to a plunge which his stream would afford him, and he concluded that the poets had much exaggerated the force of masculine passion. Nevertheless, he observed with pleasure that Miss Brooke showed an ardent submissive affection which promised to fulfil his most agreeable provisions of marriage. It had once or twice crossed his mind that possibly there was some deficiency in Dorothea, to account for the moderation of his abandonment. But he was unable to discern the deficiency, or to figure to himself a woman who would have pleased him better. So that there was clearly no reason to fall back upon but the exaggerations of human tradition. "'Could I not be preparing myself now to be more useful?' said Dorothea to him one morning, early in the time of courtship. "'Could I not learn to read Latin and Greek aloud to you, as Milton's daughters did to their father, without understanding what they read?' "'I fear that would be wearisome to you,' 
said Mr. Casaubon, smiling. And, indeed, if I remember rightly, the young women you have mentioned regarded that exercise in unknown tongues as a ground for rebellion against the poet. Yes, but in the first place they were very naughty girls, else they would have been proud to minister to such a father. And in the second place, they might have studied privately and taught themselves to understand what they read, and then it would have been interesting. I hope you don't expect me to be naughty and stupid. I expect you to be all that an exquisite young lady can be, in every possible relation of life. Certainly it might be a great advantage if you were able to copy the Greek character, and to that end it were well to begin with a little reading." Dorothea seized this as precious permission. She would not have asked Mr. Casaubon at once to teach her the languages, dreading of all things to be tiresome instead of helpful. But it was not entirely out of devotion to her future husband that she wished to know Latin and Greek. Those provinces of masculine knowledge seemed to her a standing-ground from which all truth could be seen more truly. As it was, she constantly doubted her own conclusions, because she felt her own ignorance. How could she be confident that one-roomed cottages were not for the glory of God, when men who knew the classics appeared to conciliate indifference to the cottages with zeal for the glory? Perhaps even Hebrew might be necessary, at least the alphabet and a few roots, in order to arrive at the core of things and to judge soundly on the social duties of the Christian. And she had not reached that point of renunciation at which she would have been satisfied with having a wise husband. She wished, poor child, to be wise herself. Miss Brooke was certainly very naive with all her alleged cleverness. Celia, whose mind had never been thought too powerful, saw the emptiness of other people's pretensions much more readily. To have in general but little feeling seems to be the only security against feeling too much on any particular occasion. However, Mr. Casaubon consented to listen and teach for an hour together, like a schoolmaster of little boys, or rather like a lover, to whom a mistress's elementary ignorance and difficulties have a touching fitness. Few scholars would have disliked teaching the alphabet under such circumstances. But Dorothea herself was a little shocked and discouraged at her own stupidity, and the answers she got to some timid questions about the value of the Greek accents gave her a painful suspicion that here indeed there might be secrets not capable of explanation to a woman's reason. Mr. Brooke had no doubt on that point, and expressed himself with his usual strength upon it one day that he came into the library while the reading was going forward. "'Well, but now, Casaubon, such deep studies, classics, mathematics, that kind of thing, are too taxing for a woman. Too taxing, you know." "'Dorothea is learning to read the characters simply,' said Mr. Casaubon, evading the question. She had the very considerate thought of saving my eyes. "'Ah, well, without understanding, you know, that may not be so bad. But there is a lightness about the feminine mind, a touch-and-go, music, the fine arts, that kind of thing. They should study those up to a certain point, women should. But in a light way, you know. A woman should be able to sit down and play you or sing you a good old English tune. That is what I like. Though I have heard most things, been at the opera in Vienna, Gluck, Mozart, everything of that sort. But I'm a conservative in music. It's not like ideas, you know. I stick to the good old tunes." "'Mr. Casaubon is not fond of the piano, and I am very glad he is not,' said Dorothea, whose slight regard for domestic music and feminine fine art must be forgiven her, considering the small tinkling and smearing in which they chiefly consisted at that dark period. She smiled and looked up at her betrothed with grateful eyes. If he had always been asking her to play the last rose of summer, she would have required much resignation. He says there is only an old harpsichord at Lowick, and it is covered with books. Ha! Ah, there you are behind Celia, my dear. Celia now plays very prettily, and is always ready to play. However, since Casaubon does not like it, you are all right. But it's a pity you should not have little recreations of that sort, Casaubon. The bow always strung, that kind of thing you know, will not do. I never could look on it in the light of a recreation to have my ears teased with measured noises," said Mr. Casaubon. A tune much iterated has the ridiculous effect of making the words in my mind perform a sort of minuet to keep time, an effect hardly tolerable, I imagine, after boyhood. As to the grander forms of music, worthy to accompany solemn celebrations, and even to serve as an educating influence according to the ancient conception, I say nothing, for with these we are not immediately concerned. No, but music of that sort I should enjoy," said Dorothea. When we were coming home from Lausanne, my uncle took us to hear the great organ at Freiburg, and it made me sob. That kind of thing is not healthy, my dear," said Mr. Brooke. Casaubon, she will be in your hands now. You must teach my niece to take things more quietly. Eh, Dorothea?" 
he ended with a smile, not wishing to hurt his niece, but really thinking that it was perhaps better for her to be early married to so sober a fellow as Casaubon, since she would not hear of Chetham. "'It is wonderful, though,' he said to himself as he shuffled out of the room, "'it is wonderful that she should have liked him. However, the match is good. I should have been travelling out of my brief to have hindered it, let Mrs. Cadwallader say what she will. He is pretty certain to be a bishop, is Casaubon. That was a very seasonable pamphlet of his on the Catholic question. A deanery, at least. They owe him a deanery." And here I must vindicate a claim to philosophical reflectiveness, by remarking that Mr. Brooke on this occasion little thought of the radical speech, which, at a later period, he was led to make on the income of the bishops. What elegant historian would neglect a striking opportunity for pointing out that his heroes did not foresee the history of the world, or even their own actions? For example, that Henry of Navarre, when a Protestant baby, little thought of being a Catholic monarch, or that Alfred the Great, when he measured his laborious nights with burning candles, had no idea of future gentlemen measuring their idle days with watches. Here is a mine of truth, which, however vigorously it might be worked, is likely to outlast our coal. But of Mr. Brooke I make a further remark perhaps less warranted by precedent, namely, that if he had foreknown his speech, it might not have made any great difference. To think with pleasure of his niece's husband having a large ecclesiastical income was one thing, to make a liberal speech was another thing, and it is a narrow mind which cannot look at a subject from various points of view. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter 8. Oh, rescue her! I am her brother now, and you her father. Every gentle maid should have a guardian in each gentleman. It was wonderful to Sir James Chetham how well he continued to like going to the Grange after he had once encountered the difficulty of seeing Dorothea for the first time in the light of a woman who was engaged to another man. Of course the forked lightning seemed to pass through him when he first approached her, and he remained conscious throughout the interview of hiding uneasiness. But, good as he was, it must be owned that his uneasiness was less than it would have been if he had thought his rival a brilliant and desirable match. He had no sense of being eclipsed by Mr. Casaubon. He was only shocked that Dorothea was under a melancholy illusion, and his mortification lost some of its bitterness by being mingled with compassion. Nevertheless, while Sir James said to himself that he had completely resigned her, since with the perversity of a Desdemona she had not effected a proposed match that was clearly suitable and according to nature, he could not yet be quite passive under the idea of her engagement to Mr. Casaubon. On the day when he first saw them together in the light of his present knowledge, it seemed to him that he had not taken the affair seriously enough. Brooke was really culpable. He ought to have hindered it. Who could speak to him? Something might be done, perhaps, even now, at least to defer the marriage. On his way home he turned into the rectory and asked for Mr. Cadwallader. Happily the rector was at home, and his visitor was shown into the study, where all the fishing-tackle hung. But he himself was in a little room adjoining at work with his turning apparatus, and he called to the baronet to join him there. The two were better friends than any other landholder and clergyman in the county, a significant fact which was in agreement with the amiable expression of their faces. Mr. Cadwallader was a large man, with full lips and a sweet smile, very plain and rough in his exterior, but with that solid, imperturbable ease and good humour which is infectious, and like great grassy hills in the sunshine, quiets even an irritated egoism, and makes it rather ashamed of itself. "'Well, how are you?' he said, showing a hand not quite fit to be grasped. "'Sorry I missed you before. Is there anything particular? You look vexed.' Sir James's brow had a little crease in it, a little depression of the eyebrow, which he seemed purposely to exaggerate as he answered. "'It is only this conduct of Brooks. I really think somebody should speak to him.' "'What, meaning to stand?' said Mr. Cadwallader, going on with the arrangement of the reels which he had just been turning. "'I hardly think he means it. But where's the harm if he likes it? Any one who objects to Whiggery should be glad when the Whigs don't put up the strongest fellow. They won't overturn the Constitution with our friend Brooke's head for a battering-ram.' 
"'Oh, I don't mean that,' said Sir James, who, after putting down his hat and throwing himself into a chair, had begun to nurse his leg and examine the sole of his boot with much bitterness. "'I mean this marriage. I mean his letting that blooming young girl marry Casaubon.' "'What is the matter with Casaubon? I see no harm in him, if the girl likes him.' "'She is too young to know what she likes. Her guardian ought to interfere. He ought not to allow the thing to be done in this headlong manner. I wonder a man like you, Cadwallader, a man with daughters, can look at the affair with indifference, and with such a heart as yours. Do think seriously about it." "'I am not joking. I am as serious as possible,' said the rector, with a provoking little inward laugh. "'You are as bad as Eleanor. She has been wanting me to go and lecture Brooke, and I have reminded her that her friends had a very poor opinion of the match she made when she married me." "'But look at Casbon said Sir James indignantly. He must be fifty, and I don't believe he could ever have been much more than the shadow of a man. Look at his legs!" "'Confound you handsome young fellows! You think of having it all your own way in the world. You don't understand women. They don't admire you half so much as you admire yourselves. Eleanor used to tell her sisters that she married me for my ugliness. It was so various and amusing that it had quite conquered her prudence." You. It was easy enough for a woman to love you. But this is no question of beauty. I don't like Casaubon." This was Sir James's strongest way of implying that he thought ill of a man's character. "'Why? What do you know against him?' said the rector, laying down his reels, and putting his thumbs into his armholes with an air of attention. Sir James paused. He did not usually find it easy to give his reasons. It seemed to him strange that people should not know them without being told, since he only felt what was reasonable. At last he said, "'Now, Cadwallader, has he got any heart?' "'Well, yes. I don't mean of the melting sort, but a sound colonel, that you may be sure of. He is very good to his poor relations, pensions several of the women, and is educating a young fellow at a good deal of expense. Casaubon acts up to his sense of justice. His mother's sister made a bad match—a Pole, I think—lost herself, at any rate was disowned by her family. If it had not been for that, Casaubon would not have had so much money by half. I believe he went himself to find out his cousins, and see what he could do for them. Every man would not ring so well as that, if you tried his mettle. You would, Chetham, but not every man." "'I don't know,' said Sir James, colouring. I am not so sure of myself." He paused a moment, and then added, "'That was a right thing for Casbon to do. But a man may wish to do what is right, and yet be a sort of parchment code. A woman may not be happy with him. And I think when a girl is so young as Miss Brooke is, her friends ought to interfere a little to hinder her from doing anything foolish. You laugh, because you fancy I have some feeling on my own account. But upon my honour it is not that. I should feel just the same if I were Miss Brooke's brother or uncle. Well, but what should you do?" I should say that the marriage must not be decided on until she was of age. And depend upon it, in that case it would never come off. I wish you saw it as I do. I wish you would talk to Brooke about it." Sir James rose as he was finishing his sentence, for he saw Mrs. Cadwallader entering from the study. She held by the hand her youngest girl, about five years old, who immediately ran to Papa, and was made comfortable on his knee. I hear what you are talking about," said the wife, but you will make no impression on Humphrey. As long as the fish rise to his bait, everybody is what he ought to be. Bless you, Casaubon has got a trout stream, and does not care about fishing in it himself. Could there be a better fellow?" "'Well, there is something in that,' said the rector, with his quiet inward laugh. It is a very good quality in a man to have a trout stream." "'But seriously!" said Sir James, whose vexation had not yet spent itself. Don't you think the rector might do some good by speaking?" "'Oh, I told you beforehand what he would say,' answered Mrs. Cadwallader, lifting up her eyebrows. I have done what I could. I wash my hands of the marriage." "'In the first place,' said the rector, looking rather grave, it would be nonsensical to expect that I could convince Brooke, and make him act accordingly. Brooke is a very good fellow, but pulpy. He will run into any mould, but he won't keep shape." "'He might keep shape long enough to defer the marriage,' 
said Sir James. "'But, my dear Chetham, why should I use my influence to Casaubon's disadvantage, unless I were much surer than I am that I should be acting for the advantage of Miss Brooke? I know no harm of Casaubon. I don't care about his Zisuthrus and fee fo fum and the rest. But then he doesn't care about my fishing-tackle. As to the line he took on the Catholic question, that was unexpected, but he has always been civil to me, and I don't see why I should spoil his sport. For anything I can tell, Miss Brooke may be happier with him than she would be with any other man." "'Humphrey, I have no patience with you. You know you would rather dine under the hedge than with Casaubon alone. You have nothing to say to each other." "'What has that to do with Miss Brooke's marrying him? She does not do it for my amusement." "'He has got no good red blood in his body,' said Sir James. No, somebody put a drop under a magnifying glass, and it was all semicolons and parentheses," said Mrs. Cadwallader. "'Why does he not bring out his book, instead of marrying?' said Sir James, with a disgust which he held warranted by the sound feeling of an English layman. "'Oh, he dreams footnotes, and they run away with all his brains. They say when he was a little boy he made an abstract of Hop o' My Thumb, and has been making abstracts ever since. Ugh. And that is the man Humphrey goes on saying that a woman may be happy with." "'Well, he is what Miss Brooke likes,' said the rector. "'I don't profess to understand every young lady's taste.' "'But if she were your own daughter,' said Sir James. "'That would be a different affair. She is not my daughter, and I don't feel called upon to interfere. Casaubon is as good as most of us. He is a scholarly clergyman and creditable to the cloth. Some radical fellow speechifying at Middlemarch said Casaubon was the learned straw-chopping incumbent, and Freak was the brick-and-mortar incumbent, and I was the angling incumbent. And upon my word I don't see that one is worse or better than the other." The rector ended with his silent laugh. He always saw the joke of any satire against himself. His conscience was large and easy, like the rest of him. It did only what it could do without any trouble. Clearly, there would be no interference with Miss Brooke's marriage through Mr. Cadwallader, and Sir James felt with some sadness that she was to have perfect liberty of misjudgment. It was a sign of his good disposition that he did not slacken at all in his intention of carrying out Dorothea's design of the cottages. Doubtless this persistence was the best course for his own dignity. But pride only helps us to be generous. It never makes us so, any more than vanity makes us witty. She was now enough aware of Sir James's position with regard to her, to appreciate the rectitude of his perseverance in a landlord's duty, to which he had at first been urged by a lover's complaisance, and her pleasure in it was great enough to count for something, even in her present happiness. Perhaps she gave to Sir James Chetham's cottages all the interest she could spare from Mr. Casaubon, or rather from the symphony of hopeful dreams, admiring trust, and passionate self-devotion which that learned gentleman had set playing in her soul. Hence it happened that in the good baronet's succeeding visits, while he was beginning to pay small attentions to Celia, he found himself talking with more and more pleasure to Dorothea. She was perfectly unconstrained and without irritation towards him now, and he was gradually discovering the delight there is in frank kindness and companionship between a man and a woman who have no passion to hide or confess. End of chapter 8 Chapter Nine of Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter Nine. First Gentleman. An ancient land in ancient oracles is called Law Thirsty. All the struggle there was after order and a perfect rule. Pray, where lie such lands now? Second gentleman. Why, where they lay of old, in human souls. Mr. Casaubon's behaviour about settlements was highly satisfactory to Mr. Brooke, and the preliminaries of marriage rolled smoothly along, shortening the weeks of courtship. The betrothed bride must see her future home, and dictate any changes that she would like to have made there. A woman dictates before marriage, in order that she may have an appetite for submission afterwards. And certainly, the mistakes that we male and female mortals make when we have our own way, might fairly raise some wonder that we are so fond of it. 
On a grey but dry November morning, Dorothea drove to Lowick in company with her uncle and Celia. Mr. Casaubon's home was the manor-house. Close by, visible from some parts of the garden, was the little church, with the old parsonage opposite. In the beginning of his career, Mr. Casaubon had only held the living, but the death of his brother had put him in possession of the manor also. It had a small park, with a fine old oak here and there, and an avenue of limes towards the southwest front, with a sunk fence between park and pleasure-ground, so that from the drawing-room windows the glance swept uninterruptedly along a slope of greensward, till the limes ended in a level of corn and pastures, which often seemed to melt into a lake under the setting sun. This was the happy side of the house, for the south and east looked rather melancholy, even under the brightest morning. The grounds here were more confined, the flower-beds showed no very careful tendance, and large clumps of trees, chiefly of sombre yews, had risen high, not ten yards from the windows. The building, of greenish stone, was in the old English style, not ugly, but small-windowed and melancholy-looking, the sort of house that must have children, many flowers, open windows, and little vistas of bright things, to make it seem a joyous home. In this latter end of autumn, with a sparse remnant of yellow leaves falling slowly athwart the dark evergreens, in a stillness without sunshine, the house, too, had an air of autumnal decline, and Mr. Casaubon, when he presented himself, had no bloom that could be thrown into relief by that background. "'Oh, dear,' Celia said to herself, "'I am sure Freshet Hall would have been pleasanter than this.' She thought of the white freestone, the pillared portico, and the terrace full of flowers, Sir James smiling above them like a prince issuing from his enchantment in a rose-bush, with a handkerchief swiftly metamorphosed from the most delicately odorous petals, Sir James, who talked so agreeably, always about things which had common sense in them, and not about learning. Celia had those light young feminine tastes which grave and weather-worn gentlemen sometimes prefer in a wife, but happily Mr. Casaubon's bias had been different, for he would have had no chance with Celia. Dorothea, on the contrary, found the house and grounds all that she could wish, the dark bookshelves in the long library, the carpets and curtains with colours subdued by time, the curious old maps and bird's-eye views on the walls of the corridor, with here and there an old vase below, had no oppression for her, and seemed more cheerful than the Easts and pictures at the Grange, which her uncle had long ago brought home from his travels, they being probably among the ideas that he had taken in at one time. To poor Dorothea these severe classical nudities, and smirking Renaissance corrigiosities, were painfully inexplicable, staring into the midst of her puritanic conceptions. She had never been taught how she could bring them into any sort of relevance with her life. But the owners of Lowick apparently had not been travellers, and Mr. Casbon's studies of the past were not carried on by means of such aids. Dorothea walked about the house with delightful emotion. Everything seemed hallowed to her. This was to be the home of her wifehood. And she looked up with eyes full of confidence to Mr. Casaubon, when he drew her attention specially to some actual arrangement, and asked her if she would like an alteration. All appeals to her taste she met gratefully, but saw nothing to alter. His efforts at exact courtesy and formal tenderness had no defect for her. She filled up all blanks with unmanifested perfections, interpreting him as she interpreted the works of Providence, and accounting for seeming discords by her own deafness to the higher harmonies. And there are many blanks left in the weeks of courtship, which a loving faith fills with happy assurance. "'Now, my dear Dorothea, I wish you to favour me by pointing out which room you would like to have as your boudoir,' said Mr. Casaubon, showing that his views of the womanly nature were sufficiently large to include that requirement. "'It is very kind of you to think of that,' said Dorothea. But I assure you I would rather have all those matters decided for me. I shall be much happier to take everything as it is, just as you have been used to have it, or as you will yourself choose it to be. I have no motive for wishing anything else." "'Oh, Dodo,' said Celia, "'will you not have the bow-windowed room upstairs?' Mr. Casaubon led the way thither. The bow-window looked down the avenue of limes. The furniture was all of a faded blue and there were miniatures of ladies and gentlemen with powdered hair hanging in a group. A piece of tapestry over a door also showed a blue-green world with a pale stag in it. The chairs and tables were thin-legged and easy to upset. It was a room where one might fancy the ghost of a tight-laced lady revisiting the scene of her embroidery. 
A light bookcase contained duodecimo volumes of polite literature in calf, completing the furniture. "'Yes,' said Mr. Brooke, "'this would be a pretty room with some new hangings, sofas, and that sort of thing. A little bare now.' "'No, uncle,' said Dorothea eagerly. "'Pray do not speak of altering anything. There are so many other things in the world that want altering. I like to take these things as they are. And you like them as they are, don't you?' she added, looking at Mr. Casaubon. Perhaps this was your mother's room when she was young." "'It was,' he said, with his slow bend of the head. "'This is your mother,' said Dorothea, who had turned to examine the group of miniatures. "'It is like the tiny one you brought me. Only I should think a better portrait. And this one opposite, who is this?' "'Her elder sister. They were, like you and your sister, the only two children of their parents, who hang above them, you see.' "'The sister is pretty,' said Celia implying that she thought less favourably of Mr. Casaubon's mother. It was a new opening to Celia's imagination, that he came of a family who had all been young in their time, the ladies wearing necklaces. "'It is a peculiar face,' said Dorothea, looking closely. "'Those deep grey eyes rather near together, and the delicate, irregular nose with a sort of ripple in it, and all the powdered curls hanging backward. Altogether it seems to me peculiar rather than pretty. There is not even a family likeness between her and your mother." No, and they were not alike in their lot. "'You did not mention her to me,' said Dorothea. "'My aunt made an unfortunate marriage. I never saw her.' Dorothea wondered a little, but felt that it would be indelicate just then to ask for any information which Mr. Casaubon did not proffer, and she turned to the window to admire the view. The sun had lately pierced the grey and the avenue of limes cast shadows. "'Shall we not walk in the garden now?' said Dorothea. "'And you would like to see the church, you know,' said Mr. Brooke. "'It is a droll little church. And the village. It all lies in a nutshell. By the way, it will suit you, Dorothea, for the cottages are like a row of almshouses, little gardens, jilly-flowers, that sort of thing.' "'Yes, please,' said Dorothea, looking at Mr. Casaubon. "'I should like to see all that.' She had got nothing from him more graphic about the Lowick cottages than that they were not bad. They were soon on a gravel walk which led chiefly between grassy borders and clumps of trees, this being the nearest way to the church, Mr. Casaubon said. At the little gate leading into the churchyard there was a pause while Mr. Casaubon went to the parsonage close by to fetch a key. Celia, who had been hanging a little in the rear, came up presently, when she saw that Mr. Casaubon was gone away and said in her easy staccato, which always seemed to contradict the suspicion of any malicious intent, "'Do you know, Dorothea, I saw someone quite young coming up one of the walks?' "'Is that astonishing, Celia?' "'There may be a young gardener, you know. Why not?' said Mr. Brooke. "'I told Casbon he should change his gardener.' "'No, not a gardener,' said Celia. "'A gentleman with a sketch-book. He had light brown curls. I only saw his back.' but he was quite young." "'The curate's son, perhaps,' said Mr. Brooke. "'Ah, there is Casaubon again, and Tucker with him. He is going to introduce Tucker. You don't know Tucker yet.' Mr. Tucker was the middle-aged curate, one of the inferior clergy, who are usually not wanting in sons. But after the introduction, the conversation did not lead to any question about his family, and the startling apparition of youthfulness was forgotten by every one but Celia. She inwardly declined to believe that the light brown curls and slim figure could have any relationship to Mr. Tucker, who was just as old and musty-looking as she would have expected Mr. Casaubon's curate to be, doubtless an excellent man who would go to heaven, for Celia wished not to be unprincipled, but the corners of his mouth were so unpleasant. Celia thought with some dismalness of the time she should have to spend as bridesmaid at Lowick, while the curate had probably no pretty little children whom she could like, irrespective of principle. Mr. Tucker was invaluable in their walk, and perhaps Mr. Casaubon had not been without foresight on this head, the curate being able to answer all Dorothea's questions about the villagers and the other parishioners. Everybody, he assured her, was well off in Lowick. Not a cottager in those double cottages at a low rent, but kept a pig, and the strips of garden at the back were well tended. The small boys wore excellent corduroy, the girls went out as tidy servants, or did a little straw-plating at home. No looms here, no descent, and though the public disposition was rather towards laying by money than towards spirituality, there was not much vice. The speckled fowls were so numerous that Mr. Brooke observed, 
Your farmers leave some barley for the women to glean, I see. The poor folks here might have a fowl in their pot, as the good French king used to wish for all his people. The French eat a good many fowls—skinny fowls, you know." "'I think it was a very cheap wish of his,' said Dorothea indignantly. "'Are kings such monsters that a wish like that must be reckoned a royal virtue?' "'And if he wished them a skinny fowl,' said Celia, "'that would not be nice. But perhaps he wished them to have fat fowls." "'Yes, but the word has dropped out of the text, or perhaps was subauditum. That is, present in the king's mind, but not uttered," said Mr. Casaubon, smiling and bending his head towards Celia, who immediately dropped backward a little, because she could not bear Mr. Casaubon to blink at her. Dorothea sank into silence on the way back to the house. She felt some disappointment, of which she was yet ashamed, that there was nothing for her to do in Lowick, and in the next few minutes her mind had glanced over the possibility, which she would have preferred of finding that her home would be in a parish which had a larger share of the world's misery, so that she might have had more active duties in it. Then, recurring to the future actually before her, she made a picture of more complete devotion to Mr. Casaubon's aims, in which she would await new duties. Many such might reveal themselves to the higher knowledge gained by her in that companionship. Mr. Tucker soon left them, having some clerical work which would not allow him to lunch at the hall, and as they were re-entering the garden through the little gate, Mr. Casaubon said, "'You seem a little sad, Dorothea. I trust you are pleased with what you have seen.' "'I am feeling something which is perhaps foolish and wrong,' answered Dorothea, with her usual openness, "'almost wishing that the people wanted more to be done for them here. I have known so few ways of making my life good for anything. Of course my notions of usefulness must be narrow. I must learn new ways of helping people.' "'Doubtless,' said Mr. Casaubon. Each position has its corresponding duties. Yours, I trust, as the mistress of Lowick, will not leave any yearning unfulfilled." "'Indeed, I believe that,' said Dorothea earnestly. Do not suppose that I am sad." "'That is well. But if you are not tired, we will take another way to the house than that by which we came." Dorothea was not at all tired, and a little circuit was made towards a fine yew-tree, the chief hereditary glory of the grounds on this side of the house. As they approached it, a figure, conspicuous on a dark background of evergreens, was seated on a bench sketching the old tree. Mr. Brooke, who was walking in front with Celia, turned his head and said, "'Who is that youngster, Casaubon?' They had come very near when Mr. Casaubon answered, "'That is a young relative of mine, a second cousin. The grandson, in fact,' he added, looking at Dorothea, "'of the lady whose portrait you have been noticing, my Aunt Julia.' The young man had laid down his sketch-book and risen. His bushy light-brown curls, as well as his youthfulness, identified him at once with Celia's apparition. "'Dorothea, let me introduce you to my cousin, Mr. Ladislaw. Will, this is Miss Brooke." The cousin was so close now, that, when he lifted his hat, Dorothea could see a pair of grey eyes rather near together, a delicate, irregular nose with a little ripple in it, and hair falling backward but there was a mouth and chin of a more prominent, threatening aspect than belonged to the type of the grandmother's miniature. Young Ladislaw did not feel it necessary to smile, as if he were charmed with this introduction to his future second cousin and her relatives, but wore rather a pouting air of discontent. "'You are an artist, I see,' said Mr. Brooke, taking up the sketch-book and turning it over in his unceremonious fashion. "'No, I only sketch a little. There is nothing fit to be seen there,' said young Ladislaw colouring, perhaps with temper rather than modesty. "'Oh, come! This is a nice bit, now. I did a little in this way myself at one time, you know. Look here, now. This is what I call a nice thing, done with what we used to call brio.' Mr. Brooke held out towards the two girls a large coloured sketch of a stony ground and trees with a pool. "'I am no judge of these things,' said Dorothea, not coldly, but with an eager deprecation of the appeal to her. "'You know, uncle, I never see the beauty of those pictures which you say are so much praised. They are a language I do not understand. I suppose there is some relation between pictures and nature which I am too ignorant to feel, just as you see what a Greek sentence stands for which means nothing to me." Dorothea looked up at Mr. Casaubon, who bowed his head towards her, while Mr. Brooke said, smiling nonchalantly, "'Bless me now how different people are! But you had a bad style of teaching, you know else this is just the thing for girls, sketching, fine art, and so on. But you took to drawing plans. You don't understand morbidatza and that kind of thing. 
You will come to my house, I hope, and I will show you what I did in this way," he continued, turning to young Ladislaw, who had to be recalled from his preoccupation in observing Dorothea. Ladislaw had made up his mind that she must be an unpleasant girl, since she was going to marry Casaubon, and what she said of her stupidity about pictures would have confirmed that opinion, even if he had believed her. As it was, he took her words for a covert judgment, and was certain that she thought his sketch detestable. There was too much cleverness in her apology. She was laughing both at her uncle and himself. But what a voice! It was like the voice of a soul that had once lived in an Aeolian harp. This must be one of nature's inconsistencies. There could be no sort of passion in a girl who would marry Casaubon. But he turned from her, and bowed his thanks for Mr. Brooke's invitation. "'We will turn over my Italian engravings together,' continued that good-natured man. "'I have no end of those things. That I have laid by for years. One gets rusty in this part of the country, you know. Not you, Casaubon, you stick to your studies. But my best ideas get undermost, out of use, you know. You clever young men must guard against indolence. I was too indolent, you know, else I might have been anywhere at one time." "'That is a seasonable admonition,' said Mr. Casaubon. "'But now we will pass on to the house, lest the young lady should be tired of standing." When their backs were turned, young Ladislaw sat down to go on with his sketching, and as he did so his face broke into an expression of amusement, which increased as he went on drawing, till at last he threw back his head and laughed aloud. Partly it was the reception of his own artistic production that tickled him, partly the notion of his grave cousin as the lover of that girl, and partly Mr. Brooke's definition of the place he might have held, but for the impediment of indolence. Mr. Will Ladislaw's sense of the ludicrous lit up his features very agreeably. It was the pure enjoyment of comicality, and had no mixture of sneering and self-exaltation. "'What is your nephew going to do with himself, Casaubon? said Mr. Brooke, as they went on. "'My cousin, you mean, not my nephew.' "'Yes, yes, cousin. But in the way of a career, you know.' The answer to that question is painfully doubtful. On leaving Rugby he declined to go to an English university, where I would gladly have placed him, and chose what I must consider the anomalous course of studying at Heidelberg. And now he wants to go abroad again, without any special object, save the vague purpose of what he calls culture preparation for he knows not what. He declines to choose a profession." "'He has no means but what you furnish, I suppose.' "'I have always given him and his friends reason to understand that I would furnish in moderation what was necessary for providing him with a scholarly education, and launching him respectably. I am therefore bound to fulfil the expectation so raised,' said Mr. Casaubon, putting his conduct in the light of mere rectitude, a trait of delicacy which Dorothea noted with admiration. He has a thirst for travelling. Perhaps he may turn out a Bruce or a Mungo Park," said Mr. Brooke. I had a notion of that myself at one time. No, he has no bent towards exploration, or the enlargement of our Geonosis. That would be a special purpose which I could recognise with some approbation, though without felicitating him on a career which so often ends in premature and violent death. But so far is he from having any desire for a more accurate knowledge of the earth's surface, that he said he should prefer not to know the sources of the Nile, and that there should be some unknown regions preserved as hunting-grounds for the poetic imagination." "'Well, there is something in that, you know,' said Mr. Brooke, who had certainly an impartial mind. "'It is, I fear, nothing more than a part of his general inaccuracy and indisposition to thoroughness of all kinds, which would be a bad augury for him in any profession, civil or sacred, even were he so far submissive to ordinary rule as to choose one." Perhaps he has conscientious scruples founded on his own unfitness," said Dorothea, who was interesting herself in finding a favourable explanation. Because the law and medicine should be very serious professions to undertake, should they not? People's lives and fortunes depend on them." Doubtless. But I fear that my young relative Will Ladislaw is chiefly determined in his aversion to these callings by a dislike to steady application and to that kind of acquirement which is needful instrumentally, but is not charming or immediately inviting to self-indulgent taste. I have insisted to him on what Aristotle has stated with admirable brevity, that for the achievement of any work regarded as an end, there must be a prior exercise of many energies or acquired facilities of a secondary order, demanding patience. I have pointed to my own manuscript volumes, which represent the toil of years preparatory to a work not yet accomplished but in vain. To careful reasoning of this kind he replies by calling himself Pegasus, and every form of prescribed work, Harness. 
Celia laughed. She was surprised to find that Mr. Casaubon could say something quite amusing. "'Well, you know, he may turn out a Byron, a Chatterton, a Churchill, that sort of thing. There's no telling,' said Mr. Brooke. "'Shall you let him go to Italy, or wherever else he wants to go?' "'Yes. I have agreed to furnish him with moderate supplies for a year or so. He asks no more. I shall let him be tried by the test of freedom.' "'That is very kind of you,' said Dorothea, looking up at Mr. Casaubon with delight. It is noble. After all, people may really have in them some vocation which is not quite plain to themselves, may they not? They may seem idle and weak because they are growing. We should be very patient with each other, I think." "'I suppose it is being engaged to be married that has made you think patience good,' said Celia, as soon as she and Dorothea were alone together, taking off their wrappings. "'You mean that I am very impatient, Celia? Yes, when people don't do and say just what you like." Celia had become less afraid of saying things to Dorothea since this engagement. Cleverness seemed to her more pitiable than ever. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter 10 He had catched a great cold, had he had no other clothes to wear than the skin of a bear not yet killed. Fuller Young Ladislaw did not pay that visit to which Mr. Brooke had invited him, and only six days afterwards Mr. Casaubon mentioned that his young relative had started for the continent, seeming by this cold vagueness to waive inquiry. Indeed, Will had declined to fix on any more precise destination than the entire area of Europe. Genius, he held, is necessarily intolerant of fetters. On the one hand it must have the utmost play for its spontaneity, on the other it may confidently await those messages from the universe which summon it to its peculiar work, only placing itself in an attitude of receptivity towards all sublime chances. The attitudes of receptivity are various, and Will had sincerely tried many of them. He was not excessively fond of wine, but he had several times taken too much, simply as an experiment in that form of ecstasy. He had fasted till he was faint, and then supped on lobster. He had made himself ill with doses of opium. Nothing greatly original had resulted from these measures, and the effects of the opium had convinced him that there was an entire dissimilarity between his constitution and de Quincey's. The superadded circumstance which would evolve the genius had not yet come, the universe had not yet beckoned. Even Caesar's fortune at one time was but a grand presentiment. We know what a masquerade all development is, and what effective shapes may be disguised in helpless embryos. In fact, the world is full of hopeful analogies and handsome dubious eggs called possibilities. Will saw clearly enough the pitiable instances of long incubation producing no chick, and but for gratitude would have laughed at Casaubon, whose plodding application, rows of notebooks, and small taper of learned theory exploring the tossed ruins of the world, seemed to enforce a moral entirely encouraging to Will's generous reliance on the intentions of a universe with regard to himself. He held that reliance to be a mark of genius, and certainly it is no mark to the contrary, genius consisting neither in self-conceit nor in humility, but in a power to make or do, not anything in general, but something in particular. Let him start for the continent, then, without our pronouncing on his future. Among all forms of mistake, prophecy is the most gratuitous. But at present, this caution against a too hasty judgment interests me more in relation to Mr. Casaubon than to his young cousin. If to Dorothea Mr. Casaubon had been the mere occasion which had set alight the fine and flammable material of her youthful illusions, does it follow that he was fairly represented in the minds of those less impassioned personages who have hitherto delivered their judgments concerning him? I protest against any absolute conclusion, any prejudice derived from Mrs. Cadwallader's contempt for a neighbouring clergyman's alleged greatness of soul, or Sir James Chetham's poor opinion of his rival's legs, from Mr. Brooke's failure to elicit a companion's ideas, or from Celia's criticism of a middle-aged scholar's personal appearance. 
I am not sure that the greatest man of his age, if ever that solitary superlative existed, could escape these unfavourable reflections of himself in various small mirrors, and even Milton, looking for his portrait in a spoon, must submit to have the facial angle of a bumpkin. Moreover, if Mr. Casaubon, speaking for himself, has rather a chilling rhetoric, it is not therefore certain that there is no good work or fine feeling in him. Did not an immortal physicist, an interpreter of hieroglyphs, write detestable verses? Has the theory of the solar system been advanced by graceful manners and conversational tact? Suppose we turn from outside estimates of a man, to wonder with keener interest, what is the report of his own consciousness about his doings or capacity? with what hindrances he is carrying on his daily labours, what fading of hopes, or what deeper fixity of self-delusion the years are marking off within him, and with what spirit he wrestles against universal pressure, which will one day be too heavy for him, and bring his heart to its final pause. Doubtless his lot is important in his own eyes, and the chief reason that we think he asks too large a place in our consideration, must be our want of room for him, since we refer him to the divine regard with perfect confidence. Nay, it is even held sublime for our neighbour to expect the utmost there, however little he may have got from us. Mr. Casaubon, too, was the centre of his own world. If he was liable to think that others were providentially made for him, and especially to consider them in the light of their fitness for the author of a Key to All Mythologies, this trait is not quite alien to us, and, like the other mendicant hopes of mortals, claims some of our pity. Certainly this affair of his marriage with Miss Brooke touched him more nearly than it did any one of the persons who have hitherto shown their disapproval of it, and in the present stage of things, I feel more tenderly towards his experience of success, than towards the disappointment of the amiable Sir James. For, in truth, as the day fixed for his marriage came nearer, Mr. Casaubon did not find his spirits rising, nor did the contemplation of that matrimonial garden scene, where, as all experience showed, the path was to be bordered with flowers, prove persistently more enchanting to him than the accustomed vaults where he walked taper in hand. He did not confess to himself, still less could he have breathed to another, his surprise that though he had won a lovely and noble-hearted girl, he had not won delight, which he had also regarded as an object to be found by search. It is true that he knew all the classical passages implying the contrary, but knowing classical passages, we find, is a mode of motion which explains why they leave so little extra force for their personal application. Poor Mr. Casaubon had imagined that his long, studious bachelorhood had stored up for him a compound interest of enjoyment, and that large draughts on his affections would not fail to be honoured. For we all of us, grave or light, get our thoughts entangled in metaphors, and act fatally on the strength of them. And now he was in danger of being saddened by the very conviction that his circumstances were unusually happy. There was nothing external by which he could account for a certain blankness of sensibility, which came over him just when his expectant gladness should have been most lively, just when he exchanged the accustomed dullness of his Lowick library, for his visits to the Grange. Here was a weary experience, in which he was as utterly condemned to loneliness, as in the despair which sometimes threatened him while toiling in the morass of authorship, without seeming nearer to the goal. And this was that worst loneliness, which would shrink from sympathy. He could not but wish that Dorothea should think him not less happy than the world would expect her successful suitor to be, and in relation to his authorship, he leaned on her young trust and veneration. He liked to draw forth her fresh interest in listening, as a means of encouragement to himself. In talking to her, he presented all his performance and intention, with the reflected confidence of the pedagogue, and rid himself for the time of that chilling ideal audience which crowded his laborious, uncreative hours with the vaporous pressure of Tartarian shades. For to Dorothea, after that toy-box history of the world adapted to young ladies, which had made the chief part of her education, Mr. Casaubon's talk about his great book was full of new vistas. And this sense of revelation, this surprise of a nearer introduction to Stoics and Alexandrians, as people who had ideas not totally unlike her own, kept in abeyance for the time her usual eagerness for a binding theory which could bring her own life and doctrine into a strict connection with that amazing past, and give the remotest sources of knowledge some bearing on her actions. That more complete teaching would come. Mr. Casaubon would tell her all that. She was looking forward to higher initiation and ideas, as she was looking forward to marriage, and blending her dim conceptions of both. It would be a great mistake to suppose that Dorothea would have cared about any share in Mr. Casaubon's learning, as mere accomplishment, 
for though opinion in the neighbourhood of Freshett and Tipton had pronounced her clever, that epithet would not have described her to circles in whose more precise vocabulary cleverness implies mere aptitude for knowing and doing, apart from character. All her eagerness for acquirement lay within that full current of sympathetic motive in which her ideas and impulses were habitually swept along. She did not want to deck herself with knowledge, to wear it loose from the nerves and blood that fed her action, and if she had written a book she must have done it as St. Teresa did, under the command of an authority that constrained her conscience. But something she yearned for by which her life might be filled with action at once rational and ardent, and since the time was gone by for guiding visions and spiritual directors, since prayer heightened yearning, but not instruction, what lamp was there but knowledge? Surely learned men kept the only oil, and who more learned than Mr. Casaubon? Thus in these brief weeks Dorothea's joyous, grateful expectation was unbroken, and however her lover might occasionally be conscious of flatness, he could never refer it to any slackening of her affectionate interest. The season was mild enough to encourage the project of extending the wedding journey as far as Rome, and Mr. Casaubon was anxious for this, because he wished to inspect some manuscripts in the Vatican. "'I still regret that your sister is not to accompany us,' he said one morning, some time after it had been ascertained that Celia objected to go, and that Dorothea did not wish for her companionship. "'You will have many lonely hours, Dorothea for I shall be constrained to make the utmost use of my time during our stay in Rome, and I should feel more at liberty if you had a companion." The words, I should feel more at liberty, grated on Dorothea. For the first time in speaking to Mr. Casaubon, she coloured from annoyance. "'You must have misunderstood me very much,' she said, if you think I should not enter into the value of your time, if you think that I should not willingly give up whatever interfered with your using it to the best purpose. "'That is very amiable in you, my dear Dorothea,' said Mr. Casaubon, not in the least noticing that she was hurt. "'But if you had a lady as your companion, I could put you both under the care of a cicerone, and we could thus achieve two purposes in the same space of time.' "'I beg you will not refer to this again,' said Dorothea, rather haughtily. But immediately she feared that she was wrong, and turning towards him she laid her hand on his, adding in a different tone, "'Pray, do not be anxious about me. I shall have so much to think of when I am alone, and Tantrip will be a sufficient companion, just to take care of me. I could not bear to have Celia. She would be miserable." It was time to dress. There was to be a dinner-party that day, the last of the parties which were held at the Grange as proper preliminaries to the wedding, and Dorothea was glad of a reason for moving away at once on the sound of the bell, as if she needed more than her usual amount of preparation. She was ashamed of being irritated from some cause she could not define even to herself for though she had no intention to be untruthful, her reply had not touched the real hurt within her. Mr. Casaubon's words had been quite reasonable, yet they had brought a vague instantaneous sense of aloofness on his part. "'Surely I am in a strangely selfish, weak state of mind,' she said to herself. "'How can I have a husband who is so much above me, without knowing that he needs me less than I need him?' Having convinced herself that Mr. Casaubon was altogether right, she recovered her equanimity, and was an agreeable image of serene dignity, when she came into the drawing-room in her silver-gray dress, the simple lines of her dark brown hair, parted over her brow and coiled massively behind, in keeping with the entire absence from her manner and expression, of all search after mere effect. Sometimes when Dorothea was in company, there seemed to be as complete an air of repose about her, as if she had been a picture of Santa Barbara, looking out from her tower into the clear air. But these intervals of quietude, made the energy of her speech and emotion, the more remarked when some outward appeal had touched her. She was naturally the subject of many observations this evening, for the dinner-party was large, and rather more miscellaneous as to the male portion, than any which had been held at the Grange since Mr. Brooke's nieces had resided with him, so that the talking was done in duos and trios more or less inharmonious. There was the newly elected mayor of Middlemarch, who happened to be a manufacturer the philanthropic banker, his brother-in-law, who predominated so much in the town that some called him a Methodist, others a hypocrite, according to the resources of their vocabulary, and there were various professional men. In fact, Mrs. Cadwallader said that Brooke was beginning to treat the middle-marchers, and that she preferred the farmers at the tithe dinner, who drank her health unpretentiously, and were not ashamed of their grandfather's furniture. For in that part of the country, before reform had done its notable part in developing the political consciousness, there was a clearer distinction of ranks and a dimmer distinction of parties, 
so that Mr. Brooke's miscellaneous invitations seemed to belong to that general laxity which came from his inordinate travel and habit of talking too much in the form of ideas. Already, as Miss Brooke passed out of the dining-room, opportunity was found for some interjectional asides. "'A fine woman, Miss Brooke! An uncommonly fine woman by God!' said Mr. Standish, the old lawyer, who had been so long concerned with the landed gentry that he had become landed himself, and used that oath in a deep-mouthed manner, as a sort of armorial bearings, stamping the speech of a man who held a good position. Mr. Bulstrode, the banker, seemed to be addressed, but that gentleman disliked coarseness and profanity, and merely bowed. The remark was taken up by Mr. Chichely, a middle-aged bachelor and coursing celebrity, who had a complexion something like an Easter egg, a few hairs carefully arranged, and a carriage implying the consciousness of a distinguished appearance. "'Yes, but not my style of woman. I like a woman who lays herself out a little more to please us. There should be a little filigree about a woman, something of the coquette. A man likes a sort of challenge. The more of a dead set she makes at you, the better.' "'There's some truth in that,' said Mr. Standish, disposed to be genial. "'And by God it's usually the way with them. I suppose it answers some wise ends. Providence made them so, eh, Bulstrode?' "'I should be disposed to refer coquetry to another source,' said Mr. Bulstrode. "'I should rather refer it to the devil.' "'Aye, to be sure, there should be a little devil in a woman,' said Mr. Chichely, whose study of the fair sex seemed to have been detrimental to his theology. "'And I like them blonde, with a certain gait, and a swan neck. Between ourselves, the mayor's daughter is more to my taste than Miss Brooke or Miss Celia either. If I were a marrying man, I should choose Miss Vincy before either of them.' "'Well, make up, make up,' said Mr. Standish, jocosely. "'You see the middle-aged fellows early the day.' Mr. Chichely shook his head with much meaning. He was not going to incur the certainty of being accepted by the woman he would choose. The Miss Vincy who had the honour of being Mr. Chichely's ideal was, of course, not present, for Mr. Brooke, always objecting to go too far, would not have chosen that his nieces should meet the daughter of a Middlemarch manufacturer, unless it were on a public occasion. The feminine part of the company included none whom Lady Chetham or Mrs. Cadwallader could object to, for Mrs. Renfrew, the Colonel's widow, was not only unexceptionable in point of breeding, but also interesting on the ground of her complaint, which puzzled the doctors, and seemed clearly a case wherein the fullness of professional knowledge might need the supplement of quackery. Lady Chetham, who attributed her own remarkable health to home-made bitters united with constant medical attendance, entered with much exercise of the imagination into Mrs. Renfrew's account of symptoms, and into the amazing futility in her case of all, strengthening medicines. "'Where can all the strength of those medicines go, my dear?' said the mild but stately dowager, turning to Mrs. Cadwallader reflectively, when Mrs. Renfrew's attention was called away. "'It strengthens the disease,' said the rector's wife, much too well born not to be an amateur in medicine. "'Everything depends on the constitution. Some people make fat, some blood, and some bile. That's my view of the matter. And whatever they take is a sort of grist to the mill." "'Then she ought to take medicines that would reduce, reduce the disease, you know, if you are right, my dear. And I think what you say is reasonable." "'Certainly it is reasonable. You have two sorts of potatoes, fed on the same soil. One of them grows more and more watery." Ah, like this poor Mrs. Renfrew, that is what I think. Dropsy. There is no swelling yet. It is inward. I should say she ought to take drying medicines, shouldn't you? Or a dry hot-air bath? Many things might be tried of a drying nature." "'Let her try a certain person's pamphlets,' said Mrs. Cadwallader, in an undertone, seeing the gentleman enter. He does not want drying." "'Who, my dear?' said Lady Chetham, a charming woman, not so quick as to nullify the pleasure of explanation. "'The bridegroom, Casabon, he has certainly been drying up faster since the engagement. The flame of passion, I suppose.' "'I should think he is far from having a good constitution,' said Lady Chetham, with a still deeper undertone. "'And then his studies, so very dry, as you say.' Really, by the side of Sir James, he looks like a death's head skinned over for the occasion. Mark my words, in a year from this time that girl will hate him. She looks up to him as an oracle now, and by and by she will be at the other extreme. All flightiness." "'How very shocking! I fear she is headstrong. 
But tell me, you know all about him. Is there anything very bad? What is the truth?" "'The truth? He is as bad as the wrong physic, nasty to take, and sure to disagree." "'There could not be anything worse than that,' said Lady Chetham, with so vivid a conception of the physic that she seemed to have learned something exact about Mr. Casaubon's disadvantages. However, James will hear nothing against Miss Brooke. He says she is the mirror of women still." "'That is a generous make-believe of his. Depend upon it, he likes little Celia better, and she appreciates him. I hope you like my little Celia." "'Certainly. She is fonder of geraniums, and seems more docile, though not so fine a figure. But we were talking of physic. Tell me about this new young surgeon, Mr. Lydgate. I am told he is wonderfully clever. He certainly looks it. A fine brow, indeed." "'He is a gentleman. I heard him talking to Humphrey. He talks well." "'Yes. Mr. Brooke says he is one of the Lydgates of Northumberland, really well connected. One does not expect it in a practitioner of that kind. For my own part, I like a medical man more on a footing with the servants. They are often all the cleverer. I assure you I found poor Hicks's judgment unfailing. I never knew him wrong. He was coarse and butcher-like, but he knew my constitution. It was a loss to me his going off so suddenly. Dear me! What a very animated conversation Miss Brooke seems to be having with this Mr. Lydgate!" "'She is talking cottages and hospitals with him,' said Mrs. Cadwallader, whose ears and power of interpretation were quick. I believe he is a sort of philanthropist, so Brooke is sure to take him up." "'James,' said Lady Chetham, when her son came near. Bring Mr. Lydgate and introduce him to me. I want to test him." The affable dowager declared herself delighted with this opportunity of making Mr. Lydgate's acquaintance, having heard of his success in treating fever on a new plan. Mr. Lydgate had the medical accomplishment of looking perfectly grave whatever nonsense was talked to him, and his dark, steady eyes gave him impressiveness as a listener. He was as little as possible like the lamented Hicks, especially in a certain careless refinement about his toilet and utterance. Yet Lady Chetham gathered much confidence in him. He confirmed her view of her own constitution as being peculiar, by admitting that all constitutions might be called peculiar, and he did not deny that hers might be more peculiar than others. He did not approve of a too lowering system, including reckless cupping, nor, on the other hand, of incessant port wine and bark. He said, I think so, with an air of so much deference accompanying the insight of agreement, that she formed the most cordial opinion of his talents. I am quite pleased with your protégé," she said to Mr. Brooke before going away. "'My protégé? Dear me! Who is that?' said Mr. Brooke. "'This young Lydgate, the new doctor. He seems to me to understand his profession admirably.' "'Oh, Lydgate! He is not my protégé, you know. Only I knew an uncle of his who sent me a letter about him. However, I think he is likely to be first-rate, has studied in Paris, knew Broussay has ideas, you know, wants to raise the profession." "'Lydgate has lots of ideas, quite new, about ventilation and diet, that sort of thing," resumed Mr. Brooke, after he had handed out Lady Chetham, and had returned to be civil to a group of middle-marchers. "'Hang it! Do you think that is quite sound, upsetting the old treatment which has made Englishmen what they are?' said Mr. Standish. "'Medical knowledge is at a low ebb among us,' said Mr. Bulstrode who spoke in a subdued tone, and had rather a sickly air. I, for my part, hail the advent of Mr. Lydgate. I hope to find good reason for confiding the new hospital to his management." "'That is all very fine,' replied Mr. Standish, who was not fond of Mr. Bulstrode. If you like him to try experiments on your hospital patients, and kill a few people for charity, I have no objection. But I am not going to hand money out of my purse to have experiments tried on me. I like treatment that has been tested a little." "'Well, you know, Standish, every dose you take is an experiment. An experiment, you know,' said Mr. Brooke, nodding towards the lawyer. "'Oh, if you talk in that sense,' said Mr. Standish, with as much disgust at such non-legal quibbling as a man can well betray towards a valuable client. "'I should be glad of any treatment that would cure me without reducing me to a skeleton, like poor Granger,' said Mr. Vincey, the mayor, a florid man who would have served for a study of flesh in striking contrast with the Franciscan tints of Mr. Bulstrode. 
It's an uncommonly dangerous thing to be left without any padding against the shafts of disease, as somebody said, and I think it a very good expression myself." Mr. Lydgate, of course, was out of hearing. He had quitted the party early, and would have thought it altogether tedious, but for the novelty of certain introductions, especially the introduction to Miss Brooke, whose youthful bloom, with her approaching marriage to that faded scholar, and her interest in matters socially useful, gave her the piquancy of an unusual combination. She is a good creature, that fine girl, but a little too earnest, he thought. It is troublesome to talk to such women. They are always wanting reasons, yet they are too ignorant to understand the merits of any question, and usually fall back on their moral sense to settle things after their own taste. Evidently Miss Brooke was not Mr. Lydgate's style of woman any more than Mr. Chichely's. Considered indeed in relation to the latter, whose meed was matured, she was altogether a mistake, and calculated to shock his trust in final causes, including the adaptation of fine young women to purple-faced bachelors. But Lydgate was less ripe, and might possibly have experience before him, which would modify his opinion as to the most excellent things in woman. Miss Brooke, however, was not again seen by either of these gentlemen under her maiden name. Not long after that dinner-party, she had become Mrs. Casaubon, and was on her way to Rome. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter 11. But deeds and language such as men do use, and persons such as comedy would choose, when she would show an image of the times, and sport with human follies, not with crimes. Ben Jonson Lydgate, in fact, was already conscious of being fascinated by a woman strikingly different from Miss Brooke. He did not in the least suppose that he had lost his balance and fallen in love, but he had said of that particular woman, "'She is grace itself. She is perfectly lovely and accomplished. That is what a woman ought to be. She ought to produce the effect of exquisite music." Plain women he regarded as he did the other severe facts of life, to be faced with philosophy and investigated by science. But Rosamond Vincy seemed to have the true melodic charm, and when a man has seen the woman whom he would have chosen, if he had intended to marry speedily, his remaining a bachelor will usually depend on her resolution rather than on his. Lydgate believed that he should not marry for several years not marry until he had trodden out a good, clear path for himself away from the broad road which was quite ready-made. He had seen Miss Vincy above his horizon, almost as long as it had taken Mr. Casaubon to become engaged and married. But this learned gentleman was possessed of a fortune, he had assembled his voluminous notes, and had made that sort of reputation which precedes performance, often the larger part of a man's fame. He took a wife, as we have seen, to adorn the remaining quadrant of his course, and be a little moon that would cause hardly a calculable perturbation. But Lydgate was young, poor, ambitious. He had his half-century before him instead of behind him, and he had come to Middlemarch bent on doing many things that were not directly fitted to make his fortune, or even secure him a good income. To a man under such circumstances, taking a wife is something more than a question of adornment, however highly he may rate this, and Lydgate was disposed to give it the first place among wifely functions. To his taste, guided by a single conversation, here was the point on which Miss Brooke would be found wanting, notwithstanding her undeniable beauty. She did not look at things from the proper feminine angle. The society of such women was about as relaxing as going from your work to teach the second form, instead of reclining in a paradise with sweet laughs for bird-notes, and blue eyes for a heaven. Certainly nothing at present could seem much less important to Lydgate than the turn of Miss Brooke's mind or to Miss Brooke than the qualities of the woman who had attracted this young surgeon. But any one watching keenly the stealthy convergence of human lots sees a slow preparation of effects from one life on another, which tells like a calculated irony on the indifference or the frozen stare with which we look at our unintroduced neighbour. Destiny stands by sarcastic, with our dramatis personae folded in her hand. Old provincial society had its share of this subtle movement, 
had not only its striking downfalls, its brilliant young professional dandies, who ended by living up an entry with a drab and six children for their establishment, but also those less marked vicissitudes which are constantly shifting the boundaries of social intercourse, and begetting new consciousness of interdependence. Some slipped a little downward, some got higher footing. People denied aspirates, gained wealth, and fastidious gentlemen stood for boroughs. Some were caught in political currents, some in ecclesiastical, and perhaps found themselves surprisingly grouped in consequence, while a few personages or families that stood with rocky firmness amid all this fluctuation, were slowly presenting new aspects in spite of solidity, and altering with the double change of self and beholder. Municipal town and rural parish gradually made fresh threads of connection, gradually, as the old stocking gave way to the savings bank, and the worship of the solar guinea became extinct, while squires and baronets, and even lords who had once lived blamelessly afar from the civic mind, gathered the faultiness of closer acquaintanceship. Settlers, too, came from distant counties, some with an alarming novelty of skill, others with an offensive advantage in cunning. In fact, much the same sort of movement and mixture went on in old England as we find in older Herodotus, who also, in telling what had been, thought it well to take a woman's lot for his starting-point, though Io, as a maiden apparently beguiled by attractive merchandise, was the reverse of Miss Brooke, and in this respect perhaps bore more resemblance to Rosamond Vincy, who had excellent taste in costume, with that nymph-like figure, and pure blindness which give the largest range to choice in the flow and colour of drapery. But these things made only part of her charm. She was admitted to be the flower of Mrs. Lemon's school, the chief school in the county, where the teaching included all that was demanded in the accomplished female, even to extras, such as the getting in and out of a carriage. Mrs. Lemon herself had always held up Miss Vincy as an example. No pupil, she said, exceeded that young lady for mental acquisition and propriety of speech, while her musical execution was quite exceptional. We cannot help the way in which people speak of us, and probably if Mrs. Lemon had undertaken to describe Juliet or Imogen, these heroines would not have seemed poetical. The first vision of Rosamond would have been enough with most judges to dispel any prejudice excited by Mrs. Lemon's praise. Lydgate could not be long in Middlemarch without having that agreeable vision, or even without making the acquaintance of the Vincy family. For though Mr. Peacock, whose practice he had paid something to enter on, had not been their doctor, Mrs. Vincy not liking the lowering system adopted by him, he had many patients among their connections and acquaintances. For who of any consequence in Middlemarch was not connected, or at least acquainted, with the Vincys? They were old manufacturers and had kept a good house for three generations, in which there had naturally been much intermarrying with neighbours more or less decidedly genteel. Mr. Vincy's sister had made a wealthy match in accepting Mr. Bulstrode, who, however, as a man not born in the town, and altogether of dimly known origin, was considered to have done well in uniting himself with a real Middlemarch family. On the other hand, Mr. Vincy had descended a little, having taken an innkeeper's daughter. But on this side, too, there was a cheering sense of money, for Mrs. Vincy's sister had been second wife to rich old Mr. Featherstone, and had died childless years ago, so that her nephews and nieces might be supposed to touch the affections of the widower. And it happened that Mr. Bulstrode and Mr. Featherstone, two of Peacock's most important patients, had, from different causes, given an especially good reception to his successor, who had raised some partisanship as well as discussion. Mr. Wrench, medical attendant to the Vincy family, very early had grounds for thinking lightly of Lydgate's professional discretion, and there was no report about him which was not retailed at the Vincy's, where visitors were frequent. Mr. Vincy was more inclined to general good fellowship than to taking sides, but there was no need for him to be hasty in making any new man acquaintance. Rosamond silently wished that her father would invite Mr. Lydgate. She was tired of the faces and figures she had always been used to the various irregular profiles and gaits and turns of phrase, distinguishing those Middlemarch young men whom she had known as boys. She had been at school with girls of higher position, whose brothers, she had felt sure, it would have been possible for her to be more interested in, than in these inevitable Middlemarch companions. But she would not have chosen to mention her wish to her father, and he, for his part, was in no hurry on the subject. An alderman about to be mayor must by and by enlarge his dinner-parties, but at present there were plenty of guests at his well-spread table. That table often remained covered with the relics of the family breakfast long after Mr. Vincy had gone with his second son to the warehouse, 
and when Miss Morgan was already far on in morning lessons with the younger girls in the schoolroom. It awaited the family laggard, who found any sort of inconvenience, to others, less disagreeable than getting up when he was called. This was the case one morning of the October in which we have lately seen Mr. Casaubon visiting the Grange, and though the room was a little overheated with the fire, which had sent the spaniel panting to a remote corner, Rosamond, for some reason, continued to sit at her embroidery longer than usual, now and then giving herself a little shake, and laying her work on her knee to contemplate it, with an air of hesitating weariness. Her mamma, who had returned from an excursion to the kitchen, sat on the other side of the small work-table, with an air of more entire placidity, until, the clock again giving notice that it was going to strike, she looked up from the lace-mending which was occupying her plump fingers, and rang the bell. "'Knock at Mr. Fred's door again, Pritchard, and tell him it has struck half-past ten. This was said without any change in the radiant good humour of Mrs. Vincy's face, in which forty-five years had delved neither angles nor parallels, and pushing back her pink cap-strings, she let her work rest on her lap, while she looked admiringly at her daughter. Mamma said Rosamond, when Fred comes down I wish you would not let him have red herrings. I cannot bear the smell of them all over the house at this hour of the morning. Oh, my dear, you are so hard on your brothers. It is the only fault I have to find with you. You are the sweetest temper in the world, but you are so tetchy with your brothers." "'Not tetchy, mamma. You never hear me speak in an unladylike way." "'Well, but you want to deny them things. Brothers are so unpleasant." "'Oh, my dear, you must allow for young men. Be thankful if they have good hearts. A woman must learn to put up with little things. You will be married some day." not to any one who is like Fred. Don't decry your own brother, my dear. Few young men have less against them. Although he couldn't take his degree, I am sure I can't understand why, for he seems to me most clever. And you know yourself he was thought equal to the best society at college. So particular as you are, my dear, I wonder you are not glad to have such a gentlemanly young man for a brother. You are always finding fault with Bob because he is not Fred." Oh, no, mamma, only because he is Bob. Well, my dear, you will not find any Middlemarch young man who has not something against him." But—here Rosamond's face broke into a smile, which suddenly revealed two dimples. She herself thought unfavourably of these dimples, and smiled little in general society. But I shall not marry any Middlemarch young man. So it seems, my love, for you have as good as refused the pick of them, and if there is better to be had, I am sure there is no girl better deserves it. Excuse me, mamma. I wish you would not say the pick of them. Why? What else are they? I mean, mamma, it is rather a vulgar expression. Very likely, my dear, I never was a good speaker. What should I say? The best of them. Why, that seems just as plain and common. If I had had time to think, I should have said, the most superior young men. But with your education you must know. "'What must Rosie know, mother?' said Mr. Fred, who had slid in unobserved through the half-open door while the ladies were bending over their work, and now, going up to the fire, stood with his back towards it, warming the soles of his slippers. "'Whether it's right to say superior young men,' said Mrs. Vincy, ringing the bell. "'Oh, there are so many superior teas and sugars now. Superior is getting to be shopkeeper slang.' "'Are you beginning to dislike slang, then?' said Rosamond, with mild gravity. "'Only the wrong sort. All choice of words is slang. It marks a class.' "'There is correct English. That is not slang.' "'I beg your pardon. Correct English is the slang of prigs who write history and essays, and the strongest slang of all is the slang of poets.' Oh, "'You will say anything, Fred, to gain your point.' Well, tell me whether it is slang or poetry to call an ox a leg-plater." "'Of course, you can call it poetry if you like." "'Ah, Miss Rosie, you don't know Homer from slang. I shall invent a new game. I shall write bits of slang and poetry on slips, and give them to you to separate." "'Dear me, how amusing it is to hear young people talk,' said Mrs. Vincy, with cheerful admiration. "'Have you got nothing else for my breakfast, Pritchard?' said Fred to the servant who brought in coffee and buttered toast, while he walked round the table surveying the ham, potted beef, and other cold remnants, with an air of silent rejection, 
and polite forbearance from signs of disgust. "'Should you like eggs, sir?' "'Eggs? No! Bring me a grilled bone!' "'Really, Fred,' said Rosamond, when the servant had left the room, "'if you must have hot things for breakfast, I wish you would come down earlier. You can get up at six o'clock to go out hunting. I cannot understand why you find it so difficult to get up on other mornings.' "'That is your want of understanding, Rosie. I can get up to go hunting, because I like it.' "'What would you think of me if I came down two hours after every one else, and ordered grilled bone?' "'I should think you were an uncommonly fast young lady,' said Fred, eating his toast with the utmost composure. "'I cannot see why brothers are to make themselves disagreeable any more than sisters. I don't make myself disagreeable. It is you who find me so. Disagreeable is a word that describes your feelings, and not my actions.' "'I think it describes the smell of grilled bone.' "'Not at all. It describes a sensation in your little nose associated with certain finicking notions which are the classics of Mrs. Lemon's school. Look at my mother. You don't see her objecting to everything except what she does herself. She is my notion of a pleasant woman.' "'Bless you both, my dears, and don't quarrel,' said Mrs. Vincy, with motherly cordiality. "'Come, Fred, tell us all about the new doctor. How is your uncle pleased with him?' Mm, "'Pretty well, I think. He asks Lydgate all sorts of questions, and then screws up his face while he hears the answers, as if they were pinching his toes. That's his way. Ah, here comes my grilled bone. But how came you to stay out so late, my dear? You only said you were going to your uncle's. Oh, I dined at Plymdale's. We had whist. Lydgate was there, too. And what do you think of him? He is very gentlemanly, I suppose. They say he is of excellent family, his relations quite county people. "'Yes,' said Fred. "'There was a Lydgate at John's who spent no end of money. I find this man is a second cousin of his. But rich men may have very poor devils for second cousins.' "'It always makes a difference, though, to be of good family,' said Rosamond, with a tone of decision which showed that she had thought on this subject. Rosamond felt that she might have been happier if she had not been the daughter of a Middlemarch manufacturer. She disliked anything which reminded her that her mother's father had been an innkeeper. Certainly any one remembering the fact might think that Mrs. Vincy had the air of a very handsome, good-humoured landlady, accustomed to the most capricious orders of gentlemen. "'I thought it was odd his name was Tertius,' said the bright-faced matron. "'But of course it's a name in the family. But now tell us exactly what sort of man he is.' "'Oh, tallish, dark, clever, talks well. Rather a prig, I think.' "'I never can make out what you mean by a prig,' said Rosamond. "'A fellow who wants to show that he has opinions.' "'Why, my dear, doctors must have opinions,' said Mrs. Vincy. "'What are they there for else?' "'Yes, mother, the opinions they are paid for. But a prig is a fellow who is always making you a present of his opinions.' "'I suppose Mary Garth admires Mr. Lydgate,' said Rosamond, not without a touch of innuendo. "'Really, I can't say,' said Fred, rather glumly, as he left the table and, taking up a novel which he had brought down with him, threw himself into an armchair. "'If you are jealous of her, go oftener to Stone Court yourself and eclipse her.' "'I wish you would not be so vulgar, Fred. If you have finished, pray ring the bell.' "'It is true, though, what your brother says, Rosamond,' Mrs. Vincy began when the servant had cleared the table. It is a thousand pities that you haven't the patience to go and see your uncle more, so proud of you as he is, and wanted you to live with him. There's no knowing what he might have done for you as well as for Fred. God knows I'm fond of having you at home with me, but I can part with my children for their good, and now it stands to reason that your uncle Featherstone will do something for Mary Garth. Mary Garth can bear being at Stone Court, because she likes that better than being a governess," said Rosamond, folding up her work. I would rather not have anything left to me if I must earn it by enduring much of my uncle's cough and his ugly relations. He can't be long for this world, my dear. I wouldn't hasten his end. But what with asthma and that inward complaint, let us hope there is something better for him in another. And I have no ill will towards Mary Garth, but there is justice to be thought of. And Mr. Featherstone's first wife brought him no money as my sister did. Her nieces and nephews can't have so much claim as my sister's. And I must say, I think Mary Garth a dreadful plain girl, more fit for a governess." "'Everyone would not agree with you there, mother,' 
said Fred, who seemed to be able to read and listen, too. "'Well, my dear,' said Mrs. Vincey, wheeling skilfully, "'if she had some fortune left her, a man marries his wife's relations, and the Garths are so poor, and live in such a small way. But I shall leave you to your studies, my dear, for I must go and do some shopping.' "'Fred's studies are not very deep,' said Rosamond, rising with her mamma. He is only reading a novel." "'Well, well, by and by he'll go to his Latin and things,' said Mrs. Vincey, soothingly, stroking her son's head. "'There's a fire in the smoking-room on purpose. It's your father's wish, you know. Fred, my dear, and I always tell him you will be good, and go to college again to take your degree.' Fred drew his mother's hand down to his lips, but said nothing. "'I suppose you are not going out riding to-day,' said Rosamond, lingering a little after her mamma was gone. No. Why? Papa says I may have the chestnut to ride now. You can go with me to-morrow, if you like. Only I am going to Stone Court, remember. I want to ride so much. It is indifferent to me where we go. Rosamond really wished to go to Stone Court, of all other places. Oh, I say, Rosie, said Fred, as she was passing out of the room, if you are going to the piano, let me come and play some airs with you. Pray do not ask me this morning. Why not this morning? Really, Fred, I wish you would leave off playing the flute. A man looks very silly playing the flute, and you play so out of tune. When next any one makes love to you, Miss Rosamond, I will tell him how obliging you are. Why should you expect me to oblige you by hearing you play the flute, any more than I should expect you to oblige me by not playing it? And why should you expect me to take you out riding? This question led to an adjustment, for Rosamond had set her mind on that particular ride. So Fred was gratified with nearly an hour's practice of Ar Hedinos, Ye Banks and Brays, and other favourite airs from his Instructor on the Flute, a wheezy performance, into which he threw much ambition and an irrepressible hopefulness. End of chapter 11 Chapter Twelve of Middlemarch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter Twelve. He had more toe on his distaff than Gervais knew. Chaucer. The ride to Stone Court, which Fred and Rosamond took the next morning, lay through a pretty bit of midland landscape, almost all meadows and pastures, with hedgerows still allowed to grow in bushy beauty, and to spread out coral fruit for the birds. Little details gave each field a particular physiognomy, dear to the eyes that have looked on them from childhood. The pool in the corner where the grasses were dank, and trees leaned whisperingly. The great oak shadowing a bare place in mid-pasture the high bank where the ash-trees grew, the sudden slope of the old marl-pit making a red background for the burdock, the huddled roofs and ricks of the homestead without a traceable way of approach, the grey gate and fences against the depths of the bordering wood, and the stray hovel, its old, old thatch full of mossy hills and valleys, with wondrous modulations of light and shadow, such as we travel far to see in later life, and see larger, but not more beautiful. These are the things that make the gamut of joy and landscape to midland-bred souls, the things they toddled among, or perhaps learned by heart, standing between their father's knees, while he drove leisurely. But the road, even the by-road, was excellent, for Lowick, as we have seen, was not a parish of muddy lanes and poor tenants, and it was into Lowick Parish that Fred and Rosamond entered, after a couple of miles riding. Another mile would bring them to Stone Court, and at the end of the first half, the house was already visible, looking as if it had been arrested in its growth toward a stone mansion by an unexpected budding of farm buildings on its left flank, which had hindered it from becoming anything more than the substantial dwelling of a gentleman farmer. It was not the less agreeable an object in the distance for the cluster of pinnacled corn-ricks which balanced the fine row of walnuts on the right. Presently it was possible to discern something that might be a gig on the circular drive before the front door. "'Dear me,' said Rosamond. I hope none of my uncle's horrible relations are there." "'They are, though. That is Mrs. Wall's gig, 
The last yellow gig left, I should think. When I see Mrs. Wall in it, I understand how yellow can have been worn for mourning. That gig seems to be more funereal than a hearse. But then Mrs. Wall always has black crape on. How does she manage it, Rosie? Her friends can't always be dying." "'I don't know at all. And she is not in the least evangelical,' said Rosamond reflectively, as if that religious point of view would have fully accounted for perpetual crape. "'And not poor,' she added, after a moment's pause. "'No, by George! They are as rich as Jews, those walls and featherstones. I mean, for people like them who don't want to spend anything. And yet they hang about my uncle like vultures, and are afraid of a farthing going away from their side of the family. But I believe he hates them all." The Mrs. Wall, who was so far from being admirable in the eyes of these distant connections, had happened to say this very morning, not at all with a defiant air, but in a low, muffled, neutral tone, as of a voice heard through cotton wool, that she did not wish to enjoy their good opinion. She was seated, as she observed, on her own brother's hearth, and had been Jane Featherstone five and twenty years before she had been Jane Wall, which entitled her to speak when her own brother's name had been made free with by those who had no right to it. "'What are you driving at there?' said Mr. Featherstone, holding his stick between his knees and settling his wig, while he gave her a momentary sharp glance, which seemed to react on him like a draught of cold air, and set him coughing. Mrs. Wall had to defer her answer till he was quiet again till Mary Garth had supplied him with fresh syrup, and he had begun to rub the gold knob of his stick, looking bitterly at the fire. It was a bright fire, but it made no difference to the chill-looking purplish tint of Mrs. Wall's face, which was as neutral as her voice, having mere chinks for eyes, and lips that hardly moved in speaking. "'The doctors can't master that cough, brother. It's just like what I have, for I'm your own sister, constitution and everything. But, as I was saying, it's a pity Mrs. Vincy's family can't be better conducted." "'Tcha! You said nothing of the sort. You said somebody had made free with my name. And no more than can be proved, if what everybody says is true. My brother Solomon tells me it's the talk up and down in Middlemarch how unsteady young Vincy is, and has been forever gambling at billiards since he came home." "'Nonsense! What's a game at billiards? It's a good gentlemanly game, and young Vincy is not a clodhopper. If your son John took to billiards now, he'd make a fool of himself." "'Your nephew John never took to billiards or any other game, brother, and is far from losing hundreds of pounds, which, if what everybody says is true, must be found somewhere else than out of Mr. Vincy the father's pocket. For they say he's been losing money for years, though nobody would think so, to see him go coursing and keeping open house as they do. And I've heard say Mr. Bolstrode condemns Mrs. Vincy beyond anything for her flightiness, and spoiling her children so. What's Mr. Bolstrode to me? I don't bank with him." "'Well, Mrs. Bolstrode is Mr. Vincy's own sister. And they do say that Mr. Vincy mostly trades on the bank money. And you may see yourself, brother, when a woman past forty has pink strings always flying, and that light way of laughing at everything. It's very unbecoming. But indulging your children is one thing, and finding money to pay their debts is another. And it's openly said that young Vincy has raised money on his expectations. I don't say what expectations. Miss Garth hears me, and is welcome to tell again. I know young people hang together." "'No, thank you, Mrs. Wall,' said Mary Garth. I dislike hearing scandal too much to wish to repeat it." Mr. Featherstone rubbed the knob of his stick, and made a brief convulsive show of laughter, which had much the same genuineness as an old whist-player's chuckle over a bad hand. Still looking at the fire, he said, "'And who pretends to say Fred Vincy hasn't got expectations? Such a fine-spirited fellow is like enough to have him." There was a slight pause before Mrs. Wall replied, and when she did so, her voice seemed to be slightly moistened with tears, though her face was still dry. "'Whether or no, brother, it is naturally painful to me and my brother Solomon to hear your name made free with, and your complaint being such as may carry you off sudden, and people who are no more featherstones than the Mary Andrew at the fair, openly reckoning on your property coming to them and me your own sister, and Solomon your own brother. And if that's to be it, what has it pleased the Almighty to make families for?" Here Mrs. Wall's tears fell, but with moderation. "'Come out with it, Jane,' said Mr. Featherstone, looking at her. "'You mean to say Fred Vincy has been getting someone to advance him money on what he says he knows about my will, eh?' "'I never said so, brother,' Mrs. Wall's voice had again become dry and unshaken. 
It was told me by my brother Solomon last night when he called, coming from market, to give me advice about the old wheat, me being a widow, and my son John only three and twenty, though steady beyond anything. And he had it from most undeniable authority, and not one, but many. "'Stuff and nonsense! I don't believe a word of it. It's all a got-up story. Go to the window, Missy. I thought I heard a horse. See if the doctor's coming.' "'Not got up by me, brother, nor yet by Solomon, who, whatever else he may be, and I don't deny he has oddities, has made his will and parted his property equal between such kin as he's friends with, though for my part I think there are times when some should be considered more than others. But Solomon makes it no secret what he means to do.' "'The more fool he!' said Mr. Featherstone, with some difficulty, breaking into a severe fit of coughing, that required Mary Garth to stand near him, so that she did not find out whose horses they were, which presently paused stamping on the gravel before the door. Before Mr. Featherstone's cough was quiet, Rosamond entered, bearing up her riding habit with much grace. She bowed ceremoniously to Mrs. Wall, who said stiffly, "'How do you do, miss?' smiled and nodded silently to Mary, and remained standing till the coughing should cease, and allow her uncle to notice her. "'Hey day, miss,' he said at last, "'you have a fine colour. Where's Fred?' "'Seeing about the horses. He will be in presently.' "'Sit down, sit down. Mrs. Wall, you'd better go.' Even those neighbours who had called Peter Featherstone an old fox had never accused him of being insincerely polite, and his sister was quite used to the peculiar absence of ceremony with which he marked his sense of blood relationship. Indeed, she herself was accustomed to think that entire freedom from the necessity of behaving agreeably was included in the Almighty's intentions about families. She rose slowly without any sign of resentment, and said in her usual muffled monotone, "'Brother, I hope the new doctor will be able to do something for you. Solomon says there's great talk of his cleverness. I'm sure it's my wish you should be spared. And there's none more ready to nurse you than your own sister, and your own nieces, if you'd only say the word. There's Rebecca and Joanna and Elizabeth, you know.' Ay, ay, I remember, you'll see I've remembered em all, all dark and ugly. They'd need have some money, eh? There never was any beauty in the women of our family. But the Featherstones have always had some money, and the Walls, too. Wall had money, too. A warm man was Wall. Ay, ay, money's a good egg, and if you have got money to leave behind you, lay it in a warm nest. Good-bye, Mrs. Wall. Here Mr. Featherstone pulled at both sides of his wig, as if he wanted to deafen himself and his sister went away ruminating on this oracular speech of his. Notwithstanding her jealousy of the Vincies and of Mary Garth, there remained as the nethermost sediment in her mental shallows a persuasion that her brother Peter Featherstone could never leave his chief property away from his blood relations. Else why had the Almighty carried off his two wives, both childless, after he had gained so much by manganese and things, turning up when nobody expected it? And why was there a Lowick parish church, and the walls and powderols all sitting in the same pew for generations, and the Featherstone pew next to them, if, the Sunday after her brother Peter's death, everybody was to know that the property was gone out of the family. The human mind has at no period accepted a moral chaos, and so preposterous a result was not strictly conceivable. But we are frightened at much that is not strictly conceivable. When Fred came in the old man eyed him with a peculiar twinkle which the younger had often had reason to interpret as pride, in the satisfactory details of his appearance. "'You two misses go away,' said Mr. Featherstone. "'I want to speak to Fred.' "'Come into my room, Rosamond. You will not mind the cold for a little while,' said Mary. The two girls had not only known each other in childhood, but had been at the same provincial school together, Mary as an articled pupil, so that they had many memories in common, and liked very well to talk in private. Indeed, this tête-à-tête -tête was one of Rosamond's objects in coming to Stone Court. Old Featherstone would not begin the dialogue till the door had been closed. He continued to look at Fred with the same twinkle, and with one of his habitual grimaces, alternately screwing and widening his mouth, and when he spoke it was in a low tone, which might be taken for that of an informer ready to be bought off, rather than for the tone of an offended senior. He was not a man to feel any strong moral indignation, even on account of trespasses against himself. It was natural that others should want to get an advantage over him, but then he was a little too cunning for them. "'So, sir, you've been paying ten per cent for money which you've promised to pay off by mortgaging my land when I'm dead and gone, eh? You put my life at a twelve-month, say. But I can alter my will yet.' Fred blushed. He had not borrowed money in that way, for excellent reasons, but he was conscious of having spoken with some confidence, perhaps with more than he exactly remembered 
about his prospect of getting Featherstone's land, as a future means of paying present debts. "'I don't know what you refer to, sir. I have certainly never borrowed any money on such an insecurity. Please to explain.' "'No, sir. It's you must explain. I can alter my will yet, let me tell you. I'm of sound mind, can reckon compound interest in my head, and remember every fool's name as well as I could twenty years ago. What the deuce! I'm under eighty. I say you must contradict this story." "'I have contradicted it, sir,' Fred answered, with a touch of impatience, not remembering that his uncle did not verbally discriminate contradicting from disproving though no one was further from confounding the two ideas than old Featherstone, who often wondered that so many fools took his own assertions for proofs. "'But I contradict it again. The story is a silly lie.' "'Nonsense! You must bring documents. It comes from authority.' "'Name the authority, and make him name the man of whom I borrowed the money, and then I can disprove the story.' "'It's pretty good authority, I think. A man who knows most of what goes on in Middlemarch. It's that fine, religious, charitable uncle of yours. Come, now!" Here Mr. Featherstone had his peculiar inward shake which signified merriment. "'Mr. Bulstrode. Who else, eh?' "'Then the story has grown into this lie out of some sermonizing words he may have let fall about me. Do they pretend that he named the man who lent me the money?' "'If there is such a man, depend upon it Bulstrode knows him. But supposing you only tried to get the money lent, and didn't get it, Bulstrode would know about that, too. You bring me a writing from Bulstrode to say he doesn't believe you'd ever promise to pay your debts out of my land. Come, now!" Mr. Featherstone's face required its whole scale of grimaces, as a muscular outlet to his silent triumph in the soundness of his faculties. Fred felt himself to be in a disgusting dilemma. "'You must be joking, sir. Mr. Bulstrode, like other men, believes scores of things that are not true, and he has a prejudice against me. I could easily get him to write that he knew no facts and proof of the report you speak of, though it might lead to unpleasantness. But I could hardly ask him to write down what he believes or does not believe about me." Fred paused an instant, and then added, in politic appeal to his uncle's vanity, "'That is hardly a thing for a gentleman to ask.' But he was disappointed in the result. Aye, I know what you mean. You'd sooner offend me than Bulstrode. And what's he? He's got no land hereabout that ever I heard tell of. A speculating fellow. He may come down any day when the devil leaves off backing him. And that's what his religion means. He wants God Almighty to come in. That's nonsense. There's one thing I made out pretty clear when I used to go to church, and it's this. God Almighty sticks to the land. He promises land, and he gives land, and he makes chaps rich with corn and cattle. But you take the other side. You like Bulstrode and speculation better than Featherstone and land." "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said Fred, rising, standing with his back to the fire and beating his boot with his whip. "'I like neither Bulstrode nor speculation.' He spoke rather sulkily, feeling himself stalemated. "'Well, well, you can do without me, that's pretty clear said old Featherstone, secretly disliking the possibility that Fred would show himself at all independent. "'You neither want a bit of land to make a squire of you instead of a starving person, nor a lift of a hundred pound by the way. It's all one to me. I can make five codicils if I like, and I shall keep my bank-notes for an nest egg. It's all one to me.' Fred coloured again. Featherstone had rarely given him presents of money and at this moment it seemed almost harder to part with the immediate prospect of banknotes than with the more distant prospect of the land. "'I am not ungrateful, sir. I never meant to show disregard for any kind intentions you might have towards me. On the contrary—' "'Very good. Then prove it. You bring me a letter from Bulstrode saying he doesn't believe you've been cracking and promising to pay your debts out of my land, and then, if there's any scrape you've gone into, we'll see if I can't back you a bit. Come now, that's a bargain. Here, give me your arm. I'll try and walk round the room." Fred, in spite of his irritation, had kindness enough in him to be a little sorry for the unloved, unvenerated old man, who with his dropsical legs looked more than usually pitiable in walking. While giving his arm, he thought that he should not himself like to be an old fellow with his constitution breaking up, and he waited good-temperedly, first before the window to hear the wonted remarks about the guinea-fowls and the weathercock, and then before the scanty bookshelves, of which the chief glories in dark calf were Josephus, Culpepper, Klopstock's Messiah, and several volumes of the Gentleman's Magazine. "'Read me the name of the books,' 
Come now, you're a college man." Fred gave him the titles. "'What did Missy want with more books? What must you be bringing her more books for?' "'They amuse her, sir. She is very fond of reading.' "'A little too fond,' said Mr. Featherstone captiously. "'She was for reading when she sat with me. But I put a stop to that. She's got the newspaper to read out loud. That's enough for one day, I should think. I can't abide to see her reading to herself. You mind and not bring her any more books, do you hear?" "'Yes, sir, I hear.' Fred had received this order before, and had secretly disobeyed it. He intended to disobey it again. "'Ring the bell,' said Mr. Featherstone. "'I want Missy to come down.' Rosamond and Mary had been talking faster than their male friends. They did not think of sitting down, but stood at the toilet-table near the window while Rosamond took off her hat, adjusted her veil, and applied little touches of her fingertips to her hair hair of infantine fairness, neither flaxen nor yellow. Mary Garth seemed all the plainer standing at an angle between the two nymphs, the one in the glass and the one out of it, who looked at each other with eyes of heavenly blue. Deep enough to hold the most exquisite meanings an ingenious beholder could put into them, and deep enough to hide the meanings of the owner if these should happen to be less exquisite. Only a few children in Middlemarch looked blonde by the side of Rosamond, and the slim figure displayed by her riding habit had delicate undulations. In fact, most men in Middlemarch, except her brothers, held that Miss Vincy was the best girl in the world, and some called her an angel. Mary Garth, on the contrary, had the aspect of an ordinary sinner. She was brown, her curly dark hair was rough and stubborn, her stature was low, and it would not be true to declare, in satisfactory antithesis, that she had all the virtues. Plainness has its peculiar temptations and vices quite as much as beauty. It is apt either to feign amiability, or, not feigning it, to show all the repulsiveness of discontent. At any rate, to be called an ugly thing in contrast with that lovely creature your companion is apt to produce some effect beyond a sense of fine veracity and fitness in the phrase. At the age of two and twenty, Mary had certainly not attained that perfect good sense and good principle which are usually recommended to the less fortunate girl, as if they were to be obtained in quantities ready mixed, with a flavour of resignation as required. Her shrewdness had a streak of satiric bitterness continually renewed and never carried utterly out of sight, except by a strong current of gratitude toward those who, instead of telling her that she ought to be contented, did something to make her so. Advancing womanhood had tempered her plainness, which was of a good human sort, such as the mothers of our race have very commonly worn in all latitudes, under a more or less becoming headgear. Rembrandt would have paid it her with pleasure, and would have made her broad features look out of the canvas with intelligent honesty. For honesty, truth-telling fairness, was Mary's reigning virtue. She neither tried to create illusions, nor indulged in them for her own behoof, and when she was in a good mood she had humour enough in her to laugh at herself. When she and Rosamond happened both to be reflected in the glass, she said laughingly, "'What a brown patch I am by the side of you, Rosie! You are the most unbecoming companion.' "'Oh, no! No one thinks of your appearance. You are so sensible and useful, Mary.' Beauty is of very little consequence in reality," said Rosamond, turning her head towards Mary, but with eyes swerving towards the new view of her neck in the glass. "'You mean my beauty,' said Mary rather sardonically. Rosamond thought, "'Poor Mary! She takes the kindest things ill.' Aloud she said, "'What have you been doing lately?' "'I? Oh, minding the house, pouring out syrup, pretending to be amiable and contented learning to have a bad opinion of everybody. "'It is a wretched life for you.' "'No,' said Mary curtly, with a little toss of her head. "'I think my life is pleasanter than your Miss Morgan's.' "'Yes, but Miss Morgan is so uninteresting, and not young.' "'She is interesting to herself, I suppose, and I am not at all sure that everything gets easier as one gets older.' "'No,' said Rosamond reflectively. One wonders what such people do without any prospect. To be sure, there is religion as a support. But, she added, dimpling, it is very different with you, Mary. You may have an offer. Has anyone told you he means to make me one? Of course not. I mean, there is a gentleman who may fall in love with you, seeing you almost every day. A certain change in Mary's face was chiefly determined by the resolve not to show any change. Does that always make people fall in love?" she answered carelessly. It seems to me quite as often a reason for detesting each other. 
not when they are interesting and agreeable. I hear that Mr. Lydgate is both." "'Oh, Mr. Lydgate,' said Mary, with an unmistakable lapse into indifference. "'You want to know something about him,' she added, not choosing to indulge Rosamond's indirectness. "'Merely how you like him.' "'There is no question of liking at present. My liking always wants some little kindness to kindle it. I am not magnanimous enough to like people who speak to me without seeming to see me." "'Is he so haughty?' said Rosamond, with heightened satisfaction. "'You know that he is of good family.' "'No. He did not give that as a reason.' "'Mary, you are the oddest girl. But what sort of looking man is he? Describe him to me.' "'How can one describe a man? I can give you an inventory. Heavy eyebrows, dark eyes, a straight nose, thick dark hair, large, solid white hands, and—let me see—oh, an exquisite cambric pocket-handkerchief. But you will see him. You know this is about the time of his visits." Rosamond blushed a little, but said meditatively, "'I rather like a haughty manner. I cannot endure a rattling young man.' I did not tell you that Mr. Lydgate was haughty, but il y en a pour tous les goûts as little Mamselle used to say, and if any girl can choose the particular sort of conceit she would like, I should think it is you, Rosie." "'Haughtiness is not conceit. I call Fred conceited." "'I wish no one said any worse of him. He should be more careful. Mrs. Wall has been telling Uncle that Fred is very unsteady." Mary spoke from a girlish impulse which got the better of her judgment. There was a vague uneasiness associated with the word unsteady which she hoped Rosamond might say something to dissipate. But she purposely abstained from mentioning Mrs. Wall's more special insinuation. "'Oh, Fred is horrid,' said Rosamond. She would not have allowed herself so unsuitable a word to any one but Mary. "'What do you mean by horrid?' "'He is so idle, and makes papa so angry, and says he will not take orders.' "'I think Fred is quite right.' "'How can you say he is quite right, Mary? I thought you had more sense of religion." "'He is not fit to be a clergyman." "'But he ought to be fit." "'Well, then, he is not what he ought to be. I know some other people who are in the same case." "'But no one approves of them. I should not like to marry a clergyman, but there must be clergymen." "'It does not follow that Fred must be one." "'But when Papa has been at the expense of educating him for it, and only suppose if he should have no fortune left him." I can suppose that very well," said Mary dryly. "'Then I wonder you can defend Fred,' said Rosamond, inclined to push this point. "'I don't defend him,' said Mary, laughing. "'I would defend any parish from having him for a clergyman.' "'But, of course, if he were a clergyman he must be different.' "'Yes, he would be a great hypocrite, and he is not that yet.' "'Oh, it is of no use saying anything to you, Mary. You always take Fred's part.' Why should I not take his part?" said Mary, lighting up. He would take mine. He is the only person who takes the least trouble to oblige me." "'You make me feel very uncomfortable, Mary,' said Rosamond, with her gravest mildness. I would not tell Mamma for the world." "'What would you not tell her?' said Mary angrily. "'Pray do not go into a rage, Mary,' said Rosamond, mildly as ever. "'If your Mamma is afraid that Fred will make me an offer, Tell her that I would not marry him if he asked me. But he is not going to do so, that I am aware. He certainly never has asked me." "'Mary, you are always so violent. And you are always so exasperating." "'I? What can you blame me for?' "'Oh, blameless people are always the most exasperating. Oh, there is the bell. I think we must go down." "'I did not mean to quarrel,' said Rosamond, putting on her hat. Quarrel. Nonsense! We have not quarrelled. If one is not to get into a rage sometimes, what is the good of being friends?" "'Am I to repeat what you have said?' "'Just as you please. I never say what I am afraid of having repeated. But let us go down." Mr. Lydgate was rather late this morning, but the visitors stayed long enough to see him, for Mr. Featherstone asked Rosamond to sing to him, and she herself was so kind as to propose a second favourite song of his, Flow on, thou shining river, after she had sung Home, Sweet Home which she detested. This hard-headed old overreach approved of the sentimental song as a suitable garnish for girls, and also as fundamentally fine, sentiment being the right thing for a song. 
Mr. Featherstone was still applauding the last performance, and assuring Missy that her voice was as clear as a blackbird's, when Mr. Lydgate's horse passed the window. His dull expectation of the usual disagreeable routine with an aged patient, who can hardly believe that medicine would not set him up if the doctor were only clever enough, added to his general disbelief in Middlemarch charms, made a doubly effective background to this vision of Rosamond, whom old Featherstone made haste ostentatiously to introduce as his niece, though he had never thought it worth while to speak of Mary Garth in that light. Nothing escaped Lydgate in Rosamond's graceful behaviour. How delicately she waved the notice which the old man's want of taste had thrust upon her by a quiet gravity, not showing her dimples on the wrong occasion, but showing them afterwards in speaking to Mary, to whom she addressed herself with so much good-natured interest, that Lydgate, after quickly examining Mary more fully than he had done before, saw an adorable kindness in Rosamond's eyes. But Mary, from some cause, looked rather out of temper. "'Miss Rosie has been singing me a song. You've nothing to say against that, eh, doctor?' said Mr. Featherstone. "'I like it better than your physic.' "'That has made me forget how the time was going,' said Rosamond, rising to reach her hat, which she had laid aside before singing, so that her flower-like head on its white stem was seen in perfection above her riding habit. "'Fred, we really must go.' "'Very good,' said Fred, who had his own reasons for not being in the best spirits, and wanted to get away. "'Miss Vincy is a musician,' said Lydgate, following her with his eyes. Every nerve and muscle in Rosamond was adjusted to the consciousness that she was being looked at. She was by nature an actress of parts that entered into her physique. She even acted her own character, and so well that she did not know it to be precisely her own. "'The best in Middlemarch I'll be bound,' said Mr. Featherstone. "'Let the next be who she will. Eh, Fred? Speak up for your sister.' "'I'm afraid I'm out of court, sir. My evidence would be good for nothing.' "'Middlemarch has not a very high standard, uncle,' said Rosamond, with a pretty lightness, going towards her whip, which lay at a distance. Lydgate was quick in anticipating her. He reached the whip before she did, and turned to present it to her. She bowed and looked at him. He, of course, was looking at her, and their eyes met with that peculiar meeting which is never arrived at by effort, but seems like a sudden divine clearance of haze. I think Lydgate turned a little paler than usual, but Rosamond blushed deeply, and felt a certain astonishment. After that, she was really anxious to go, and did not know what sort of stupidity her uncle was talking of when she went to shake hands with him. Yet this result, which she took to be a mutual impression, called falling in love, was just what Rosamond had contemplated beforehand. Ever since that important new arrival in Middlemarch, she had woven a little future, of which something like this scene was the necessary beginning. Strangers, whether wrecked and clinging to a raft, or duly escorted and accompanied by portmanteaus, have always had a circumstantial fascination for the virgin mind, against which native merit has urged itself in vain. And a stranger was absolutely necessary to Rosamond's social romance, which had always turned on a lover and bridegroom who was not a middle-marcher, and who had no connections at all like her own. Of late, indeed, the construction seemed to demand that he should somehow be related to a baronet. Now that she and the stranger had met, reality proved much more moving than anticipation, and Rosamond could not doubt that this was the great epoch of her life. She judged of her own symptoms as those of awakening love, and she held it still more natural that Mr. Lydgate should have fallen in love at first sight of her. These things happened so often at balls, and why not by the morning light, when the complexion showed all the better for it? Rosamond, though no older than Mary, was rather used to being fallen in love with, but she, for her part, had remained indifferent and fastidiously critical towards both fresh sprig and faded bachelor and here was Mr. Lydgate suddenly corresponding to her ideal, being altogether foreign to Middlemarch, carrying a certain air of distinction congruous with good family, and possessing connections which offered vistas of that middle-class heaven, rank. A man of talent, also, whom it would be especially delightful to enslave. In fact, a man who had touched her nature quite newly, and brought a vivid interest into her life which was better than any fancied might be, such as she was in the habit of opposing to the actual. Thus, in riding home, both the brother and the sister were preoccupied and inclined to be silent. Rosamond, whose basis for her structure had the usual airy slightness, was of remarkably detailed and realistic imagination when the foundation had once been presupposed, and before they had ridden a mile, she was far on in the costume and introductions of her wedded life, having determined on her house in Middlemarch, and foreseen the visit she would pay to her husband's high-bred relatives at a distance 
whose finished manners she could appropriate as thoroughly as she had done her school accomplishments, preparing herself thus for vaguer elevations which might ultimately come. There was nothing financial, still less sordid, in her provisions. She cared about what were considered refinements, and not about the money that was to pay for them. Fred's mind, on the other hand, was busy with an anxiety which even his ready hopefulness could not immediately quell. He saw no way of eluding Featherstone's stupid demand without incurring consequences, which he liked less even than the task of fulfilling it. His father was already out of humour with him, and would be still more so if he were the occasion of any additional coolness between his own family and the Bulstrodes. Then he himself hated having to go and speak to his uncle Bulstrode, and perhaps after drinking wine he had said many foolish things about Featherstone's property, and these had been magnified by report. Fred felt that he made a wretched figure as a fellow who bragged about expectations from a queer old miser like Featherstone, and went to beg for certificates at his bidding. But those expectations! He really had them, and he saw no agreeable alternative if he gave them up. Besides, he had lately made a debt which galled him extremely, and old Featherstone had almost bargained to pay it off. The whole affair was miserably small. His debts were small, even his expectations were not anything so very magnificent. Fred had known men to whom he would have been ashamed of confessing the smallness of his scrapes. Such ruminations naturally produced a streak of misanthropic bitterness. To be born the son of a Middlemarch manufacturer, an inevitable heir to nothing in particular while such men as Mainwaring and Vian, certainly life was a poor business, when a spirited young fellow, with a good appetite for the best of everything, had so poor an outlook. It had not occurred to Fred that the introduction of Bulstrode's name in the matter was a fiction of old Featherstone's, nor could this have made any difference to his position. He saw plainly enough that the old man wanted to exercise his power by tormenting him a little, and also probably to get some satisfaction out of seeing him on unpleasant terms with Bulstrode. Fred fancied that he saw to the bottom of his uncle Featherstone's soul, though in reality half what he saw there was no more than the reflex of his own inclinations. The difficult task of knowing another soul is not for young gentlemen, whose consciousness is chiefly made up of their own wishes. Fred's main point of debate with himself was, whether he should tell his father, or try to get through the affair without his father's knowledge. It was probably Mrs. Wall who had been talking about him and if Mary Garth had repeated Mrs. Wall's report to Rosamond, it would be sure to reach his father, who would as surely question him about it. He said to Rosamond, as they slackened their pace, "'Rosie, did Mary tell you that Mrs. Wall had said anything about me?' "'Yes, indeed, she did.' "'What?' "'That you were very unsteady.' "'Was that all?' "'I should think that was enough, Fred.' "'You are sure she said no more?' Mary mentioned nothing else. But really, Fred, I think you ought to be ashamed." "'Oh, fudge! Don't lecture me. What did Mary say about it?' "'I am not obliged to tell you. You care so very much what Mary says, and you are too rude to allow me to speak.' "'Of course I care what Mary says. She is the best girl I know.' "'I should never have thought she was a girl to fall in love with.' "'How do you know what men would fall in love with? Girls never know.' At least, Fred, let me advise you not to fall in love with her, for she says she would not marry you if you asked her." She might have waited till I did ask her. I knew it would nettle you, Fred. Not at all. She would not have said so if you had not provoked her. Before reaching home, Fred concluded that he would tell the whole affair as simply as possible to his father, who might perhaps take on himself the unpleasant business of speaking to Bulstrode. End of chapter 12 End of Book One This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. George Eliot, Middlemarch, Book Two, Old and Young, Chapter Thirteen. First gent, how class your man as better than the most, or seeming better, worse beneath that cloak, as saint or knave, pilgrim or hypocrite? Second gent, nay, tell me how you class your wealth of books, the drifted relics of all time, 
as well sort them at once by size and livery vellum tall copies and the common calf will hardly cover more diversity than all your labels cunningly devised to class your unread authors in consequence of what he had heard from fred mr vincey determined to speak with mr bulstrode in his private room at the bank at half-past one when he was usually free from other callers but a visitor had come in at one o'clock and mr bulstrode had so much to say to him that there was little chance of the interview being over in half an hour the banker's speech was fluent but it was also copious and he used up an appreciable amount of time in brief meditative pauses do not imagine his sickly aspect to have been of the yellow black-haired sort he had a pale blond skin, thin grey besprinkled brown hair, light grey eyes, and a large forehead. Loud men called his subdued tone an undertone, and sometimes implied that it was inconsistent with openness, though there seems to be no reason why a loud man should not be given to concealment of anything except his own voice, unless it can be shown that Holy Writ has placed the seat of candour in the lungs. Mr. Bulstrode had also a deferential bending attitude in listening, and an apparently fixed attentiveness in his eyes, which made those persons who thought themselves worth hearing infer that he was seeking the utmost improvement from their discourse. Others, who expected to make no great figure, disliked this kind of moral lantern turned on them. If you are not proud of your cellar, there is no thrill of satisfaction in seeing your guest hold up his wine-glass to the light and look judicial. Such joys are reserved for conscious merit. Hence Mr. Bulstrode's close attention was not agreeable to the publicans and sinners in Middlemarch. It was attributed by some to his being a Pharisee, and by others to his being evangelical. Less superficial reasoners among them wished to know who his father and grandfather were, observing that five-and-twenty years ago nobody had ever heard of a Bulstrode in Middlemarch. To his present visitor, Lydgate, the scrutinizing look was a matter of indifference. He simply formed an unfavorable opinion of the banker's constitution, and concluded that he had an eager inward life, with little enjoyment of tangible things. "'I shall be exceedingly obliged if you will look in on me here occasionally, Mr. Lydgate,' the banker observed, after a brief pause, "'if, as I dare to hope, I have the privilege of finding you a valuable coadjutor in the interesting matter of hospital management. There will be many questions which we shall need to discuss in private. As to the new hospital, which is nearly finished, I shall consider what you have said about the advantages of the special destination for fevers.' The decision will rest with me, for though Lord Medlicott has given the land and timber for the building, he is not disposed to give his personal attention to the object. There are few things better worth the pains in a provincial town like this, said Lydgate. A fine fever hospital, in addition to the old infirmary, might be the nucleus of a medical school here, when once we get our medical reforms, and what would do more for medical education than the spread of such schools over the country? a born provincial man who has a grain of public spirit as well as a few ideas should do what he can to resist the rush of everything that is a little better than common towards london any valid professional aims may often find a freer if not a richer field in the provinces one of Lydgate's gifts was a voice habitually deep and sonorous yet capable of becoming very low and gentle at the right moment about his ordinary bearing there was a certain fling a fearless expectation of success, a confidence in his own powers, and integrity much fortified by contempt for pretty obstacles or seductions of which he had no experience. But this proud openness was made lovable by an expression of unaffected goodwill. Mr. Bulstrode perhaps liked him the better for the difference between them in pitch and manners. He certainly liked him the better, as Rosamond did, for being a stranger in Middlemarch. One can begin so many things with a new person, even begin to be a better man. "'I shall rejoice to furnish your seal with fuller opportunities,' Mr. Bulstrode answered. "'I mean, by confining to you the superintendence of my new hospital, should a mature knowledge favour that issue. 
for i am determined that so great an object shall not be shackled by our two physicians indeed i am encouraged to consider your advent in this town as a gracious indication that a more manifest blessing is now to be awarded to my efforts which have hitherto been much withstood with regard to the old infirmary we have gained the initial point i mean your election and now i hope you will not shrink from incurring a certain amount of jealousy and dislike from your professional brethren by presenting yourself as a reformer i will not profess bravery said lydgate smiling but i acknowledge a good deal of pleasure in fighting and i should not care for my profession if i did not believe that better methods were to be found and enforced there as well as everywhere else the standard of that profession is low in middlemarch my dear sir said the banker i mean in knowledge and skill not in social status for our medical men are most of them connected with respectable townspeople here my own imperfect health has induced me to give some attention to those palliative resources which the divine mercy has placed within our reach i have consulted eminent men in the metropolis and i am painfully aware of the backwardness under which medical treatment labours in our provincial districts yes with our present medical rules and education one must be satisfied now and then to meet with a fair practitioner as to the higher questions which determine the starting point of a diagnosis as to the philosophy of medial evidence any glimmering of these can only come from a scientific culture of which country practitioners have usually no more notion than the man in the moon mr bulstrode bending and looking intently found the form which lydgate had given to his agreement not quite suited to his comprehension under such circumstances a judicious man changes the topic and enters on ground where his own gifts may be more useful i am aware he said that the peculiar bias of medical ability is towards material means nevertheless mr lydgate i hope we shall not vary in sentiment as to a measure in which you are not likely to be actively concerned but in which your sympathetic concurrence may be an aid to me you recognize i hope the existence of spiritual interests in your patients certainly i do but those words are apt to cover different meanings to different minds precisely and on such subjects wrong teaching is as fatal as no teaching now a point which i have much at heart to secure is a new regulation as to clerical attendance at the old infirmary the building stands in mr fairbrother's parish you know mr fairbrother i have seen him he gave me his vote i must call to thank him he seems a very bright pleasant little fellow and i understand he is a naturalist mr fairbrother my dear sir is a man deeply painful to contemplate i suppose there is not a clergyman in this country who has greater talents mr bulstrode paused and looked meditative i have not yet been pained by finding any excessive talent in middlemarch said lydgate bluntly what i desire mr bulstrode continued looking still more serious is that mr fairbrother's attendance at the hospital should be superseded by the appointment of a chaplain of mr tyke in fact and that no other spiritual aid should be called in as a medial man i could have no opinion on such point unless i knew mr tyke and even then i should require to know the cases in which he was applied lydgate smiled but he was bent on being circumspect of course you cannot enter fully into the merits of this measure at present but um, here mr bulstrode began to speak with a more chiselled emphasis the subject is likely to be referred to the medical board of the infirmary and what i trust i may ask of you is that in virtue of the cooperation between us which i now look forward to you will not so far as you are concerned be influenced by my opponents in this matter i hope i shall have nothing to do with clerical disputes said lydgate the path i have chosen is to work well in my own profession my responsibility mr lydgate is of a broader kind with me indeed this question is one of sacred accountableness whereas with my opponents i have good reason to say that it is an occasion for gratifying a spirit of worldly opposition but i shall not therefore drop one jota of my convictions or cease to identify myself with the truth which an evil generation hates i have devoted myself to this object of hospital improvement but i will boldly confess to you mr lydgate that i should have no interest in hospitals if i believed that nothing more was concerned therein than the cure of mortal diseases 
I have another ground of action, and in the face of persecution I will not conceal it." Mr. Bulstrode's voice had become a loud and agitated whisper as he said the last words. "'There we certainly differ,' said Lydgate, but he was not sorry that the door was now opened and Mr. Vincey was announced. That florid, sociable personage was become more interesting to him since he had seen Rosamond. Not that, like her, he had been weaving any future in which their lots were united, but a man naturally remembers a charming girl with pleasure, and is willing to dine where he may see her again. Before he took leave, Mr. Winsey had given that invitation which he had been in no hurry about, for Rosamond at breakfast had mentioned that she thought her uncle Featherstone had taken the new doctor into great favour. Mr. Bulstrode alone with his brother-in-law poured himself out a glass of water and opened a sandwich-box. "'I cannot persuade you to adopt my regimen, Winsey.' "'No, no, I have no opinion of that system. Life wants padding,' said Mr. Vincey unable to omit his portable theory. However, he went on, accenting the word, as if to dismiss all irrelevance. What I came here to talk about was a little affair of my young scapegrace Fred's. That is a subject on which you and I are likely to take quite as different views as on diet, Vincey. I hope not this time. Mr. Vincey was resolved to be good-humoured. The fact is, it's about a whim of old Featherstone's, somebody has been cooking up a story out of spite and telling it to the old man to try to set him against fred he is very fond of fred and is likely to do something handsome for him indeed he has as good as told fred that he means to leave him his land and that makes other people jealous vincey i must repeat that you will not get any concurrence from me as to the course you have pursued with your eldest son it was entirely from worldly vanity that you destined him for the church with a family of three sons and four daughters you were not warranted in devoting money to an expensive education which has succeeded in nothing but in giving him extravagant idle habits you are now reaping the consequences to point out other people's errors was a duty that mr bulstrode rarely shrank from but mr vincey was not equally prepared to be patient when a man has the immediate prospect of being mayor and is ready in the interests of commerce to take up a firm attitude on politics generally he has naturally a sense of his importance to the framework of things which seems to throw questions of private conduct into the background and this particular reproof irritated him more than any other it was eminently superfluous to him to be told that he was reaping the consequences but he felt his neck under balstrow's yoke and though he usually enjoyed kicking he was anxious to refrain from that relief as to that bulstrode it's no use going back i'm not one of your pattern men and i don't pretend to be i couldn't foresee everything in the trade there wasn't a finer business in middlemarch than ours and the lad was clever my poor brother was in the church and would have done well had got preferment already but that stomach fever took him off else he might have been a dean by this time i think i was justified in what i tried to do for fred if you come to religion it seems to me a man shouldn't want to carve out his meat to an ounce beforehand one must trust a little to providence and be generous it's a good british feeling to try and raise your family a little in my opinion it's a father's duty to give his sons a fine chance I don't wish to act otherwise than as your best friend, Vincey, when I say that what you have been uttering just now is one mass of worldliness and inconsistent folly. Very well, said Mr. Vincey, kicking in spite of resolutions. I never profess to be anything but worldly, and, what's more, I don't see anybody else who's not worldly. I suppose you don't conduct business on what you call unworldly principles. The only difference I see is that one worldliness is a little bit honester than another. This kind of discussion is unfruitful, Vincey, said Mr. Bulstrode, who, finishing his sandwich, had thrown himself back in his chair and shaded his eyes as if weary. You had some more particular business. Yes, yes, the long and short of it is somebody has told old Featherstone, giving you as the authority, that Fred has been borrowing or trying to borrow money on prospect of his land. Of course, you never said any such nonsense, but the old fellow will insist on it that Fred should bring him a denial in your handwriting. That is just a bit of note saying you don't believe a word of such stuff. 
either of his having borrowed or tried to borrow in such a fool's way. I suppose you can have no objection to that? Pardon me, I have an objection. I am by no means sure that your son, in his recklessness and ignorance, I will use no severer word, has not tried to raise money by holding out his future prospects, or even that someone may not have been foolish enough to supply him on so vague a presumption. There is plenty of such lax money-lending as of other folly in the world. But Fred gives me his honour that he has never borrowed money on the pretence of any understanding about his uncle's land. He is not a liar. I don't want to make him better than he is. I have blown him up well. Nobody can say I wink at what he does. But he is not a liar. And I should have thought, but I may be wrong, that there was no religion to hinder a man from believing the best of a young fellow, when you don't know worse. It seems to me it would be a poor sort of religion to put a spoke in his wheel by refusing to say you don't believe such harm of him, as you've got no good reason to believe. I am not at all sure that I should be befriending your son by smoothing his way to the future possession of Featherstone's property. I cannot regard wealth as a blessing to those who use it simply as a harvest for this world. You do not like to hear these things, Vincy, but on this occasion I feel called upon to tell you that I have no motive for furthering such a disposition of property as that which you refer to. I do not shrink from saying that it will not tend to your son's eternal welfare or to the glory of God. Why then should you expect me to pen this kind of affidavit, which has no object but to keep up a foolish partiality and secure a foolish bequest? If you mean to hinder everybody from having money but saints and evangelists, you must give up some profitable partnerships, that's all I can say. Mr. Vincey burst out very bluntly. It may be for the glory of God, but it is not for the glory of the Middlemarch trade, that Plymdale's house uses those blue and green dyes it gets from the brassing manufactory. They rot the silk, that's all I know about it. Perhaps if other people knew so much of the profit went to the glory of God, they might like it better, but I don't mind so much about that. I could get up a pretty row if I chose. Mr. Balstrud paused a little before he answered. "'You pain me very much by speaking in this way, Vincy. I do not expect you to understand my grounds of action. It is not an easy thing even to thread a path for principles in the intricacies of the world, still less to make the thread clear for the careless and the scoffing. You must remember, if you please, that I stretch my tolerance towards you as my wife's brother.' and that it little becomes you to complain of me as withholding material help towards a worldly position for your family. I must remind you that it is not your own prudence or judgment that has enabled you to keep your place in the trade. Very likely not. But you have been no loser by my trade yet, said Mr. Vincey, thoroughly nettled, a result which was seldom much retarded by previous resolutions. And when you married Harriet, I don't see how you could expect that our families should not hang by the same nail. If you've changed your mind and want my family to come down in the world, you'd better say so. I've never changed. I'm a plain churchman now, just as I used to be before doctrines came up. I take the world as I find it, in trade and everything else. I'm content to be no worse than my neighbours. But if you want us to come down in the world, say so. I shall know better what to do then. Of this letter to about your son? Well, whether or not I consider it very unhandsome of you to refuse it, such doings may be lined with religion, but outside they have a nasty dog in the manger look. You might as well slander Fred. It comes pretty near to it when you refuse to say you didn't set a slander going. It's this sort of thing. This tyrannical spirit, wanting to play bishop and banker everywhere, it's this sort of thing makes a man's name stink. Vincy, if you insist on quarrelling with me, it will be exceedingly painful to Harriet as well as myself, said Mr. Bulstrode, with a trifle more eagerness and paleness than usual. I don't want to quarrel. It's for my interest, and perhaps for yours too, that we should be friends. I bear you no grudge. I think no worse of you than I do of other people. A man who half starves himself and goes the length in family prayers, and so on, that you do, believes in his religion, whatever it may be, you could turn over your capital just as fast with cursing and swearing. Plenty of fellows do. You like to be master. There's no denying that. You must be first chop in heaven, else you won't like it much. 
but you're my sister's husband and we ought to stick together and if i know harriet she'll consider it your fault if we quarrel because you strain at a gnat in this way and refuse to do fred a good turn and i don't mean to say i shall bear it well i consider it unhandsome mr vincey rose began to button his great coat and looked steadily at his brother-in-law meaning to imply a demand for a decisive answer this was not the first time that Mr. Bulstrode had begun by admonishing Mr. Vincey, and had ended by seeing a very unsatisfactory reflection of himself in the coarse, unflattering mirror which that manufacturer's mind presented to the subtler lights and shadows of his fellow-men. And perhaps his experience ought to have warned him how the scene would end, but a full-fed fountain will be generous with its waters even in the rain, when they are worse than youthless and a fine fount of admonition is apt to be equally irrepressible. It was not in Mr. Balstrow's nature to comply directly in consequence of uncomfortable suggestions. Before changing his course, he always needed to shape his motives and bring them into accordance with his habitual standard. He said at last, "'I will reflect a little, Vincy. I will mention the subject to Harriet. I shall probably send you a letter.' "'Very well.' as soon as you can please i hope it will all be settled before i see you tomorrow end of chapter 13 of middlemarch by george elliot read by lars rolander This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter 14. Follows here the strict receipt for that sauce to dainty meat, named idleness which many eat by preference and call it sweet first watch for morsels like a hound mix well with buffets stir them round with good thick oil of flatteries and froth with me self-lauding lies sir warm the vessels you must choose to keep it in our dead men's shoes mr balstrow's consultation of harriet seemed to have had the effect desired by mr vincey for early the next morning a letter came which Fred could carry to Mr. Featherstone as the required testimony. The old gentleman was staying in bed on account of the cold weather, and as Mary Garth was not to be seen in the sitting-room, Fred went upstairs immediately and presented the letter to his uncle, who, propped up comfortably on the bedrest, was not less able than usual to enjoy his consciousness of wisdom in distrusting and frustrating mankind. He put on the spectacles to read the letter, pursuing up his lips and drawing down their corners. "'Under the circumstances I will not decline to state my conviction—' "'Tcha! What fine words the fellow puts! He's as fine as an auctioneer. That your son Frederick has not obtained any advance of money on bequests promised by Mr. Featherstone—' "'Promised! Who said I had ever promised? I promise nothing. I shall make codicils as long as I like, and that, considering the nature of such proceeding, it is unreasonable to presume that a young man of sense and character would attempt it. Ah, but the gentleman doesn't say you are a young man of sense and character. Mark you that, sir.' As to my own concern with any report of such nature, I distinctly affirm that I never made any statement to the effect that your son had borrowed money on any property that might accrue to him on Mr. Featherstone's demise. Bless my heart! Property accrue demise! Lawyer Standish is nothing to him. He couldn't speak finer if he wanted to borrow. Well, Mr. Featherstone here looked over his spectacles at Fred, while he handed back the letter to him, with a contemptuous gesture. "'You don't suppose I believe a thing because Bulstrode writes it out fine, eh?' Fred collared. "'You wish to have the letter, sir. I should think it very likely that Mr. Bulstrode's denials is as good as the authority which told you what he denies.' every bit i never said i believed either one or the other now what do you expect said mr featherstone curtly keeping on his spectacles but withdrawing his hands under his wraps 
"'I expect nothing, sir,' Fred with difficulty restrained himself from venting his irritation. "'I came to bring you the letter. If you like, I will bid you good morning. Not yet, not yet. Ring the bell. I want Missy to come.' It was a servant who came in answer to the bell. "'Tell Missy to come.' said mr featherstone impatiently what business had she to go away he spoke in the same tone when mary came why couldn't you sit still here till i told you to go want my waistcoat now i told you always to put it on the bed mary's eyes looked rather red as if she had been crying it was clear that mr featherstone was in one of his most snappish humours this morning and though fred had now the prospect of receiving the much-needed present of money he would have preferred being free to turn round on the old tyrant and tell him that mary garth was too good to be at his beck though fred had risen as she entered the room she had barely noticed him and looked as if her nerves were quivering with the expectation that something would be thrown at her but she never had anything worse than words to dread when she went to reach the waistcoat from a peg, Fred went up to her side and said, "'Allow me.' "'Let it alone. You bring it, Missy, and lay it down here,' said Mr. Featherstone. "'Now you go away again till I call you,' he added, when the waistcoat was laid down by him. It was usual with him to season his pleasure, in showing favour to one person by being especially disagreeable to another, and Mary was always at hand to furnish the condiment." When his own relatives came, she was treated better. Slowly he took out a bunch of keys from the waistcoat pocket, and slowly he drew forth a tin box which was under the bedcloth. "'You expect I'm going to give you a little fortune, eh?' he said, looking above his spectacles, and pausing in the act of opening the lid. "'Not at all, sir. You were good enough to speak of making me present the other day, else, of course, I should not have thought of the matter.' But Fred was of a hopeful disposition, and a vision had presented itself of a sum just large enough to deliver him from a certain anxiety. When Fred got into debt, it always seemed to him highly probable that something or other, he did not necessarily conceive what, would come to pass, enabling him to pay in due time. And now that the providential occurrence was apparently close at hand, it would have been sheer absurdity to think that the supply would be short of the need as absurd as a faith that believed in half a miracle for want of strength to believe in a whole one the deep-veined hands fingered many banknotes one after the other laying them down flat again while fred leaned back in his chair scorning to look eager he held himself to be a gentleman at heart and did not like courting an old fellow for his money at last mr featherstone eyed him again over his spectacles and presented him with a little sheaf of notes fred could see distinctly that there were but five, as the less significant edges gaped towards him, but then each might mean fifty pounds. He took them, saying, I am uh, very much obliged to you, sir, and was going to roll them up without seeming to think of their value. But this did not suit Mr. Featherstone, who was eyeing him intently. Come, don't you think it worth your while to count them? You take money like a lord. I suppose you lose it like one. I thought I was not to look a gift horse in the mouth, sir, but I shall be very happy to count them. Fred was not so happy, however, after he had counted them, for they actually presented the absurdity of being less than his hopefulness had decided that they must be. What can the fitness of things mean, if not their fitness to a man's expectations? Failing this absurdity, an atheism gaped behind him. The collapse for Fred was severe when he found that he held no more than five twenties, and his share in the higher education of his country did not seem to help him. Nevertheless, he said, with rapid changes in his fairy complexion, "'It is very handsome of you, sir.' "'I should think it is,' said Mr. Featherstone, locking his box and replacing it, then taking off his spectacles deliberately, and at length, as if his inward meditation had more deeply convinced him, repeating, "'I should think it handsome.' "'I assure you, sir, I am very grateful,' said Fred, who had had time to recover his cheerful air. "'So you ought to be. You want to cut a figure in the world, and I reckon Peter Featherstone is the only one you've got to trust to.' Here the old man's eyes gleamed with a curiously mingled satisfaction in the consciousness that this smart young fellow relied upon him and that the smart young fellow was rather a fool for doing so. 
yes indeed i was not born to very splendid chances few men have been more cramped than i have been said fred with some sense of surprise at his own virtue considering how hardly he was dealt with it really seems a little too bad to have to ride a broken winded hunter and see men who are not half such good judges as yourself able to throw away any amount of money on buying bad bargains well you can buy yourself a fine hunter now eighty pound is enough for that i reckon and you'll have twenty pound over to get yourself out of any little scrape said mr featherstone chuckling slightly you are very good sir said fred with a fine sense of contrast between the words and his feeling ay rather a better uncle than your fine uncle balstrud you won't get much out of his speculations i think he's got a pretty strong string round your father's leg by what i hear eh my father never tells me anything about his affairs sir well he shows some sense there but other people find em out without his telling he'll never have much to leave you he'll most like die without will he's the sort of man to do it let em make him mayor of middlemarch as much as they like but you won't get much by his dying without a will though you are the eldest son fred thought that mr featherstone had never been so disagreeable before true he had never before given him quite so much money at once shall i destroy this letter of mr balstrud's sir said fred rising with the letter as if he would put it in the fire ay ay i don't want it it's worth no money to me fred carried the letter to the fire and thrust the poker through it with much zest he longed to get out of the room but he was a little ashamed before his inner self as well as before his uncle to run away immediately after pocketing the money Presently the farm bailiff came up to give his master a report, and Fred, to his unspeakable relief, was dismissed with the injunction to come again soon. He had longed not only to be set free from his uncle, but also to find Mary Garth. She was now in her usual place by the fire, with sewing in her hands and a book open on the little table by her side. Her eyelids had lost some of their redness now, and she had her usual air of self-command am i wanted upstairs she said half rising as fred entered no i'm only dismissed because simmons is gone up mary sat down again and resumed her work she was certainly treating him with more indifference than usual she did not know how affectionately indignant he had felt on her behalf upstairs may i stay here a little mary or shall i bore you pray sit down said mary you will not be so heavy a bore as mr john wall who was here yesterday and he sat down without asking my leave poor fellow i think he is in love with you i am not aware of it and to me it is one of the most odious things in a girl's life that there must always be some supposition of falling in love coming between her and any man who is kind to her and to whom she is grateful i should have thought that i at least might have been saved from all that i have no ground for the nonsensical vanity of fancying everybody who comes near me is in love with me mary did not mean to betray any feeling but in spite of herself she ended in a tremulous tone of vexation confound john wall i did not mean to make you angry i didn't know you had any reason for being grateful to me i forgot what a great service you think it if any one snuffs a candle for you fred also had his pride and was not going to show that he knew what had called forth this outburst of mary's oh i'm not angry except with the ways of the world i do like to be spoken to as if i had common sense i really often feel that if i could understand a little more than i ever hear even from young gentlemen who have been to college mary had recovered and she spoke with a suppressed stripling undercurrent of laughter pleasant to hear i don't care how merry you are at my expense this morning said fred i thought you looked so sad when you came upstairs it's a shame you should stay here to be bullied in that way oh i have an easy life by comparison i have tried being a teacher and i am not fit for that my mind is too fond of wandering on its own way i think any hardship is better than pretending to do what one is paid for and never really doing it everything here i can do as well as any one else could perhaps better than some 
Rosie, for example, though she's just the sort of beautiful creature that is imprisoned with augurs in fairy tales. Rosie? cried Fred in a tone of profound brotherly scepticism. Come, Fred, said Mary emphatically. You have no right to be so critical. Do you mean anything particular just now? No, I mean something general, always. Oh, that I'm idle and extravagant. Well, I'm not fit to be a poor man. I should not have made a bad fellow if I had been rich. You would have done your duty in that state of life to which it has not pleased God to call you, said Mary, laughing. Well, I couldn't do my duty as a clergyman any more than you could do yours as a governess. You ought to have a little fellow feeling in there, Mary. I never said you ought to be a clergyman. There are other sorts of work. It seems to me very miserable not to resolve on some course and act accordingly. So I could if— Fred broke off and stood up, leaning against the mantelpiece. If you were sure you should not have a fortune? I did not say that. You want to quarrel with me. It's too bad of you to be guided by what other people say about me. How can I want to quarrel with you? I should be quarrelling with all my new books, said Mary, lifting the volume on the table. However naughty you may be to other people, you are good to me, because I like you better than anyone else. But I know you despise me. Yes, I do a little, said Mary, nodding with a smile. You would admire a stupendous fellow who would have wise opinions about everything. Yes, I should, Mary was suing swiftly, and seemed provokingly mistress of the situation. When a conversation had taken a wrong turn for us, we only get farther and farther into the swamp of awkwardness. This was what Fred Vincey felt. I suppose a woman is never in love with anyone she has always known, ever since she can remember, as a man often is. It is always some new fellow who strikes a girl. Let me see, said Mary, the corners of her mouth curling archly. I must go back on my experience. There is Juliet. She seems an example of what you say. But then Ophelia had probably known Hamlet a long while, and Brenda Troy she had known Mordant Merton ever since they were children. But then he seems to have been an estimable young man. And Minna was still more deeply in love with Cleveland, who was a stranger. Waverley was new to Flora Mucklevore, but then she did not fall in love with him. And there are Olivia and Sophia Primrose and Corinne. They may be said to have fallen in love with new men. Altogether, my experience is rather mixed. Mary looked up with some roguishness at Fred, and that look of hers was dear to him, though the eyes were nothing more than clear windows where observation sat laughingly. He was certainly an affectionate fellow, and, as he had grown from boy to man, he had grown in love with his old playmate, notwithstanding that share in the higher education of the country which had exalted his views of rank and income when a man is not loved it is no use for him to say that he could be a better fellow could do anything i mean if he were sure of being loved in return not of the least use in the world for him to say he could be better might could would they are contemptible auxiliaries I don't see how a man is to be good for much unless he has some one woman to love him dearly. I think the goodness should come before he expects that. You know better, Mary. Women don't love men for their goodness. Perhaps not, but if they love them, they never think them bad. It is hardly fair to say I am bad. I said nothing at all about you. I never shall be good for anything, Mary, if you will not say that you love me, if you will not promise to marry me, I mean, when I am able to marry. If I did love you, I would not marry you. I would certainly not promise ever to marry you. I think that is quite wicked, Mary. If you love me, you ought to promise to marry me. On the contrary, I think it would be wicked in me to marry you even if I did love you. You mean, just as I am, without any means of maintaining a wife? Of course, I am but three-and-twenty. In that last point you will alter. But I am not sure of any other alteration. My father says an idle man ought not to exist, much less be married. Then I am to blow my brains out? No, on the whole I should think you would do better to pass your examination. I've heard Mr. Fairbrother say it's disgracefully easy. That is all very fine. Anything is easy to him. 
not that cleverness has anything to do with it. I am ten times cleverer than many men who pass. Dear me, said Mary, unable to repress her sarcasm, that accounts for the curates like Mr. Krause. Divide your cleverness by ten, and the quotient, dear me, is able to take a gree. But that only shows you are ten times more idle than the others. Well, if I did pass, you would not want me to go into the church? That is not the question, what I want you to do. You have a conscience of your own, I suppose. There, there is Mr. Lydgate. I must go and tell my uncle. Mary, said Fred, seizing her hand as she rose, if you will not give me some encouragement, I shall get worse instead of better. I will not give you any encouragement, said Mary, reddening. Your friends would dislike it, and so would mine. My father would think it a disgrace to me if I accepted a man who got into debt and would not work. Fred was stung and released her hand. She walked to the door, but there she turned and said, Fred, you have always been so good, so generous to me. I am not ungrateful, but never speak to me in that way again. Very well, said Fred sulkily, taking up his hat and whip. His complexion showed patches of pale pink and dead white. Like many a plucked idle young gentleman, he was thoroughly in love and with a plain girl who had no money. But having Mr. Featherstone's land in the background, and a persuasion that, let Mary say what she would, she really did care for him, Fred was not utterly in despair. When he got home he gave four of the twenties to his mother, asking her to keep them for him. I don't want to spend that money, mother. I want it to pay a debt with, so keep it safe from my fingers. Bless you, my dear, said Mrs. Vincey. She doted on her eldest son and her youngest girl, a child of six, whom others thought her two naughtiest children. The mother's eyes are not always deceived in their partiality. She at least can best judge who is the tender, filial-hearted child, and Fred was certainly very fond of his mother. Perhaps it was his fondness for another person also that made him particularly anxious to take some security against his own liability to spend the hundred pounds, for the creditor to whom he owed a hundred and sixty held a firmer security in the shape of a bill signed by Mary's father. End of chapter 14 of Middlemarch by George Eliot Read by Lars Rolander This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. George Eliot, Middlemarch, Chapter 15 Black eyes you've left, you say. Blue eyes fail to draw you. Yet you see more rapt today than of old we saw you. Oh, I track the fairest fair through new haunts of pleasure. Footprints here and echoes there guide me to my treasure. Lo, she turns immortal youth wrought to mortal stature fresh as starlight's aged truth many named nature a great historian as he insisted on calling himself who had the happiness to be dead a hundred and twenty years ago and so to take his place among the colossi whose huge legs our living pettiness is observed to walk under glories in his copious remarks and digressions as the least imitable part of his work and especially in those initial chapters to the successive books of his history, where he seems to bring his armchair to the proscenium and chat with us in all the lusty ease of his fine English. But Fielding lived when the days were longer, for time, like money, is measured by our needs. When summer afternoons were spacious and the clock ticked slowly, 
in the winter evenings we belated historians must not linger after his example and if we did so it is probable that our chat would be thin and eager as if delivered from a camp-stool in a parrot house i at least have so much to do in unravelling certain human lots and seeing how they were woven and interwoven that all the light i can command must be concentrated on this particular web and not dispersed over that tempting range of relevances called the universe at present i have to make the new settler lydgate better known to any one interested in him than he could possibly be even to those who had seen the most of him since his arrival in middlemarch for surely all must admit that a man may be puffed and belauded envied ridiculed counted upon as a tool and fallen in love with or at least selected as a future husband and yet remain virtually unknown known merely as a cluster of signs for his neighbour's false suppositions there was a general impression however that lydgate was not altogether a common country doctor and in middlemarch at that time such an impression was significant of great things being expected from him for everybody's family doctor was remarkably clever and was understood to have immeasurable skill in the management and training of the most skittish of vicious diseases the evidence of his cleverness was of the higher intuitive order lying in his lady patient's immovable conviction and was unassailable by any objection except that their intuitions were opposed by others equally strong each lady who saw medical truth in wrench and the strengthening treatment regarding toller and the lowering system as medical perdition for the heroic times of copious bleeding and blistering had not yet departed still less the times of thorough-going theory when disease in general was called by some bad name and treated accordingly without shilly-shally as if for example it were to be called insurrection which must not be fired on with blank cartridge but have its blood drawn at once the strengtheners and the lowering were all clever men in somebody's opinion which is really as much as can be said for any living talents nobody's imagination had gone so far as to conjecture that mr lydgate could know as much as dr sprague or dr minchin the two physicians who alone could offer any hope when danger was extreme and when the smallest hope was worth a guinea still i repeat there was a general impression that lydgate was something rather more uncommon than any general practitioner in middlemarch and this was true he was but seven-and-twenty an age at which many men are not quite common at which they are hopeful of achievement resolute in avoidance thinking that mammon shall never put a bit in their mouths and get astride their backs but rather that mammon if they have anything to do with him shall draw their chariot he had been left an orphan when he was fresh from public school his father a military man had made but little provision for three children and when the boy tertius asked to have a medical education it seemed easier to his guardians to grant his request by apprenticing him to a country practitioner than to make any objections on the score of family dignity he was one of the rarer lads who early get a decided bent and make up their minds that there is something particular in life which they would like to do for its own sake and not because their fathers did it most of us who turn to any subject with love remember some morning or evening hour when we got on a high stool to reach down an untried volume or sat with parted lips listening to a new talker or for very lack of books began to listen to the voices within as the first traceable beginning of our love something of that sort happened to lydgate he was a quick fellow and when hot from play would toss himself in a corner and in five minutes be deep in any sort of book that he could lay his hands on if it were rasselas or gulliver so much the better but bailey's dictionary would do or the bible with the apocrypha in it something he must read when he was not riding the pony or running and hunting or listening to the talk of men and this was true of him at ten years of age he had then read through chrysal or the adventures of a guinea which was neither milk for babes nor any chalky mixture meant to pass for milk and it had already occurred to him that books were stuff and that life was stupid 
His school studies had not much modified that opinion, for though he did his classics and mathematics, he was not preeminent in them. It was said of him that Lydgate could do anything he liked, but he had certainly not yet liked to do anything remarkable. He was a vigorous animal with a ready understanding, but no spark had yet kindled in him an intellectual passion. Knowledge seemed to him a very superficial affair, easily mastered, judging from the conversation of his elders. He had apparently got already more than was necessary for mature life. Probably this was not an exceptional result of expensive teaching at that period of short-waisted coats and other fashions which have not yet recurred. But one vacation, a wet day, sent him to the small home library to hunt once more for a book which might have some freshness for him, in vain, unless, indeed, he took down a dusty row of volumes with grey paperbacks and dingy labels, the volumes of an old cyclopedia which he had never disturbed. It would at least be a novelty to disturb them. They were on the highest shelf, and he stood on a chair to get them down. But he opened the volume which he first took from the shelf. Somehow one is apt to read in a makeshift attitude, just where it might seem inconvenient to do so. The page he opened on was under the head of anatomy, and the first passage that drew his eyes was on the valves of the heart. He was not much acquainted with valves or of any sort, but he knew that the valva were folding doors, and through this crevice came a sudden light startling him with his first vivid notion of finely adjusted mechanism in the human frame. A liberal education had, of course, left him free to read the indecent passages in the school classics, but beyond a general sense of secrecy and obscenity in connection with his internal structure, had left his imagination quite unbiased so that for anything he knew his brains lay in small bags at his temples and he had no more thought of representing to himself how his blood circulated than how paper served instead of gold but the moment of occasion had come and before he got down from his chair the world was made new to him by presentiment of endless processes filling the vast spaces planked out of his sight by that wordy ignorance which he had supposed to be knowledge from that hour Lydgate felt the growth of an intellectual passion. We are not afraid of telling over and over again how a man comes to fall in love with a woman and be wedded to her, or else be fatally parted from her. It is due to excess of poetry or of stupidity that we are never weary of describing what King James called a woman's mactum and her fairness, never weary of listening for the twanging of the old troubadour strings, and are comparatively uninterested in that other kind of mactum and fairness, which must be wooed with industrious thought and patient renunciation of small desires. In the story of this passion, too, the development varies. Sometimes it is the glorious marriage, sometimes frustration and final parting, and not seldom the catastrophe is bound up with the other passion sung by the troubadours. For in the multitude of middle-aged men who go about their vocations in a daily course determined for them much in the same way as the tie of their cravats, there is always a good number who once meant to shape their own deeds and alter the world a little. The story of their coming to be shapen, after the average and fit to be packed by the cross, is hardly ever told, even in their consciousness for perhaps their ardour in generous unpaid toil cooled as imperceptibly as the ardour of other youthful loves till one day their earlier self walked like a ghost in its old home and made the new furniture ghastly nothing in the world more subtle than the process of their gradual change in the beginning they inhaled it unknowingly you and I may have sent some of our breaths towards infecting them when we uttered our conforming falsities or drew our silly conclusions, or perhaps it came with the vibrations from a woman's glance. Lydgate did not mean to be one of those failures, and there was the better hope of him, because his scientific interest soon took the form of a professional enthusiasm. He had a youthful belief in his bread-winning work not to be stifled by that initiation in makeshift called his prentice days, 
and he carried to his studies in london edinburgh and paris the conviction that the medical profession as it might be was the finest in the world presenting the most perfect interchange between science and art offering the most direct alliance between intellectual conquest and the social good lydgate's nature demanded this combination he was an emotional creature with a flesh and blood sense of fellowship which withstood all the abstractions of special study he cared not only for cases but for john and elizabeth especially elizabeth there was another attraction in his profession it wanted reform and gave a man an opportunity for some indignant resolve to reject its venal decorations and other humbug and to be the possessor of genuine though undemanded qualifications he went to study in paris with the determination that when he provincial home again he would be settled in some provincial town as a general practitioner and resist the irrational severance between medical and surgical knowledge in the interest of his own scientific pursuits as well as of all the general advance he would keep away from the range of london intrigues jealousies and social truckling and win celebrity however slowly as jenner had done by the independent value of his work for it must be remembered that this was a dark period and in spite of venerable colleges which used great efforts to secure purity of knowledge by making it scarce and to exclude error by a rigid exclusiveness in relation to fees and appointments it happened that very ignorant young gentlemen were promoted in town and many more got a legal right to practice over large areas in the country also the high standard held up to the public mind by the college of which which gave its peculiar sanction to the expensive and highly rarefied medical instruction obtained by graduates of oxford and cambridge did not hinder quackery from having an excellent time of it for since professional practice chiefly consisted in giving a great many drugs the public inferred that it might be better off with more drugs still if they could only be got cheaply and hence swallowed large cubic measures of physic prescribed by unscrupulous ignorance which had taken no degrees considering the statistics had not yet embraced a calculation as to the number of ignorant or counting doctors which absolutely must exist in the teeth of all changes it seemed to lydgate that a change in the units was the most direct mode of changing the numbers he meant to be unit who would make a certain amount of difference towards that spreading change which would one day tell appreciably upon the averages and in the meantime have the pleasure of making an advantageous difference to the viscera of his own patients but he did not simply aim at a more genuine kind of practice than was common he was ambitious of a wider effect he was fired with the possibility that he might work out the proof of an anatomical conception and make a link in the chain of discovery does it seem incongruous to you that a middlemarch surgeon should dream of himself as a discoverer most of us indeed know little of the great originators until they have been lifted up among the constellations and already rule our fates that herschel for example who broke the barriers of the heavens did he not once play a provincial church organ and give musical lessons to stumbling pianists each of those shining ones had to walk on the earth among neighbours who perhaps thought much more of his gait and his garments than of anything which was to give him a title of everlasting fame each of them had his little local personal history sprinkled with small temptations and sordid cares which made the retarding friction of his course towards final companionship with the immortals lydgate was not blind to the dangers of such friction but he had plenty of confidence in his resolution to avoid it as far as possible being seven-and-twenty he felt himself experienced and he was not going to have his vanities provoked by contact with the showy worldly successes of the capital but to live among people who could hold no rivalry with that pursuit of a great idea which was to be a twin object with the assiduous practice of his profession 
there was fascination in the hope that the two purposes would illuminate each other the careful observation and inference which was his daily work the use of the lens to further his judgment in special cases would further his thought as an instrument of larger inquiry was not this the typical pre-eminence of his profession he would be a good middlemarch doctor and by that very means keep himself in the track of far-reaching investigation on one point he may fairly claim approval at this particular stage of his career he did not mean to imitate those philanthropic models who made a profit out of poisonous pickles to support themselves while they are exposing adulteration or hold shares in a gambling hell that they may have leisure to represent the cause of public morality he intended to begin in his own case some particular reforms which were quite certainly within his reach and much less of a problem than the demonstrating of an anatomical conception one of these reforms was to act stoutly on the strength of a recent legal decision and simply prescribe without dispensing drugs or taking percentage from druggists this was an innovation for one who had chosen to adopt the style of general practitioner in a country town and would be felt as offensive criticism by his professional brethren but lydgate meant to innovate in this treatment also and he was wise enough to see that the best security for his practising honestly according to his belief was to get rid of systematic temptations to the contrary perhaps that was a more cheerful time for observers and theorizers than the present we are apt to think it the finest era of the world when america was beginning to be discovered when a bold sailor even if he were wrecked might alight on a new kingdom and about eighteen twenty nine the dark territories of pathology were a fine america for a spirited young adventurer lydgate was ambitious above all to contribute towards enlarging the scientific rational basis of his profession the more he became interested in special questions of disease such as the nature of fever or fevers the more keenly he felt the need for that fundamental knowledge of structure which just at the beginning of the century had been illuminated by the brief and glorious career of beechat who died when he was only one and thirty but like another alexander left a realm large enough for many heirs that great frenchman first carried out the conception that living bodies fundamentally considered are no associations of organs which can be understood by studying them first apart and then as it were federally but must be regarded as consisting of certain primary webs or tissues out of which the various organs brain heart lungs and so on are compacted as the various accommodations of a house are built up in various proportions of wood iron stone brick zinc and the rest each material having its peculiar composition and proportions no man one sees can understand and estimate the entire structure or its parts what are its frailties and what its repairs without knowing the nature of the materials and the conception brought out by beechat with his detailed study of the different tissues acted necessarily on medical questions as the turning of gaslight would act on a dim oil-lit street showing new connections and hitherto hidden facts of structure which must be taken into account in considering the symptoms of maladies and the action of medicaments but results which depended on human conscience and intelligence work slowly and now at the end of eighteen twenty nine most medical practice was still strutting or shambling along the old paths and there was still scientific work to be done which might have seemed to be a direct sequence of beechat this great seer did not go beyond the consideration of the tissues as ultimate facts in the living organism marking the limit of anatomical analysis but it was open to another mind to say have not these structures some common basis from which they have all started as your sarsnet gauze net satin and velvet from the raw cocoon here would be another light as of oxyhydrogen showing the very grain of things and revising all former explanations of this sequence to bichat's work already vibrating along many currents of the european mind lydgate was enamoured he longed to demonstrate the more intimate relations of living structure and help to define men's thought more accurately after the true order 
the work had not yet been done but only prepared for those who knew how to use the preparation what was the primitive tissue in that way lydgate put the question not quite in the way required by the awaiting answer but such missing of the right word befalls many seekers and he counted on quiet intervals to be watchfully seized for taking up threads of investigation on many hints to be won from diligent application not only of the scalpel but of the microscope which research had begun to use again with new enthusiasm of reliance such was lydgate's plan of his future to do good small work for middlemarch and great work for the world he was certainly a happy fellow at this time to be seven-and-twenty without any fixed vices with a generous resolution that his action should be beneficent and with ideas in his brain that made life interesting quite apart from the cultus of horse flesh and other mystic rites of costly observance which the eight hundred pounds left him after buying his practice would certainly not have gone far in paying for he was at a starting point which makes many a man's career a fine subject for betting if there were any gentleman given to that amusement who could appreciate the complicated probabilities of an arduous purpose with all the possible thwartings and furtherings of circumstance all the niceties of inward balance by which a man swims and makes his point or else is carried headlong the risk would remain even with close knowledge of lingate's character for character too is a process and an unfolding the man was still in the making as much as the middlemarch doctor and immortal discoverer and there were both virtues and faults capable of shrinking or expanding the faults will not i hope be a reason for the withdrawal of your interest in him among our valued friends is there not some one or other who is a little too self-confident or and disdainful whose distinguished mind is a little spotted with commonness who is a little pinched here and protuberant there with native prejudices or whose better energies are liable to lapse down the wrong channel under the influence of transient solicitations all these things might be alleged against lydgate but then they are the periphrases of a polite preacher who talks of adam and would not like to mention anything painful to the pew renters the particular faults from which these delicate generalities are distilled have distinguishable physiognomies diction accent and grimaces filling up parts in very various dramas our vanities differ as our noses do all conceit is not the same conceit but varies in correspondence with the minutiae of mental make in which one of us differs from another lydgate's conceit was of the arrogant sort never simpering never impertinent but massive in its claims and benevolently contemptuous he would do a great deal for noodles being sorry for them and feeling quite sure that they could have no power over him he had thought of joining the saint simonians when he was in paris in order to turn them against some of their own doctrines all his faults were marked by kinder traits and were those of a man who had a fine baritone whose clothes hung well upon him and who even in his ordinary gestures had an air of inbred distinction where then lay the spots of commonness says a young lady enamoured of that careless grace how could there be any commonness in a man so well-bred so ambitious of social distinction so generous and unusual in his views of social duty as easily as there may be stupidity in a man of genius if you take him unawares on the wrong subject or as many a man who has the best will to advance the social millennium might be ill-inspired in imagining its lighter pleasures unable to go beyond offenbach's music or the brilliant punning in the last burlesque lydgate's spots of commonness lay in the complexion of his prejudices which in spite of noble intention and sympathy were half of them such as are found in ordinary men of the world that distinction of mind which belonged to his intellectual ardour did not penetrate his feelings and judgment about furniture or women or the desirability of its being known without his telling that he was better born than other country surgeons 
he did not mean to think of furniture at present but whenever he did so it was to be feared that neither biology or schemes of reform would lift him above the vulgarity of feeling that there would be an incompatibility in his furniture not being of the best as to women he had once already been drawn headlong by impetuous folly which he meant to be final since marriage at some distant period would of course not be impetuous for those who want to be acquainted with lydgate it will be good to know what was that case of impetuous folly for it may stand as an example of the fitful swerving of passion to which he was prone together with the chivalrous kindness which helped to make him morally lovable the story can be told without many words it happened when he was studying in paris and just at the time when over and above his other work he was occupied with some galvanic experiments one evening tired with his experimenting and uh, not being able to elect the facts he needed he left his frogs and rabbits to some repose under their trying and mysterious dispensation of unexplained shocks and went to finish his evening at the theatre of the porte saint martin where there was a melodrama which he had already seen several times attracted not by the ingenious work of the collaborating authors but by an actress whose part it was to stab her lover mistaking him for the evil designing duke of the peace lydgate was in love with this actress as a man is in love with a woman whom he never expects to speak to she was a provencal with dark eyes a greek profile and rounded majestic form having that sort of beauty which carries a sweet matronliness even in youth and her voice was a soft cooing she had but lately come to paris and bore a virtuous reputation her husband acting with her as the unfortunate lover it was her acting which was no better than it should be but the public was satisfied lydgate's only relaxation now was to go and look at this woman just as he might have thrown himself under the breath of sweet south on a bank of violets for a while without prejudice to his galvanis to which he would presently return but this evening the old drama had a new catastrophe at the moment when the heroine was to act the stabbing of her lover and he was to fall gracefully the wife veritably stabbed her husband who fell as death willed a wild shriek pierced the house and the Provencal fell swooning. A shriek and a swoon were demanded by the play, but the swooning too was real this time. Lydgate leaped and climbed, he hardly knew how, onto the stage, and was active in help making the acquaintance of his heroine by finding a contusion on her head and lifting her gently in his arms. Paris rang with the story of this death. Was it murder? some of the actress's warmest admirers were inclined to believe in her guilt and liked her the better for it such was the taste of those times but lydgate was not one of these he vehemently contended for her innocence and the remote impersonal passion for her beauty which he had felt before had passed now into personal devotion and tender thoughts of her lot the notion of murder was absurd no motive was discoverable the young couple being understood to dote on each other and it was not unprecedented that an accidental slip of the foot should have brought these grave consequences the legal investigation ended in madame lor's release lydgate by this time had had many interviews with her and found her more and more adorable she talked little but that was an additional charm she was melancholy and seemed grateful her presence was enough like that of the evening light lydgate was madly anxious about her affection and jealous lest any other man than himself should win it and ask her to marry him but instead of reopening her engagement at the port st martin where she would have been all the more popular for the fatal episode she left paris without warning forsaking her little court of her admirers perhaps no one carried inquiry far except lydgate who felt that all science had come to stand still while he imagined the unhappy lore stricken by ever wandering sorrow herself wandering and finding no faithful comforter hidden actresses however are not so difficult to find as some other hidden facts and it was not long before lydgate gathered indications that lore had taken the route to lyons 
he found her at last acting with great success at avignon under the same name looking more majestic than ever as forsaken wife carrying her child in her arms he spoke to her after the play was received with the usual quietude which seemed to him beautiful as clear depth of water and obtained leave to visit her the next day when he was bent on telling her that he adored her and on asking her to marry him he knew that this was like the sudden impulse of a madman in congress even with his habitual foibles no matter it was the one thing which he was resolved to do he had two selves within him apparently and they must learn to accommodate each other and to bear reciprocal impediments strange that some of us with quick alternate vision see beyond our infatuations and even while we rave on the heights behold the wide plain where our persistent self pauses and awaits us to have approached lor with any suit that was not reverentially tender would have been simply a contradiction of his whole feeling towards her you have come all the way from paris to find me she said to him the next day sitting before him with folded arms and looking at him with eyes that seemed to wander as an untamed ruminating animal wanders are all englishmen like that i came because i could not live without trying to see you you are lonely i love you i want you to consent to be my wife i will wait but i want you to promise that you will marry me no one else lore looked at him in silence with a melancholy radiance from under her grand eyelids until he was full of rapturous certainty he knelt close to her knees i will tell you something she said in her cooing way keeping her arms folded my foot really slipped i know i know said lydgate depreciately it was a fatal accident a dreadful stroke of calamity that bound me to you the more again lor paused a little and then said slowly i meant to do it lydgate strong man as he was turned pale and trembled moments seemed to pass before he rose and stood at a distance from her there was a secret then he said at last vehemently he was brutal to you you hated him no he wearied me he was too fond he would live in paris and not in my country that was not agreeable to me great god said lydgate in a groan of horror and you planned to murder him i did not plan it came to me in the play i meant to do it lydgate stood mute and unconsciously pressed his hat on while he looked at her he saw this woman the first to whom he had given his young adoration amid the throng of stooping criminals you are a good young man she said but i do not like husbands i will never have another three days afterwards lydgate was at his galvanism again in his paris chambers believing that illusions were at an end for him he was saved from hardening effects by the abundant kindness of his heart and his belief that human life might be made better but he had more reason than ever for trusting his judgment now that it was so experienced and henceforth he would take a strictly scientific view of woman entertaining no expectations but such as were justified beforehand no one in middlemarch was likely to have such a notion of lydgate's past as has here been faintly shadowed and indeed the respectable townsfolk there were not more given than mortals generally to any eager attempt at exactness in the representation of themselves who what did not come under their own senses not only young virgins of that town but grey-bearded men also were often in haste to conjecture how a new acquaintance might be wrought into their purposes contended with every vague knowledge as to the way in which life had been shaping him for that instrumentality middlemarch in fact counted on swallowing lydgate and assimilating him very comfortably end of chapter fifteen middlemarch by george elliot read by lars rolander
Chapter Sixteen of Middle March. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Red Abras. Middle March by George Eliot. Chapter Sixteen. All that in a woman is adored, in thy fair self I find, for the whole sex can but afford the handsome and the kind. Sir Charles Sedley The question whether Mr. Tyke should be appointed as salaried chaplain to the hospital was an exciting topic to the middle marchers, and Lydgate heard it discussed in a way that threw much light on the power exercised in the town by Mr. Bulstrode. The banker was evidently a ruler, but there was an opposition party, and even among his supporters there were some who allowed it to be seen that their support was a compromise, and who frankly stated their impression that the general scheme of things, and especially the casualties of trade, required you to hold a candle to the devil. Mr. Bulstrode's power was not due simply to his being a country banker who knew the financial secrets of most traders in the town and could touch the springs of their credit it was fortified by a beneficence that was at once ready and severe ready to confer obligations and severe in watching the result he had gathered as an industrious man always at his post a chief share in administering the town charities and his private charities were both minute and abundant he would take a great deal of pains about apprenticing Teg, the shoemaker's son, and he would watch over Teg's church going. He would defend Mrs. Stripe, the washerwoman, against Stubbs' unjust exaction on the score of a drying ground, and he would himself scrutinize a calumny against Mrs. Stripe. His private minor loans were numerous, but he would inquire strictly into the circumstances both before and after. In this way a man gathers a domain in his neighbor's hope and fear, as well as gratitude and power, when once it has got into that subtle region propagates itself, spreading out of all proportion to its external means. It was a principle with Mr. Bulstrode to gain as much power as possible, that he might use it for the glory of God. He went through a great deal of spiritual conflict and inward argument in order to adjust his motives, and make clear to himself what God's glory required. But as we have seen, his motives were not always rightly appreciated. There were many crass minds in Middlemarch whose reflective scales could only weigh things in the lump and they had a strong suspicion that since Mr. Bulstrode could not enjoy life in their fashion, eating and drinking so little as he did, and worriting himself about everything, he must have a sort of vampire's feast in the sense of mastery. The subject of the chaplaincy came up at Mr. Vincey's table when Lydgate was dining there, and the family connection with Mr. Bulstrode did not, he observed, prevent some freedom of remark even on the part of the host himself, though his reasons against the proposed arrangement turned entirely on his objection to Mr. Tyke's sermons, which were all doctrine, and his preference for Mr. Fairbrother, whose sermons were free from that taint. Mr. Vincey liked well enough the notion of the chaplain's having a salary, supposing it were given to Fairbrother, who was as good a little fellow as ever breathed, and the best preacher anywhere, and companionable too. "'What line shall you take, then?' said Mr. Chichley, the coroner, a great coursing comrade of Mr. Vincey's. "'Oh, I am precious glad I am not one of the directors now.' I shall vote for referring the matter to the directors and the medical board together. I shall roll some of my responsibility on your shoulders, doctor, said Mr. Vincey, glancing first at Dr. Sprague, the senior physician of the town, and then at Lydgate, who sat opposite. You medical gentlemen must consult which sort of black draught you will prescribe. Eh, Mr. Lydgate? I know little of either, said Lydgate. But in general, appointments are apt to be made too much a question of personal liking. The fittest man for a particular post is not always the best fellow or the most agreeable. 
sometimes if you wanted to get a reform your only way would be to pension off the good fellows whom everybody is fond of and put them out of the question dr sprague who was considered the physician of most weight though dr minchin was usually said to have more penetration divested his large heavy face of all expression and looked at his wine glass while lydgate was speaking whatever was not problematical and suspected about this young man for example a certain showiness as to foreign ideas and a disposition to unsettle what had been settled and forgotten by his elders was positively unwelcome to a physician whose standing had been fixed thirty years before by the tritzi on meningitis of which at least one copy marked own was bound in calf for my part i have some fellow feeling with dr sprague one's self-satisfaction is an untaxed kind of property which it is very unpleasant to find deprecated lydgate's remark however did not meet the sense of the company mr vincey said that if he could have his way he would not put disagreeable fellows anywhere hang your reforms said mr chichley there is no greater humbug in the world you never hear of a reform but it means some trick to put in new men i hope you are not one of the lancet's men mr lydgate wanting to take the coronership out of the hands of the legal profession your words appear to point that way i disapprove of wakely interposed dr sprague no man more he is an ill-intentioned fellow who would sacrifice the respectability of the profession which everybody knows depends on the london colleges for the sake of getting some notoriety for himself there are men who don't mind about being kicked blue if they can only get talked about but wakely is right sometimes the doctor added judicially i could mention one or two points in which wakely is in the right oh well said mr chitley i blame no man for standing up in favour of his own cloth but coming to argument i should like to know how a coroner is to judge of evidence if he has not had a legal training in my opinion said lydgate legal training only makes a man more incompetent in questions that require knowledge of another kind people talk about evidence as if it could really be weighed in scales by a blind justice no man can judge what is good evidence on any particular subject unless he knows that subject well a lawyer is no better than an old woman at a post-mortem examination how is he to know the action of a poison you might as well say that scanning verse will teach you to scan the potato crops you were aware i suppose that it is not the coroner's business to conduct the post-mortem but only to take the evidence of the medical witness said mr chichley with some scorn who is often almost as ignorant as the coroner himself said lydgate questions of medical jurisprudence ought not to be left to the chance of decent knowledge in a medical witness and the coroner ought not to be a man who will believe that strychnine will destroy the coats of the stomach if an ignorant practitioner happens to tell him so lydgate had really lost sight of the fact that mr chichley was his majesty's coroner and ended innocently with the question don't you agree with me dr sprague to a certain extent with regard to populous districts and in the metropolis said the doctor but i hope it will be long before this part of the country loses the services of my friend chichley even though it might get the best man in our profession to succeed him i am sure vincey will agree with me yes yes give me a coroner who is a good coursing man said mr vincey jovially and in my opinion you are safest with a lawyer nobody can know everything most things are visitation of god and as to poisoning why what you want to know is the law come shall we join the ladies lydgate's private opinion was that mr chichley might be the very coroner without bias as to the coats of the stomach but he had not meant to be personal this was one of the difficulties of moving in good middlemarch society it was dangerous to insist on knowledge as a qualification for any salaried office fred vincey had called lydgate a prick and now mr chichley was inclined to call him prick-eared especially when in the drawing-room he seemed to be making himself eminently agreeable to rosamond whom he had easily monopolized in a tete-a-tete since mrs vincey herself sat at the tea-table 
she resigned no domestic function to her daughter and the matron's blooming good-natured face with the two volatile pink strings floating from her fine throat and her cheery manners to husband and children was certainly among the great attractions of the vincey house attractions which made it all the easier to fall in love with the daughter the tinge of unpretentious inoffensive vulgarity in mrs vincey gave more effect to rosamond's refinement which was beyond what lydgate had expected certainly small feet and perfectly turned shoulders aid the impression of refined manners and the right thing said seems quite astonishingly right when it is accompanied with exquisite curves of lip and eyelid and rosamond could say the right thing for she was clever with that sort of cleverness which catches every tone except the humorous happily she never attempted to joke and this perhaps was the most decisive mark of her cleverness she and lydgate readily got into conversation he regretted that he had not heard her sing the other day at stone court the only pleasure he allowed himself during the latter part of his stay in paris was to go and hear music you have studied music probably said rosamond no i know the notes of many birds and i know many melodies by ear but the music that i don't know at all and have no notion about delights me affects me how stupid the world is that it does not make more use of such a pleasure within its reach yes and you will find middlemarch very tuneless there are hardly any good musicians i only know two gentlemen who sing at all well i suppose it is the fashion to sing comic songs in a rhythmic way leaving you to fancy the tune very much as if it were trapped on a drum ah you have heard mr bower said rosamond with one of her rare smiles but we are speaking very ill of our neighbours lydgate was almost forgetting that he must carry on the conversation in thinking how lovely this creature was her garment seeming to be made out of the faintest blue sky herself so immaculately blonde as if the petals of some gigantic flower had just opened and disclosed her and yet with this infantine blondness showing so much ready self-possessed grace since he had had the memory of lorry lydgate had lost all taste for large-eyed silence the divine cow no longer attracted him and rosamond was her very opposite but he recalled himself you will let me hear some music to-night i hope i will let you hear my attempts if you like said rosamond papa is sure to insist on my singing but i shall tremble before you who have heard the best singers in paris i have heard very little i have only once been to london but our organist at st peter's is a good musician and i go on studying with him tell me what you saw in london very little a more naive girl would have said oh everything but rosamond knew better a few of the ordinary sights such as raw country girls are always taken to do you call yourself a raw country girl said lydgate looking at her with an involuntary emphasis of admiration which made rosamond blush with pleasure but she remained simply serious turned her long neck a little and put up her hand to touch her wondrous hair plates and habitual gesture with her as pretty as any movements of a kitten's paw not that rosamond was in the least like a kitten she was a sylph caught young and educated at mrs lemon's i assure you my mind is raw she said immediately i pass at middlemarch i am not afraid of talking to our old neighbours but i am really afraid of you an accomplished woman almost always knows more than we men though her knowledge is of a different sort i am sure you should teach me a thousand things as an exquisite bird would teach a bear if there were any common language between them happily there is a common language between women and men and so the bears can get taught ah there is fred beginning to strum i must go and hinder him from jarring all your nerves said rosamond moving to the other side of the room where fred having opened the piano at his father's desire that rosamond might give them some music was parenthetically performing cherry ripe with one hand able men who have passed their examinations will do these things sometimes not less than the plucked fred fred pray defer your practising till to-morrow 
you will make mr lydgate ill said rosamond he has an ear fred laughed and went on with his tune to the end rosamond turned to lydgate smiling gently and said you perceive the bears will not always be taught now then rosie said fred springing from the stool and twisting it upward for her with a hearty expectation of enjoyment some good rousing tunes first rosamond played admirably her master at mrs lemon's school close to a country town with a memorable history that had its relics in church and castle was one of those excellent musicians here and there to be found in our provinces worthy to compare with many a noted capel mister in a country which offers more plentiful conditions of musical celebrity rosamond with the executant's instinct had seized his manner of playing and gave forth his large rendering of noble music with the precision of an echo it was almost startling heard for the first time a hidden soul seemed to be flowing forth from rosamond's fingers and so indeed it was since souls live on in perpetual echoes and to all fine expression there goes somewhere an originating activity if it be only that of an interpreter lydgate was taken possession of and began to believe in her as something exceptional after all he thought one need not be surprised to find the rare conjunctions of nature under circumstances apparently unfavourable come where they may they always depend on conditions that are not obvious he sat looking at her and did not rise to pay her any compliments leaving that to others now that his admiration was deepened her singing was less remarkable but also well trained and sweet to hear as a chime perfectly in tune it is true she sang meet me by moonlight and i have been roaming for mortals must share the fashions of their time and none but the ancients can be always classical but rosamond could also sing black-eyed susan with effect or hayden's canzonets or voice sapete or batti batti she only wanted to know what her audience liked her father looked round at the company delighting in their admiration her mother sat like a noibe before her troubles with her youngest little girl on her lap softly beating the child's hand up and down in time to the music and fred notwithstanding his general scepticism about rosie listened to her music with perfect allegiance wishing he could do the same thing on his flute it was the pleasantest family party that lydgate had seen since he came to middlemarch the vincies had the readiness to enjoy the rejection of all anxiety and the belief in life as a merry lot which made a house exceptional in most county towns at that time when evangelicalism had cast a certain suspicion as of plague infection over the few amusements which survived in the provinces at the vincies there was always whist and the card tables stood ready now making some of the company secretly impatient of the music before it ceased mr fairbrother came in a handsome broad-chested but otherwise small man about forty whose black was very threadbare the brilliancy was all in his quick grey eyes he came like a pleasant change in the light arresting little louisa with fatherly nonsense as she was being led out of the room by miss morgan greeting everybody with some special word and seeming to condense more talk into ten minutes than had been held all through the evening he claimed from lydgate the fulfilment of a promise to come and see him i can't let you off you know because i have some beetles to show you we collectors feel an interest in every new man till he has seen all we have to show him but soon he swerved to the whist table rubbing his hands and saying come now let us be serious mr lydgate not play ah you are too young and light for this kind of thing lydgate said to himself that the clergyman whose abilities were so painful to mr bulstrode appeared to have found an agreeable resort in this certainly not erudite household he could half understand it the good humour the good looks of elder and younger and the provision for passing the time without any labour of intelligence might make the house be willing to people who had no particular use for their odd hours 
Everything looked blooming and joyous except Miss Morgan, who was brown, dull, and resigned, and altogether, as Mrs. Vincy often said, just the sort of person for a governess. Lydgate did not mean to pay many such visits himself. They were a wretched waste of the evenings, and now, when he had talked a little more to Rosamond, he meant to excuse himself and go. You will not like us at Middlemarch, I feel sure, she said, when the whist players were settled. We are very stupid, and you have been used to something quite different. I suppose all country towns are pretty much alike, said Lydgate. But I have noticed that one always believes one's own town to be more stupid than any other. I have made up my mind to take Middlemarch as it comes, and shall be much obliged if the town will take me in the same way. I have certainly found some charms in it which are much greater than I had expected. You mean the rides towards Tipton and Lowick? Everyone is pleased with those, said Rosamond with simplicity. No, I mean something much nearer to me. Rosamond rose and reached her netting, and then said, Do you care about dancing at all? I am not quite sure whether clever men ever dance. I would dance with you if you would allow me. Oh, said Rosamond, with a slight deprecatory laugh. I was only going to say that we sometimes have dancing, and I wanted to know whether you would feel insulted if you were asked to come. Not on the condition I mentioned. After this chat, Lydgate thought that he was going, but on moving towards the whist stables, he got interested in watching Mr. Fairbrother's play, which was masterly, and also his face, which was a striking mixture of the shrewd and the mild. At ten o'clock, supper was brought in. Such were the customs of Middlemarch, and there was a punch drinking, but Mr. Fairbrother had only a glass of water. He was winning, but there seemed to be no reason why the renewal of rubbers should end, and Lydgate at last took his leave. But as it was not eleven o'clock, he chose to walk in the brisk air towards the tower of St. Botolph's, Mr. Fairbrother's church, which stood out dark, square, and massive against the starlight. It was the oldest church in Middlemarch. The living, however, was but a vicarage worth barely four hundred a year. Lydgate had heard that, and he wondered now whether Mr. Fairbrother cared about the money he won at cards, thinking, he seems a very pleasant fellow, but Bulstrode may have his good reasons. Many things would be easier to Lydgate if it should turn out that Mr. Bulstrode was generally justifiable. What is his religious doctrine to me if he carries some good notions along with it? One must use such brains as are to be found. These were actually Lydgate's first meditations as he walked away from Mr. Vincey's, and on this ground I fear that many ladies will consider him hardly worthy of their attention. He thought of Rosamond and her music only in the second place, and though when her turn came he dwelt on the image of her for the rest of his walk, he felt no agitation, and had no sense that any new current had set into his life. He could not marry yet, he wished not to marry for several years, and therefore he was not ready to entertain the notion of being in love with a girl whom he happened to admire. He did admire Rosamond exceedingly, but that madness which had once beset him about Lore was not, he thought, likely to occur in relation to any other woman. Certainly, if falling in love had been at all in question, it would have been quite safe with a creature like this Miss Vincy, who had just the kind of intelligence one would desire in a woman, polished, refined, docile, lending itself to finish in all the delicacies of life, and enshrined in a body which expressed this with a force of demonstration that excluded the need for other evidence. Lydgate felt sure that if ever he married, his wife would have that feminine radiance, that distinctive womanhood which must be classed with flowers and music, that sort of beauty which by its very nature was virtuous, being moulded only for pure and delicate joys. But since he did not mean to marry for the next five years, his more pressing business was to look into Lois' new book on fever, which he was specially interested in, because he had known Louis in Paris, and had followed many anatomical demonstrations in order to ascertain the specific differences of typhus and typhoid. He went home and read far into the smallest hour, 
bringing a much more testing vision of details and relations into this pathological study than he had ever thought it necessary to apply to the complexities of love and marriage these being subjects on which he felt himself amply informed by literature and that traditional wisdom which is handed down in the genial conversation of men whereas fever had obscure conditions and gave him that delightful labor of the imagination which is not mere arbitrariness but the exercise of disciplined power combining and constructing with the clearest eye for probabilities and the fullest obedience to knowledge and then in yet more energetic alliance with impartial nature standing aloof to invent tests by which to try its own work many men have been praised as vividly imaginative on the strength of their profuseness indifferent drawing or cheap narration reports of very poor talk going on in distant orbs or portraits of lucifer coming down on his bad errands as a largely ugly man with bat's wings and spurts of phosphorescence or exaggerations of wantonness that seem to reflect life in a diseased dream but these kinds of inspiration lydgate regarded as rather vulgar and vinous compared with the imagination that reveals subtle actions inaccessible by any sort of lens but tracked in that outer darkness through long pathways of necessary sequence by the inward light which is the last refinement of energy capable of bathing even the ethereal atoms in its ideally illuminated space he for his part had tossed away all cheap inventions where ignorance finds itself able and at ease he was enamoured of that ardorous invention which is the very eye of research provisionally framing its object and correcting it to more and more exactness of relation he wanted to pierce the obscurity of those minute processes which prepare human misery and joy those invisible thoroughfares which are the first lurking places of anguish mania and crime that delicate poise and transition which determine the growth of happy or unhappy consciousness as he threw down his book stretched his legs towards the embers in the grate and clasped his hands at the back of his head in that agreeable afterglow of excitement when thought lapses from examination of a specific object into a suffusive sense of its connections with all the rest of our existence seems as it were to throw itself on its back after vigorous swimming and float with the repose of unexhausted strength lydgate felt a triumphant delight in his studies and something like pity for those less lucky men who were not of his profession if i had not taken that turn when i was a lad he thought i might have gone into some stupid draught horse work or other and lived always in blinkers i should never have been happy in any profession that did not call forth the highest intellectual strain and yet keep me in good warm contact with my neighbors there is nothing like the medical profession for that one can have the exclusive scientific life that touches the distance and befriend the old foggies in the parish too it is rather harder for a clergyman fairbrother seems to be an anomaly this last thought brought back the vincies and all the pictures of the evening they floated in his mind agreeably enough and as he took up his bed candle his lips were curled with that incipient smile which is apt to accompany agreeable recollections he was an ardent fellow but at present his ardor was absorbed in love of his work and in the ambition of making his life recognized as a factor in the better life of mankind like other heroes of signs who had nothing but an obscure country practice to begin with poor lydgate or shall i say poor rosamond each lived in a world of which the other knew nothing it had not occurred to lydgate that he had been a subject of eager meditation to rosamond who had neither any reason for throwing her marriage into distant perspective nor any pathological studies to divert her mind from that ruminating habit that inward repetition of looks words and phrases which makes a large part in the lives of most girls 
he had not meant to look at her or speak to her with more than the inevitable amount of admiration and compliment which a man must give to a beautiful girl indeed it seemed to him that his enjoyment of her music had remained almost silent for he feared falling into the rudeness of telling her his great surprise at her possession of such accomplishment but rosamond had registered every look and word and estimated them as the opening incidents of a preconceived romance incidents which gather value from the foreseen development and climax in Rosamond's romance it was not necessary to imagine much about the inward life of the hero, or of his serious business in the world. Of course he had a profession, and was clever, as well as sufficiently handsome, but the piquant fact about Lydgate was his good birth, which distinguished him from all Middlemarch admirers, and presented marriage as a prospect of rising in rank and getting a little nearer to that celestial condition on earth in which she would have nothing to do with vulgar people, and perhaps at last associate with relatives quite equal to the country people who looked down on the Middlemarchers. It was part of Rosamond's cleverness to discern very subtly the faintest aroma of rank, and once when she had been the Miss Brooks accompanying their uncle at the country assizes and seated among the aristocracy, she had envied them, notwithstanding their plain dress. If you think it incredible that to imagine Lydgate as a man of family could cause thrills of satisfaction which had anything to do with the sense that she was in love with him, I will ask you to use your power of comparison a little more effectively, and consider whether red cloth and epaulets have never had an influence of that sort. Our passions do not live apart in locked chambers, but, dressed in their small wardrobe of notions, bring their provisions to a common table and mess together, feeding out of the common store according to their appetite. Rosamond, in fact, was entirely occupied not exactly with Tertius Lydgate, as he was in himself, but with his relation to her, and it was excusable in a girl who was accustomed to hear that all young men might, could, would be, or actually were in love with her, to believe at once that Lydgate could be no exception. His looks and words meant more to her than other men's, because she cared more for them she thought of them diligently and diligently attended to that perfection of appearance behaviour sentiments and all other elegancies which would find in lydgate a more adequate admirer than she had yet been conscious of for rosamond though she would never do anything that was disagreeable to her was industrious and now more than ever she was active in sketching her landscapes and market cards and portraits of friends in practising her music and in being from morning till night her own standard of a perfect lady having always an audience in her own consciousness with sometimes the not unwelcome addition of a more variable external audience in the numerous visitors of the house she found time also to read the best novels and even the second best and she knew much poetry by heart her favourite poem was Lala Rook, the best girl in the world, he will be a happy fellow who gets her, was the sentiment of the elderly gentleman who visited the Vincies, and the rejected young men thought of trying again, as is the fashion in country towns where the horizon is not thick with coming rivals. But Mrs. Plymdale thought that Rosamond had been educated to a ridiculous pitch for what was the use of accomplishment which would be all laid aside as soon as she was married while her aunt bulstrode who had a sisterly faithfulness towards her brother's family had two sincere wishes for rosamond that she might show a more serious turn of mind and that she might meet with a husband whose wealth corresponded to her habits End of chapter 16. Recording by Red Abrus, January 2008Chapter 17 of Middle March. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Red Abras. Middle March by George Eliot. Chapter 17. The clerkly person smiled and said, Promise was a pretty maid, but being poor she died unwed. The Reverend Camden Fairbrother, whom Lydgate went to see the next evening, lived in an old parsonage, built of stone, venerable enough to match the church which it looked out upon. All the furniture, too, in the house was old, but with another grade of age, that of Mr. Fairbrother's father and grandfather. There were painted white chairs, with gilding and wreaths on them, and some lingering red silk damask with slits in it. There were engraved portraits of Lord Chancellors and other celebrated lawyers of the last century, and there were old pier glasses to reflect them, as well as the little satin wood tables and the sofas resembling a prolongation of uneasy chairs, all standing in relief against the dark wainscot. This was the physiognomy of the drawing-room into which Lydgate was shown, and there were three ladies to receive him, who were also old-fashioned, and of a faded but genuine respectability. Mrs. Fairbrother, the vicar's white-haired mother, befrilled and kerchiefed with dainty cleanliness, upright, quick-eyed, and still under seventy. Miss Noble, her sister, a tiny old lady of meeker aspect, with frills and kerchief decidedly more worn and mended, and Miss Winifred Fairbrother, the vicar's elder sister, well-looking like himself, but nipped and subdued as single women are apt to be, who spend their lives in uninterrupted subjection to their elders. Lydgate had not expected to see so quaint a group. Knowing simply that Mr. Fairbrother was a bachelor, he had thought of being ushered into a snuggery where the chief furniture would probably be books and collections of natural objects. The vicar himself seemed to wear rather a changed aspect, as most men do when acquaintances made elsewhere see them for the first time in their own homes, some indeed showing like an actor of genial parts disadvantageously cast for the curmudgeon in a new piece. This was not the case with Mr. Fairbrother. He seemed a trifle milder and more silent, the chief talker being his mother, while he only put in a good-humoured moderating remark here and there. The old lady was evidently accustomed to tell her company what they ought to think, and to regard no subject as quite safe without her steering. She was afforded lizard for this function by having all her little wants attended to by Miss Winifred. Meanwhile, tiny Miss Noble carried on her arm a small basket, into which she diverted a bit of sugar, which she had first dropped in her saucer as if by mistake. Looking round furtively afterwards, and reverting to her teacup with a small innocent noise as of a tinny timid quadruped. Pray think no ill of Miss Noble. That basket held small savings from her more portable food, destined for the children of her poor friends, among whom she trotted on fine mornings, fostering and petting all needy creatures, being so spontaneous a delight to her, that she regarded it much as if it had been a pleasant vice that she was addicted to. Perhaps she was conscious of being tempted to steal from those who had much that she might give to those who had nothing and carried in her conscience the guilt of that repressed desire. One must be poor to know the luxury of giving. Mrs. Fairbrother welcomed the guest with a lively formality and precision. She presently informed him that they were not often in want of medical aid in that house. She had brought up her children to wear flannel and not to overeat themselves, which last habit she considered the chief reason why people needed doctors. Lydgate pleaded for those whose fathers and mothers had overeaten themselves, but Mrs. Fairbrother held that view of things dangerous. Nature was more just than that. It would be easy for any felon to say that his ancestors ought to have been hanged instead of him. If those he had bad fathers and mothers were bad themselves, they were hanged for that. There was no need to go back on what you couldn't see. My mother is like old George the Third, said the vicar. She objects to metaphysics. 
I object to what is wrong, Camden. I say, keep hold of a few plain truths, and make everything square with them. When I was young, Mr. Lydgate, there never was any question about right and wrong. We knew our catechism, and that was enough. We learned our creed and our duty. Every respectable church person had the same opinions. But now, if you speak out of the prayer book itself, you are liable to be contradicted. That makes rather a pleasant time of it for those who like to maintain their own point, said Lydgate. But my mother always gives way, said the vicar slyly. No, no, Camden, you must not lead Mr. Lygate into a mistake about me. I shall never show that disrespect to my parents to give up what they taught me. Any one may see what comes of turning. If you change once, why not twenty times? A man might see good arguments for changing once and not see them for changing again, said Lydgate, amused with the decisive old lady. Excuse me there. If you go up on arguments, they are never wanting when a man has no constancy of mind. My father never changed, and he preached plain moral sermons without arguments, and was a good man. Few better. When you get me a good man made out of arguments, I will get you a good dinner with reading you the cookery book. That's my opinion, and I think anybody's stomach will bear me out. About the dinner, certainly, mother, said Mr. Fairbrother. It is the same thing, the dinner or the man. I am nearly seventy, Mr. Lydgate, and I go upon experience. I am not likely to follow new lights, though there are plenty of them here as elsewhere. I say they came in with the mixed stuffs that will neither wash nor wear. I was not so in my youth. A churchman was a churchman, and a clergyman, you might be pretty sure, was a gentleman, if nothing else. But now he may be no better than a dissenter, and want to push aside my son on pretense of doctrine. But whoever may wish to push him aside, I am proud to say, Mr. Lydgate, that he will compare with any preacher in this kingdom, not to speak of this town, which is but a low standard to go by, at least to my thinking, for I was born and bred at Exeter. A mother is never partial, said Mr. Fairbrother, smiling. What do you think Dyke's mother says about him? Ah, poor creature. What indeed, said Mrs. Fairbrother, her sharpness blunted for the moment by her confidence in maternal judgments. She says the truth to herself. Depend upon it. And what is the truth? said Lidgate. I am curious to know. Oh, nothing bad at all, said Mr. Fairbrother. He is a zealous fellow. Not very learned and not very wise, I think, because I don't agree with him. Why, Camden? said Miss Winifred. Griffin and his wife told me only today that Mr. Tyke said they should have no more coals if they came to hear you preach. Mrs. Fairbrother laid down her knitting, which she had resumed after her small allowance of tea and toast, and looked at her son as if to say, You hear that? Miss Noble said, Oh, poor things, poor things, in reference, probably to the double loss of preaching and coal. But the vicar answered quietly, that is because they are not my parishioners, and I don't think my sermons are worth a load of coals to them. Mr. Lydgate, said Mrs. Fairbrother, who could not let this pass? You don't know my son. He always undervalues himself. I tell him he is undervaluing the God who made him, and made him a most excellent preacher. That must be a hint for me to take Mr. Lydgate away to my study, mother, said the vicar, laughing. I promised to show you my collection, he added, turning to Lydgate. Shall we go? All three ladies remonstrated. Mr. Lydgate ought not to be hurried away without being allowed to accept another cup of tea. Miss Winifred had abundance of good tea in the pot. Why was Camden in such a haste to take a visitor to his den? There was nothing but pickled vermin, and drawers full of blue bottles and moths, with no carpet on the floor. Mr. Lydgate must excuse it. A game at cribbage would be far better. In short, it was plain that a vicar might be adored by his womankind as the king of men and preachers, 
and yet be held by them to stand in much need of their direction lydgate with the usual shallowness of a young bachelor wondered that mr fairbrother had not taught them better my mother is not used to my having visitors who can take any interest in my hobbies said the vicar as he opened the door of his study which was indeed as bare of luxuries for the body as the ladies had implied unless a short porcelain pipe and a tobacco box were to be accepted men of your profession don't generally smoke he said lydgate smiled and shook his head nor of mine either properly i suppose you will hear that pipe alleged against me by bulstrode and company they don't know how pleased the devil would be if i gave it up i understand you are of an excitable temper and want a sedative i am heavier and should get idle with it i should rush into idleness and stagnate there with all my might and you mean to give it all to your work i am some ten or twelve years older than you and have come to a compromise i feed a weakness or two lest they should get clamorous see continued the vicar opening several small drawers i fancy i have made an exhaustive study of the entomology of this district i am going on both with the fauna and the flora but i have at least done my insects well we are singularly rich in orthoptera i don't know whether ah you have got hold of that glass jar you are looking into that instead of my drawers you don't really care about these things not by the side of this lovely anencephalous monster i have never had time to give myself much to natural history i was early bitten with an interest in structure and it is what lies most directly in my profession i have no hobby besides i have the sea to swim in there ah you are a happy fellow said mr fairbrother turning on his heel and beginning to fill his pipe you don't know what it is to want spiritual tobacco bad emendations of old texts or small items about a variety of aphis brassicae with the well-known signature of philomicron for the twaddler's magazine or a learned treatise on the entomology of the pentateuch including all the insects not mentioned but probably met with by the israelites in their passage through the desert with a monograph on the ant as treated by solomon showing the harmony of the book of proverbs with the results of modern research you don't mind my fumigating you lydgate was more surprised at the openness of this talk than at its implied meaning that the vicar felt himself not altogether in the right vocation the neat fitting up of drawers and shelves and the bookcase filled with the expensive illustrated books on natural history made him think again of the winnings at cards and their destination but he was beginning to wish that the very best construction of everything that mr fairbrother did should be the true one the vicar's frankness seemed not of the repulsive sort that comes from an uneasy consciousness seeking to forestall the judgment of others but simply the relief of a desire to do with as little pretence as possible apparently he was not without a sense that his freedom of speech might seem premature for he presently said i have not yet told you that i have the advantage of you mr lydgate and know you better than you know me you remember trolley who shared your apartment at paris for some time i was a correspondent of his and he told me a good deal about you i was not quite sure when you first came that you were the same man i was very glad when i found that you were only i don't forget that you have not had the like prologue about me lydgate divined some delicacy of feeling here but did not half understand it by the way he said what has become of trolley i have quite lost sight of him he was hot on the french social systems and talked of going to the backwoods to found a sort of pythagorean community is he gone not at all he is practising at a german bath and has married a rich patient then my notions were the best so far said lydgate with a short scornful laugh he would have it the medical profession was an inevitable system of humbug i said the fault was in the men men who truckle to lies and folly instead of preaching against humbug outside the walls it might be better to set up a disinfecting apparatus within in short 
I am reporting my own conversation. You may be sure I had all the good sense on my side. Your scheme is a good deal more difficult to carry out than the Pythagorean community, though. You have not only got the old Adam in yourself against you, but you have got all those descendants of the original Adam who formed the society around you. You see, I have paid twelve or thirteen years more than you for my knowledge of difficulties. But, Mr. Fairbrother broke off a moment, and then added, You are eyeing that glass bus again. Do you want to make an exchange? You shall not have it without a fair barter. I have some sea mice, fine specimens in spirits, and I will throw in Robert Brown's new thing, microscopic observations on the pollen of plants, if you don't happen to have it already. Why, seeing how you long for the monster, I might ask a higher price. Suppose I ask you to look through my drawers and agree with me about all my new species. The vicar, while he talked in this way, alternately moved about with his pipe in his mouth and returned to hang rather fondly over his drawers. That would be good discipline, you know, for a young doctor who has to please his patients in Middlemarch. You must learn to be bored, remember? However, you shall have the monster on your own terms. Don't you think men overrate the necessity for humouring everybody's nonsense till they get despised by the very fools they humour? said Lydgate, moving to Mr. Fairbrother's side, and looking rather absently at the insects ranged in fine gradation, with names subscribed in exquisite writing. The shortest way is to make your value felt, so that people must put up with you whether you flatter them or not. With all my heart, but then you must be sure of having the value, and you must keep yourself independent. Very few men can do that. Either you slip out of service altogether and become good for nothing, or you wear the harness and draw a good deal where your yoke fellows pull you. But do look at these delicate orthoptera. Lydgate had, after all, to give some scrutiny to each drawer, the vicar laughing at himself and yet persisting in the exhibition. Apropos of what you said about wearing harness, Lydgate began, after they had sat down, I made up my mind some time ago to do with as little of it as possible. That was why I determined not to try anything in London, for a good many years at least. I didn't like what I saw when I was studying there, so much empty big wiggism and obstructive trickery. In the country, people have less pretension to knowledge and are less of companions. But for that reason, they affect one's amour propre less, one makes less bad blood, and one can follow one's own course more quietly. Yes, well, you have got a good start. You are in the right profession, the work you feel yourself most fit for. Some people miss that and repent too late, but you must not be too sure of keeping your independence. You mean of family ties, said Lydgate conceiving that these might press rather tightly on Mr. Fairbrother. Not altogether. Of course, they make many things more difficult. But a good wife, a good unworldly woman, may really help a man and keep him more independent. There's a parishioner of mine, a fine fellow, but who would hardly have pulled through as he has done without his wife. Do you know the guards? I think they were not Peacock's patients. No, but there is a Miss Garth at Old Featherstone's at Lowick, their daughter, an excellent girl. She is very quiet. I have hardly noticed her. She has taken notice of you, though, depend upon it. I don't understand, said Lilkate. He could hardly say, of course. Oh, she gorges everybody. I prepared her for confirmation. She is a favorite of mine. Mr. Fairbrother puffed a few moments in silence, Lydgate not caring to know more about the guards. At last the vicar laid down his pipe, stretched out his legs, and turned his bright eyes with a smile towards Lydgate, saying, But we Middlemarchers are not so tame as you take us to be. We have our intrigues and our parties. I am a party man, for example, and Bullstrode is another. If you vote for me, you will offend Bullstrode. What is there against Bullstrode? said Lydgate emphatically. I did not say there was anything against him except that if you vote against him, you will make him your enemy. I don't know that I need mind about that, said Lydgate, rather proudly, but he seems to have good ideas about hospitals, and he spends large sums on useful public objects. 
he might help me a good deal in carrying out my ideas. As to his religious notions, why, as Voltaire said, incantations will destroy a flock of sheep if administered with a certain quantity of arsenic. I look for the man who will bring the arsenic and don't mind about his incantations. Very good, but then you must not offend your arsenic man. You will not offend me, you know, said Mr. Fairbrother quite unaffectedly. I don't translate my own convenience into other people's duties. I am opposed to Bullstrode in many ways. I don't like the set he belongs to. They are a narrow, ignorant set, and do more to make their neighbors uncomfortable than to make them better. Their system is a sort of worldly spiritual clickpaising. They really look on the rest of mankind as a doomed carcass which is to nourish them for heaven. But, he added smilingly, I don't say that Bullstrode's new hospital is a bad thing, and as to his wanting to oust me from the old one, why? If he thinks me a mischievous fellow, he is only returning a compliment. And I am not a model clergyman, only a decent makeshift. Lydgate was not at all sure that the vicar maligned himself. A model clergyman like a model doctor ought to think his own profession the finest in the world and take all knowledge as mere nourishment to his moral pathology and therapeutics. He only said, What reason does Bullstrode give for superseding you? That I don't teach his opinions, which he calls spiritual religion, and that I have no time to spare. Both statements are true, but then I could make time, and I should be glad of the forty pounds. That is the plain fact of the case, but let us dismiss it. I only wanted to tell you that if you vote for your arsenic man, you are not to cut me in consequence. I can't spare you. You are a sort of circumnavigator come to settle among us, and will keep up my belief in the antipodes. Now tell me all about them in Paris. End of chapter 17 Recording by Red Abras, January 2008Chapter 18 of Middle March. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Red Abris. Middle March by George Eliot. Chapter 18. O oh, sir, the loftiest hopes on earth draw lots with meaner hopes heroic breasts, breathing bad air, ran risk of pestilence, or, lacking lime juice when they cross the line, may languish with the scurvy. Some weeks passed after this conversation before the question of the chaplaincy gathered any practical import for Lydgate, and without telling himself the reason, he deferred the predetermination on which side he should give his vote. It would really have been a matter of total indifference to him, that is to say, he would have taken the more convenient side and given his vote for the appointment of Tyke without any hesitation, if he had not cared personally for Mr. Fairbrother. But his liking for the vicar of St. Botolph's grew with growing acquaintanceship. That entering into Lydgate's position as a newcomer who had his own professional objects to secure, Mr. Fairbrother should have taken pains rather to warn off than to obtain his interest, showed an unusual delicacy and generosity which Lydgate's nature was keenly alive to. It went along with other points of conduct in Mr. Fairbrother which were exceptionally fine and made his character resemble those southern landscapes which seem divided between natural grandeur and social slovenliness. Very few men could have been as filial and chivalrous as he was to the mother, aunt, and sister, whose dependence on him had in many ways shaped his life rather uneasily for himself. Few men who feel the pressure of small needs are so nobly resolute 
not to dress up their inevitably self-interested desires in a pretext of better motives in these matters he was conscious that his life would bear the closest scrutiny and perhaps the consciousness encouraged a little defiance towards the critical strictness of persons whose celestial intimacies seemed not to improve their domestic manners and whose lofty aims were not needed to account for their actions then his preaching was ingenious and pithy like the preaching of the english church in its robust age and his sermons were delivered without book people outside his parish went to hear him and since to fill the church was always the most difficult part of a clergyman's function here was another ground for a careless sense of superiority besides he was a likable man sweet-tempered ready-witted frank without grins of suppressed bitterness or other conversational flavours which make half of us an affliction to our friends lydgate liked him heartily and wished for his friendship with this feeling uppermost he continued to waive the question of the chaplaincy and to persuade himself that it was not only no proper business of his but likely enough never to vex him with a demand for his vote lydgate at mr bulstrode's request was laying down plans for the internal arrangements of the new hospital and the two were often in consultation the banker was always presupposing that he could count in general on lydgate as a coadjutor but made no special recurrence to the coming decision between tyke and fairbrother when the general board of the infirmary had met however and lydgate had noticed that the question of the chaplaincy was thrown on a council of the directors and medical men to meet on the following friday he had a vexed sense that he must make up his mind on this trivial middlemarch business he could not help hearing within him the distinct declaration that bulstrode was prime minister and that the tyke affair was a question of office or no office and he could not help an equally pronounced dislike to giving up the prospect of office for his observation was constantly confirming mr fairbrother's assurance that the banker would not overlook opposition confound their petty politics was one of his thoughts for three mornings in the meditative process of shaving when he had begun to feel that he must really hold a court of conscience on this matter certainly there were valid things to be said against the election of mr fairbrother he had too much on his hands already especially considering how much time he spent on non-clerical occupations then again it was a continually repeated shock disturbing lydgate's esteem that the vicar should obviously play for the sake of money liking the play indeed but evidently liking some end which it served mr fairbrother contended on theory for the desirability of all games and said that englishmen's wit was stagnant for want of them but lydgate felt certain that he would have played very much less but for money there was a billiard room at the green dragon which some anxious mothers and wives regarded as the chief temptation in middlemarch the vicar was a first-rate billiard player and though he did not frequent the green dragon there were reports that he had sometimes been there in the daytime and had won money and as to the chaplaincy he did not pretend that he cared for it except for the sake of the forty pounds lydgate was no puritan but he did not care for play and winning money at it had always seemed a meanness to him besides he had an ideal of life which made this subservience of conduct to the gaining of small sums thoroughly hateful to him hitherto in his own life his wants had been supplied without any trouble to himself and his first impulse was always to be liberal with half-crowns as matters of no importance to a gentleman it had never occurred to him to devise a plan for getting half-crowns he had always known in a general way that he was not rich but he had never felt poor and he had no power of imagining the part which the want of money plays in determining the actions of men 
money had never been a motive to him hence he was not ready to frame excuses for this deliberate pursuit of small gains it was altogether repulsive to him and he never entered into any calculation of the ratio between the vicar's income and his more or less necessary expenditure it was possible that he would not have made such a calculation in his own case and now when the question of voting had come this repulsive fact told more strongly against mr fairbrother than it had done before one would know much better what to do if men's characters were more consistent and especially if one's friends were invariably fit for any function they desired to undertake lydgate was convinced that if there had been no valid objection to mr fairbrother he would have voted for him whatever bulstrode might have felt on the subject he did not intend to be a vassal of bulstrode's on the other hand there was tyke a man entirely given to his clerical office who was simply curate at a chapel of ease in st peter's parish and had time for extra duty nobody had anything to say against mr tyke except that they could not bear him and suspected him of cant really from his point of view bulstrode was thoroughly justified but whichever way lydgate began to incline there was something to make him wince and being a proud man he was a little exasperated at being obliged to wince he did not like frustrating his own best purposes by getting on bad terms with bulstrode he did not like voting against fairbrother and helping to deprive him of function and salary and the question occurred whether the additional forty pounds might not leave the vicar free from the ignoble care about winning at cards moreover lydgate did not like the consciousness that in voting for tyke he should be voting on the side obviously convenient for himself but would the end really be his own convenience other people would say so and would allege that he was scurrying favour with bulstrode for the sake of making himself important and getting on in the world what then he for his own part knew that if his personal prospects simply had been concerned he would not have cared a rotten nut for the banker's friendship or enmity what he really cared for was a medium for his work a vehicle for his ideas and after all was he not bound to prefer the object of getting a good hospital where he could demonstrate the specific distinctions of fever and test therapeutic results before anything else connected with this chaplaincy for the first time lydgate was feeling the hampering thread-like pressure of small social conditions and their frustrating complexity at the end of his inward debate when he set out for the hospital his hope was really in the chance that discussion might somehow give a new aspect to the question and make the scale dip so as to exclude the necessity for voting i think he trusted a little also to the energy which is begotten by circumstances some feeling rushing warmly and making resolve easy while debate in cool blood had only made it more difficult however it was he did not distinctly say to himself on which side he would vote and all the while he was inwardly resenting the subjection which had been forced upon him it would have seemed beforehand like a ridiculous piece of bad logic that he with his unmixed resolutions of independence and his select purposes would find himself at the very outset in the grasp of petty alternatives each of which was repugnant to him in his student's chambers he had prearranged his social action quite differently lydgate was late in setting out but dr sprague the two other surgeons and several of the directors had arrived early mr bulstrode treasurer and chairman being among those who were still absent the conversation seemed to imply that the issue was problematical and that a majority for tyke was not so certain as had been generally supposed the two physicians for a wonder turned out to be unanimous or rather though of different minds they concurred in action dr sprague the rugged and weighty was as every one had foreseen an adherent of mr fairbrother the doctor was more than suspected of having no religion but somehow middlemarch tolerated his deficiency in him as if he had been a lord chancellor 
Indeed, it is probable that his professional weight was the more believed in, the world old association of cleverness with the evil principle being still potent in the minds even of lady patients who had the strictest ideas of frilling and sentiment. It was perhaps this negation in the doctor which made his neighbors call him hard-headed and dry-witted. Conditions of texture which were also held favorable to the storing of judgments connected with drugs. At all events, it is certain that if any medical man had come to Middlemarch with the reputation of having very definite religious views, of being given to prayer, and of otherwise showing an active piety, there would have been a general presumption against his medical skill. On this ground, it was, professionally speaking, fortunate for Dr. Minchin that his religious sympathies were of a general kind, and such as gave a distant medical sanction to all serious sentiment, whether of church or dissent, rather than any adhesion to particular tenets. If Mr. Bulstrode insisted, as he was apt to do, on the Lutheran doctrine of justification, as that by which a church must stand or fall, Dr. Minchin, in return, was quite sure that man was not a mere machine or a fortuitous conjunction of atoms. If Mrs. Wimple insisted on a particular providence in relation to her stomach complaint, Dr. Minchin, for his part, liked to keep the mental windows open and objected to fixed limits. If the Unitarian brewer jested about the Athanasian creed, Dr. Minchin quoted Pope's essay on man. He objected to the rather free style of anecdote in which Dr. Sprague indulged, preferring well-sanctioned quotations, and liking refinement of all kinds. It was generally known that he had some kinship to a bishop, and sometimes spent his holidays at the palace. Dr. Minchin was soft-handed, pale-complexioned, and of rounded outline, not to be distinguished from a mild clergyman in appearance. Whereas Dr. Sprague was superfluously tall, his trousers got creased at the knees, and showed an excess of boot at a time when straps seemed necessary to any dignity of bearing. You heard him go in and out, and up and down, as if he had come to see after the roofing. In short, he had weight, and might be expected to grapple with a disease and throw it while Dr. Minchin might be better able to detect it lurking and to circumvent it. They enjoyed about equally the mysterious privilege of medical reputation, and concealed with much etiquette their contempt for each other's skill. Regarding themselves as Middlemarch institutions, they were ready to combine against all innovators and against non-professionals given to interference. On this ground, they were both in their hearts equally averse to Mr. Bulstrode, though Dr. Minchin had never been in open hostility with him, and never differed from him without elaborate explanation to Mrs. Bulstrode, who had found that Dr. Minchin alone understood her constitution. A layman who pried into the professional conduct of medical men, and was always obtruding his reforms, though he was less directly embarrassing to the two physicians than to the surgeon apothecaries who attended paupers by contract, was nevertheless offensive to the professional nostril as such. And Dr. Minchin shared fully in the new pique against Bulstrode, excited by his apparent determination to patronize Lydgate. The long-established practitioners, Mr. Wrench and Mr. Toller, were just now standing apart and having a friendly colloquy, in which they agreed that Lydgate was a jack and apes, just made to serve Bulstrode's purpose. To non-medical friends, they had already concurred in praising the other young practitioner, who had come into the town on Mr. Peacock's retirement without further recommendation than his own merits and such argument for solid professional acquirement as might be gathered from his having apparently wasted no time on other branches of knowledge. It was clear that Lydgate, by not dispensing drugs, intended to cast imputations on his equals and also to obscure the limit between his own rank as a general practitioner and that of the physicians, who, in the interest of the profession, felt bound to maintain its various grades. 
especially against a man who had not been to either of the english universities and enjoyed the absence of anatomical and bedside study there but came with a libellous pretension to experience in edinburgh and paris where observation might be abundant indeed but hardly sound thus it happened that on this occasion bulstrode became identified with lydgate and lydgate with dyke and owing to this variety of interchangeable names for the chaplaincy question diverse minds were enabled to form the same judgment concerning it dr sprague said at once bluntly to the group assembled when he entered i go for fair brother a salary with all my heart but why take it from the vicar he has none too much has to insure his life besides keeping house and doing a vicar's charities put forty pounds in his pocket and you will do no harm he is a good fellow is fair brother with as little of the parson about him as will serve to carry orders ho ho doctor said old mr powderell a retired ironmonger of some standing his interjection being something between a laugh and a parliamentary disapproval we must let you have your say but what we have to consider is not anybody's income it is the souls of the poor sick people here mr powderell's voice and face had a sincere pathos in them he is a real gospel preacher is mr tyke i should vote against my conscience if i voted against mr tyke i should indeed mr tyke's opponents have not asked any one to vote against his conscience i believe said mr hackbutt a rich tanner of fluent speech whose glittering spectacles and erect hair were turned with some severity towards innocent mr powderell but in my judgment it behoves us as directors to consider whether we will regard it as our whole business to carry out propositions emanating from a single quarter will any member of the committee aver that he would have entertained the idea of displacing the gentleman who has always discharged the function of chaplain here if it had not been suggested to him by parties whose disposition it is to regard every institution of this room as a machinery for carrying out their own views i tax no man's motives let them lie between himself and a higher power but i do say that there are influences at work here which are incompatible with genuine independence and that a crawling servility is usually dictated by circumstances which gentlemen so conducting themselves could not afford either morally or financially to avow i myself am a layman but i have given no inconsiderable attention to the divisions in the church and oh damn the divisions burst in mr frank holly lawyer and town clerk who rarely presented himself at the board but now looked in hurriedly whip in hand we have nothing to do with them here fair brother has been doing the work what there was without pay and if pay is to be given it should be given to him i call it a confounded job to take the thing away from fair brother i think it would be as well for gentlemen not to give their remarks a personal bearing said mr plimdale i shall vote for the appointment of mr tyke but i should not have known if mr hackbutt hadn't hinted it that i was a servile crawler i disclaim any personalities I expressly said, if I may be allowed to repeat, or even to conclude what I was about to say. Ah, here is Minchin, said Mr. Frank Holly, at which everybody turned away from Mr. Hackbutt, leaving him to feel the uselessness of superior gifts in Middlemarch. Come, doctor, I must have you on the right side, eh? I hope so, said Dr. Minchin, nodding and shaking hands here and there, at whatever cost to my feelings if there's any feeling here it should be feeling for the man who is turned out i think said mr frank holly i confess i have feelings on the other side also i have a divided esteem said dr minchin rubbing his hands i consider mr tyke an exemplary man none more so and i believe him to be proposed from unimpeachable motives i for my part wish that i could give him my vote but i am constrained to take a view of the case which gives the preponderance to mr fairbrother's claims he is an amiable man 
an able preacher, and has been longer among us. Old Mr. Powderell looked on, sad and silent. Mr. Plimdale settled his cravat uneasily. "'You don't set up Fairbrother as a pattern of what a clergyman ought to be, I hope,' said Mr. Larcher, the eminent carrier who had just come in. "'I have no ill-will towards him, but I think we owe something to the public, not to speak of anything higher, in these appointments. In my opinion, Fairbrother is too lax for a clergyman. I don't wish to bring up particulars against him, but he will make a little attendance here go as far as he can.' "'And a devilish deal better than too much,' said Mr. Hawley, "'whose bad language was notorious in that part of the county. "'Sick people can't bear so much praying and preaching, "'and that methodistical sort of religion is bad for the spirits. "'Bad for the inside, eh?' he added, "'turning quickly round to the four medical men who were assembled. "'But any answer was dispensed with by the entrance of three gentlemen, "'with whom there were greetings more or less cordial.' These were the Reverend Edward Thesiger, Rector of St. Peter's, Mr. Bulstrode, and our friend Mr. Brooke of Tipton, who had lately allowed himself to be put on the board of directors in his turn, but had never before attended, his attendance now being due to Mr. Bulstrode's exertions. Lydgate was the only person still expected. Everyone now sat down, Mr. Bulstrode presiding, pale and self-restrained as usual. Mr. Thesiger, a moderate evangelical, wished for the appointment of his friend Mr. Tyke, a zealous, able man, who, officiating at the chapel of ease, had not a cure of souls too extensive to leave him ample time for the new duty. It was desirable that the chaplaincies of this kind should be entered on with a fervent intention. There were particular opportunities for spiritual influence, and while it was good that a salary should be allotted, there was the more need for scrupulous watching lest the office should be perverted into a mere question of salary. Mr. Thesiger's manner had so much quiet propriety that objectors could only simmer in silence. Mr. Brooke believed that everybody meant well in the matter. He had not himself attended to the affairs of the infirmary, though he had a strong interest in whatever was for the benefit of Middlemarch, and was most happy to meet the gentleman present on any public question. "'Any public question, you know,' Mr. Brooke repeated, with his nod of perfect understanding. "'I am a good deal occupied as a magistrate, and in the collection of documentary evidence, but I regard my time as being at the disposal of the public.' and in short my friends have convinced me that a chaplain with a salary a salary you know is a very good thing and i am happy to be able to come here and vote for the appointment of mr tyke who i understand is an unexceptionable man apostolic and eloquent and everything of that kind and i am the last man to withhold my vote under the circumstances you know it seems to me that you have been crammed with one side of the question, Mr. Brooke, said Mr. Frank Hawley, who was afraid of nobody, and was a Tory suspicious of electioneering intentions. You don't seem to know that one of the worthiest men we have has been doing duty as a chaplain here for years without pay, and that Mr. Tyke is proposed to supersede him. Excuse me, Mr. Hawley, said Mr. Bulstrode. Mr. Brooke has been fully informed of Mr. Fairbrother's character and position by his enemies flashed out mr hawley i trust there is no personal hostility concerned here said mr thesiger i will swear there is though retorted mr hawley gentlemen said mr bulstrode in a subdued tone the merits of the question may be very briefly stated and if any one present doubts that every gentleman who is about to give his vote has not been fully informed i can now recapitulate the considerations that should weigh on either side i don't see the good of that said mr hawley i suppose we all know whom we mean to vote for any man who wants to do justice does not wait till the last minute to hear both sides of the question I have no time to lose, and I propose that the matter be put to the vote at once. A brief but still hot discussion followed before each person wrote 
tyke or fair brother on a piece of paper and slipped it into a glass tumbler and in the meantime mr bulstrode saw lydgate enter i perceive that the votes are equally divided at present said mr bulstrode in a clear biting voice then looking up at lydgate there is a casting vote still to be given it is yours mr lydgate will you be good enough to write the thing is settled now said mr wrench rising we all know how mr lydgate will vote you seem to speak with some peculiar meaning sir said lydgate rather defiantly and keeping his pencil suspended i merely mean that you are expected to vote with mr bulstrode do you regard that meaning as offensive it may be offensive to others but i shall not desist from voting with him on that account lydgate immediately wrote down tyke so the reverend walter tyke became chaplain to the infirmary and lydgate continued to work with mr bulstrode he was really uncertain whether tyke were not the more suitable candidate and yet his consciousness told him that if he had been quite free from indirect bias he should have voted for mr fairbrother the affair of the chaplaincy remained a sore point in his memory as a case in which this petty medium of middle march had been too strong for him how could a man be satisfied with a decision between such alternatives and under such circumstances no more than he can be satisfied with his hat which he has chosen from among such shapes as the resources of the age offer him wearing it at best with a resignation which is chiefly supported by comparison but mr fairbrother met him with the same friendliness as before the character of the publican and sinner is not always practically incompatible with that of the modern pharisee for the majority of us scarcely see more distinctly the faultiness of our own conduct than the faultiness of our own arguments or the dullness of our own jokes but the vicar of st potol's had certainly escaped the slightest tincture of the pharisee and by dint of admitting to himself that he was too much as other men were he had become remarkably unlike them in this that he could excuse others for thinking slightly of him and could judge impartially of their conduct even when it told against him the world has been too strong for me i know he said one day to lydgate but then i am not a mighty man i shall never be a man of renown the choice of hercules is a pretty fable but prodicus makes it easy work for the hero as if the first results were enough another story says that he came to hold the distaff and at last wore the nicious shirt i suppose one good resolve might keep a man right if everybody else's resolve helped him the vicar's talk was not always inspiriting he had escaped being a pharisee but he had not escaped that low estimate of possibilities which we rather hastily arrive at as an inference from our own failure lydgate thought that there was a pitiable infirmity of will in mr fairbrother End of chapter 18 Recording by Red Abrus January 2008all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Red Abrus. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter 19. El ultra vedete cha ha fato alla guancia. Della sua palma. Sospirando leto. Purgatorio 7. When George the Fourth was still reigning over the privacies of Windsor, when the Duke of Wellington was Prime Minister, and Mr. Vincey was Mayor of the old corporation in Middlemarch, Mrs. Casuabon, born Dorothea Brooke, had taken her wedding journey to Rome. In those days the world in general was more ignorant of good and evil 
by forty years than it is at present travellers did not often carry full information on christian art either in their heads or their pockets and even the most brilliant english critic of the day mistook the flower-flushed tomb of the ascended virgin for an ornamental vase due to the painter's fancy romanticism which has helped to fill some dull blanks with love and knowledge had not yet penetrated the times with its leaven and entered into everybody's food it was fermenting still as a distinguishable vigorous enthusiasm in certain long-haired german artists at rome and the youth of other nations who worked or idled near them were sometimes caught in the spreading movement one fine morning a young man whose hair was not immoderately long but abundant and curly and who was otherwise english in his equipment had just turned his back on the belvedere torso in the vatican and was looking out on the magnificent view of the mountains from the adjoining round vestibule he was sufficiently absorbed not to notice the approach of a dark-eyed animated german who came up to him and placing a hand on his shoulder said with a strong accent come here quick else she will have changed her pose quickness was ready at the call and the two figures passed lightly along by the milliager towards the hall where the reclining ariadne then called the cleopatra lies in the marble voluptuousness of her beauty the drapery folding around her with a petal-like ease and tenderness they were just in time to see another figure standing against a pedestal near the reclining marble a breathing blooming girl whose form not shamed by the ariadne was clad in a quakerish grey drapery her long cloak fastened at the neck was thrown backward from her arms and one beautiful ungloved hand pillowed her cheek pushing somewhat backward the white beaver bonnet which made a sort of halo to her face around the simply braided dark brown hair she was not looking at the sculpture probably not thinking of it her large eyes were fixed dreamily on a streak of sunlight which fell across the floor but she became conscious of the two strangers who suddenly paused as if to contemplate the cleopatra and without looking at them immediately turned away to join a maid-servant and courier who were loitering along the hall at a little distance off what do you think of that for a fine bit of antithesis said the german searching in his friend's face for responding admiration but going on volubly without waiting for any other answer there lies antique beauty not corpse-like even in the death but arrested in the complete contentment of its sensuous perfection and here stands beauty in its breathing life with the consciousness of christian centuries in its bosom but she would be dressed as a nun i think she looks almost what you call a quaker i would dress her as a nun in my picture however she is married i saw her wedding ring on that wonderful left hand otherwise i should have thought the sallow gazed lisher was her father i saw him parting from her a good while ago and just now i found her in that magnificent pose only think he is perhaps rich and would like to have her portrait taken ah it's no use looking after her there she goes let us follow her home no no said his companion with a little frown you are singular larislaw you look struck together do you know her i know that she is married to my cousin said will larislaw sauntering down the hall with a preoccupied air while his german friend kept at his side and watched him eagerly what the gaislisher he looks more like an uncle a more useful sort of relation he is not my uncle i tell you he is my second cousin said ladislaw with some irritation scorn scorn don't be snappish you are not angry with me for thinking mrs second cousin the most perfect young madonna i ever saw angry nonsense i have only seen her once before for a couple of minutes when my cousin introduced her to me just before i left england they were not married then i didn't know they were coming to rome but you will go to see them now you will find out what they have for an address since you know the name 
Shall we go to the post? And you could speak about the portrait. Confound you, Norman! I don't know what I shall do. I am not so brazen as you. Bah! That is because you are dilettantish and amateurish. If you were an artist, you would think of Mistress Second Cousin as antique form animated by Christian sentiment, a sort of Christian antigone, sensuous force controlled by spiritual passion. Yes, and that your painting her was the chief outcome of her existence, the divinity passing into higher completeness and all but exhausted in the act of covering your bit of canvas. I am amateurist, if you like. I do not think that all the universe is straining towards the obscure significance of your pictures. But it is, my dear, so far as it is straining through me, Adolf Norman, that stands firm, said the good-natured painter, putting a hand on Ladislaw's shoulder, and not in the least disturbed by the unaccountable touch of ill-humour in his tone. See now? My existence presupposes the existence of the whole universe, does it not? And my function is to paint, and as a painter I have a conception which is altogether genialish of your great-aunt or second-grandmother as a subject for a picture. Therefore, the universe is straining towards that picture through that particular hook or claw which it puts forth in the shape of me. Not true? but how if another claw in the shape of me is straining to thwart it the case is a little less simple then not at all the result of the struggle is the same thing picture or no picture logically will could not resist this imperturbable temper and the cloud in his face broke into sunshiny laughter come now my friend you will help said norman in a hopeful tone no nonsense norman english ladies are not at everybody's service as models and you want to express too much with your painting. You would only have made a better or worse portrait with a background which every connoisseur would give a different reason for or against. And what is a portrait of a woman? Your painting and plastic are poor stuff after all. They perturb and dull conceptions instead of raising them. Language is a finer medium. Yes, for those who can't paint, said Norman. There, you have perfect right. I did not recommend you to paint, my friend. The amiable artist carried his sting, but Ladislaw did not choose to appear stung. He went on as if he had not heard. Language gives a fuller image, which is all the better for being vague. After all, the true seeing is within, and painting stares at you with an insistent imperfection. I feel that especially about representations of women, as if a woman were a mere coloured superficies. You must wait for movement and tone. There is a difference in their very breathing. They change from moment to moment. This woman, whom you have just seen, for example, how would you paint her voice? Pray? But her voice is much diviner than anything you have seen of her. I see, I see. You are jealous. No man must presume to think that he can paint your ideal. This is serious, my friend. Your great-aunt. Der Nefe als Onkel, in a tragic sense, un You and I shall quarrel now, man, if you call that lady my aunt again. How is she to be called then? Mrs. Kossaubon. Good. Suppose I get acquainted with her in spite of you, and find that she very much wishes to be painted. Yes, suppose, said Will Ladislaw, in a contemptuous undertone, intended to dismiss the subject. He was conscious of being irritated by ridiculously small causes, which were half of his own creation. Why was he making any fuss about Mrs. Casaubon? And yet he felt as if something had happened to him with regard to her. There are characters which are continually creating collisions and nodes for themselves in dramas, which nobody is prepared to act with them. Their susceptibilities will clash against objects that remain innocently quiet. End of chapter 19. Recording by Red Abras. January 2008. Chapter 20 of Middlemarch. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Red Abris. Middle March by George Eliot. Chapter 20 A child forsaken, waking suddenly, whose gaze afeard on all things round doth rove, and seeth only that it cannot see the meeting eyes of love. Two hours later, Dorothea was seated in an inner room or border of a handsome apartment in the Via Sistina. I am sorry to add that she was sobbing bitterly, with such abandonment to this relief of an oppressed heart as a woman habitually controlled by pride on her own account and thoughtfulness for others will sometimes allow herself when she feels securely alone. And Mrs. Cosobon was certain to remain away for some time at the Vatican. Yet Dorothea had no distinctly shapen grievance that she could state even to herself, and in the midst of her confused thought and passion, the mental act that was struggling forth into clearness was a self-accusing cry that her feeling of desolation was the fault of her own spiritual poverty. She had married the man of her choice, and with the advantage over most girls that she had contemplated her marriage chiefly as the beginning of new duties. From the very first she had thought of Mr. Cosobon as having a mind so much above her own, that he must often be claimed by studies which she could not entirely share. Moreover, after the brief narrow experience of her girlhood she was beholding Rome, the city of visible history, where the past of a whole hemisphere seems moving in funeral procession with strange ancestral images and trophies gathered from afar. But this stupendous fragmentariness heightened the dreamlike strangeness of her bridal life. Dorothea had now been five weeks in Rome, and in the kindly mornings when autumn and winter seemed to go hand in hand like a happy aged couple, one of whom would presently survive in chiller loneliness, she had driven about at first with Mr. Cosobon, but of late chiefly with Tantrip and their experienced courier. She had been led through the best galleries, had been taken to the chief points of view, and had been shown the grandest ruins and the most glorious churches, and she had ended by oftenest choosing to drive out to the Campagna, where she could feel alone with the earth and sky, away from the oppressive masquerade of ages in which her own life, too, seemed to become a mask with enigmatical costumes. To those who have looked at Rome with the quickening power of a knowledge which breathes a growing soul into all historic shapes and traces out the suppressed transitions which unite all contrasts, Rome may still be the spiritual center and interpreter of the world. But let them conceive one more historical contrast, the gigantic broken revelations of that imperial and papal city thrust abruptly on the notions of a girl who had been brought up in English and Swiss Puritanism, fed on meagre Protestant histories and on art chiefly of the hand-screen sort, a girl whose ardent nature turned all her small allowance of knowledge into principles, fusing her actions into their mould, and whose quick emotions gave the most abstract things the quality of a pleasure or a pain, a girl who had lately become a wife, and from the enthusiastic acceptance of untried duty found herself plunged in tumultuous preoccupation with her personal lot. The weight of unintelligible Rome might lie easily on bright nymphs to whom it formed a background for the brilliant picnic of Anglo-foreign society, but Dorothea had no such defense against deep impressions. Ruins and basilicas, palaces and colossi, set in the midst of a sordid present, where all that was living and warm-blooded seemed sunk in the deep degeneracy of a superstition divorced from reverence. The dimmer but yet eager titanic life, gazing and struggling on walls and ceilings, the long vistas of white forms whose marble eyes seemed to hold the monotonous light of an alien world. All this vast wreck of ambitious ideals, sensuous and spiritual, mixed confusedly with the signs of breathing forgetfulness and degradation, at first jarred her as with an electric shock, 
and then urged themselves on her with that ache belonging to a glut of confused ideas which check the flow of emotion forms both pale and glowing took possession of her young sense and fixed themselves in her memory even when she was not thinking of them preparing strange associations which remained through her after years our moods are apt to bring with them images which succeeded each other like the magic lantern pictures of a doze and in certain states of dull forlornness dorothea all her life continued to see the vastness of saint peter's the huge bronze canopy the excited intention in the attitudes and garments of the prophets and evangelists in the mosaics above and the red drapery which was being hung for christmas spreading itself everywhere like a disease of the retina not that this inward amazement of dorothea's was anything very exceptional many souls in their young nudity are tumbled out among incongruities and left to find their feet among them while their elders go about their business nor can i suppose that when mrs cosobon is discovered in a fit of weeping six weeks after her wedding the situation will be regarded as tragic some discouragement some faintness of heart at the new real future which replaces the imaginary is not unusual and we do not expect people to be deeply moved by what is not unusual that element of tragedy which lies in the very fact of frequency has not yet wrought itself into the coarse emotion of mankind and perhaps our frames could hardly bear much of it if we had a keen vision and feeling of all ordinary human life it would be like hearing the grass grow and the squirrel's heartbeat and we should die of that roar which lies on the other side of silence as it is the quickest of us walk about well waded with stupidity however dorothea was crying and if she had been required to state the cause she could only have done so in some such general words as i have already used to have been driven to be more particular would have been like trying to give a history of the lights and shadows for that new real future which was replacing the imaginary drew its material from the endless minutia by which her view of mr cosobon and her wifely relation now that she was married to him was gradually changing with the secret motion of a watch hand from what it had been in her maiden dream it was too early yet for her fully to recognize or at least admit the change still more of her to have readjusted that devotedness which was so necessary a part of a mental life that she was almost sure sooner or later to recover it permanent rebellion the disorder of a life without some loving reverent resolve was not possible to her but she was now in an interval when the very force of her nature heightened its confusion in this way the early months of marriage often are times of critical tumult whether that of a shrimp pool or of deeper waters which afterwards subsides into cheerful peace but was not mr cosobon just as learned as before had his forms of expression changed or his sentiments become less laudable of oh, waywardness of womanhood did his chronology fail him or his ability to state not only a theory but the names of those who held it or his provision for giving the heads of any subject on demand and was not rome the place in all the world to give free play to such accomplishments besides had not dorothea's enthusiasm especially dwelt on the prospect of relieving the weight and perhaps the sadness with which great tasks lie on him who has to achieve them and that such weight pressed on mr cosobon was only plainer than before all these are crushing questions but whatever else remained the same the light had changed and you cannot find the pearly dawn at noonday the fact is unalterable that a fellow mortal with whose nature you are acquainted solely through the brief entrances and exist of a few imaginative weeks called courtship may when seen in the continuity of married companionship be disclosed as something better or worse than what you have preconceived but will certainly not appear altogether the same and it would be astonishing to find how soon the change is felt if we had no kindred changes to compare with it to share lodgings with a brilliant dinner companion or to see your favorite politician in the ministry may bring about changes quite as rapid 
In these cases, too, we begin by knowing little and believing much, and we sometimes end by inverting the quantities. Still, such comparisons might mislead, for no man was more incapable of flashy make-believe than Mr. Cossabon. He was as genuine a character as any ruminant animal, and he had not actively assisted in creating any illusions about himself. How was it that in the weeks since her marriage, Dorothea had not distinctly observed but felt with a stifling depression that the large vistas and wide fresh air which she had dreamed of finding in her husband's mind were replaced by anterooms and winding passages which seemed to lead no whither? I suppose it was that in courtship everything is regarded as provisional and preliminary, and the smallest sample of virtue or accomplishment is taken to guarantee delightful stores which the broad leisure of marriage will reveal. But the door sill of marriage once crossed, expectation is concentrated on the present. Having once embarked on your marital voyage, it is impossible not to be aware that you make no way, and that the sea is not within sight, that, in fact, you are exploring an enclosed basin. In their conversation before marriage, Mr. Cossabon had often dwelt on some explanation or questionable detail of which Dorothea did not see the bearing, but such imperfect coherence seemed due to the brokenness of their intercourse, and, supported by her faith in their future, she had listened with fervid patience to a recitation of possible arguments to be brought against Mr. Cossabon's entirely new view of the Philistine god Dagon and other fish deities, thinking that, hereafter she should see this subject which touched him so nearly from the same high ground whence doubtless it had become so important to him again the matter of course statement and tone of dismissal with which he treated what to her were the most stirring thoughts was easily accounted for as belonging to the sense of haste and preoccupation in which she herself shared during their engagement but now since they had been in Rome, with all the depths of her emotion roused to tumultuous activity, and with life made a new problem by new elements, she had been becoming more and more aware, with a certain terror, that her mind was continually sliding into inward fits of anger and repulsion, or else into forlorn weariness. How far the judicious hooker or any other hero of erudition would have been the same at Mr. Cossabon's time of life, she had no means of knowing, so that he could not have the advantage of comparison, but her husband's way of commenting on the strangely impressive objects around them had begun to affect her with a sort of mental shiver. He had perhaps the best intention of acquitting himself worthily, but only of acquitting himself. What was fresh to her mind was worn out to his, and such capacity of thought and feeling as had ever been stimulated in him by the general life of mankind had long shrunk to a sort of dried preparation, a lifeless embalmment of knowledge. When he said, Does this interest you, Dorothea? Shall we stay a little longer? I am ready to stay if you wish it. It seemed to her as if going or staying were alike dreary. Or should you like to go to the Farnesina, Dorothea? It contains celebrated frescoes designed or painted by Raphael, which most persons think it worth while to visit. But do you care about them? was always Dorothea's question. They are, I believe, highly esteemed. Some of them represent the fable of Cupid and Psyche, which is probably the romantic invention of a literary period, and cannot, I think, be reckoned as a genuine mythical product. But if you like these wall paintings, we can easily drive thither, and you will then, I think, have seen the chief works of Raphael, any of which it were a pity to omit in a visit to Rome. He is the painter who has been held to combine the most complete grace of form with sublimity of expression. Such at least I have gathered to be the opinion of Cognoscenti. This kind of answer, given in a measured official tone, as of a clergyman reading according to the rubric, did not help to justify the glories of the eternal city, or to give her the hope that if she knew more about them, the world would be joyously illuminated for her. 
there is hardly any contact more depressing to a young ardent creature than that of a mind in which years full of knowledge seem to have issued in a blank absence of interest or sympathy on other subjects indeed mr cosimon showed a tenacity of occupation and an eagerness which are usually regarded as the effect of enthusiasm and dorothea was anxious to follow this spontaneous direction of his thoughts instead of being made to feel that she dragged him away from it but she was gradually ceasing to expect with her former delightful confidence that she should see any wide opening where she followed him poor mr cosimon himself was lost among small closets and winding stairs and in an agitated dimness about the cabaret or in an exposure of other mythologists ill-considered parallels easily lost sight of any purpose which had prompted him to these labours with his taper stuck before him he forgot the absence of windows and in bitter manuscript remarks on the other men's notions about the solar deities he had become indifferent to the sunlight these characteristics fixed and unchangeable as born in mr cosabon might have remained longer unfelt by dorothea if she had been encouraged to pour forth her girlish and womanly feeling if he would have held her hands between his and listened with the delight of tenderness and understanding to all the little histories which made up her experience and would have given her the same sort of intimacy in return so that the past life of each could be included in their mutual knowledge and affection or if she could have fed her affection with those childlike caresses which are the bent of every sweet woman who has begun by showering kisses on the hard pate of her bald doll creating a happy soul within that woodenness from the wealth of her own love that was dorothea's bent with all her yearning to know what was afar from her and to be widely benignant she had ardour enough for what was near to have kissed mr cosabon's coat sleeve or to have caressed his shoe latchet if he would have made any other sign of acceptance than pronouncing her with his unfailing propriety to be of a most affectionate and truly feminine nature indicating at the same time by politely reaching a chair for her that he regarded these manifestations as rather crude and startling having made his clerical toilet with due care in the morning he was prepared only for those amenities of life which were suited to the well-adjusted stiff cravat of the period and to a mind weighted with unpublished matter and by a sad contradiction dorothea's ideas and resolves seemed like melting ice floating and lost in the warm flood of which they had been but another form she was humiliated to find herself a mere victim of feeling as if she could know nothing except through that medium all her strength was scattered in fits of agitation of struggle of despondency and then again in visions of more complete renunciation transforming all hard conditions into duty poor dorothea she was certainly troublesome to herself chiefly but this morning for the first time she had been troublesome to mr cosabon she had begun while they were taking coffee with a determination to shake off what she inwardly called her selfishness and turned a face all cheerful attention to her husband when he said my dear dorothea we must now think of all that is yet left undone as a preliminary to our departure i would fain have returned home earlier that we might have been at lowick for the christmas but my inquiries here have been protracted beyond their anticipated period i trust however that the time here has not been passed unpleasantly to you among the sights of europe that of rome has ever been held one of the most striking and in some respects edifying i well remember that i considered it an epoch in my life when i visited it for the first time after the fall of napoleon an event which opened the continent to travellers indeed i think it is one among several cities to which an extreme hyperbole has been applied see rome and die but in your case i would propose an emendation and say see rome as a bride and live henceforth as a happy wife mr cosabon pronounced this little speech with the most conscientious intention blinking a little and swaying his head up and down and concluding with a smile 
he had not found marriage a rapturous state but he had no idea of being anything else than an irreproachable husband who would make a charming young woman as happy as she deserved to be i hope you are thoroughly satisfied with our stay i mean with the result so far as your studies are concerned said dorothea trying to keep her mind fixed on what most affected her husband yes said mr Cosabon, with that peculiar pitch of voice which makes the word half a negative i have been led farther than i had foreseen and various subjects for annotation have presented themselves which though i have no direct need of them i could not pretermit the task notwithstanding the assistance of my amanuensis has been a somewhat laborious one but your society has happily prevented me from that too continuous prosecution of thought beyond the hours of study which has been the snare of my solitary life i am very glad that my presence has made any difference to you said dorothea who had a vivid memory of evenings in which she had supposed that mr cosabon's mind had gone too deep during the day to be able to get to the surface again i fear there was a little temper in her reply i hope when we get to lowick i shall be more useful to you and be able to enter a little more into what interests you doubtless my dear said mr cosabon with a slight bow the notes i have here made will want sifting and you can if you please extract them under my direction and all your notes said dorothea whose heart had already burned within her on this subject so that now she could not help speaking with her tongue all those rows of volumes will you not now do what you used to speak of will you not make up your mind what part of them you will use and begin to write the book which will make your vast knowledge useful to the world i will write to your dictation or i will copy and extract what you tell me i can be of no other use dorothea in a most unaccountable darkly feminine manner ended with a slight sob and eyes full of tears the excessive feeling manifested would alone have been highly disturbing to mr Cosabon, but there were other reasons why dorothea's words were among the most cutting and irritating to him that she could have been impelled to use she was as blind to his inward troubles as he to hers she had not yet learned those hidden conflicts in her husband which claim our pity she had not yet listened patiently to his heartbeats but only felt that her own was beating violently in mr Cosabon's ear dorothea's voice gave loud emphatic iteration to those muffled suggestions of consciousness which it was possible to explain as mere fancy the illusion of exaggerated sensitiveness always when such suggestions are unmistakably repeated from without they are resisted as cruel and unjust we are angered even by the full acceptance of our humiliating confessions how much more by hearing in hard distinct syllables from the lips of a near observer those confused murmurs which we try to call morbid and strive against as if they were the oncoming of numbness and this cruel outward accuser was there in the shape of a wife nay of a young bride who instead of observing his abundant pen scratches and amplitude of paper with the uncritical awe of an elegant-minded canary bird seemed to present herself as a spy watching everything with a malign power of inference here towards this particular point of the compass mr Cosabon had a sensitiveness to match dorothea's and an equal quickness to imagine more than the fact he had formerly observed with the approbation her capacity for worshipping the right object he now foresaw with sudden terror that his capacity might be replaced by presumption this worship by the most exasperating of all criticism that which sees vaguely a great many finance and has not the least notion what it costs to reach them for the first time since dorothea had known him mr Cosabon's face had a quick angry flush upon it my love he said with irritation reined in by propriety you may rely upon me for knowing the times and the seasons adapted to the different stages of a work which is not to be measured by the facile conjectures of ignorant onlookers it had been easy for me to gain a temporary effect by a mirage of baseless opinion but it is ever the trial of the scrupulous explorer to be saluted with the impatient scorn of chatterers 
who attempt only the smallest achievements being indeed equipped for no other and it were well if all such could be admonished to discriminate judgments of which the true subject matter lies entirely beyond their reach from those of which the elements may be compassed by a narrow and superficial survey the speech was delivered with an energy and readiness quite unusual with mr Cosabon. it was not indeed entirely an improvisation but had taken shape in inward colloquy and rushed out like the round grains from a fruit when sudden heat cracks it dorothea was not only his wife she was a personification of that shallow world which surrounds the appreciated or desponding author dorothea was indignant in her turn had she not been repressing everything in herself except the desire to enter into some fellowship with her husband's chief interests my judgment was a very superficial one such as i am capable of forming she answered with a prompt resentment that needed no rehearsal you showed me the rows of notebooks you have often spoken of them you have often said that they wanted digesting but i never heard you speak of the writing that is to be published those were very simple facts and my judgment went no farther i only begged you to let me be of some good to you dorothea rose to leave the table and mr Cosabon made no reply taking up a letter which lay beside him as if to reperuse it both were shocked at their mutual situation that each should have betrayed anger towards the other if they had been at home settled at lowick in ordinary life among their neighbors the clash would have been less embarrassing but on a wedding journey the express object of which is to isolate two people on the ground that they are all the world to each other the sense of disagreement is to say the least confounding and stultifying to have changed your longitude extensively and placed yourself in a moral solitude in order to have small explosions to find conversation difficult and to hand a glass of water without looking can hardly be regarded as satisfactory fulfilment even to the toughest minds to dorothea's inexperienced sensitiveness it seemed like a catastrophe changing all prospects and to mr Cosabon it was a new pain he never having been on a wedding journey before or found himself in that close union which was more of a subjection than he had been able to imagine since this charming young bride not only obliged him to much consideration on her behalf which he had sedulously given but turned out to be capable of agitating him cruelly just where he most needed soothing instead of getting a soft fence against the cold shadowy unapplausive audience in his life had he only given it a more substantial presence neither of them felt it possible to speak again at present to have reversed a previous arrangement and declined to go out would have been a show of persistent anger which dorothea's conscience shrank from seeing that she already began to feel herself guilty however just her indignation might be her ideal was not to claim justice but to give tenderness so when the carriage came to the door she drove with mr Cosabon to the vatican walked with him through the stony avenue of inscriptions and when she parted with him at the entrance to the library went on through the museum out of mere listlessness as to what was around her she had not spirit to turn round and say that she would drive anywhere it was when mr Cosabon was quitting her that no man had first seen her and he had entered the long gallery of sculpture at the same time with her but here no man had to await ladislaw with whom he was to settle a bet of champagne about an enigmatical medieval looking figure there after they had examined the figure and had walked on finishing their dispute they had parted ladislaw lingering behind while no man had gone into the hall of statues where he again saw dorothea and saw her in that brooding abstraction which made her pose remarkable she did not really see the streak of sunlight on the floor more than she saw the statues she was inwardly seeing the light of years to come in her own home and over the english fields and elms and hedge bordered high roads and feeling that the way in which they might be filled with joyful devotedness was not so clear to her as it had been but in dorothea's mind there was a current into which all thought and feeling were apt sooner or later to flow the reaching forward of the whole consciousness towards the fullest truth the least partial good 
there was clearly something better than anger and despondency. End of chapter 20 Recording by Red Abris January 2008Chapter 21 of Middle March. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middle March by George Eliot. Chapter 21 Hive for Conde, ek full womanly and plain. No contrafeted terms had she, to seamen wise. Chaucer. It was in that way Dorothea came to be sobbing, as soon as she was securely alone. But she was presently roused by a knock at the door, which made her hastily dry her eyes before saying, Come in. Tantrip had brought a card, and said that there was a gentleman waiting in the lobby. The courier had told him that only Mrs. Casabon was at home, but he said he was a relation of Mr. Casabon's. Would she see him? Yes, said Dorothea, without pause. Show him into the salon. Her chief impressions about young Ladislaw were that when she had seen him at Lowick, she had been made aware of Mr. Casabon's generosity towards him and also that she had been interested in his own hesitation about his career. She was alive to anything that gave her an opportunity for active sympathy, and at this moment it seemed as if the visit had come to shake her out of her self-absorbed discontent, to remind her of her husband's goodness, and make her feel that she had now the right to be his helpmate in all kind needs. She waited a minute or two, but when she passed into the next room, there were just signs enough that she had been crying to make her open face look more youthful and appealing than usual. She met Ladislaw with that exquisite smile of goodwill, which is unmixed with vanity, and held out her hand to him. He was the elder by several years, but at that moment he looked much the younger, for his transparent complexion flushed suddenly, and he spoke with a shyness extremely unlike the ready indifference of his manner with his male companion, while Dorothea became all the calmer with a wondering desire to put him at ease. I was not aware that you and Mr. Casabon were in Rome until this morning, when I saw you in the Vatican Museum, he said. I knew you at once, but I mean that I concluded Mr. Casabon's address would be found at the Posti Restante, and I was anxious to pay my respects to him and you as early as possible. Pray sit down. He is not here now but he will be glad to hear of you, I am sure, said Dorothea, seating herself unthinkingly between the fire and the light of the tall window, and pointing to a chair opposite, with the quietude of a benignant matron. The signs of girlish sorrow in her face were only the more striking. Mr. Casabon is much engaged, but you will leave your address, will you not? and he will write to you. You are very good, said Ladislaw, beginning to lose his diffidence in the interest with which he was observing the signs of weeping, which had altered her face. My address is on my card, but if you will allow me, I will call again to-morrow at an hour when Mr. Casabon is likely to be at home. He goes to read in the library of the Vatican every day and you can hardly see him except by an appointment, especially now. We are about to leave Rome, and he is very busy. 
he is usually away almost from breakfast till dinner, but I am sure he will wish you to dine with us. Will Ladislaw was struck mute for a few moments. He had never been fond of Mr. Casabon, and if it had not been for the sense of obligation, would have laughed at him as a bat of erudition. But the idea of this dried-up pedant, this elaborator of small explanations about as important as the surplus stock of false antiquities, kept in a vendor's back chamber, having first got this adorable young creature to marry him, and then passing his honeymoon away from her, groping after his mouldy futilities. Will was given to hyperbole. This sudden picture stirred him with a sort of comic disgust. He was divided between the impulse to laugh aloud, and the equally unseasonable impulse to burst into scornful invective. For an instant he felt that the struggle was causing a queer contortion of his mobile features, but with a good effort he resolved it into nothing more offensive than a merry smile. Dorothea wondered, but the smile was irresistible, and shone back from her face too. Will Ladislaw's smile was delightful, unless you were angry with him beforehand. It was a gush of inward light illuminating the transparent skin as well as the eyes, and playing about every curve and line as if some aerial were touching them with a new charm, and banishing forever the traces of moodiness. The reflection of that smile could not but have a little merriment in it too, even under dark eyelashes still moist as Dorothea said inquiringly, "'Something amuses you?' "'Yes,' said Will, quick in finding resources. "'I am thinking of the sort of figure I cut the first time I saw you, when you annihilated my poor sketch with your criticism.' "'My criticism?' said Dorothea, wondering still more. "'Surely not. I always feel particularly ignorant about painting.' I suspected you of knowing so much that you knew how to say just what was most cutting. You said, I dare say you don't remember it as I do, that the relation of my sketch to nature was quite hidden from you. At least you implied that. We could laugh now as well as smile. That was really my ignorance said Dorothea, admiring Will's good humour. I must have said so only because I never could see any beauty in the pictures which my uncle told me all judges thought very fine, and I have gone away with just the same ignorance in Rome. There are comparatively few paintings that I can really enjoy. At first, when I enter a room where the walls are covered with frescoes, or with rare pictures, I feel a kind of awe, like a child present at great ceremonies where there are grand robes and processions. I feel myself in the presence of some higher light than my own, but when I begin to examine the pictures one by on the light goes out of them, or else is something violent and strange to me. It must be my own dullness." I am seeing so much all at once, and not understanding half of it. That always makes one feel stupid. It is painful to be told that anything is very fine, and not be able to feel that it is fine, something like being blind, while people talk of the sky. Oh, there is a great deal in the feeling for art which must be acquired, said Will. It was impossible now to doubt the directness of Dorothea's confession. Art is an old language with a great many artificial affected styles, and sometimes the chief pleasure one gets out of knowing them is the mere sense of knowing. I enjoy the art of all sorts here immensely, but I suppose if I could pick my enjoyment to pieces, I should find it made up of many different threads. 
There is something in daubing a little one's self, and having an idea of the process. You mean perhaps to be a painter, said Dorothea, with a new direction of interest. You mean to make painting your profession? Mr. Casabon will like to hear that you have chosen a profession. Oh, oh no, said Will, with some coldness. I have quite made up my mind against it. It is too one-sided a life. I have been seeing a great deal of the German artists here. I travelled from Frankfurt with one of them. Some are fine, even brilliant fellows, but I should not like to get into their way of looking at the world entirely from the studio point of view. That I can understand, said Dorothea cordially, and in Rome it seems as if there were so many things which are more wanted in the world than pictures. But if you have a genius for painting, would it not be right to take that as a guide? Perhaps you might do better things than these, or different, so that there might not be so many pictures almost all alike in the same place. There was no mistaking this simplicity, and Will was won by it into frankness. A man must have a very rare genius to make changes of that sort. I am afraid mine would not carry me, even to the pitch of doing well, what has been done already, at least not so well as to make it worth while. And I should never succeed in anything by dint or drudgery. If things don't come easily to me, I never get them. I have heard Mr. Cusabon say that he regrets your want of patience, said Dorothea gently. She was rather shocked at this mode of taking all life as a holiday. Yes, I know Mr. Casabon's opinion. He and I differ. The slight streak of contempt in his hasty reply offended Dorothea. She was all the more susceptible about Mr. Casabon because of her morning's trouble. Certainly you differ, she said, rather proudly. I did not think of comparing you. Such power of persevering devoted labour as Mr. Casabon's is not common. Will saw that she was offended, but this only gave an additional impulse to the new irritation of his latent dislike towards Mr. Casabon. It was too intolerable that Dorothea should be worshipping this husband. Such weakness in a woman is pleasant to no man but the husband in question. Mortals are easily tempted to pinch the life out of the neighbor's buzzing glory, and think that such killing is no murder. No, indeed, he answered promptly, and therefore it is a pity that it should be thrown away as so much English scholarship is, for want of knowing what is being done by the rest of the world. If Mr. Casabon read German, he would save himself a great deal of trouble. I do not understand you, said Dorothea, startled and anxious. I merely mean, said Will, in an offhand way, that the Germans have taken the lead in historical inquiries and they laugh at results which are got by groping about in woods with a pocket compass while they have made good roads. When I was with Mr. Casabon, I saw that he deafened himself in that direction. It was almost against his will that he read a Latin treatise written by a German. I was very sorry. Will only thought of giving a good pinch that would annihilate that vaunted laboriousness, and was unable to imagine the mode in which Dorothea would be wounded. Young Mr. Ladislaw was not at all deep himself in German writers, but very little achievement is required in order to pity another man's shortcomings. Poor Dorothea felt a pang at the thought that the labour of her husband's life might be void, which left her no energy to spare for the question whether this young relative, who was so much obliged to him, ought not to have repressed his observation. She did not even speak, 
but sat looking at her hands, absorbed in the piteousness of that thought. Will, however, having given the annihilating pinch, was rather ashamed, imagining from Dorothea's silence that he had offended her still more, and having also a conscience about plucking the tail feathers from a benefactor. I regretted it especially, he resumed, taking the usual course from detraction to insecure eulogy, because of my gratitude and respect towards my cousin. I would not signify so much in a man whose talents and character were less distinguished. Dorothea raised her eyes, brighter than usual, with excited feeling, and said in her saddest recitative, How I wish I had learned German when I was at Lausanne. There were plenty of German teachers, but now I can be of no use. There was a new light, but still a mysterious light, for Will in Dorothea's last words. The question how she had come to accept Mr. Casabon, which he had dismissed when he first saw her by saying that she must be disagreeable in spite of appearances, was not now to be answered on any such short and easy method. Whatever else she might be, she was not disagreeable. She was not coldly clever and indirectly satirical, but adorably simple and full of feeling. She was an angel beguiled. It would be a unique delight to wait and watch for the maladious fragments in which her heart and soul came forth so directly and ingenuously. The alien harp again came into his mind. She must have made some original romance for herself in this marriage, and if Mr. Casabon had been a dragon who had carried her off to his lair with his talons simply and without legal forms, it would have been an unavoidable feat of heroism to release her and fall at her feet. But he was something more unmanageable than a dragon. He was a benefactor with collective society at his back, and he was at that moment entering the room in all the unimpeachable correctness of his demeanour, while Dorothea was looking animated with the newly roused alarm and regret, and Will was looking animated with his admiring speculation about her feelings. Mr. Casabon felt a surprise which was quite unmixed with pleasure, but he did not swerve from his usual politeness of greeting when Will rose and explained his presence. Mr. Casabon was less happy than usual, and this perhaps made him look all the dimmer and more faded, else the effect might easily have been produced by the contrast of his young cousin's appearance. The first impression on seeing Will was one of sunny brightness, which added to the uncertainty of his changing expression. Surely his very features changed their form. His jaw looked sometimes large and sometimes small, and the little ripple in his nose was a preparation for metamorphosis. When he turned his head quickly, his hair seemed to shake out light, and some persons thought they saw decided genius in this coruscation. Mr. Casabon, on the contrary, stood rayless. As Dorothea's eyes were turned anxiously on her husband, she was perhaps not insensible to the contrast, but it was only mingled with other causes in making her more conscious of that new alarm on his behalf, which was the first stirring of a pitying tenderness fed by the realities of his lot and not by her own dreams. Yet it was a source of greater freedom to her that Will was there. His young equality was agreeable, and also perhaps his openness to conviction. She felt an immense need of someone to speak to, and she had never before seen anyone who seemed so quick and pliable, so likely to understand everything. Mr. Casabon gravely hoped 
that Will was passing his time profitably as well as pleasantly in Rome, had thought his intention was to remain in South Germany, but begged him to come and dine to-morrow, when he could converse more at large. At present he was somewhat weary. Ladislaw understood, and accepting the invitation, immediately took his leave. Dorothea's eyes followed her husband anxiously, while he sunk down wearily at the end of a sofa, and resting his elbow supported his head and looked on the floor. A little flushed, and with bright eyes, she seated herself beside him, and said, Forgive me for speaking so hastily to you this morning. I was wrong. I fear I hurt you and made the day more burdensome. I am glad that you feel that, my dear, said Mr. Casabon. He spoke quietly and bowed his head a little, but there was still an uneasy feeling in his eyes as he looked at her. But you do forgive me, said Dorothea, with a quick sob. In her need for some manifestation of feeling, she was ready to exaggerate her own fault. Would not love see returning penitence afar off, and fall on its neck and kiss it? My dear Dorothea, who with repentance is not satisfied, is not of heaven nor earth. You do not think me worthy to be banished by that severe sentence, said Mr. Casabon, exerting himself to make a strong statement, and also to smile faintly. Dorothea was silent, but a tear which had come up with the sob would insist on falling. You are excited, my dear, and I also am feeling some unpleasant consequences of too much mental disturbance, said Mr. Casabon. In fact, he had it in his thought to tell her that she ought not to have received young Ladislaw in his absence, but he abstained, partly from the sense that it would be ungracious to bring a new complaint in the moment of her penitent acknowledgment, partly because he wanted to avoid further agitation of himself by speech, and partly because he was too proud to betray that jealousy of disposition which was not so exhausted on his scholarly compeers that there was none to spare in other directions. There is a sort of jealousy which needs very little fire. It is hardly a passion, but a blight bred in the cloudy, damp despondency of uneasy egotism. I think it is time for us to dress, he added, looking at his watch. They both rose, and there was never any further allusion between them to what had passed on this day. But Dorothea remembered it to the last with the vividness with which we all remember epochs in our experience when some dear expectation dies, or some new motive is born. Today she had begun to see that she had been under a wild delusion in expecting a response to her feeling from Mr. Casabon, and she had felt the waking of a presentiment that there might be a sad consciousness in his life which made as great a need on his side as on her own. We are all of us born in moral stupidity, taking the world as an udder to feed our supreme selves. Dorothea had early begun to emerge from that stupidity, but yet it had been easier to her to imagine how she would devote herself to Mr. Casabon, and become wise and strong in his strength and wisdom, than to conceive with that distinctness, which is no longer reflection but feeling, an idea wrought back to the directness of sense, like the solidity of objects, that he had an equivalent centre of self, whence the lights and shadows must always fall with a certain difference. End of chapter 21。Chapter 22 of Middle March。This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot. Chapter 22. Nor cause a may long temps, el et et simple a bon. Ni se shun par le mal, el fosa le bien. De riches du cor el me fit le mon. A tout en accountant, com le cure si don. Sans osseri pensi, j lu donal le mien. El importa ma vie. A nin su jamarien. Alfred D. Massat. Will Ladislaw was delightfully agreeable at dinner the next day, and gave no opportunity for Mr. Casabon to show disapprobation. On the contrary, it seemed to Dorothea that Will had a happier way of drawing her husband into conversation, and of deferentially listening to him that she had ever observed in any one before. To be sure, the listeners about Tipton were not highly gifted. Will talked a great deal himself, but what he said was thrown in with such rapidity, and with such an unimportant air of saying something by the way, that it seemed a gay little chime after the great bell. If Will was not always perfect, this was certainly one of his good days. He described touches of incident among the poor people in Rome, only to be seen by one who could move about freely. He found himself in agreement with Mr. Casabon as to the unsound opinions of Middleton concerning the relations of Judaism and Catholicism, and passed easily to a half-enthusiastic, half-playful picture of the enjoyment he got out of the very miscellaneousness of Rome, which made the mind flexible with constant comparison, and saved you from seeing the world's ages as a set of box-like partitions without vital connection. Mr. Casabon's studies, Will observed, had always been of too broad a kind of that, and he had perhaps never felt any such sudden effect. But for himself he confessed that Rome had given him quite a new sense of history as a whole. The fragments stimulated his imagination and made him constructive. Then occasionally, but not too often, he appealed to Dorothea and discussed what she said, as if her sentiment were an item to be considered in the final judgment even of the Madonna di Fologno or the Laocoon. A sense of contributing to form the world's opinion makes conversation particularly cheerful, and Mr. Casabon, too, was not without his pride in his young wife, who spoke better than most women, as indeed he had perceived in choosing her. Since things were going on so pleasantly, Mr. Casabon's statement that his labours in the library would be suspended for a couple of days, and that after brief renewal he should have no further reason for staying in Rome, encouraged Will to urge that Mrs. Casabon should not go away without seeing a studio or two. Would not Mr. Casabon take her? That sort of thing ought not to be missed. It was quite special. It was a form of life that grew like a small fresh vegetation, with its population of insects on huge fossils. Will would be happy to conduct them, not to anything wearisome, only to a few examples. Mr. Casabon, seeing Dorothea look earnestly towards him, could not but ask her if she would be interested in such visits. He was now at her service during the whole day, and it was agreed that Will should come on the morrow and drive with them. Will could not admit Thorwaldson, a living celebrity about whom even Mr. Casabon inquired, but before the day was far advanced, he led the way to the studio of his friend, 
Adolf Newman, whom he mentioned as one of the chief renovators of Christian art, one of those who had not only revived, but expanded that grand conception of supreme events as mysteries, at which the successive ages were spectators, and in relation to which the great souls of all periods became as if were contemporaries. Will added that he had made himself Newman's pupil for the nonce. I have been making some oil sketches under him, said Will. I hate copying. I must put something of my own in. Newman has been painting the saints drawing the car of the church, and I have been making a sketch of Marlowe's Tamburlaine driving the conquered kings in his chariot. I am not so ecclesiastical as Newman, and I sometimes twit him with his excess of meaning. But this time I mean to outdo him in breadth of intention. I take Tamburlaine in his chariot for the tremendous course of the world's physical history, lashing on the harnessed dynasties. In my opinion, that is a good mythical interpretation. Will here looked at Mr. Casabon, who received this off-hand treatment of symbolism very uneasily, and bowed with a neutral air. The sketch must be very grand, if it conveys so much, said Dorothea. I should need some explanation even of the meaning you give. Do you intend Tamburlaine to represent earthquakes and volcanoes? Oh, yes, said Will, laughing and migrations of races and clearings of forests, and America and the steam engine. Everything you can imagine. What a difficult kind of shorthand, said Dorothea, smiling towards her husband. It would require all your knowledge to be able to read it. Mr. Casabon blinked furtively at Will. He had a suspicion that he was being laughed at but it was not possible to include Dorothea in the suspicion. They found Newman painting industriously, but no model was present. His pictures were advantageously arranged, and his own plain, vivacious person set off by a dove-coloured blouse and a maroon velvet cap, so that everything was as fortunate as if he had expected the beautiful young English lady exactly at that time. The painter, in his confident English, gave little dissertations on his finished and unfinished subjects, seeming to observe Mr. Casabon as much as he did Dorothea. Will burst in here and there with ardent words of praise, marking out particular merits in his friend's work and Dorothea felt that she was getting quite new notions as to the significance of Madonnas seated under inexplicable canopied thrones with the simple country as a background, and of saints with architectural models in their hands, or knives accidentally wedged in their skulls. Some things which had seemed monstrous to her were gathering intelligibility and even a natural meaning, but all this was apparently a branch of knowledge in which Mr. Casabon had not interested himself. I think I would rather feel that painting is beautiful than have to read it as an enigma, but I should learn to understand these pictures sooner than yours, with the very wide meaning, said Dorothea, speaking to Will. Don't speak of my painting before Newman, said Will. He will tell you it is all fouchere, which is his most opprobrious word. Is that true? said Dorothea, turning her sincere eyes on Newman, who made a slight grimace and said, Oh, he does not mean it seriously with painting. His walk must be ballet lettre, that is why. Newman's pronunciation of the vowel seemed to stretch the word satirically. Will did not half like it, but managed to laugh, and Mr. Casbon, while he felt some disgust at the artist's German accent, began to entertain a little respect for his judicious severity. 
the respect was not diminished when Newman, after drawing Will aside for a moment and looking, first at a large canvas, then at Mr. Casabon, came forward again and said, "'My friend Ladislaw thinks you will pardon me, sir, if I say that a sketch of your head would be invaluable to me for the St. Thomas Aquino in my picture there. It is too much to ask, but I so seldom see just what I want, the idealistic in the real. You astonish me greatly, sir, said Mr. Casabon. His looks improved with a glow of delight. But if, if my poor physiognomy, which I have been accustomed to regard, as of the commonest order, can be of any use to you in furnishing some traits for the angelical doctor, I shall feel on it. That is to say, if the operation will not be a lengthy one, and if Mrs. Casabon will not object to the delay. As for Dorothea, nothing could have pleased her more, unless it had been a miraculous voice pronouncing Mr. Casabon the wisest and worthiest among the sons of men. In that case her tottering faith would have become firm again. Newman's apparatus was at hand in wonderful completeness, and the sketch went on at once as well as the conversation. Dorothea sat down and subsided into calm silence, feeling happier than she had done for a long while before. Every one about her seemed good, and she said to herself that Rome, if she had only been less ignorant, would have been full of beauty, its sadness would have been winged with hope. No nature could be less suspicious than hers. When she was a child she believed in the gratitude of wasps and the honourable susceptibility of sparrows, and was proportionately indignant when their baseness was made manifest. The adroit artist was asking Mr. Casabon questions about English polities, which brought long answers, and Will, meanwhile, had perched himself on some steps in the background overlooking all. Presently Newman said, Now if I could lay this by for half an hour and take it up again, come and look. Ladislaw, I think it is perfect so far. Will vented those adjuring interjections, which imply that admiration is too strong for syntax. And Newman said in a tone of piteous regret, Ah, now, if I could but have had more, but you have other engagements. I could not ask it, or even to come again to-morrow. Oh, let us stay, said Dorothea, we have nothing to do to-day except go about, have we? she added, looking entreatingly at Mr. Casabon. It would be a pity not to make the head as good as possible. I am at your service, sir, in the matter, said Mr. Casabon, with polite condescension. Having given up the interior of my head to idleness, it is as well that the exterior should work in this way. You are unspeakably good. Now I am happy, said Newman, and then went on in German to Will, pointing here and there to the sketch, as if he were considering that. Putting it aside for a moment, he looked round vaguely, as if seeking some occupation for his visitors, and afterwards, turning to Mr. Casabon, said, Perhaps the beautiful bride, the gracious lady, would not be unwilling to let me fill up the time by trying to make a slight sketch of her. Not, of course, as you see for that picture, only as a single study. Mr. Casabon, bowing, doubted not that Mrs. Casabon would oblige him, and Dorothea said at once, Where shall I put myself? Newman was all apologies in asking her to stand, and allow him to adjust her attitude, to which she submitted without any of the affected airs and laughs frequently thought necessary on such occasions, when the painter said, It is as saying to Clara that I want you to stand, leaning so, with your cheek against your hand, so, looking at that stool, please, so, 
Will was divided between the inclination to fall at the saint's feet and kiss her robe, and the temptation to knock Newman down while he was adjusting her arm. All this was impudence and desecration, and he repented that he had brought her. The artist was diligent, and Will, recovering himself, moved about and occupied Mr. Casabon as ingeniously as he could, but he did not in the end prevent the time from seeming long to that gentleman, as was clear from his expressing a fear that Mrs. Casabon would be tired. Newman took the hint and said, Now, sir, if you can oblige me again, I will release the lady wife. So Mr. Casabon's patience held out further, and when after all it turned out that the head of St. Thomas Aquinae would be more perfect if another sitting could be had, it was granted for the morrow. On the morrow Santa Clara too was retouched more than once. The result of all was so far from displeasing to Mr. Casabon that he arranged for the purchase of the picture in which St. Thomas Aquinae sat among the doctors of the church in a disputation too abstract to be represented, but listened to with more or less attention by an audience above. The Santa Clara, which was spoken of in the second place, Newman declared himself to be dissatisfied with. He could not, in conscience, engage to make a worthy picture of it, so about the Santa Clara the arrangement was conditional. I will not dwell on Newman's jokes at the expense of Mr. Casabon that evening, or on his ditty rams about Dorothea's charm, in all which Will joined, but with the difference. No sooner did Newman mention any detail of Dorothea's beauty than Will got exasperated at his presumption. There was grossness in his voice of the most ordinary words, and what business had he to talk of her lips? She was not a woman to be spoken of as other women were. Will could not say just what he thought, but he became irritable. And yet, when after some resistance he had consented to take the Casabons to his friend's studio, he had been allured by the gratification of his pride in being the person who could grant Newman such an opportunity of studying her loveliness, or rather her divineness, for the ordinary phrases which might apply to mere bodily prettiness were not applicable to her. Certainly all Tipton and its neighbourhood, as well as Dorothea herself, would have been surprised at her beauty being made so much of. In that part of the world, Miss Brooke had been only a fine young woman. Oblige me by letting the subject drop, Newman. Mrs. Casbon is not to be talked of as if she were a model, said Will. Newman stared at him. Schott, I will talk of my Aquino. The head is not a bad type, after all. I dare say the great scholastic himself would have been flattered to have his portrait asked for. Nothing like these starchy doctors for vanity. It was, as I thought, he cared much less for her portrait than his own. His accursed white-blooded pedantic coxcomb, said Will, with gnashing impetuosity. His obligations to Mr. Casabon were not known to his hearer but Will himself was thinking of them, and wishing that he could discharge them all by a check. Newman gave a shrug and said, It is good they go away soon, my dear. They are spoiling your fine temper. All Will's hope and contrivance were now concentrated on seeing Dorothea when she was alone. He only wanted her to take more emphatic notice of him. He only wanted to be something more special in her remembrance than he could yet believe himself likely to be. He was rather impatient under that open ardent goodwill, reach he saw was her usual state of feeling. 
The remote worship of a woman throned out of their reach plays a great part in men's lives, but in most cases the worshipper longs for some queenly recognition, some approving sign by which his soul's sovereign may cheer him without descending from her high place. That was precisely what Will wanted, but there were plenty of contradictions in his imaginative demands. It was beautiful to see how Dorothea's eyes turned with wifely anxiety and beseeching to Mr. Casabon. She would have lost some of her halo if she had been without the duteous preoccupation, and yet at the next moment the husband's sandy absorption of such nectar was too intolerable, and Will's longing to say damaging things about him was perhaps not the less tormenting because he felt the strongest reasons for restraining it. Will had not been invited to dine the next day, hence he persuaded himself that he was bound to call, and that the only eligible time was the middle of the day, when Mr. Casabon would not be at home. Dorothea, who had not been made aware that her former reception of Will had displeased her husband, had no hesitation about seeing him, especially as he might be come to pay a farewell visit. When he entered she was looking at some cameos, which she had been buying for Celia. She greeted Will as if his visit were quite a matter of course, and said at once, having a cameo bracelet in her hand, I am so glad you are come. Perhaps you understand all about cameos, and can tell me if these are really good. I wished to have you with us choosing them, but Mr. Casabon objected. He thought there was not time. He will finish his work tomorrow, and we shall go away in three days. I have been uneasy about these cameos. Pray sit down and look at them. I am not particularly knowing but there can be no great mistake about these little Homeric bits. They are exquisitely neat, and the colour is fine. It will just suit you. Oh, they are for my sister, who has quite a different complexion. You saw her with me at Lowick. She is light-haired and very pretty. At least, I think so. We were never so long away from each other in our lives before. She is a great pet, and never was naughty in her life. I found out before I came away that she wanted me to buy her some cameos, and I should be sorry for them not to be good, after their kind. Dorothea added the last words with a smile. You seem not to care about cameos, said Will, seating himself at some distance from her, and observing her while she closed the cases. No, frankly, I don't think them a great object in life, said Dorothea. I fear you are a heretic about art generally. How is that? I should have expected you to be very sensitive to the beautiful everywhere. I suppose I am dull about many things, said Dorothea simply. I should like to make life beautiful. I mean everybody's life and then all this immense expense of art, that seems somehow to lie outside life and make it no better for the world, pains one. It spoils my enjoyment of anything when I am made to think that most people are shut out from it. I call that fanaticism of sympathy, said Will impetuously. You might say the same of landscape, of poetry, of all refinement. If you carried it out, you ought to be miserable in your own goodness, and turn evil that you might have no advantage over others. The best piety is to enjoy when you can. You are doing the most than to save the earth's character as an agreeable planet, and enjoyment radiates. It is of no use to try and take care of all the world that is being taken care of when you feel delight, in art or in anything else. 
Would you turn all the youth of the world into a tragic chorus, wailing and moralizing over misery? I suspect that you have some false belief in the virtues of misery, and want to make your life a martyrdom. Will had gone further than he intended, and checked himself, but Dorothea's thought was not taking just the same direction as his own, and she answered without any special emotion. Indeed, you mistake me. I am not a sad, melancholy creature. I am never unhappy long together. I am angry and naughty, not like Celia. I have a great outburst, and then all seems glorious again. I cannot help believing in glorious things in a blind sort of way. I should be quite willing to enjoy the art here, but there is so much that I don't know the reason of, so much that seems to me a consecration of ugliness rather than beauty. The painting and sculpture may be wonderful, but the feeling is often low and brutal, and sometimes even ridiculous. Here and there I see what takes me at once as noble, something that I might compare with the Alban Mountains, or the sunset from the Pincian Hill, but that makes it the greater pity that there is so little of the best kind among all that mass of things over which men have toiled so. Of course there is always a great deal of poor work. The rarer things want that soil to grow in. Oh, dear, said Dorothea, taking up that thought into the chief current of her anxiety. I see it must be very difficult to do anything good. I have often felt since I have been in Rome that most of our lives would look much uglier and more bungling than the pictures, if they could be put on the wall. Dorothea parted her lips again, as if she were going to say more, but changed her mind and paused. You are too young. It is an anchorism for you to have such thoughts, said Will, energetically, with a quick shake of the head habitual to him. You talk as if you had never known any youth. It is monstrous, as if you had had a vision of Hades in your childhood, like the boy in the legend. You have been brought up in some of those horrible notions that choose the sweetest women to devour, like minotaurs, and now you will go and be shut up in that stone prison at Lowick. You will be buried alive. It makes me savage to think of it. I would rather never have seen you than think of you with such a prospect. Will again feared that he had gone too far but the meaning we attach to words depends on our feeling, and his tone of angry regret had so much kindness in it for Dorothea's heart, which had always been giving out ardor and had never been fed with much from the living beings around her, that she felt a new sense of gratitude and answered with a gentle smile. It is very good of you to be anxious about me, it is because you did not like Lowick yourself. You had set your heart on another kind of life, but Lowick is my chosen home. The last sentence was spoken with an almost solemn cadence, and Will did not know what to say, since it would not be useful for him to embrace her slippers, and tell her that he would die for her. It was clear that she required nothing of the sort, and they were both silent for a moment or two. When Dorothea began again, with an air of saying at last what had been in her mind beforehand, I wanted to ask you again about something you said the other day. Perhaps it was half of it, your lively way of speaking. I noticed that you like to put things strongly. I myself often exaggerate when I speak hastily. What was it? said Will observing that she spoke with a timidity quite new in her. I have a hyperbolical tongue. It catches fire as it goes. I dare say I shall have to retract. I mean what you said about the necessity of knowing German. I mean for the subjects that Mr. Casabon is engaged in. I have been thinking about it. 
and it seems to me that with Mr. Casabon's learning he must have before him the same materials as German scholars. Has he not? Dorothea's timidity was due to an indistinct consciousness that she was in the strange situation of consulting a third party about the adequacy of Mr. Casabon's learning. Not exactly the same materials, said Will, thinking that he would be duly reserved. He is not an orientalist, you know. He does not profess to have more than second-hand knowledge there. But there are very valuable books about antiquities, which were written a long while ago by scholars, who knew nothing about these modern things, and they are still used. Why should Mr. Casabon's not be valuable like theirs? said Dorothea, with more remonstrant energy. She was impelled to have the argument aloud, which she had been having on her own mind. That depends on the line of study taken, said Will, also getting a tone of rejoinder. The subject Mr. Casabond has chosen is as changing as chemistry. New discoveries are constantly making new points of view. Who wants a system on the basis of the four elements, or a book to refute Paracelsus? Do you not see that it is no use now to be crawling a little way after men of the last century, men like Bryant, and correcting their mistakes, living in a lumber room and furbishing up broken legged theories about Chas and Mizraim? How can you bear to speak so lightly? said Dorothea, with a look between sorrow and anger. If it were as you say, what could be sadder than so much ardent labour all in vain? I wonder it does not affect you more painfully. If you really think that a man like Mr. Casabon, of so much goodness, power, and learning, should in any way fail in what has been the labour of his best years. She was beginning to be shocked that she had got to such a point of supposition, and indignant with Will for having led her to it. "'You question me about the matter of fact, not of feeling,' said Will, "'but if you wish to punish me for the fact, I submit I am not in a position to express my feeling toward Mr. Casabon. It would be at best a pensioner's eulogy.' "'Pray excuse me,' said Dorothea, colouring deeply. I am aware, as you say, that I am in fault in having introduced the subject. Indeed, I am wrong altogether. Failure, after long perseverance, is much grander than never to have a striving good enough to be called a failure. I quite agree with you, said Will, determined to change the situation so much so that I have made up my mind not to run that risk of never attaining a failure. Mr. Casabon's generosity has perhaps been dangerous to me, and I mean to renounce the liberty it has given me. I mean to go back to England shortly, and work my own way, depend on nobody else than myself. That is fine, I respect that feeling, said Dorothea with returning kindness. But Mr. Casabon, I am sure, has never thought of anything in the matter except what was most for your welfare. She has obstinacy and pride enough to serve instead of love. Now she has married him, said Will to himself. Aloud, he said, rising. I shall not see you again. Oh, stay till Mr. Casabon comes, said Dorothea earnestly. I am so glad we met in Rome. I wanted to know you. And I have made you angry, said Will. I have made you think ill of me. Oh, no, my sister tells me I am always angry with people who do not say just what I like. But I hope I am not given to think ill of them. In the end, I am usually obliged to think ill of myself for being so impatient. Still, you don't like me. I have made myself an unpleasant thought to you. Not at all, said Dorothea, with the most open kindness. I like you very much. 
Will was not quite contented, thinking that he would apparently have been of more importance if he had been disliked. He said nothing, but looked dull, not to say sulky. And I am quite interested to see what you will do, Dorothea went on cheerfully. I believe devoutly in a natural difference of vocation. If it were not for that belief, I suppose I should be very narrow. There are so many things, besides painting, that I am quite ignorant of. You would hardly believe how little I have taken in of music and literature, which you know so much of. I wonder what your vocation will turn out to be. Perhaps you will be a poet. That depends. To be a poet is to have a soul so quick to discern that no shade of quality escapes it, and so quick to feel that discernment is but a hand playing with finely ordered variety on the chords of emotion, a soul in which knowledge passes instantaneously into feeling, and feeling flashes back as a new organ of knowledge. One may have that condition by fits only, but you leave out the poems, said Dorothea. I think they are wanted to complete the poet. I understand what you mean about knowledge passing into feeling, for that seems to be just what I experience, but I am sure I could never produce a poem. You are a poem, and that is to be the best part of a poet. What makes up the poet's consciousness in his best moods, said Will, showing such originality as we all share with the morning and the spring time and other endless renewals. I am very glad to hear it, said Dorothea, laughing out her words in a bird-like modulation, and looking at Will with playful gratitude in her eyes. What very kind things you say to me. I wish I could ever do anything that would be what you call kind, that I could ever be of the slightest service to you, I fear, I shall never have the opportunity. Will spoke with fervour. Oh, yes, said Dorothea cordially. It will come, and I shall remember how well you wish me. I quite hoped that we should be friends when I first saw you, because of your relationship to Mr. Casavon. There was a certain liquid brightness in her eyes, and Will was conscious that his own were obeying a law of nature and feeling too. The allusion to Mr. Casabon would have spoiled all if anything at that moment could have spoiled the subduing power, the sweet dignity of her noble unsuspicious inexperience. And there is one thing even now that you can do, said Dorothea rising and walking a little way under the strength of a recurring impulse. Promise me that you will not again, to any one, speak of that subject. I mean about Mr. Casabon's writings. I mean in that kind of way. It was I who led to it. It was my fault, but promise me. She had returned from her brief pacing and stood opposite Will, looking gravely at him. Certainly I will promise you, said Will, reddening, however. If he never said a cutting word about Mr. Casabon again, and left off receiving favours from him, it would clearly be permissible to hate him the more. The poet must know how to hate, says Goethe, and Will was at least ready with the accomplishment. He said that he must go now without waiting for Mr. Casabon whom he would come to take leave of at the last moment. Dorothea gave him her hand, and they exchanged a simple good-bye. But going out of the port cochelle he met Mr. Casabon, and that gentleman, expressing the best wishes for his cousin, politely waived the pleasure of any further leave-taking on the morrow, which would be sufficiently crowded with the preparations for departure. I have something to tell you about our cousin, Mr. Lattislaw, which I think will heighten your opinion of him, said Dorothea to her husband in the course of the evening. 
She had mentioned immediately on his entering that Will had just gone away, and would come back again, but Mr. Casabon had said, I met him outside, and we made our final adieu, I believe, saying this with the air and tone by which we imply that any subject, whether private or public, does not interest us enough to wish for a further remark upon it. So Dorothea had waited. "'What is that, my love?' said Mr. Casabon. He always said, my love, when his manner was the coldest. He has made up his mind to leave off wandering at once, and to give up his dependence on your generosity. He means soon to go back to England, and work his own way. I thought you would consider that a good sign, said Dorothea, with an appealing look into her husband's neutral face. Did he mention the precise order of occupation to which he would addict himself? No, but he said that he felt the danger which lay for him in your generosity. Of course he will write to you about it. Do you not think better of him for his resolve? I shall await his communication on the subject, said Mr. Casabon. I told him I was sure that the thing you considered in all you did for him was his own welfare. I remembered your goodness in what you said about him when I first saw him at Lowick, said Dorothea, putting her hand on her husband's. I had a duty towards him, said Mr. Casabon, laying his other hand on Dorothea's, in conscientious acceptance of her caress, but with a glance which he could not hinder from being uneasy. The young man, I confess, is not otherwise an object of interest to me, nor need we, I think, discuss his future course, which it is not ours to determine beyond the limits which I have sufficiently indicated. Dorothea did not mention Will again. End of chapter 22「and first-rate whip Apollo. What e'er they be, I'll eat my head, but I will beat them hollow. Fred Vincey, we have seen, had a debt on his mind, and though no such immaterial burthen could depress that buoyant-hearted young gentleman for many hours together, there were circumstances connected with his debt, which made the thought of it unusually importunate. The creditor was Mr. Bambridge, a horse-dealer of the neighbourhood, whose company was much sought in Middlemarch by young men understood to be addicted to pleasure. During the vacations Fred had naturally required more amusements than he had ready money for, and Mr. Bainbridge had been accommodating enough not only to trust him for the hire of horses and the accidental expense of ruining a fine hunter, but also to make a small advance by which he might be able to meet some losses at billiards. The total debt was a hundred and sixty pounds. Bainbridge was in no alarm about his money, being sure that young Vincey had backers, but he had required something to show for it and Fred had at first given a bill with his own signature. Three months later he had renewed this bill with the signature of Caleb Garth. On both occasions Fred had felt confident that he should meet the bill himself, having ample funds at disposal in his own hopefulness. You will hardly demand that his confidence should have a basis in external facts, 
such confidence, we know, is something less coarse and materialistic. It is a comfortable disposition leading us to expect that the wisdom of providence or the folly of our friends, the mysteries of luck, or the still greater mystery of our high individual value in the universe, will bring about agreeable issues, such as are consistent with our good taste in costume, and our general preference for the best style of thing. Fred felt sure that he should have a present from his uncle, that he should have a run of luck that by dint of swapping he should gradually metamorphose a horse worth forty pounds into a horse that would fetch a hundred at any moment. Judgment, being always equivalent to an unspecified sum in hard cash, and in any case even supposing negations which only a morbid distrust could imagine. Fred had always, at that time, his father's pocket as a last resource, so that his assets of hopefulness had a sort of gorgeous superfluity about them. Of what might be the capacity of his father's pocket, Fred had only a vague notion. Was not trade elastic? And would not the deficiencies of one year be made up for by the surplus of another? The Vincys lived in an easy profuse way, not with any new ostentation, but according to the family habits and traditions, so that the children had no standard of economy, and the elder ones retained some of their infantine notion that their father might pay for anything if he would. Mr. Vincey himself had expensive Middlemarch habits, spent money on coursing, on his cellar, and on dinner giving while Mamma had those running accounts with tradespeople, which give a cheerful sense of getting everything one wants without any question of payment. But it was in the nature of fathers, Fred knew, to bully one about expenses. There was always a little storm over his extravagance if he had to disclose a debt, and Fred disliked bad weather within doors. He was too filial to be disrespectful to his father, and he bore the thunder with the certainty that it was transient. But in the meantime it was disagreeable to see his mother cry, and also to be obliged to look sulky instead of having fun. For Fred was so good-tempered that if he looked glum, under scolding, it was chiefly for propriety's sake. The easier course, plainly, was to renew the bill with a friend's signature. Why not? With the superfluous securities of hope at his command, there was no reason why he should not have increased other people's liabilities to any extent, but for the fact that men whose names were good for anything were usually pessimists, indisposed to believe that the universal order of things would necessarily be agreeable to an agreeable young gentleman. With a favour to ask, we review our list of friends, do justice to their more amiable qualities, forgive their little offences, and concerning each in turn, try to arrive at the conclusion that he will be eager to oblige us, our own eagerness to be obliged, being as communicable as other warmth. Still there is always a certain number who are dismissed as but moderately eager until the others have refused, and it happened that Fred checked off all his friends but one, on the ground that applying to them would be disagreeable, being implicitly convinced that he at least whatever might be maintained about mankind generally, had a right to be free from anything disagreeable. That he should ever fall into a thoroughly unpleasant position, where trousers shrunk with washing, eat cold mutton, have to walk for want of a horse, or to duck under in any sort of way, was an absurdity 
irreconcilable with those cheerful intuitions implanted in him by nature, and Fred winced under the idea of being looked down upon as wanting funds for small debts. Thus it came to pass that the friend whom he chose to apply to was at once the poorest and the kindest, namely Caleb Garth. The Garths were very fond of Fred, as he was of them, for when he and Rosamond were little ones, and the Garths were better off, the slight connection between the two families through Mr. Featherstone's double marriage, the first to Mr. Garth's sister, and the second to Mrs. Vincey's, had led to an acquaintance which was carried on between the children, rather than the parents. The children drank tea together out of their toy teacups, and spent whole days together in play. Mary was a little hoyden, and Fred, at six years old, thought her the nicest girl in the world, making her his wife with a brass ring which he had cut from an umbrella. Through all the stages of his education he had kept his affection for the Garths, and his habit of going to their house as a second home, though any intercourse between them and the elders of his family had long ceased. Even when Caleb Garth was prosperous, the Vincys were on condescending terms with him and his wife, for there was nice distinctions of rank in Middlemarch, and though old manufacturers could not any more than dukes be connected with none but equals, they were conscious of an inherent social superiority which was defined with great nicety in practice, though hardly expressible theoretically. Since then Mr. Garth had failed in the building business, which he had unfortunately added to his other avocations of surveyor, valuer and agent, had conducted that business for a time entirely for the benefit of his assignees, and had been living narrowly, exerting himself to the utmost, that he might after all pay twenty shillings in the pound. He had now achieved this, and from all who did not think it a bad precedent, his honourable exertions had won him due esteem but in no part of the world is genteel, visiting founded on esteem, in the absence of suitable furniture and complete dinner service. Mrs. Vincy had never been at ease with Mrs. Garth, and frequently spoke of her as a woman who had had to work for her bread, meaning that Mrs. Garth had been a teacher before her marriage, in which case an intimacy with Lindley Murray and Magnall's questions was something like a draper's discrimination of calico trademarks, or a courier's acquaintance with foreign countries. No woman who was better off needed that sort of thing. And since Mary had been keeping Mr. Featherstone's house, Mrs. Vincey's want of liking for the Garths had been converted into something more positive, by alarm lest Fred should engage himself to this plain girl, whose parents lived in such a small way. Fred, being aware of this, never spoke at home of his visits to Mrs. Garth, which had of late become more frequent, the increasing ardour of his affection for Mary inclining him the more towards those who belonged to her. Mr. Garth had a small office in the town, and to this Fred went with his request. He obtained it without much difficulty, for a large amount of painful experience had not sufficed to make Caleb Garth cautious about his own affairs, or distrustful of his fellow men when they had not proved themselves untrustworthy and he had the highest opinion of Fred, was sure the lad would turn out well, an open affectionate fellow, with a good bottom to his character. You might trust him for anything. Such was Caleb's psychological argument. He was one of those rare men who are rigid to themselves and indulgent to others, 
He had a certain shame about his neighbours' errors, and never spoke of them willingly. Hence he was not likely to divert his mind from the best mode of hardening timber and other ingenuous devices in order to preconceive those errors. If he had to blame any one, it was necessary for him to move all the papers within his reach, or describe various diagrams with his stick, or make calculations with the odd money in his pocket, before he could begin. And he would rather do other men's work than find fault with their doing. I fear he was a bad disciplinarian. When Fred stated the circumstances of his debt, his wish to meet it without troubling his father, and the certainty that the money would be forthcoming so as to cause no one any inconvenience, Caleb pushed his spectacles upward, listened, looked into his favourite's clear young eyes, and believed him not distinguishing confidence about the future from veracity about the past but he felt that it was an occasion for a friendly hint as to conduct, and that before giving his signature he must give a rather strong admonition. Accordingly, he took the paper and lowered his spectacles, measured the space at his command, reached his pen and examined it, dipped it in the ink and examined it again, then pushed the paper a little way from him, lifted up his spectacles again, showed a deepened depression in the outer angle of his bushy eyebrows, which gave his face a peculiar mildness. Pardon these details for once. You would have learned to love them if you had known Caleb Garth, and said in a comfortable tone, It was a misfortune, eh, that breaking the horse's knees. And then these exchanges... They don't answer when you have cute jockeys to deal with. You'll be wiser another time, my boy. Whereupon Caleb drew down his spectacles and proceeded to write his signature with the care which he always gave to that performance. For whatever he did in the way of business, he did well. He contemplated the large, well-proportioned letters and final flourish, with his head a trifle on one side for an instant, then handed it to Fred, said good-bye, and returned forthwith to his absorption in a plan for St. James Chetham's new farm buildings. Either because his interest in his work thrust the incident of the signature from his memory, or for some reason of which Caleb was more conscious, Mrs. Garth remained ignorant of the affair. Since it occurred, a change had come over Fred's sky, which altered his view of the distance, and was the reason why his uncle Featherstone's present of money was of importance enough to make his colour come and go, first with a too definite expectation, and afterwards with a proportionate disappointment. His failure in passing his examination had made his accumulation of college debts the more unpardonable by his father, and there had been an unprecedented storm at home. Mr. Vincey had sworn that if he had anything more of that sort to put up with, Fred should turn out and get his living how he could, and he had never yet quite recovered his good-humoured tone to his son, who had especially enraged him by saying at this stage of things that he did not want to be a clergyman, and would rather not go on with that. Fred was conscious that he would have been yet more severely dealt with if his family as well as himself had not secretly regarded him as Mr. Featherstone's heir. That old gentleman's pride in him, and apparent fondness for him, serving in the stead a more exemplary conduct, just as when a youthful nobleman steals jewellery we call the act kleptomania speak of it with a philosophical smile and never think of his being sent to the house of correction as if he were a ragged boy who had stolen turnips in fact 
tacit expectations of what would be done for him by Uncle Featherstone determined the angle at which most people viewed Fred Vincy in Middle March and in his own consciousness. What Uncle Featherstone would do for him in an emergency, or what he would do simply as an incorporated luck, formed always an immeasurable depth of aerial perspective. But that present of banknotes, once made, was measurable, and being applied to the amount of the debt, showed a deficit which had still be filled up either by Fred's judgment or by luck in some other shape. For that little episode of the alleged borrowing in which he had made his father the agent in getting the Balstrode certificate was a new reason against going to his father for money towards meeting his actual debt. Fred was keen enough to foresee that anger would confuse distinctions, and that his denial of having borrowed expressly on the strength of his uncle's will would be taken as a falsehood. He had gone to his father and told him one vexatious affair, and he had left another untold. In such cases the complete revelation always produces the impressions of a previous duplicity. Now Fred piqued himself on keeping clear of lies, and even fibs. He often shrugged his shoulders and made a significant grimace at what he called Rosamond's fibs. It is only brothers who can associate such ideas with a lovely girl. And rather than incur the accusation of falsehood, he would even incur some trouble and self-restraint. It was under strong inward pressure of this kind that Fred had taken the wise step of depositing the eighty pounds with his mother. It was a pity that he had not at once given them to Mr. Garth, but he meant to make the sum complete with another sixty, and with a view to this he had kept twenty pounds in his own pocket as a sort of seed corn, which, planted by judgment and watered by luck, might yield more than threefold a very poor rate of multiplication when the field is a young gentleman's infinite soul, and all the numerals at command. Fred was not a gambler. He had not that specific disease in which the suspension of the whole nervous energy on a chance or risk becomes as necessary as the dram to the drunkard. He had only the tendency to that diffusive form of gambling, which has no alcoholic intensity, but is carried on with the healthiest child-fed blood, keeping up a joyous imaginative activity, which fashions events according to desire, and having no fears about its own weather, only sees the advantage there must be to others in going aboard with it. Hopefulness has a pleasure in making a throw of any kind, because the prospect of success is certain, and only a more generous pleasure in offering as many as possible a share in the stake. Fred liked play, especially billiards, as he liked hunting or riding a steeple chase, and he only liked it the better because he wanted money and hoped to win. But the twenty pounds worth of seed corn had been planted in vain in the seductive green plot, all of it at least, which had not been dispersed by the roadside, and Fred found himself close upon the term of payment, with no money at command beyond the eighty pounds, which he had deposited with his mother. The broken-winded horse which he rode represented a present which had been made to him a long while ago by his uncle Featherstone, his father always allowed him to keep a horse, Mr. Vincy's own habits making him regard this as a reasonable demand, even for a son who was rather exasperating. This horse, then, was Fred's property, and in his anxiety to meet the imminent bill, he determined to sacrifice a possession without which life would certainly be worth little. He made the resolution with a sense of heroism. 
heroism forced on him by the dread of breaking his word to Mr. Garth, by his love for Mary and awe of her opinion. He would start for Hounsley Horse Fair, which was to be held the next morning, and simply sell his horse, bringing back the money by coach. Well, the horse would hardly fetch more than thirty pounds, and there was no knowing what might happen. It would be folly to balk himself of luck beforehand. It was a hundred to one that some good chance would fall in his way. The longer he thought of it, the less possible it seemed that he should not have a good chance, and the less reasonable that he should not equip himself with the powder and shot for bringing it down. He would ride to Hounsley with Bainbridge and with Horrock, the vet, and without asking them anything expressly, he should virtually get the benefit of their opinion. Before he set out, Fred got the eighty pounds from his mother. Most of those who saw Fred riding out of Middlemarch in company with Bainbridge and Horrock on his way, of course, to Hounsley Horse Fair, thought that young Vincy was pleasure-seeking as usual, and but for an unwanted consciousness of grave matters on hand, he himself would have had a sense of dissipation, and of doing what might be expected of a gay young fellow. Considering that Fred was not at all coarse, that he rather looked down on the manners and speech of young men who had not been to university, and that he had written stanzas as pastoral and unvoluptuous as his flute playing, his attraction towards Bainbridge and Horrock was an interesting fact which even the love of horse-flesh would not wholly account for without that mysterious influence of naming which determinates so much of mortal choice. Under any other name than pleasure, the society of Messiers, Bainbridge and Horrock must certainly have been regarded as monotonous, and to arrive with them at Hounsley on a drizzling afternoon to get down at the red line in a street shaded with coal dust, and dine in a room furnished with a dirt enamelled map of the country, a bad portrait of an anonymous horse in a stable, His Majesty George the Fourth with legs and cravat, and various leaden spittoons, might have seemed a hard business, but for the sustaining power of Nom and Clatchel, was determined that the pursuit of these things was gay. In Mr. Horrock there was certainly an apparent unfathomableness which offered play to the imagination. Costume, at a glance, gave him a thrilling association with horses, enough to specify the hat brim, which took the slightest upward angle just to escape the suspicion of bending downwards and nature had given him a face which by dint of Mongolian eyes and a nose, mouth, and chin seeming to follow his hat brim in a moderate inclination upwards, gave the effect of a subdued, unchangeable, sceptical smile, of all expressions the most tyrannous, over a susceptible mind, and, when accompanied by adequate silence, likely to create the reputation of an invincible understanding, an infinite fund of humour, too dry to flow, and probably in a state of immovable crust, and a critical judgment which, if you could ever be fortunate enough to know it, would be the thing and no other. It is a physiognomy seen in all vocations, but perhaps it has never been more powerful over the youth of England than in a judge of horses. Mr. Horrock, at a question from Fred about his horse's fetlock, turned sideways in his saddle and watched the horse's action for the space of three minutes, then turned forward, twitched his own bridle, and remained silent with a profile neither more nor less sceptical than it had been. The part thus played in dialogue by Mr. Horrock was terribly effective. A mixture of passions was excited in Fred. 
a mad desire to thrash Horrock's opinion into utterance, restrained by anxiety to retain the advantage of his friendship. There was always the chance that Horrock might say something quite invaluable at the right moment. Mr. Bainbridge had more open manners, and appeared to give forth his ideas without economy. He was loud, robust, and was sometimes spoken of as being given to indulgence, chiefly in swearing, drinking, and beating his wife. Some people who had lost by him called him a vicious man, but regarded horse-dealing as the finest of the arts, and might have argued plausibly that it had nothing to do with morality. He was undeniably a prosperous man, bore his drinking better than others bore their moderation, and, on the whole, flourished like the green bay tree. But his range of conversation was limited, and, like the fine old tune, Drops of Brandy, gave you after a while a sense of returning upon itself in a way that might make weak heads dizzy. But a slight infusion of Mr. Bainbridge was felt to give tone and character to several circles in Middle March, and he was a distinguished figure in the bar and billiard room at the Green Dragon. He knew some anecdotes about the heroes of the turf, and various clever tricks of marquises and viscounts, which seemed to prove that blood asserted its preeminence even among black legs but the minute retentiveness of his memory was chiefly shown about the horses he had himself bought and sold, the number of miles they would trot you in no time, without turning a hair being, after the lapse of years, still a subject of passionate asseveration, in which he would assist the imagination of his hearers by solemnly swearing that they never saw anything like it. In short, Mr. Bainbridge was a man of pleasure and a gay companion. Fred was subtle, and did not tell his friends that he was going to Hounsley, bent on selling his horse. He wished to get in directly at their genuine opinion of its value, not being aware that a genuine opinion was the last thing likely to be extracted from such eminent critics. It was not Mr. Bainbridge's weakness to be a gratuitous flutterer. He had never before seemed so much struck with the fact that this unfortunate bay was aurora to a degree which required roundest word for perdition to give you any idea of it. You made a bad hand at swapping when you went to anybody but me, Vincy. Why, you never threw your leg across a finer horse than that chestnut and you gave him for this brute. If you set him cantering, he goes on like twenty sawyers. I never heard but one worse roarer in my life, and that was a roan. It belonged to Pegwell, the corn factor. He used to drive him in his gig seven years ago, and he wanted me to take him, but I said, Thank you, Peg. I don't deal in wind instruments. That was what I said. It went the round of the country, that joke did. But what the hell, the horse was a penny trumpet to the roarer of yours. Why, you said just now he was worse than mine, said Fred, more irritable than usual. I said a lie then, said Mr. Bainbridge emphatically. There wasn't a penny to choose between em. Fred spurred his horse, and they trotted on a little way. When they slackened again, Mr. Bainbridge said, Not by what the roan was a better trotter than yours. I'm quite satisfied with his paces, I know, said Fred, who required all the consciousness of being in gay company to support him. I say his trot is an uncommonly clean one, eh, Horrick? Mr. Horrick looked before him as complete a neutrality as if he had been a portrait by a great master. Fred gave up the fallacious hope of getting a genuine opinion, but on reflection he saw that Bainbridge's depreciation and Horrock's silence were both virtually encouraging, 
and indicated that they thought better of the horse than they chose to say. That very evening, indeed, before the fair had set in, Fred thought he saw a favourable opening for disposing advantageously of his horse, but an opening which made him congratulate himself on his foresight in bringing with him his eighty pounds. A young farmer, acquainted with Mr. Bainbridge, came into the Red Lion, and entered into conversation about parting with a hunter, which he introduced at once as Diamond, implying that it was a public character. For himself he only wanted a useful hack, which would draw upon occasion being about to marry and to give up hunting. The hunter was in a friend's stable at some little distance. There was still time for gentlemen to see it before dark. The friend's stable had to be reached through a back street, where you might as easily have been poisoned without expense of drugs, as in any grim street of that unsanitary period. Fred was not fortified against disgust by brandy, as his companions were but the hope of having at last seen the horse that would enable him to make money was exhilarating enough to lead him over the same ground again the first thing in the morning. He felt sure that if he did not come to a bargain with the farmer, Bainbridge would, for the stress of circumstances, Fred felt, was sharpening his acuteness and endowing him with all the constructive power of suspicion. Bainbridge had run down Diamond in a way that he never would have done, the horse being a friend's. If he had not thought of buying it, every one who looked at the animal, even Horrock, was evidently impressed with its merit. To get all the advantage of being with men of this sort, you must know how to draw your inferences, and not be a spoon who takes things literally. The colour of the horse was a dappled grey, and Fred happened to know that Lord Medlicote's man was on the lookout for such a horse. After all his running down, Bainbridge let it out in the course of the evening, when the farmer was absent, that he had seen worse horses go for eighty pounds. Of course he contradicted himself twenty times over but when you know what is likely to be true, you can test a man's admissions. And Fred could not but reckon his own judgment of a horse as worth something. The farmer had paused over Fred's respectable, though broken-winded steed long enough to show that he thought it worth consideration, and it seemed probable that he would take it, with five and twenty pounds in addition as the equivalent of diamond. In that case, Fred, when he had parted with his new horse for at least eighty pounds, would be fifty-five pounds in pocket by the transaction, and would have a hundred and thirty-five pounds towards meeting the bill, so that the deficit temporarily thrown on Mr. Garth would at the utmost be twenty-five pounds. By the time he was hurrying on his clothes in the morning, he saw so clearly the importance of not losing this rare chance, that if Bainbridge and Horrock had both dissuaded him, he would not have been deluded into a direct interpretation of their purpose. He would have been aware that those deep hands held something else than a young fellow's interest. With regard to horses, distrust was your only clue, but scepticism, as we know, can never be thoroughly applied, else life would come to a standstill, something we must believe in and do, and whatever that something may be called, it is virtually our own judgment, even when it seems like the most slavish reliance on another. Fred believed in the excellence of his bargain, and even before the fair had well set in, had got possession of the dappled grey at the price of his old horse and thirty pounds in addition, only five pounds more than he had expected to give. But he felt a little worried and wearied, perhaps with mental debate, 
and without waiting for the further gaieties of the horse fair, he set out alone on his fourteen miles' journey, meaning to take it very quietly and keep his horse fresh. End of chapter 23「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.」Middlemarch by George Eliot As read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com Chapter 24 the offender's sorrow brings but small relief to him who wears the strong offence's cross. Shakespeare. Sonnets. I am sorry to say that only the third day after the propitious events at Hounsley, Fred Vincey had fallen into worse spirits than he had known in his life before. Not that he had been disappointed as to the possible market for his horse, but that before the bargain could be concluded with Lord Medlicott's man, this diamond, in which hope to the amount of eighty pounds had been invested, had, without the slightest warning, exhibited in the stable a most vicious energy in kicking, had just missed killing the groom, and had ended in laming himself severely by catching his leg on a rope that overhung the stable-board. There was no more redress for this than for the discovery of bad temper after marriage, which, of course, old companions were aware of before the ceremony. For some reason or other, Fred had none of his usual elasticity under this stroke of ill-fortune. He was simply aware that he had only fifty pounds, that there was no chance of his getting any more at present, and that the bill for a hundred and sixty would be presented in five days. Even if he had applied to his father on the plea that Mr. Garth should be saved from loss, Fred felt smartingly that his father would angrily refuse to rescue Mr. Garth from the consequence of what he would call encouraging extravagance and deceit. He was so utterly downcast that he could frame no other project than to go straight to Mr. Garth and tell him the sad truth carrying with him the fifty pounds, and getting that sum, at least, safely out of his hands. His father, being at the warehouse, did not yet know of the accident. When he did, he would storm about the vicious brute being brought into his stable, and before meeting that lesser annoyance, Fred wanted to get away with all his courage to face the greater. He took his father's nag, for he had made up his mind that when he had told Mr. Garth he would ride to Stone Court and confess all to Mary. In fact, it is probable that but for Mary's existence and Fred's love for her, his conscience would have been much less active, both in previously urging the debt on his thought and impelling him not to spare himself, after his usual fashion, by deferring an unpleasant task, but to act as directly and simply as he could. Even much stronger mortals than Fred Vincey hold half their rectitude in the mind of the being they love best. The theatre of all my actions is fallen said an antique personage, when his chief friend was dead, and they are fortunate who get a theatre where the audience demands their best. Certainly it would have made a considerable difference to Fred at that time if Mary had had no decided notions as to what was admirable in character. Mr. Garth was not at the office, and Fred rode on to his house, which was a little way outside the town, a homely place with an orchard in front of it, a rambling, old-fashioned, half-timbered building, which, before the town had spread, had been a farmhouse, but was now surrounded with the private gardens of the townsmen. We get the fonder of our houses if they have a physiognomy of their own, as our friends have. The Garth family, which was rather a large one, for Mary had four brothers and one sister, was very fond of their old house, from which all the best furniture had long been sold. Fred liked it, too, knowing it by heart, even to the attic which smelt deliciously of apples and quinces, and, until to-day, he had never come to without pleasant expectations. But his heart beat uneasily now with the sense that he should probably have to make his confession before Mrs. Garth, of whom he was rather more in awe than of her husband. Not that she was inclined to sarcasm and to impulsive sallies, as Mary was. In her present matronly age, at least, Mrs. Garth had never committed herself by over-hasty speech, having, as she said, borne the yoke in her youth and learned self-control. She had that rare sense which discerns what is unalterable, and submits to it without murmuring. Adoring her husband's virtues, she had early made up her mind to his incapacity of minding his own interests, and had met the consequences cheerfully. 
She had been magnanimous enough to renounce all pride in teapots or children's frilling, and had never poured any pathetic confidences into the ears of her feminine neighbours concerning Mr. Garth's want of prudence and the sums he might have had if he had been like other men. Hence these fair neighbours thought her either proud or eccentric, and sometimes spoke of her to their husbands as, "'You're fine, Mrs. Garth.' She was not without her criticism of them in return, being more accurately instructed than most matrons in Middlemarch, and, where is the blameless woman, apt to be a little severe towards her own sex, which, in her opinion, was framed to be entirely subordinate. On the other hand, she was disproportionately indulgent toward the failings of men, and was often heard to say that these were natural. Also, it must be admitted that Mrs. Garth was a trifle too emphatic in her resistance to what she held to be follies. The passage from governess into housewife had wrought itself a little too strongly into her consciousness, and she rarely forgot that while her grammar and accent were above the town standard, she wore a plain cap, cooked the family dinner, and darned all the stockings. She had sometimes taken pupils in a peripatetic fashion, making them follow her about in the kitchen with their book or slate. She thought it good for them to see that she could make an excellent lather while she corrected their blunders, without looking. That a woman with her sleeves tucked up above her elbows might know all about the subjective mood or the torrid zone, that, in short, she might possess education, and other good things ending in shun, and worthy to be pronounced emphatically, without being a useless doll. When she made remarks to this edifying effect, she had a firm little frown on her brow, which yet did not hinder her face from looking benevolent, and her words, which came forth like a procession, were uttered in a fervid, agreeable contralto. Certainly the exemplary Mrs. Garth had her dull aspects, but her character sustained her oddities as a very fine wine sustains a flavour of skin. Towards Fred Vincy she had a motherly feeling, and had always been disposed to excuse his errors, though she would probably not have excused Mary for engaging herself to him, her daughter being included in that more rigorous judgment which she applied to her own sex. But this very fact of her exceptional indulgence toward him made it the harder to Fred that he must now inevitably sink in her opinion, and the circumstances of his visit turned out to be still more unpleasant than he had expected, for Caleb Garth had gone out early to look at some repairs not far off. Mrs. Garth, at certain hours, was always in the kitchen, and this morning she was carrying on several occupations at once there, making her pies at the well-scoured deal-table on one side of that airy room, observing Sally's movements at the oven and dough-tub through an open door, and giving lessons to her youngest boy and girl who were standing opposite to her at the table, with their books and slates before them. A tub and a clothes-horse at the other end of the kitchen indicated an intermittent wash of small things also going on. Mrs. Garth, with her sleeves turned up above her elbows, deftly handling her pastry, applying her rolling-pin, and giving ornamental pinches, while she expounded with grammatical fervour what were the right views about the concord of verbs and pronouns, with nouns of multitude or signifying many, was a sight agreeably amusing. She was of the same curly-haired, square-faced type as Mary, but handsomer, with more delicacy of feature, a pale skin, a solid matronly figure, and a remarkable firmness of glance. In her snowy frilled cap she reminded one of that delightful Frenchwoman, whom we have all seen marketing, basket on arm. Looking at the mother, you might hope that the daughter would become like her, which is a prospective advantage equal to a dowry, the mother too often standing behind the daughter like a malignant prophecy, such as I am, she will shortly be. Now let us go through that once more, said Mrs. Garth, pinching an apple puff which seemed to distract Ben, an energetic young male with a heavy brow, from due attention to the lesson, not without regard to the import of the word as conveying unity or plurality of idea. Tell me again what that means, Ben. Mrs. Garth, like more celebrated educators, had her favourite ancient paths, and, in a general wreck of society, would have tried to hold her Lindley Murray above the waves. Oh, it means you must think what you mean, said Ben, rather peevishly. I hate grammar. What's the use of it? to teach you to speak and write correctly, so that you can be understood," said Mrs. Garth, with severe precision. "'Should you like to speak as old Job does?' "'Yes,' said Ben Stanley. "'It's funnier. He says, "'Yo goo, that's as good as you go.' "'But he says a ship's in the garden instead of a sheep,' said Letty, with an air of superiority. "'You might think he meant a ship of the sea.' "'No, you mightn't, if you weren't silly,' said Ben. "'How could a ship off the sea come here?' "'These things belong only to pronunciation, which is the least part of grammar,' said Mrs. Garth. "'That apple-peel is to be eaten by the pigs, Ben. If you eat it, I must give them your piece of pasty.' 
Job has only to speak about very plain things. How do you think you would write or speak about anything more difficult if you knew no more of grammar than he does? You would use wrong words and put words in the wrong places, and instead of making people understand you, they would turn away from you as a tiresome person. What would you do then? I shouldn't care. I should leave off, said Ben, with a sense that this was an agreeable issue where grammar was concerned. "'I see you are getting tired and stupid, Ben,' said Mrs. Garth, accustomed to these obstructive arguments from her male offspring. Having finished her pies, she moved toward the clothes-horse, and said, "'Come here, and tell me the story I told you on Wednesday about Cincinnatus.' "'I know! He was a farmer,' said Ben. "'Now, Ben, he was a Roman. Let me tell,' said Letty, using her elbow contentiously. "'You silly thing! He was a Roman farmer, and he was ploughing. "'Yes, but before that, that didn't come first. People wanted him,' said Letty. "'Well, but you must say what sort of a man he was first, insisted Ben. "'He was a wise man, like my father, and that made the people want his advice. "'And he was a brave man and could fight, and so could my father. "'Couldn't you, mother?' "'Now, Ben, let me tell the story straight on, as mother told it us,' said Letty, frowning. "'Please, mother, tell Ben not to speak.' "'Letty, I am ashamed of you,' said her mother, wringing out the caps from the tub. "'When your brothers began, you ought to have waited to see if he could not tell the story.' "'How rude you look, pushing and frowning, as if you wanted to conquer with your elbows. "'Cincinnatus, I am sure, would have been very sorry to see his daughter behave so.' "'Mrs. Garth delivered this awful sentence with such majesty of enunciation, "'and Letty felt that between repressed volubility and general disesteem, "'that of the Romans inclusive, life was really a painful affair. "'Now, Ben, well, oh, well, why, there was a great deal of fighting, and they were all blockheads, and— "'I can't tell it just how you told it, but they wanted a man to be captain and king and everything. "'Dictator now,' said Letty, with injured looks, and not without a wish to make her mother repent. Oh, "'Very well, dictator,' said Ben contemptuously. "'But that isn't a good word. He didn't tell them to write it on slates.' "'Come, come, Ben, you are not so ignorant as that,' said Mrs. Garth, carefully serious. "'Hark, there is a knock at the door. Run, Letty, and open it.' The knock was Fred's, and when Letty said that her father was not in yet, but that her mother was in the kitchen— Fred had no alternative. He could not depart from his usual practice of going to see Mrs. Garth in the kitchen if she happened to be at work there. He put his arm around Letty's neck silently, and led her into the kitchen without his usual jokes and caresses. Mrs. Garth was surprised to see Fred at this hour, but surprise was not a feeling that she was given to express, and she only said, quietly continuing her work, "'You, Fred, so early in the day? You look quite pale. Has anything happened?' "'I want to speak to Mr. Garth.' said Fred, not ready to say more. "'And to you also,' he added, after a little pause, for he had no doubt that Mrs. Garth knew everything about the bill, and he must, in the end, speak of it before her, if not to her solely. "'Caleb will be in again in a few minutes,' said Mrs. Garth, who imagined some trouble between Fred and his father. "'He is sure not to be long, because he has some work at his desk that must be done this morning. Do you mind staying with me while I finish my matters here?' "'But we needn't go on about Cincinnati, need we?' said Ben, who had taken Fred's whip out of his hand and was trying its efficiency on the cat. "'Now go out now, and put that whip down. How very mean of you to whip poor old tortoise. Pray take the whip from him, Fred.' "'Come, old boy, give it to me,' said Fred, putting out his hand. "'Will you let me ride on your horse to-day?' said Ben, rendering up the whip with an air of not being obliged to do it. "'Not to-day. Another time. I am not riding my own horse. Shall you see Mary to-day?' "'Yes, I think so,' said Fred, with an unpleasant twinge. "'Tell her to come home soon and play at forfeits and make fun.' "'Enough, enough, Ben, run away,' said Mrs. Garth, seeing that Fred was teased. "'Ah, Letty and Ben, you're only pupils now, Mrs. Garth,' said Fred, when the children were gone, and it was needful to say something that should pass the time. He was not yet sure whether he should wait for Mr. Garth, or use any good opportunity in conversation to confess to Mrs. Garth herself, give her the money, and ride away. "'One, only one. Fanny Hackbutt comes at half-past eleven. I am not getting a great income now.' said Mrs. Garth, smiling. I am at a low ebb with pupils. But I have saved my little purse for Alfred's premium. I have ninety-two pounds. He can go to Mr. Hammer's now. He is just at the right age. This did not lead well towards the news that Mr. Garth was on the brink of losing ninety-two pounds and more. Fred was silent. Young gentlemen who go to college are rather more costly than that, Mrs. Garth innocently continued, pulling out the edging on a cap border, and Caleb thinks that Alfred will turn out a distinguished engineer. He wants to give the boy a good chance. There he is. I hear him coming in. We will go to him in the parlour, shall we? When they entered the parlour, Caleb had thrown down his hat and was seated at his desk. Why, Fred, my boy, he said in a tone of mild surprise, holding his pen still undipped. You are here betimes. 
but missing the usual expression of cheerful greeting in Fred's face, he immediately added, "'Is there anything up at all? Anything the matter?' "'Yes, Mr. Garth. I am come to tell you something, but I am afraid will give you a bad opinion of me. I am come to tell you and Mrs. Garth that I can't keep my word. I can't find the money to meet the bill after all. I have been unfortunate. I have only got these fifty pounds towards the hundred and sixty. While Fred was speaking, he had taken out the notes and laid them on the desk before Mr. Garth. He had burst forth at once with the plain fact, feeling boyishly miserable and without verbal resources. Mrs. Garth was mutely astonished and looked at her husband for an explanation. Caleb blushed, and after a little pause said, "'Oh, I didn't tell you, Susan. I put my name to a bill for Fred. It was for a hundred and sixty pounds. He made sure he could meet it himself.' There was an evident change in Mrs. Garth's face, but it was like the change below a surface of water, which remains smooth. She fixed her eyes on Fred, saying, "'I suppose you've asked your father for the rest of the money, and he has refused you?' "'No,' said Fred, biting his lip, and speaking with more difficulty. "'But I know it would be of no use to ask him, and, unless if it were of use, I should not like to mention Mr. Garth's name in the matter.' "'It has come at an unfortunate time,' said Caleb, in his hesitating way, looking down at the notes and nervously fingering the paper. "'Christmas is upon us. I'm rather hard up just now. You see, I have to cut out everything like a tailor with a short measure. What can we do, Susan? I shall want every farthing we have in the bank. It's a hundred and ten pounds. The deuce take it!' "'I must give you the ninety-two pounds I've put by for Alfred's premium,' said Mrs. Garth, gravely and decisively, though a nice ear might have discerned a slight tremor in some of the words. And I have no doubt that Mary has twenty pounds saved from her salary by this time. She will advance it. Mrs. Garth had not again looked at Fred, and was not in the least calculating what words she should use to cut him the most effectively. Like the eccentric woman she was, she was at present absorbed in considering what was to be done, and did not fancy that the end could be better achieved by bitter remarks or explosions. But she had made Fred feel, for the first time, something like the tooth of remorse. Curiously enough, his pain in the affair beforehand had consisted almost entirely in the sense that he must seem dishonourable and sink in the opinion of the Garths. He had not occupied himself with the inconvenience and possible injury that his breach might occasion them, for this exercise of the imagination on other people's needs is not common with hopeful young gentlemen. Indeed, we are most of us brought up in the notion that the highest motive for not doing a wrong is something irrespective of the beings who would suffer the wrong. But at this moment he suddenly saw himself as a pitiful rascal who was robbing two women of their savings. "'I shall certainly pay it all, Mrs. Garth, ultimately.' he stammered out. "'Yes, ultimately,' said Mrs. Garth, who, having a special dislike to fine words on ugly occasions, could not repress an epigram. "'But boys cannot be apprenticed ultimately. They should be apprenticed at fifteen. She had never been so little inclined to make excuses for Fred. "'I was the most in the wrong, Susan,' said Caleb. "'Fred may sure find in the money, but I had no business to be fingering bills. I suppose you have looked all round and tried all honest means,' he added, fixing his merciful grey eyes on Fred. Caleb was too delicate to specify Mr. Featherstone. "'Yes, I've tried everything. I really have. I should have had a hundred and thirty pounds ready, but for a misfortune with a horse, which I was about to sell. My uncle had given me eighty pounds, and I paid away thirty with my old horse in order to get another, which I was going to sell for eighty or more. I meant to go without a horse, but now it has turned out vicious and lamed itself. I wish I and the horses, too, had been at the devil before I had brought this on you. There is no one I care so much for. You and Mrs. Garth have always been so kind to me.' Oh, but it's no use saying that. You will always think me a rascal now. Fred turned round and hurried out of the room, conscious that he was getting rather womanish, and feeling confusedly that his being sorry was not of much use to the Garths. They could see him mount, and quickly pass through the gate. "'I am disappointed in Fred Vincey,' said Mrs. Garth. "'I would not have believed beforehand that he could have drawn you into his debts. I knew he was extravagant, but I did not think that he would be so mean as to hang his risks on his oldest friend, who could the least afford to lose.' "'I was a fool, Susan. That you were,' said the wife, nodding and smiling. "'But I should not have gone to publish it in the marketplace. Why should you keep such things from me? It is just so with your buttons. You let them burst off without telling me, and go out with your wristband hanging. If I had only known, I might have been ready with some better plan.' "'You are sadly cut up, I know, Susan,' said Caleb, looking feelingly at her. "'I can't abide your losing the money you've scraped together for Alfred. It's very well that I had scraped it together.' It is you who will have to suffer, for you must teach the boy yourself. You must give up your bad habits. Some men take to drinking, and you have taken to working without pay. You must indulge yourself a little less in that. 
and you must ride over to Mary, and ask the child what money she has. Caleb had pushed his chair back and was leaning forward, shaking his head slowly, and fitting his fingertips together with much nicety. Poor Mary, he said. Susan, he went on in a lowered tone, I'm afraid she might be fond of Fred. Oh, no, she always laughs at him, and he's not likely to think of her in any other than a brotherly way. Caleb made no rejoinder, but presently lowered his spectacles, drew up his chair to the desk, and said, "'Deuce take the bill. I wish it was at Hanover. These things are a sad interruption to business.' The first part of this speech comprised his whole store of maledictory expression, and was uttered with a slight snarl easy to imagine. But it would be difficult to convey to those who never heard him utter the word business the particular tone of fervid veneration, of religious regard, in which he wrapped it, as a consecrated symbol is wrapped in its gold-fringed linen. Caleb Garth often shook his head in meditation on the value, the indispensable might of that myriad-headed, myriad-handed labour by which the social body is fed, clothed, and housed. It had laid hold of his imagination in boyhood. The echoes of the great hammer where roof or keel were a-making, the signal shouts of the workmen, the roar of the furnace, the thunder and plash of the engine, were a sublime music to him, the felling and landing of timber, and the huge trunk vibrating star-like in the distance along the highway, the crane at work on the wharf, the piled-up produce in warehouses, the precision and variety of muscular effort wherever exact work had to be turned out. All these sights of his youth had acted on him as poetry without the aid of the poets, and had made a philosophy for him without the aid of philosophers, a religion without the aid of theology. His early ambition had been to have as effective a share as possible in this sublime labour, which was peculiarly dignified by him with the name of business, and though he had only been a short time under a surveyor, and had been chiefly his own teacher, he knew more of land, building, and mining than most of the special men in the country. His classification of human employments was rather crude, and, like the categories of more celebrated men, would not be acceptable in these advanced times. He divided them into business, politics, preaching, learning, and amusement. He had nothing to say against the last four, but he regarded them as a reverential pagan regarded other gods than his own. In the same way, he thought very well of all ranks, but he would not himself have liked to be of any rank in which he had not such close contact with business as to get often honourably decorated with marks of dust and mortar, the damp of the engine, or the sweet oil of the woods and fields. Though he had never regarded himself as other than an orthodox Christian, and would argue on prevenient grace if the subject were proposed to him, I think his virtual divinities were good, practical schemes, accurate work, and the faithful completion of undertakings. His prince of darkness was a slack workman. But there was no spirit of denial in Caleb, and the world seemed so wondrous to him that he was ready to accept any number of systems, like any number of firmaments, if they did not obviously interfere with the best land drainage, solid building, correct measuring, and judicious boring for coal. In fact, he had a reverential soul with a strong practical intelligence but he could not manage finance. He knew values well, but he had no keenness of imagination for monetary results in the shape of profit and loss, and having ascertained this to his cost, he determined to give up all forms of his beloved business which required that talent. He gave himself up entirely to the many kinds of work which he could do without handling capital, and was one of those precious men within his own district whom everybody would choose to work for them, because he did his work well, charged very little, and often declined to charge at all. It is no wonder, then, that the Garths were poor, and lived in a small way. However, they did not mind it. End of chapter 24 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot As read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk, www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com Chapter 25 Love seeketh not itself to please, nor for itself hath any care, but for another gives its ease, and builds a heaven in hell's despair. Love seeketh only self to please, to bind another to its delight, joys in another's loss of ease, and builds a hell in heaven's despite. W. Blake, Songs of Experience Fred Vincey wanted to arrive at Stone Court when Mary could not expect him, and when his uncle was not downstairs. In that case she might be sitting alone in the wainscoted parlour. 
he left his horse in the yard to avoid making a noise on the gravel in front and entered the parlour without other notice than the noise of the door-handle mary was in her usual corner laughing over mrs piozzi's recollections of johnson and looked up with the fun still in her face it gradually faded as she saw fred approach her without speaking and stand before her with his elbow on the mantelpiece looking ill she too was silent only raising her eyes to him inquiringly mary he began i'm a good-for-nothing blackguard i should think one of those epithets would do at a time said mary trying to smile but feeling alarmed i know you will never think well of me any more you will think me a liar you will think me dishonest you will think i didn't care for you or your father and mother you always do make the worst of me i know i cannot deny that i shall think all that of you fred if you give me good reasons but please tell me at once what you have done i would rather know the painful truth than imagine it i owed money a hundred and sixty pounds i asked your father to put his name to a bill i thought it would not signify to him i made sure of paying the money myself and i have tried as hard as i could and now i have been so unlucky a horse has turned out badly i can only pay fifty pounds and i can't ask my father for the money he would not give me a farthing and my uncle gave me a hundred a little while ago so what can i do and now your father has no ready money to spare and your mother will have to pay away her ninety-two pounds that she has saved and she says your savings must go too you see what oh poor mother poor father said mary her eyes filling with tears and a little sob rising which she tried to repress she looked straight before her and took no notice of fred all the consequences at home becoming present to her he too remained silent for some moments feeling more miserable than ever i wouldn't have hurt you for the world mary he said at last you can never forgive me what does it matter whether i forgive you said mary passionately would that make it any better for my mother to lose money that she has been earning by lessons for four years that she might send after to mr hammers should you think all that pleasant enough if i forgave you say what you like mary i deserve it all i don't want to say anything said mary more quietly and my anger is of no use she dried her eyes threw aside her book rose and fetched her sewing fred followed her with his eyes hoping that he would meet hers and in that way find access for his imploring penitence but no mary could easily avoid looking upward i do care about your mother's money going he said when she was seated again and sewing quickly i wanted to ask you mary don't you think that mr featherstone if you were to tell him tell him i mean about apprenticing alfred would advance the money my family is not fond of begging fred we would rather work for our money besides you say that mr featherstone has lately given you a hundred pounds he rarely makes presents he has never made presents to us i am sure my father will not ask him for anything and if i chose to beg of him to be of no use i am so miserable mary if you knew how miserable i am you would be sorry for me there are other things to be more sorry for than that but selfish people always think their own discomfort of more importance than anything else in the world i see enough of that every day it is hardly fair to call me selfish if you knew what things other young men do you would think me a good way off the worst i know that other people who spend a great deal of money on themselves without knowing how they shall pay must be selfish they are always thinking of what they can get for themselves and not of what other people may lose any man may be unfortunate mary and find himself unable to pay when he meant it there is not a better man in the world than your father and yet he got into trouble how dare you make any comparison between my father and you fred said mary in a deep tone of indignation he never got into trouble by thinking of his own idle pleasures but because he was always thinking of the work that he was doing for other people and he has fared hard and worked hard to make good everybody's loss and you think that i shall never try to make good anything mary it is not generous to believe the worst of a man when you have got any power over him i think you might try to use it to make him better but that is what you never do however i am going fred ended languidly i shall never speak to you about anything again i am very sorry for all the trouble i have caused that is all mary had dropped her work out of her hand and looked up there is often something maternal even in a girlish love and mary's hard experience had wrought her nature to an impressibility very different from that hard slight thing which we call girlishness at fred's last words she felt an instantaneous pang something like what a mother feels at the imagined sobs or cries of her naughty truant child which may lose itself and get harm and when looking up her eyes met his dull despairing glance her pity for him surmounted her anger and all her other anxieties oh fred how ill you look sit down a moment don't go yet let me tell uncle that you are here he has been wondering that he has not seen you a whole week mary spoke hurriedly saying the words that came first without knowing very well what they were but saying them in a half soothing half beseeching tone 
and rising as if to go away to Mr. Featherstone. Of course, Fred felt as if the clouds had parted and a gleam had come. He moved and stood in her way. "'Say one word, Mary, and I will do anything. Say you will not look the worse of me, will not give me up altogether. As if it were any pleasure to me to think ill of you,' said Mary, in a mournful tone. "'As if it were not very painful to me to see you an idle, frivolous creature. How can you bear to be so contemptible when others are working and striving? There are so many things to be done. How can you bear to be fit for nothing in the world that is useful?' And with so much good in your disposition, Fred, you might be worth a great deal. I will try to be anything you like, Mary, if you will only say you love me. I should be ashamed to say that I loved a man who must always be hanging on others, and reckoning on what they would do for him. What will you be when you're forty? Like Mr. Boyer, I suppose. Just as idle, living in Mrs. Beck's front parlour, fat and shabby, hoping somebody will invite you to dinner, spending your morning learning a comic song. Oh, no, learning a tune on the flute. Mary's lips had begun to curl into a smile as soon as she had asked that question about Fred's future. Young souls are mobile. And before she had ended, her face had its full illumination of fun. To him it was like the cessation of an ache that Mary could laugh at him, and with a passive sort of smile he tried to reach her hand. But she slipped away quickly towards the door and said, "'I shall tell Uncle. You must see him for a moment or two. Fred secretly felt that his future was guaranteed against the fulfilment of Mary's sarcastic prophecies. Apart from that anything which he was ready to do if she would define it, he never dared in Mary's presence to approach the subject of his expectations for Mr. Featherstone, and she always ignored them, as if everything depended on himself. But if ever he actually came into the property, she must recognize the change in his position. All this passed through his mind somewhat languidly, before he went up to see his uncle. He stayed but a little while, excusing himself on the ground that he had a cold, and Mary did not reappear before he left the house. But as he rode home, he began to be more conscious of being ill than of being melancholy. When Caleb Garth arrived at Stone Court soon after dusk, she was not surprised, although he seldom had leisure for paying her a visit, and was not at all fond of having to talk with Mr. Featherstone. The old man, on the other hand, felt himself ill at ease with a brother-in-law whom he could not annoy, who did not mind about being considered poor, and had nothing to ask of him, and understood all kinds of farming and mining business better than he did. But Mary had felt sure that her parents would want to see her, and if her father had not come, she would have obtained leave to go home for an hour or two the next day. After discussing prices during tea with Mr. Featherstone, Caleb rose to bid him good-bye, and said, "'I want to speak to you, Mary.' She took a candle into another large parlour, where there was no fire, and setting down the feeble light on the dark mahogany table, turned round to her father, and putting her arms around his neck, kissed him with childish kisses which he delighted in the expression of his large brows softening, as the expression of a great, beautiful dog softens when it is caressed. Mary was his favourite child, and whatever Susan might say, and right as she was on all other subjects, Caleb thought it natural that Fred, or any one else, should think Mary more lovable than other girls. "'I've got something to tell you, my dear,' said Caleb, in his hesitating way. "'No very good news, but then it might be worse. About money, father, I think I know what it is. I?' How can that be? You see, I've been a bit of a fool again, and put my name to a bill, and now it comes to paying, and your mother has got part of her savings. That's the worst of it. And even they don't quite make things even. We wanted a hundred and ten pounds. Your mother has ninety-two, and I have none to spare in the bank, and she thinks that you might have some savings. Oh, yes, I have more than four and twenty pounds. I thought she would come farther, so I put it in my bag. See? Beautiful white notes and gold. Mary took out the fondled money from her reticule and put it into her father's hand. "'Well, but how—we only want eighteen. There, put the rest back, child. But how did you know about it?' said Caleb, who, in his unconquerable indifference to money, was beginning to be chiefly concerned about the relation the affair might have to Mary's affections. "'Fred told me this morning.' "'Ah! Did he come on purpose?' "'Yes, I think so. He was a good deal distressed.' "'I'm afraid Fred is not to be trusted, Mary,' said the father, with hesitating tenderness. "'He means better than he acts, perhaps. "'But I should think it a pity for anybody's happiness to be wrapped up in him. "'So would your mother. "'And so should I, father,' said Mary, not looking up, "'but putting the back of her father's hand against her cheek. "'I don't want to pry, my dear, but I was afraid there might be something between you and Fred, "'and I wanted to caution you. "'You see, Mary,' here Caleb's voice became more tender, he had been pushing his hat about on the table and looking at it, but finally he turned his eyes on his daughter. A woman, 
Let her be as good as she may. She's got to put up with the life her husband makes for her. Your mother has had to put up with a good deal because of me. Mary turned the back of her father's hands to her lips and smiled at him. Well, well, nobody's perfect, but— Here Mr. Garth shook his head to help out the inadequacy of words. What I'm thinking of is what it must be for a wife when she's no sure of her husband, when he hasn't got the principle in him to make him more afraid of doing the wrong thing by others than of getting his own toes pinched. That's the long and short of it, Mary. Young folks may get fond of each other before they know what life is, and they may think it all holiday if they can only get each other. But it soon turns into working day, my dear. However, you may have more sense than most, and you haven't been kept in cotton wool. There may be no occasion for me to say this, but father trembles for his daughter. You are all by yourself here. Don't fear for me, father, said Mary, gravely meeting her father's eyes. Fred has always been very good to me. He is kind-hearted and affectionate, and not false, I think, with all his self-indulgence. But I will never engage myself to one who has no manly independence, and who goes on loitering away his time on the chance that others will provide for him. You and my mother have taught me too much pride for that. That's right, that's right. Then I am easy, said Mr. Garth, taking up his hat. But it's hard to run away with your earnings, eh, child? Father! said Mary, in her deepest tone of remonstrance. "'Take pocketfuls of love, besides, to them all at home,' was her last word before he closed the outer door on himself. "'Suppose your father wanted your earnings,' said old Mr. Featherstone, with his usual power of unpleasant surmise, when Mary returned to him. "'He makes but a tight fit, I reckon. You're of an age now to be saving for yourself.' "'I consider my father and mother the best part of myself, sir,' said Mary coldly. Mr. Featherstone grunted. He could not deny that an ordinary sort of girl like her might be expected to be useful, so he thought of another rejoinder, disagreeable enough to be always apropos. "'If Fred Vincey comes to-morrow now, don't you keep him chattering. Let him come up to me.'" End of chapter 25《For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.》Middlemarch by George Eliot, as read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk, www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com. Chapter 26 He Beats Me and I Rail at Him. O oh, worthy satisfaction, would it were otherwise, that I could beat him while he railed at me. Troilus and Cressida. But Fred did not go to Stone Court the next day, for reasons that were quite peremptory. From those visits to unsanitary Hounsley streets in search of diamond, he had brought back not only a bad bargain in horseflesh, but the further misfortune of some ailment which, for a day or two, had deemed mere depression and headache, but which got so much worse when he returned from his visit to Stone Court, that, going into the dining-room, he threw himself on the sofa, and in answer to his mother's anxious question said, "'I feel very ill. I think you must send for Wrench.' Wrench came, but did not apprehend anything serious, spoke of a slight derangement, and did not speak of coming again on the morrow. He had a due value for the Vincey's house, but the wariest men are apt to be dulled by routine, and on worried mornings will sometimes go through their business with the zest of the daily bell-ringer. Mr. Wrench was a small, neat, bilious man, with a well-dressed wig, he had a laborious practice, an irascible temper, a lymphatic wife, and seven children, and he was already rather late before setting out on a four miles drive to meet Dr. Minchin on the other side of Tipton, the decease of Hicks, a rural practitioner, having increased Middlemarch practice in that direction. Great statesman error, and why not small medical men? Mr. Wrench did not neglect sending the usual white parcels, which this time had black and drastic contents. Their effect was not alleviating to poor Fred, who, however, unwilling as he is said to believe that he was in for an illness, rose at his usual easy hour the next morning, and went downstairs, meaning to breakfast, but succeeded in nothing but in sitting and shivering by the fire. Mr. Wrench was again sent for, but was gone on his rounds, and Mrs. Vincey, seeing her darling's changed looks and general misery, began to cry, and said she would send for Dr. Sprague. Oh, nonsense, mother, it is nothing said Fred, putting out his hot, dry hand to her. "'I shall soon be all right. I must have taken cold in that nasty damp ride.' Mamma said Rosamond, who was seated near the window. The dining-room windows looked on that highly respectable street called Lowick Gate. "'There is Mr. Lidgate stopping to speak to someone. If I were you, I would call him in. He has cured Ellen Bulstrode. They say he cures everyone.' 
Mrs. Vincy sprang to the window and opened it in an instant, thinking only of Fred and not of medical etiquette. Lydgate was only two yards off on the other side of some iron palisading, and turned around at the sudden sound of the sash, before she called to him. In two minutes he was in the room, and Rosamond went out, after waiting just long enough to show a pretty anxiety, conflicting with her sense of what was becoming. Lydgate had to hear a narrative in which Mrs. Vincy's mind insisted with remarkable instinct on every point of minor importance, especially on what Mr. Wrench had said and had not said about coming again. That there might be an awkward affair with Wrench, Lydgate saw at once, but the ease was serious enough to make him dismiss that consideration. He was convinced that Fred was in the pink-skinned stage of typhoid fever, and that he had taken just the wrong medicines. He must go to bed immediately, must have a regular nurse, and various appliances and precautions must be used, about which Lydgate was particular. Poor Mrs. Vincy's terror at these indications of danger found vent in such words as came most easily. She thought it very ill usage on the part of Mr. Wrench, who had attended their house so many years in preference to Dr. Peacock, though Mr. Peacock was equally a friend. Why Mr. Wrench should neglect her children more than others, she could not for the life of her understand. He had not neglected Mrs. Larcher's when they had the measles, nor indeed would Mrs. Vincy have wished that he should, and if anything should happen— Here poor Mrs. Vincy's spirit quite broke down, and her neobe throat and good-humoured face were sadly convulsed. This was in the hall out of Fred's hearing— but Rosamond had opened the drawing-room door, and now came forward anxiously. Lydgate apologized for Mr. Wrench, said the symptoms yesterday might have been disguising, and that this form of fever was very equivocal in its beginnings. He would go immediately to the druggist's, and have a prescription made up in order to lose no time, but he would write to Mr. Wrench and tell him what had been done. "'But you must come again. You must go on attending Fred. I can't have my boy left to anybody who may come or not. I bear nobody ill will, thank God, and Mr. Wrench saved me in the pleurisy. But he'd better let me die if—if—' if... "'I will meet Mr. Wrench there, then, shall I?' said Lydgate, really believing that Wrench was not well prepared to deal wisely with a case of this kind. "'Pray make that arrangement, Mr. Lydgate,' said Rosamond, coming to her mother's aid and supporting her arm to lead her away. When Mr. Vincy came home he was very angry with Wrench, and did not care if he never came into his house again. Lydgate should go on now, whether Wrench liked it or not. It was no joke to have fever in the house. Everybody must be sent to now not to come to dinner on Thursday. And Pritchard needn't get up any wine. Brandy was the best thing against infection. "'I shall drink brandy,' added Mr. Vincy emphatically, as much as to say that this was not an occasion for firing with blank cartridges. "'He's an uncommonly unfortunate lad, is Fred?' "'He need have some luck by and by to make up for all this, "'else I don't know who'd have an eldest son.' "'Don't say so, Vincy,' said the mother, with a quivering lip, "'if you don't want him to be taken from me.' "'I will warrant you to death, Lucy, that I can see,' said Mr. Vincy, more mildly. "'However, Wrench shall know what I think of the matter.' What Mr. Vincy thought, confusedly, was, that the fever might somehow have been hindered if Wrench had shown the proper solicitude about his, the mayor's, family. "'I'm the last man to give in to the cry about new doctors and new parsons, either, whether they're Bulstrode's men or not. But Wrench shall know what I think. Take it as he will.' Wrench did not take it at all well. Lydgate was as polite as he could be in his off-hand way, but politeness in a man who has placed you at a disadvantage is only an additional exasperation, especially if he happens to have been an object of dislike beforehand. Country practitioners used to be an irritable species, susceptible on the point of honour, and Mr. Wrench was one of the most irritable among them. He did not refuse to meet Lydgate in the evening, but his temper was somewhat tried on the occasion. He had to hear Mrs. Vincy say, "'Oh, Mr. Wrench, what have I ever done you should use me so? To go away, and never to come again, my boy might have been stretched a corpse!' Mr. Vincy, who had been keeping up a sharp fire on the enemy infection, and was a good deal heated in consequence, started up when he heard Wrench come in, and went in the hall to let him know what he thought. "'I'll tell you what, Wrench, this is beyond a joke,' said the mayor, who of late had had to rebuke offenders with an official air, and who broadened himself by putting his thumbs in his armholes. "'To let fever get unawares into a house like this, there are some things that ought to be actionable, and are not so. That's my opinion.' But irrational reproaches were easier to bear than the sense of being instructed, or rather the sense that a younger man, like Lydgate, inwardly considered him in need of instruction, for, in point of fact, Mr. Wrench afterwards said Lydgate paraded flighty foreign notions which would not wear. He swallowed his ire for the moment, but he afterwards wrote to decline further attendance in the case. The house might be a good one, but Mr. Wrench was not going to truckle to anybody on a professional matter. He reflected, with much probability on his side, that Lydgate would, by and by, be caught tripping too, 
and that his ungentlemanly attempts to discredit the sale of drugs by his professional brethren would by and by recoil on himself. He threw out biting remarks on Lydgate's tricks, worthy only of a quack, to get himself a factitious reputation with credulous people. That cant about cures was never got up by sound practitioners. This was a point on which Lydgate smarted as much as Wretch could desire. To be puffed by ignorance was not only humiliating, but perilous, and not more enviable than the reputation of the weather prophet. He was impatient of the foolish expectations amidst which all work must be carried on, and likely enough to damage himself as much as Mr. Wrench could wish by an unprofessional openness. However, Lydgate was installed as medical attendant on the Vincies, and the event was a subject of general conversation in Middlemarch. Some said that the Vincies had behaved scandalously, that Mr. Vincy had threatened Wrench, and that Mrs. Vincy had accused him of poisoning her son. Others were of the opinion that Mr. Lydgate's passing by was providential, that he was powerfully clever in fevers, and that Bulstrode was in the right to bring him forward. Many people believed that Lydgate's coming to the town at all was really due to Bulstrode, and Mrs. Taft, who was always counting stitches and gathered her information in misleading fragments caught between the rows of her knitting, had got it into her head that Mr. Lydgate was a natural son of Bulstrode's, a fact which seemed to justify her suspicions of evangelical laymen. She one day communicated this piece of knowledge to Mrs. Fairbrother, who did not fail to tell her son of it, observing, "'I should not be surprised at anything in Bulstrode, but I should be sorry to think it of Mr. Lydgate.' "'Why, mother,' said Mr. Fairbrother, after an explosive laugh, "'you know very well that Lydgate is of a good family in the North. He never heard of Bulstrode before he came here.' "'That is satisfactory, so far as Mr. Lydgate is concerned, Camden,' said the old lady with an air of precision. "'But as to Bulstrode, the report may be true of some other son.' End of chapter 26 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot As read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com Chapter Twenty Seven. Let the high muse chant love's Olympian. We are but mortals, and must sing of man. An eminent philosopher among my friends, who can dignify even your ugly furniture by lifting it into serene light of science, has shown me this pregnant little fact. Your pier-glass, or extensive surface of polished steel, made to be rubbed by a housemaid, will be minutely and multitudinously scratched in all directions, but place it now against a lighted candle as a centre of illumination, and, lo, the scratches will seem to arrange themselves in a fine series of concentric circles around that little sun. It is demonstrable that the scratches are going everywhere impartially, and it is only your candle which produces the flattering illusion of concentric arrangement, its light falling with an exclusive optical selection. These things are repairable. The scratches are events, and the candle is the egoism of any person now absent of Miss Vincy, for example. Rosamond had a providence of her own, who had kindly made her more charming than other girls, and who seemed to have arranged Fred's illness and Mr. Wrench's mistake, in order to bring her and Lydgate within effective proximity. It would have been to contravene these arrangements, if Rosamond had consented to go away to Stone Court or elsewhere, as her parents wished her to, especially since Mr. Lydgate thought the precaution needless. Therefore, while Miss Morgan and the children were sent away to a farmhouse the morning after Fred's illness had declared itself, Rosamond refused to leave papa and mamma. Poor mamma, indeed, was an object to touch any creature born of woman, and Mr. Vincy, who doted on his wife, was more alarmed on her account than on Fred's. But for his insistence that she would have taken no rest, her brightness was all bedimmed, unconscious of her costume, which had always been so fresh and gay, she was like a sick bird with languid eye and plumage ruffled, her senses dulled to the sights and sounds that used to interest her. Fred's delirium, in which he seemed to be wandering out of her reach, tore her heart. After her first outburst against Mr. Wrench, she went about very quietly. Her one low cry was to Lydgate. She would follow him out of the room and put her hand on his arm, moaning out, "'Save my boy!' Once she pleaded, "'He has always been good to me, Mr. Lydgate. He never had a hard word for his mother.' as if poor Fred's sufferings were an accusation against him. All the deepest fibres of the mother's memory were stirred, and the young man, whose voice took a gentler tone when he spoke to her, was one with the babe whom she had loved, with a love new to her before he was born. 
"'I have good hope, Mrs. Vincy,' Lydgate would say. "'Come down with me, and let us talk about the food.' In that way he led her to the parlour where Rosamond was, and made a change for her, surprising her into taking some tea or broth which had been prepared for her. There was a constant understanding between him and Rosamond on these matters. He almost always saw her before going to the sick-room, and she appealed to him as to what she could do for Mamma. Her presence of mind and adroitness in carrying out his hints were admirable, and it is not wonderful that the idea of seeing Rosamond began to mingle itself with his interest in the case especially when the critical stage was passed and he began to feel confident of fred's recovery in the more doubtful time he had advised calling in dr sprague who if he could would rather have remained neutral on wrench's account but after two consultations the conduct of the case was left to lydgate and there was every reason to make him assiduous morning and evening he was at mr vincey's and gradually the visits became cheerful as fred became simply feeble and lay not only in need of the utmost petting but conscious of it so that mrs vincey felt as if after all the illness had made a festival for her tenderness both father and mother held it an added reason for good spirits when old mr featherstone sent messages by lydgate saying that fred must make haste and get well as he peter featherstone could not do without him and missed his visit sadly the old man himself was getting bedridden. Mrs. Vincy told these messages to Fred when he could listen, and he turned towards her his delicate, pinched face, from which all the thick, blonde hair had been cut away, and in which the eyes seemed to have got larger, yearning for some word about Mary, wondering what she felt about his illness. No words passed his lips, but to hear with the eyes belongs to love's rare wit, and the mother, in the fullness of her heart, not only divined Fred's longing, but felt ready for any sacrifice in order to satisfy him. "'I can only see my boy strong again,' she said in her loving folly. "'And who knows? Perhaps Master of Stone Court, and he can marry anybody he likes, then.' "'Not if they won't have me, mother,' said Fred. The illness had made him childish, and tears came as he spoke. "'Oh, take a bit of jelly, my dear,' said Mrs. Vincy, secretly incredulous of any such refusal. She never left Fred's side when her husband was not in the house. And thus— Rosamond was in the usual position of being much alone. Lydgate, naturally, never thought of staying long with her, yet it seemed that the brief impersonal conversations they had together were creating that peculiar intimacy which consists in shyness. They were obliged to look at each other in speaking, and somehow the looking could not be carried through as the matter of course which it really was. Lydgate began to feel this sort of consciousness unpleasant, and one day looked down, or anywhere, like an ill-worked puppet. But this turned out badly. The next day Rosamond looked down, and the consequence was that when their eyes met again, both were more conscious than before. There was no help for this in science, and as Lydgate did not want to flirt, there seemed to be no help for it in folly. It was therefore a relief when neighbours no longer considered the house in quarantine, and when the chances of seeing Rosamond alone were very much reduced. But that intimacy of mutual embarrassment, in which each feels that the other is feeling something, having once existed, its effect is not to be done away with. Talk about the weather and other well-bred topics is apt to seem a hollow device, and behaviour can hardly become easy unless it frankly recognises a mutual fascination, which, of course, did not mean anything deep or serious. This was the way in which Rosamond and Lydgate slid gracefully into ease and made their intercourse lively again. Visitors came and went as usual. There was once more music in the drawing-room, and all the extra hospitality of Mr. Vincey's mayorality returned. Lydgate, whenever he could, took his seat by Rosamond's side, and lingered to hear her music, calling himself her captive, meaning all the while not to be her captive. The preposterousness of the notion that he could at once set up a satisfactory establishment as a married man was a sufficient guarantee against danger. This play at being a little in love was agreeable, and did not interfere with graver pursuits. Flirtation, after all, was not necessarily a singeing process. Rosamond, on her part, had never enjoyed the day so much in her life before. She was sure of being admired by some one worth captivating, and she did not distinguish flirtation from love, either in herself or in another. She seemed to be sailing with a fair wind just whither she would go, and her thoughts were much occupied with a handsome house in Lilith Gate, which she hoped would, by and by, be vacant. She was quite determined, when she was married, to rid herself adroitly of all the visitors who were not agreeable to her at her father's, and she imagined the drawing-room in her favourite house with various styles of furniture. Certainly her thoughts were much occupied with Lydgate himself. He seemed to her almost perfect. 
If he had known his notes, so that his enchantment under her music had been less like an emotional elephant's, and if he had been able to discriminate better the refinements of her taste in dress, she could hardly have mentioned a deficiency in him. How different he was from young Plymdale or Mr. Caius Larcher! Those young men had not a notion of French, and could speak on no subject with striking knowledge, except, perhaps, the dyeing and carrying trades, which, of course, they were ashamed to mention. They were Middlemarch gentry, elated with their silver-headed whips and satin stockings, but embarrassed in their manners, and timidly jocose. Even Fred was above them, having at least the accent and manner of a university man. Whereas Lydgate was always listened to, bore himself with careless politeness of conscious superiority, and seemed to have the right clothes on by a certain natural affinity, without ever having to think about them. Rosamond was proud when he entered the room, and when he approached her with a distinguishing smile, she had a delicious sense that she was the object of enviable homage. If Lydgate had been aware of all the pride he excited in that delicate bosom, he might have been just as well pleased as any other man. Even the most densely ignorant of humoral pathology or fibrous tissue, he held it one of the prettiest attitudes of the feminine mind to adore a man's preeminence without too precise a knowledge of what it consisted in. But Rosamond was not one of those helpless girls who betray themselves unawares, and whose behaviour is awkwardly driven by their impulses, instead of being steered by wary grace and propriety. Do you imagine that her rapid forecast and rumination concerning house furniture and society were ever discernible in her conversation even with her mamma? On the contrary, she would have expressed the prettiest surprise and disapprobation if she had heard that another young lady had been detected in that immodest prematureness indeed would probably have disbelieved in its possibility for rosamond never showed any unbecoming knowledge and was always that combination of correct sentiments music dancing drawing elegant note-writing private album for extracted verse and perfect blonde loveliness which made the irresistible woman for the doomed man of that date think no unfair evil of her pray for she had no wicked plots nothing sordid or mercenary in fact, she never thought of money, except as something necessary which other people would always provide. She was not in the habit of devising falsehoods, and, if her statements were no direct clue to fact, why, they were not intended in that light. They were among her elegant accomplishments, intended to please. Nature had inspired many arts in finishing Mrs. Lemon's favourite pupil, who, by general consent, Fred's accepted, was a rare compound of beauty, cleverness, and amiability. Lydgate found it more and more agreeable to be with her, and there was no constraint now. There was a delightful interchange of influence in their eyes, and what they said had that superfluity of meaning for them, which is observable with some sense of flatness by a third person. Still, they had no interviews or asides from which a third person need have been excluded. In fact, they flirted, and Lydgate was secure in the belief that they did nothing else. If a man could not love and be wise, surely he could flirt and be wise at the same time. Really, the men in Middlemarch, except Mr. Fairbrother, were great bores, and Lydgate did not care about commercial politics or cards. What was he to do for relaxation? He was often invited to the Bulstrodes, but the girls there were hardly out of the schoolroom, and Mrs. Bulstrode's naive way of conciliating piety and worldliness, the nothingness of this life and the desirability of cut glass, the consciousness at once of filthy rags and the best damask, was not a sufficient relief from the weight of her husband's invariable seriousness. The Vincy's house, with all its faults, was the pleasanter by contrast. Besides, it nourished Rosamond, sweet to look at, as a half-opened blush rose, and adorned with accomplishments for the refined amusement of man. But he made some enemies, other than medical, by his success with Miss Vincy. One evening he came into the drawing-room rather late, when several other visitors were there. The card-table had drawn off the dealers, and Mr. Ned Plymdale, one of the good matches in Little March, though not one of its leading minds, was in tete-a-tete -tete with Rosamond. He had brought the last keepsake, the gorgeous watered silk publication which marked modern progress at that time, and he considered himself very fortunate that he could be the first to look over it with her, dwelling on the ladies and gentlemen with shiny copper-plate cheeks and copper-plate smiles, and pointing to comic verses as capital and sentimental stories as interesting. Rosamond was gracious, and Mr. Ned was satisfied that he had the very best thing in art and literature as a medium for paying addresses, the very thing to please a nice girl. He had also reasons, deep rather than ostensible, for being satisfied with his own appearance. To superficial observers his chin had too vanishing an aspect, looking as if it were being gradually reabsorbed, and it did indeed cause him some difficulty about the fit of his satin stocks, for which chins were at that time useful. "'I think the Honourable Mrs. S. is something like you,' 
said Mr. Ned. He kept the book open at the bewitching portrait, and looked at it rather languishingly. "'Her back is very large. She seems to have sat for that,' said Rosamond, not meaning any satire, but thinking how red young Plymdale's hands were, and wondering why Lydgate did not come. She went on with her tatting all the while. "'I did not say she was as beautiful as you are.' said Mr. Ned, venturing to look from the portrait to its rival. "'I suspect you of being an adroit flatterer,' said Rosamond, feeling sure that she should have to reject this young man a second time. But now Lydgate came in. The book was closed before he reached Rosamond's corner, and as he took his seat with easy confidence on the other side of her, young Plymdale's jaw fell like a barometer towards the cheerless side of change. Rosamond enjoyed not only Lydgate's presence, but its effect. She liked to excite jealousy. "'What a late-comer you are,' she said, as they shook hands. "'Mamma had given you up a while ago. How do you find Fred?' "'As usual. Going on well. But slowly. I want him to go away, to Stone Court, for example. But your mamma seems to have some objection.' "'Poor fellow,' said Rosamond prettily. "'You will see Fred so changed,' she added, turning to the other suitor. "'We have looked to Mr. Lydgate as our guardian angel during this illness.' Mr. Ned smiled nervously, while Lydgate, drawing the keepsake towards him and opening it, gave a scornful laugh, and tossed up his chill, as if in wonderment at human folly. "'What are you laughing at so profanely?' said Rosamond, with bland neutrality. "'I wonder which would turn out to be the silliest, the engravings or the writing here,' said Lydgate, in his most convinced tone, while he turned over the pages quickly, seeming to see all through the book in no time, and showing his large white hands to much advantage, as Rosamond thought. "'Do look at this bridegroom coming out of a church. Did you ever see such a sugared invention, as the Elizabethans used to say?' "'Did any haberdasher ever look so smirking? "'Well, I will answer for it. "'The story makes him one of the first gentlemen in the land.' "'You are so severe. "'I am frightened at you,' said Rosamond, "'keeping her amusement duly moderate. "'Poor young Plymdale had lingered with admiration "'over this very engraving, and his spirit was stirred. "'There are a great many celebrated people "'writing in the keepsake at all events,' "'said he, in a tone at once piqued and timid. "'This is the first time I have heard it called silly.' "'I think I shall turn round on you and accuse you of being a goth,' said Rosamond, looking at Lydgate with a smile. "'I suspect you know nothing about Lady Blessington and L.E.L.' Rosamond herself was not without relish for these writers, but she did not readily commit herself by admiration, and was alive to the slightest hint that anything was not, according to Lydgate, in the very highest taste. "'But Sir Walter Scott—I suppose Mr. Lydgate knows him,' said young Plymdale, a little cheered by this advantage. "'Oh, I read no literature now.' "'said Lydgate, shutting the book and pushing it away. "'I read so much when I was a lad "'that I suppose it will last me all my life. "'I used to know Scott's poems by heart.' "'I should like to know when you left off,' said Rosamond, "'because then I might be sure that I knew something "'which you did not know.' "'Mr. Lydgate would say that is not worth knowing,' "'said Mr. Ned, purposely caustic. "'On the contrary,' said Lydgate, "'showing no smart, but smiling with exasperating confidence at Rosamond, "'it would be worth knowing by the fact that Miss Vincy could tell me.' Young Plymdale soon went to look at the whist-playing, thinking that Lydgate was one of the most conceited, unpleasant fellows it had ever been his ill fortune to meet. "'How rash you are!' said Rosamond, inwardly delighted. "'Do you see that you have given offence? What, is it Mr. Plymdale's book? Oh, I'm sorry I didn't think about it. I shall begin to admit what you said of yourself when you first came here, that you were a bear, and wanted teaching by the birds. Well, there is a bird who can teach me what she will. Don't I listen to her willingly?' To Rosamond it seemed as if she and Lydgate were as good as engaged. That they were some time to be engaged had long been an idea in her mind, and ideas, we know, tend to a more solid kind of existence, the necessary materials being at hand. It is true Lydgate had the counter-idea of remaining unengaged, but this was a mere negative, a chateau eased by our resolves, which themselves were capable of shrinking. Circumstance was almost sure to be on the side of Rosamond's idea, which had a shaping activity and looked through watchful blue eyes, whereas Lydgate's lay blind and unconcerned as a jellyfish which gets melted without knowing it. That evening, when he went home, he looked at his files to see how a process of maceration was going on, with undisturbed interest, and he wrote out his daily notes with as much precision as usual. The reveries from which it was difficult for him to detach himself were ideal constructions of something else than Rosamond's virtues and the primitive tissue was still his fair unknown. Moreover, he was beginning to feel some zest for the growing, though half-suppressed, feud between him and the other medical men, which was likely to become more manifest, now that Bulstrode's method of managing the new hospital was about to be declared, 
and there were various inspiriting signs that his non-acceptance by some of Peacock's patients might be counterbalanced by the impression he had produced in other quarters. Only a few days later, when he had happened to overtake Rosamond on the Lowick Road, and had got down from his horse to walk by her side until he had quite protected her from a passing drove, he had been stopped by a servant on horseback, with a message calling him to a house of some importance, where Peacock had never attended, and it was the second instance of this kind. The servant was Sir James Chetham's, and the house was Lowick Manor. End of chapter 27This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot, as read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk. www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com. Chapter 28 First Gentleman. All times are good to seek your wedded home, bringing a mutual delight. Second gentleman. Why, true, the calendar hath not an evil day for souls made one by love, and even death for sweetness, if it came like rolling waves while they two clasped each other, and foresaw no life apart. Mr. and Mrs. Casabon, returning from their wedding journey, arrived at Lowick Manor in the middle of January. A light snow was falling as they descended at the door, and in the morning, when Dorothea passed from her dressing-room avenue, the blue-green boudoir that we know of, she saw the long avenue of limes lifting their trunks from a white earth, and spreading white branches against the dun and motionless sky. The distant flat shrank in uniform whiteness and low-hanging uniformity of cloud. The very furniture in the room seemed to have shrunk since she saw it before. The stag in the tapestry looked more like a ghost in his ghostly blue-green world. The volumes of polite literature in the bookcase looked more like immovable imitations of books. The bright fire of dry oak boughs burning on the logs seemed an incongruous renewal of life and glow, like the figure of Dorothea herself as she entered, carrying the red leather cases containing the cameos for Celia. She was glowing from her morning toilet, as only healthful youth can glow, there was gem-like brightness on her coiled hair and in her hazel eyes. There was warm, red life in her lips. Her throat had a breathing whiteness above the differing white of the fur, which itself seemed to wind about her neck and cling down her blue-gray pelisse with a tenderness gathered from her own, a sentient, commingled innocence which kept its loveliness against that crystalline purity of the outdoor snow. As she lay the cameo cases on the table in the bow window, she unconsciously kept her hands on them immediately absorbed in looking out on the still, white enclosure which made her visible world. Mr. Casabon, had risen early, complaining of palpitation, was in the library giving audience to his curate, Mr. Tucker. By and by Celia would come in her quality of bridesmaid as well as sister, and through the next weeks there would be wedding visits received and given, all in continuance of that transitional life understood to correspond with the excitement of bridal felicity and keeping up the sense of busy ineffectiveness, as of a dream which the dreamer begins to suspect. The duties of her married life, contemplated as so great beforehand, seemed to be shrinking with the furniture and the white, vapour-walled landscape. The clear heights where she expected to walk in full communion had become difficult to see, even in her imagination. The delicious repose of the soul in a complete superior had been shaken into uneasy effort, and alarmed with dim presentiment. When would the days begin of that active, wifely devotion, which was to strengthen her husband's life and exalt her own? Never, perhaps, as she had preconceived them, but somehow, still somehow, in the solemnly pledged union of her life, duty would present itself in some new form of inspiration, and give a new meaning to wifely love. Meanwhile there was the snow and the low arc of dun vapour. There was the stifling oppression of that gentlewoman's world, where everything was done for her, and none asked for her aid, where the sense of connection with a manifold pregnant existence had to be kept up painfully as an inward vision, instead of coming from without in claims that would have shaped her energies. What shall I do? Whatever you please, my dear. That had been her brief history since she had left off learning morning lessons and practising silly rhythms on the hated piano. Marriage, which was to bring guidance into worthy and imperative occupation, had not yet freed her from the gentlewoman's oppressive liberty. It had not even filled her leisure with ruminant joy of unchecked tenderness. 
her blooming full-pulsed youth stood there in a moral imprisonment which made itself one with the chill colourless narrowed landscape with the shrunken furniture the never-read books and the ghostly stag in a pale fantastic world that seemed to be vanishing from the daylight in the first few minutes when dorothea looked out she felt nothing but the dreary oppression then came a keen remembrance and turning away from the window she walked round the room the ideas and hopes which were living in her mind when she first saw this room nearly three months before were present now only as memories she judged them as we judge transient and departed things all existence seemed to beat with a lower pulse than her own and her religious faith was a solitary cry the struggle out of a nightmare in which every object was withering and shrinking away from her each remembered thing in the room was disenchanted was deadened as an unlit transparency until her wandering gaze came to the group of miniatures and there at last she saw something which had gathered new breath and meaning it was the miniature of mr casaubon's aunt julia who had made the unfortunate marriage of will ladislaw's grandmother dorothea could fancy that it was alive now the delicate woman's face which yet had a headstrong look a peculiarity difficult to interpret was it only her friends who thought her marriage unfortunate or did she herself find it out to be a mistake and taste the salt bitterness of her tears in the merciful silence of the night what breadths of experience dorothea seemed to have passed over since she first looked at this miniature she felt a new companionship with it as if it had an ear for her and could see how she was looking at it here was a woman who had known some difficulty about marriage nay the colours deepened the lip and chin seemed to get larger the hair and eyes seemed to be sending out light the face was masculine and beamed on her with that full gaze which tells her on whom it falls that she is too interesting for the slightest movement of her eyelid to pass unnoticed and uninterpreted the vivid presentation came like a pleasant glow to dorothea she felt herself smiling and turning from the miniature sat down and looked up as if she were again talking to a figure in front of her but the smile disappeared as she went on meditating and at last she said aloud oh it was cruel to speak so how sad how dreadful she rose quickly and went out of the room hurrying along the corridor with the irresistible pulse to go and see her husband and inquire if she could do anything for him perhaps mr tucker was gone and mr casaubon was alone in the library she felt as if all her morning's gloom would vanish if she could see her husband glad because of her presence but when she reached the head of the dark oak stairs there was celia coming up and below there was mr brooke changing welcomes and congratulations with mr casaubon dodo said celia in her quiet staccato and then kissed her sister whose arms encircled her and said no more i think they both cried a little in a furtive manner while dorothea ran downstairs to greet her uncle i need not ask how you are my dear said mr brooke after kissing her forehead rome has agreed with you i see happiness frescoes the antique that sort of thing well it's very pleasant to see you back again and you understand all about art now eh but casaubon is a little pale i tell him a little pale you know studying hard in his holidays is carrying it rather too far i overdid it at one time mr brooke still held dorothea's hands but had turned his face to mr casaubon about topography ruins temples i thought i had a clue but i saw it would carry me too far and nothing might come of it you may go on any length in that sort of thing and nothing may come of it you know dorothea's eyes also were turned up to her husband's face with some anxiety at the idea that those who saw him afresh after absence might be aware of signs which she had not noticed nothing to alarm you my dear said mr brooke observing her expression a little english beef and mutton will soon make a difference it was all very well to look pale sitting for the portrait of aquinas you know we got your letter just in time but aquinas now he was a little too subtle wasn't he doesn't anybody read aquinas he is not indeed an author adapted to superficial minds said mr casaubon meeting these timely questions with dignified patience you would like coffee in your room uncle said dorothea coming to the rescue yes and you must go to celia she has great news to tell you you know i leave it all to her the blue-green boudoir looked much more cheerful when celia was seated there in a pelisse exactly like her sister's surveying the cameos with a placid satisfaction while the conversation passed on to other topics do you think it nice to go to rome on a wedding journey said celia with her ready delicate blush which dorothea was used to on the smallest occasions it would not suit all not you dear for example said dorothea quietly no one would ever know what she thought of a wedding journey in rome mrs cadwallader says it is nonsense people going on a long journey when they are married 
She says they get tired to death of each other, and can't quarrel comfortably, as they would at home, and Lady Chetham says she went to Bath. Celia's colour changed again and again, seemed to come and go with chidings from the heart, as if a running messenger had been. It must mean more than Celia's blushing usually did. "'Celia, has something happened?' said Dorothea, in a tone full of sisterly feeling. "'Have you really any great news to tell me?' "'It was because you went away, Dodo. There was nobody but me for Sir James to talk to,' said Celia, with a certain roguishness in her eyes. "'I understand. It is as I used to hope and believe.' said Dorothea, taking her sister's face between her hands, and looking at her half anxiously. Celia's marriage seemed more serious than it used to. "'It was only three days ago,' said Celia, "'and Lady Chetham is very kind.' "'And are you happy?' "'Yes. We are not going to be married yet, because everything is to be got ready, and I don't want to be married so very soon, because I think it is nice to be engaged, and we shall be married all our lives after.' "'I do believe you could not marry better, Kitty. Sir James is a good, honourable man.' said Dorothea, warmly. "'He has gone on with the cottages, Dodo. He will tell you about them when he comes. Shall you be glad to see him?' "'Of course I shall. How can you ask me?' "'I was only afraid you would be getting so learned,' said Celia, regarding Mr. Casaubon's learning as a kind of damp which might, in due time, saturate a neighbouring body. End of chapter 28《All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Middlemarch by George Eliot. As read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk. www.rlowalrus.sidesled.com. Chapter 29. I found that no genius in another could please me. My unfortunate paradoxes had entirely dried up that source of comfort. Goldsmith One morning, some weeks after her arrival at Lowick, Dorothea—but why always Dorothea? Was her point of view the only possible one with regard to this marriage? I protest against all our interest, all our effort at understanding being given to the young skins that look blooming in spite of trouble, for these too will get faded, and will know the older and more eating griefs which we are helping to neglect. In spite of the blinking eyes and white moles objectionable to Celia, and the want of muscular curve which was morally painful to Sir James, Mr. Casaubon had an intense consciousness within him, and was spiritually a hungered like the rest of us. He had done nothing exceptional in marrying, nothing but what society sanctions, and considers an occasion for wreaths and bouquets. It had occurred to him that he must not any longer defer his intention of matrimony, and he had reflected that in taking a wife— a man of good position should expect, and carefully choose, a blooming young lady, the younger the better, because more educable and submissive, of a rank equal to his own, of religious principles, virtuous disposition, and good understanding. On such a young lady he would make handsome settlements, and he would neglect no arrangement for her happiness. In return he should receive family pleasures, and leave behind him that copy of himself which seemed so urgently required of a man to the sonneteers of the sixteenth century. Times had altered since then, and no sonneteer had insisted on Mr. Casaubon's leaving a copy of himself. Moreover, he had not yet succeeded in issuing copies of his mythological key, but he had always intended to acquit himself by marriage, and the sense that he was fast leaving the years behind him, that the world was getting dimmer and that he felt lonely, was a reason to him for losing no more time in overtaking domestic delights before they too were left behind by the years. And when he had seen Dorothea— he believed that he had found even more than he demanded. She might really be such a helpmate to him as would enable him to dispense with a hired secretary, an aid which Mr. Casaubon had never yet employed, and had a suspicious dread of. Mr. Casaubon was nervously conscious that he was expected to manifest a powerful mind. Providence, in its kindness, had supplied him with the wife he needed. A wife, a modest young lady, with the purely appreciative, unambitious abilities of her sex, is sure to think her husband's mind powerful. Whether Providence had taken equal care of Miss Brooke in presenting her with Mr. Casaubon was an idea which could hardly occur to him. Society never made the preposterous demand that a man should think as much about his own qualifications for making a charming girl happy as he thinks of hers for making himself happy. As if a man could choose not only his wife, but his wife's husband— or as if he were bound to provide charms for his posterity in his own person. When Dorothy accepted him with effusion, that was only natural, 
and Mr. Casaubon believed that his happiness was going to begin. He had not had much foretaste of happiness in his previous life. To know intense joy without a strong bodily frame, one must have an enthusiastic soul. Mr. Casaubon had never had a strong bodily frame, and his soul was sensitive without being enthusiastic. It was too languid to thrill out of self-consciousness into passionate delight. It went on fluttering in the swampy ground where it was hatched, thinking of its wings, and never flying. His experience was of that pitiable kind, which shrinks from pity, and fears most of all that it should be known. It was that proud, narrow sensitiveness, which has not mass enough to spare for transformation into sympathy, and quivers, thread-like, in small currents of self-preoccupation, or, at best, of an egoistic scrupulosity. And Mr. Casaubon had many scruples. He was capable of a severe self-restraint. He was resolute in being a man of honour, according to the code. He would be unimpeachable by any recognised opinion. In conduct, these ends had been attained. But the difficulty of making his key to all mythologies unimpeachable weighed like lead upon his mind, and the pamphlets, or pererga, as he called them, by which he tested his public and deposited small monumental records of his march, were far from having been seen in all their significance. He suspected the archdeacon of not having read them. He was in painful doubt as to what was really thought of them by the leading minds of Brazenose, and bitterly convinced that his old acquaintance, Carp, had been the writer of that depreciatory recension which was kept locked in a small drawer of Mr. Casaubon's desk, and also in a dark closet of his verbal memory. These were heavy impressions to struggle against, and brought that melancholy embitterment which is the consequence of all excessive claim. Even his religious faith wavered with his wavering trust in his own authorship, and the consolations of the Christian hope in immortality seemed to lean on the immortality of the still unwritten key to all mythologies. For my part, I am very sorry for him. It is an uneasy lot, at best, to be what we call highly taught, and yet not to enjoy, to be present at this great spectacle of life, and never to be liberated from a small, hungry, shivering self, rapturously transformed into the vividness of a thought, the ardour of a passion, the energy of an action, but always to be scholarly and unspirited, ambitious and timid, scrupulous and dim-sighted. Becoming a dean or even a bishop would make little difference, I fear, to Mr. Casaubon's uneasiness. Doubtless some ancient Greek has observed that behind the big mask and the speaking-trumpet there must always be our poor little eyes, peeping as usual, and our timorous lips, more or less under anxious control. To this mental estate, mapped out a quarter of a century before, to sensibilities thus fenced in, Mr. Casaubon had thought of annexing happiness with a lovely young bride. But even before marriage, as we have seen, he found himself under a new depression in the consciousness that the new bliss was not blissful to him. Inclination yearned back to its old, easier custom, and the deeper he went into domesticity, the more did the sense of acquitting himself and acting with propriety predominate over any other satisfaction. Marriage, like religion and erudition, nay, like authorship itself, was fated to become an outward requirement, and Edward Casbon was bent on fulfilling unimpeachably all requirements. Even drawing Dorothea into use in his study, according to his own intention before marriage, was an effort which he was always tempted to defer, and, but for her pleading insistence, it might never have begun. But she had succeeded in making it a matter of course that she should take her place at an early hour in the library, and have work either of reading aloud or copying assigned her. The work had been easier to define, because Mr. Casaubon had adopted an immediate intention. There was to be a new paragon, a small monograph, on some lately traced indications concerning the Egyptian mysteries, whereby certain assertions of Warburton's could be corrected. References were extensive even here, but not altogether shoreless, and sentences were actually to be written in the shape wherein they would be scanned by Brasenose, and a less formidable posterity. These minor monumental productions were always exciting to Mr. Casaubon. Digestion was made difficult by the interference of citations, or by the rivalry of dialectical phrases ringing against each other in his brain, and from the first there was to be a Latin dedication, about which everything was uncertain, except that it was not to be addressed to Carp. It was a poisonous regret to Mr. Casaubon that he had once addressed a dedication to Carp, in which he had numbered that member of the animal kingdom among the viros nullo evo periturus, a mistake which would infallibly lay the dedicator open to ridicule in the next age, and might even be chuckled over by Pike and Tench in the present. Thus Mr. Casaubon was in one of his busiest epochs, 
and, as I began to say a little while ago, Dorothea joined him early in the library, where he had breakfasted alone. Celia, at this time, was on a second visit to Lowick, probably the last before her marriage, and was in the drawing-room, expecting Sir James. Dorothea had learned to read the signs of her husband's mood, and she saw that the morning had become more foggy there during the last hour. She was going silently to her desk when he said, in that distant tone which implied that he was discharging a disagreeable duty, "'Dorothea, here's a letter for you, which was enclosed in one addressed to me.' It was a letter of two pages, and she immediately looked at the signature. "'Mr. Landeslaw, what can he have to say to me?' she exclaimed in a tone of pleased surprise. "'But,' she added, looking at Mr. Casaubon, "'I can imagine what he has written to you about. You can, if you please, read the letter.' said Mr. Casaubon, severely pointing to it with his pen and not looking at her. "'But I may well say beforehand that I must decline the proposal it contains, to pay a visit here. I trust I may be excused for desiring an interval of complete freedom from such distractions as have hitherto been inevitable, and especially from guests whose desultory vivacity makes their presence a fatigue.' There had been no clashing of temper between Dorothea and her husband since that little explosion in Rome, which had left such strong traces in her mind that it had been easier ever since to quell emotion than to incur the consequence of venting it. But this ill-tempered anticipation that she could desire visits which might be disagreeable to her husband, this gratuitous defence of himself against selfish complaint on her part, was too sharp a sting to be meditated on until after it had been resented. Dorothea had thought that she could have been patient with John Milton, but she had never imagined him behaving in this way, and, for a moment, Mr. Casaubon seemed to be stupidly undiscerning and odiously unjust. Pity that new-born babe, which was by and by to rule many a storm within her, did not strike the blast on this occasion. With her first words, uttered in a tone that shook him, she startled Mr. Casaubon into looking at her and meeting the flash of her eyes. "'Why do you attribute to me a wish for anything that would annoy you?' "'You speak to me as if I were something you had to contend against. "'Wait at least until I appear to consult my own pleasure before yours.' "'Dorothea, you are hasty,' answered Mr. Casaubon nervously. "'Decidedly, this woman was too young to be on the formidable level of wifehood, "'unless she had been pale and featureless and taken everything for granted. "'I think it is you who are first hasty in your false suppositions about my feeling,' "'said Dorothea in the same tone. "'The fire was not dissipated yet, and she thought it was ignoble in her husband not to apologize to her.' "'We will, if you please, say no more on this subject, Dorothea. "'I have neither the leisure nor the energy for this kind of debate.' Mr. Casaubon dipped his pen, and made as if he would return to his writing, though his hand trembled so much that the words seemed to be written in an unknown character. There are answers which, in turning away wrath, only send it to the other side of the room, and to have a discussion coolly waived when you feel that justice is all on your own side is even more exasperating in marriage than in philosophy.' Dorothea left Ladislaw's two letters unread on her husband's writing-table, and went to her own place, the scorn and indignation within her, rejecting the reading of these letters, just as we hurl away any trash towards which we seem to have been suspected of mean cupidity. She did not in the least divine the subtle sources of her husband's bad temper about these letters. She only knew that they had caused him to offend her. She began to work at once, and her hand did not tremble. On the contrary, in writing out the quotations which had been given to her the day before, she felt that she was forming her letters beautifully, and it seemed to her that she saw the construction of the Latin she was copying, and which she was beginning to understand, more clearly than usual. In her indignation there was a sense of superiority, but it went out for the present in firmness of stroke, and did not compress itself into an inward articulate voice, pronouncing the once affable archangel a poor creature. There had been this apparent quiet for half an hour and Dorothea had not looked away from her own table, when she heard the loud bang of a book on the floor, and, turning quickly, saw Mr. Casaubon on the library steps, clinging forward as if he were in some bodily distress. She started up and bounded towards him in an instant. He was evidently in great straits for breath. Jumping on a stool, she got close to his elbow, and said, with her whole soul melted into tender alarm, "'Can you lean on me, dear?' He was still for two or three minutes, which seemed endless to her, unable to speak or move, gasping for breath, when at last he descended the three steps and fell backward in the large chair which Dorothea had drawn close to the front of the ladder, he no longer gasped, but seemed helpless and about to faint. Dorothea rang the bell violently, and presently Mr. Casaubon was helped to the couch. He did not faint, and was gradually reviving, when Sir James Chetham came in, having been met in the hall with the news that Mr. Casaubon had had a fit in the library. "'Good God! This is just what might have been expected!' was his immediate thought. 
If his prophetic soul had been urged to particularize, it seemed to him that fits would have been the definitive expression alighted upon. He asked his informant, the butler, whether the doctor had been sent for. The butler never knew his master wanted doctor before, but would it not be right to send for a physician? When Sir James entered the library, however, Mr. Casabon could make some signs of his usual politeness, and Dorothea, who in the reaction from her first terror had been kneeling and sobbing by his side, now rose, and herself proposed that someone should ride off for a medical man. "'I can recommend you send for Lydgate,' said Sir James. "'My mother has called him in, and she has found him uncommonly clever. She has had a poor opinion of the physician since my father's death.' Dorothea appealed to her husband, and he made a silent sign of approval. So Mr. Lydgate was sent for, and he came wonderfully soon, for the messenger, who was Sir James Chatham's man, and knew Mr. Lydgate, met him leading his horse along the Lowick Road, and giving his arm to Miss Vincy. Celia, in the drawing-room, had known nothing of the trouble till Sir James told her of it. After Dorothea's account, he no longer considered the illness a fit, but still something of that nature. "'Poor dear Dodo, how dreadful!' said Celia, feeling as much grieved as her own perfect happiness would allow. Her little hands were clasped and enclosed by Sir James's, as a bud is enfolded by a liberal calyx. It is very shocking that Mr. Casabon should be ill, but I never did like him, and I think he is not half fond enough of Dorothea, and he ought to be, for I am sure no one else would have had him. Do you think they would? I always thought it a horrible sacrifice for your sister, said Sir James. Yes, but poor Dodo never did what other people do, and I think she never will. She is a noble creature said the loyal-hearted Sir James. He had just had a fresh impression of this kind, as he had seen Dorothea stretching her tender arm under her husband's neck, and looking at him with unspeakable sorrow. He did not know how much penitence there was in that sorrow. "'Yes,' said Celia, thinking it was very well for Sir James to say so, but he would not have been comfortable with Dodo. "'Shall I go to her? Could I help her, do you think? I think it would be well for you just to go see her before Mr. Lydgate comes.' said Mr. James magnanimously, only don't stay long. While Celia was gone, he walked up and down, remembering what he had originally felt about Dorothea's engagement, and feeling a revival of his disgust at Mr. Brooke's indifference. If Cadwallader, if every one else had regarded the affair as he, Sir James, had done, the marriage might have been hindered. It was wicked to let a young girl blindly decide her fate in that way, without any effort to save her. Sir James had long ceased to have any regrets on his own account. His heart was satisfied with his engagement to Celia, but he had a chivalrous nature. Was not the disinterested service of woman among the ideal glories of old chivalry? His disregarded love had not turned to bitterness. Its death had made sweet odours, floating memories that clung with a consecrating effect to Dorothea. He could remain her brotherly friend, interpreting her actions with generous trustfulness. End of chapter 29《This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.》Middlemarch by George Eliot, as read for LibriVox by Madame Tusk, www.rlowalrus.sitesled.com. Chapter 30 Qui veut de la serre rose de propos lacet. Pascal. Mr. Casabon had no second attack of equal severity with the first, and in a few days began to recover his usual condition. But Lydgate seemed to think the case worth a great deal of attention. He not only used his stethoscope, which had not become a matter of course in practice at that time, but sat quietly by his patient and watched him. To Mr. Casabon's questions about himself, he replied that the source of the illness was the common error of intellectual men, a too eager and monotonous application. The remedy was to be satisfied with moderate work, and to seek a variety of relaxation. Mr. Brooke, who sat by on one occasion, suggested that Mr. Casabon should go fishing, as Cadwallader did, and have a turning-room, making toys and table-legs and that kind of thing. "'In short, you recommend me to anticipate the arrival of my second childhood?' said poor Mr. Casabon, with some bitterness. "'These things,' he added, looking at Lydgate, "'would be to me such relaxation as tow-ticking is to prisoners in a house of correction.' "'I confess,' said Lydgate, smiling, "'amusement is rather an unsatisfactory prescription. It is something like telling people to keep up their spirits. Perhaps I had better say that you must submit to be mildly bored rather than to go on working.' 
"'Yes, yes,' said Mr. Brooke. "'Get Dorothea to play backgammon with you in the evenings. "'And Shuttlecock now. "'I don't know a finer game than Shuttlecock for the daytime. "'I remember it all the fashion. "'To be sure your eyes might not stand that, Casabon, "'but you must unbend, you know. "'Why, you must take some time to study conchology now. "'I always think that must be a light study. "'Or get Dorothea to read to you. "'Light things. "'Smollett. "'Roderick Random. "'Humphrey Clinker. "'They are a little broad, but she may read anything now she's married, you know.' I remember they made me laugh uncommonly. There's a droll bit about a postilion's breeches. We've no such humour now. I have gone through all these things, but they might be rather new to you. As new as heating thistles would have been an answer to represent Mr. Casabon's feelings, but he only bowed resignedly with due respect to his wife's uncle, and observed that doubtless the works he mentions had served as a resource to a certain order of minds. You see, said the able magistrate to Lydgate when they were outside the door, "'Casabon has been a little narrow. "'It leaves him rather at a loss when you forbid him his particular work, "'which I believe is something very deep indeed, in the line of research, you know. "'I would never give way to that. I was always versatile. "'But a clergyman is tied a little tight. "'If they would make him a bishop now, he did a very good pamphlet for Peel. "'He would have more movement then, more show. "'He might get a little flesh. "'But I recommend you talk to Mrs. Casabon. "'She is clever enough for anything, is my niece. "'Tell her her husband wants liveliness, diversion. "'Put her on amusing tactics.' Without Mr. Brooke's advice, Lydgate had determined on speaking to Dorothea. She had not been present while her uncle was throwing out his pleasant suggestions as to the mode in which life at Lowick might be enlivened, but she was usually by her husband's side, and the unaffected signs of intense anxiety in her face and voice about whatever touched his mind or health made a drama which Lydgate was inclined to watch. He said to himself that he was only doing right in telling her the truth about her husband's probable future— but he certainly thought, also, that it would be interesting to talk confidentially with her. A medical man likes to make psychological observations, and sometimes, in the pursuit of such studies, is too easily tempted into momentous prophecy, which life and death easily set at naught. Lydgate had often been satirical on this gratuitous prediction, and he meant now to be guarded. He asked for Mrs. Casabon, but being told that she was out walking, was going away, when Dorothea and Celia appeared, both glowing from their struggle with the March wind. When Lydgate begged to speak with her alone, Dorothea opened the library door, which happened to be the nearest, thinking of nothing at that moment but what he might have to say about Mr. Casabon. It was the first time she had entered this room since her husband had been taken ill, and the servant had chosen not to open the shutters, but there was light enough to read by from the narrow upper panes of the windows. "'You will not mind this sombre light?' said Dorothea, standing in the middle of the room. "'Since you forbade books, the library has been out of the question.' "'But Mr. Casabon will soon be here again, I hope. "'Is he not making progress?' "'Yes, much more rapid progress than I first expected. "'Indeed, he is already nearly in his usual state of health.' "'You do not fear that the illness will return?' "'said Dorothea, whose quick ear had detected some significance in Lydgate's tone. "'Such cases are uh, peculiarly difficult to pronounce upon,' said Lydgate. "'The only point on which I can be confident is that it will be desirable to be very watchful on Mr. Casabon's account, lest he should in any way strain his nervous power.' "'I beseech you to speak quite plainly,' said Dorothea, in an imploring tone. "'I cannot bear to think that there might be something which I did not know, and which, if I had known it, would have made me act differently.' The words came out like a cry. It was evident that they were the voice of some mental experience which lay not very far off. "'Sit down.' she added, placing herself on the nearest chair, and throwing off her bonnet and gloves, with an instinctive discarding of formality, where a great question of destiny was concerned. "'What you say now justifies my own view,' said Lydgate. "'I think it is one's function, as a medical man, to hinder regrets of that sort as far as possible. But I beg you to observe that Mr. Casabon's case is precisely of the kind in which the issue is most difficult to pronounce upon. He may possibly live for fifteen years or more, without much worse health than he has had hitherto. Dorothea had turned very pale, and when Lydgate paused, she said in a low voice, "'You mean, if we are very careful?' "'Yes, careful against mental agitation of all kinds, and against excessive application.' "'He would be miserable if he had to give up his work,' said Dorothea, with a quick prevision of that wretchedness. "'I am aware of that. The only course is to try by all means, direct and indirect, to moderate and vary his occupations. With a happy concurrence of circumstances, there is, as I said, no immediate danger from that affection of the heart which I believe to have been the cause of his late attack. On the other hand, it is possible that the disease may develop itself more rapidly. 
It is one of those cases in which death is sometimes sudden. Nothing should be neglected which might be affected by such an issue. There was silence for a few moments, while Dorothea sat, as if she had been turned to marble, though the life within her was so intense that her mind had never before swept in brief time over an equal range of scenes and motives. "'Help me pray,' she said at last, in the same low voice as before. "'Tell me what I can do.' "'What do you think of foreign travel? You have been lately in Rome, I think.' The memories which made this resource utterly hopeless were a new current that shook Dorothea out of her pallid immobility. "'Oh, that would not do! That would be worse than anything!' she said, with a more childlike despondency, while tears rolled down. "'Nothing will be of any use that he does not enjoy.' "'I wish I could have spared you this pain,' said Lydgate, deeply touched, yet wondering about her marriage. Women, just like Dorothea, had not entered into his traditions. "'It was right of you to tell me.' I thank you for telling me the truth. I wish you to understand that I shall not say anything to enlighten Mr. Casaubon himself. I think it desirable for him to know nothing more than that he must not overwork himself, and must observe certain rules. Anxiety of any kind would be precisely the most unfavourable condition for him. Lydgate rose, and Dorothea mechanically rose at the same time, unclasping her cloak and throwing it off as if it stifled her. He was bowing and quitting her when an impulse, which, if she had been alone, would have turned into a prayer, made her say with a sob in her voice, "'Oh, you are a wise man, are you not? You know all about life and death. Advise me. Think what I can do. He has been labouring all his life and looking forward. He minds about nothing else. And I mind about nothing else.' For years after, Lydgate remembered the impression produced in him by this involuntary appeal— this cry from soul to soul, without other consciousness than their moving with kindred natures in the same embroiled medium, the same troublous, fitfully illuminated life. But what could he say now, except that he should see Mr. Casaubon again to-morrow? When he was gone, Dorothea's tears gushed forth and relieved her stifling oppression. Then she dried her eyes, reminded that her distress must not be betrayed to her husband, and looked round the room, thinking that she must order the servant to attend to it as usual, since Mr. Casaubon might now at any moment wish to enter. On his writing-table there were letters which had lain untouched since the morning when he was taken ill, and among them, as Dorothea well remembered, there were young Ladislaw's letters, the one addressed to her still unopened. The associations of these letters had been made the more painful by that sudden attack of illness which she felt that the agitation caused by her anger might have helped to bring on. It would be time enough to read them when they were again thrust upon her, and she had had no inclination to fetch them from the library. But now it occurred to her that they should be put out of her husband's sight. Whatever might have been the sources of his annoyance about them, he must, if possible, not be annoyed again, and she ran her eyes first over the letter addressed to him, to assure herself whether or not it would be necessary to write in order to hinder the offensive visit. Will wrote from Rome, and began by saying that his obligations to Mr. Casaubon were too deep for all thanks not to seem impertinent, it was plain that if he were not grateful, he must be the poorest spirited rascal who had ever found a generous friend. To expand in any worthy thanks would be like saying, I am honest. But Will had come to perceive that his defects, defects which Mr. Casaubon had himself often pointed to, needed for their correction that more strenuous position which his relative's generosity had hitherto prevented from being inevitable. He trusted that he should make the best return, if return were possible, by showing the effectiveness of the education for which he was indebted, and, by ceasing in future, to need any diversion towards himself of funds on which others might have a better claim. He was coming to England to try his fortune, as many other young men were obliged to do, whose only capital was in their brains. His friend, Nauman, had desired him to take charge of the dispute, the picture painted for Mr. Casaubon, with whose permission, and Mrs. Casaubon's, Will would convey it to Loic in person. A letter addressed to the Postes Restante in Paris within the fortnight would hinder him, if necessary, from arriving at an inconvenient moment. He enclosed a letter to Mrs. Casaubon, in which he continued a discussion about art, begun with her in Rome. Opening her own letter, Dorothea saw that it was a lively continuation of his remonstrance with her fanatical sympathy, and her want of sturdy, neutral delight in things as they were, an outpouring of his young vivacity, which it was impossible to read just now. She had immediately to consider what was to be done about the other letter. There was still time, perhaps, to prevent Will from coming to Lowick. Dorothea ended by giving the letter to her uncle, who was still in the house, and begging him to let Will know that Mr. Casaubon had been ill, and that his health would not allow the reception of any visitors. 
no one more ready than Mr. Brooke to write a letter. His only difficulty was to write a short one, and his ideas in this case expanded over the three large pages and the inward foldings. He had simply said to Dorothea, "'To be sure I will write, my dear. He is a very clever young fellow, this Ladislaw. I dare say he will be a rising young man. It's a good letter. Marks his sense of things. It's a good letter. Marks his sense of things, you know. However, I will tell him about Casabon. But Mr. Brooke's pen was a thinking organ, evolving sentences, especially of a benevolent kind, before the rest of his mind could well overtake them. It expressed regrets and proposed remedies, which, when Mr. Brooke read them, seemed felicitously worded, surprisingly the right thing, and determined a sequel which he had never before thought of. In this case, his pen found it such a pity young Ladislaw should have not come into the neighbourhood just at that time, in order that Mr. Brooke might make his acquaintance more fully, and that they might go over the long-neglected Italian drawings together. It also felt such an interest in a young man who was starting in life with a stock of ideas, that by the end of the second page it had persuaded Mr. Brooke to invite young Ladislaw, since he could not be received at Lowick, to come to Tipton Grange. Why not? They could find a great many things to do together, and this was a period of peculiar growth. The political horizon was expanding, and, in short, Mr. Brooke's pen went off into a little speech which it had lately reported for that imperfectly edited organ, the Middlemarch Pioneer. While Mr. Brooke was sealing this letter, he felt elated with an influx of dim projects. A young man capable of putting ideas into form, the pioneer purchased to clear the pathway for a new candidate, documents utilized, who knew what might come of it all? Since Celia was going to marry immediately, it would be very pleasant to have a young fellow at table with him, at least for a time. But he went away without telling Dorothea what he had put into the letter, for she was engaged with her husband, and, in fact, these things were of no importance to her. End of chapter 30「How will you know the pitch of that great bell, too large for you to stir? Let but a flute play neath the fine mixed metal. Listen close, till the right note flows forth a silvery rill. Then shall the huge bell tremble. Then the mass with myriad waves concurrent shall respond in low, soft unison. Lydgate that evening spoke to Miss Vincy of Mrs. Cashibon and laid some emphasis on the strong feeling she appeared to have for that formal, studious man thirty years older than herself. "'Of course, she is devoted to her husband,' said Rosamond, implying a notion of necessary sequence, which the scientific man regarded as the prettiest possible for a woman. But she was thinking at the same time that it was not so very melancholy to be mistress of Lowick Manor, with a husband likely to die soon.' "'Do you think her very handsome?' "'She certainly is handsome, but I have not thought about it,' said Lydgate. "'I suppose it would be unprofessional,' said Rosamond, dimpling. "'But how your practice is spreading! "'You were called in before to the Chettams, I think, and now the Cashubons.' "'Yes,' said Lydgate, in a tone of compulsory admission. "'But I don't really like attending such people so well as the poor. "'The cases are more monotonous.' and one has to go through more fuss, and listen more deferentially to nonsense. "'Not more than in Middlemarch,' said Rosamond. "'And at least you go through wide corridors, and have the scent of rose-leaves everywhere.' "'That is true, Mademoiselle de Montmorency,' said Lydgate, just bending his head to the table, and lifting with his fourth finger her delicate handkerchief, which lay at the mouth of her reticule, as if to enjoy its scent.' while he looked at her with a smile. But this agreeable holiday freedom with which Lydgate hovered about the flower of Middlemarch could not continue indefinitely. It was not more possible to find social isolation in that town than elsewhere, and two people persistently flirting could by no means escape from the various entanglements, weights, blows, clashings, motions, by which things severally go on. 
Whatever Miss Vincy did must be remarked, and she was perhaps the more conspicuous to admirers and critics, because just now Mrs. Vincy, after some struggle, had gone with Fred to stay a little while at Stone Court, there being no other way of at once gratifying old Featherstone and keeping watch against Mary Garth, who appeared a less tolerable daughter-in-law in proportion as Fred's illness disappeared. Aunt Bulstrode, for example, came a little oftener into Lowick Gate to see Rosamond, now she was alone, for Mrs. Bulstrode had a true sisterly feeling for her brother, always thinking that he might have married better, but wishing well to the children. Now Mrs. Bulstrode had a long-standing intimacy with Mrs. Plymdale. They had nearly the same preferences in silks, patterns for underclothing, chinaware, and clergymen. They confided their little troubles of health and household management to each other, and various little points of superiority on Mrs. Bulstrode's side, namely, more decided seriousness, more admiration for mind, and a house outside the town, sometimes served to give colour to their conversation without dividing them, well-meaning women both, knowing very little of their own motives. Mrs. Bulstrode, paying a morning visit to Mrs. Plymdale, happened to say that she could not stay longer, because she was going to see poor Rosamond. "'Why do you say poor Rosamond?' said Mrs. Plymdale, a round-eyed, sharp little woman, like a tamed falcon. "'She is so pretty, and has been brought up in such thoughtlessness. The mother, you know, had always that levity about her, which makes me anxious for the children.' "'Well, Harriet, if I am to speak my mind,' said Mrs. Plymdale, with emphasis, "'I must say anybody would suppose you and Mr. Bulstrode would be delighted with what has happened, "'for you have done everything to put Mr. Lydgate forward.' "'Selina, what do you mean?' said Mrs. Bulstrode, in genuine surprise. "'Not but what I am truly thankful for Ned's sake,' said Mrs. Plymdale. "'He could certainly better afford to keep such a wife than some people can.' but I should wish him to look elsewhere. Still a mother has anxieties, and some young men would take to a bad life in consequence. Besides, if I was obliged to speak, I should say I was not fond of strangers coming into a town. I don't know, Selina, said Mrs. Bulstrode, with a little emphasis in her turn. Mr. Bulstrode was a stranger here at one time. Abraham and Moses were strangers in the land, and we are told to entertain strangers. "'and especially,' she added, after a slight pause, "'when they are unexceptionable. "'I was not speaking in a religious sense, Harriet. "'I spoke as a mother. "'Selina, I am sure you have never heard me say anything "'against a niece of mine marrying your son.' "'Oh, it is pride in Miss Vincy. "'I am sure it is nothing else,' said Mrs. Plymdale, "'who had never before given all her confidence to Harriet on this subject. "'No young man in Middlemarch was good enough for her.' I have heard her mother say as much. That is not a Christian spirit, I think. But now, from all I hear, she has found a man as proud as herself. You don't mean that there is anything between Rosamond and Mr. Lydgate, said Mrs. Bulstrode, rather mortified at finding out her own ignorance. Is it possible you don't know, Harriet? Oh, I go about so little, and I am not fond of gossip. I really never hear any. "'You see so many people that I don't see. "'Your circle is rather different from ours.' "'Well, but your own niece, and Mr. Bulstrode's great favourite, "'and yours too, I'm sure, Harriet. "'I thought at one time you meant him for Kate, when she is a little older.' "'I don't believe there can be anything serious at present,' said Mrs. Bulstrode. "'My brother would certainly have told me. "'Well, people have different ways, but I understand that nobody can see Miss Vincy and Mr. Lydgate together, without taking them to be engaged. However, it is not my business. Shall I put up the pattern of mittens?' After this Mrs. Bulstrode drove to her niece with a mind newly weighted. She was herself handsomely dressed, but she noticed with a little more regret than usual that Rosamond, who was just come in, and met her in a walking dress, was almost as expensively equipped. Mrs. Bulstrode was a feminine, smaller edition of her brother, and had none of her husband's low-toned pallor. She had a good, honest glance, and used no circumlocution. "'You are alone, I see, my dear,' she said, as they entered the drawing-room together, looking round gravely. 
Rosamond felt sure that her aunt had something particular to say, and they sat down near each other. Nevertheless, the quilling inside Rosamond's bonnet was so charming that it was impossible not to desire the same kind of thing for Kate, and Mrs. Bulstrode's eyes, which were rather fine, rolled round that ample quilled circuit while she spoke. "'I have just heard something about you that has surprised me very much, Rosamond.' "'What is that, aunt?' Rosamond's eyes also were roaming over her aunt's large embroidered collar. I can hardly believe it, that you should be engaged without my knowing it, without your father's telling me. Here Mrs. Bulstrode's eyes finally rested on Rosamond's, who blushed deeply, and said, I am not engaged, aunt. How is it that every one says so, then, that it is the town's talk? The town's talk is of very little consequence, I think, said Rosamond, inwardly gratified. "'Oh, my dear, be more thoughtful. Don't despise your neighbours so. Remember, you are turned twenty-two now, and you will have no fortune. Your father, I am sure, will not be able to spare you anything. Mr. Lydgate is very intellectual and clever. I know there is an attraction in that. I like talking to such men myself, and your uncle finds him very useful. But the profession is a poor one here.' To be sure, this life is not everything, but it is seldom a medical man has true religious views. There is too much pride of intellect. And you are not fit to marry a poor man. Mr. Lydgate is not a poor man, aunt. He has very high connections. He told me himself he was poor. That is because he is used to people who have a high style of living. My dear Rosamond, you must not think of living in high style. Rosamond looked down, and played with her reticule. She was not a fiery young lady, and had no sharp answers, but she meant to live as she pleased. "'Then it is really true,' said Mrs. Bulstrode, looking very earnestly at her niece. "'You are thinking of Mr. Lydgate? There is some understanding between you, though your father doesn't know. Be open, my dear Rosamond. Mr. Lydgate has really made you an offer?' Poor Rosamond's feelings were very unpleasant. She had been quite easy as to Lydgate's feeling and intention, but now, when her aunt put this question, she did not like being unable to say yes. Her pride was hurt, but her habitual control of manner helped her. "'Pray excuse me, aunt. I would rather not speak on the subject.' "'You would not give your heart to a man without a decided prospect, I trust, my dear. And think of the two excellent offers I know of that you have refused.' and one still within your reach, if you will not throw it away. I knew a very great beauty who married badly at last by doing so. Mr. Ned Plimdale is a nice young man, some might think good-looking, and an only son, and a large business of that kind is better than a profession. Not that marrying is everything. I would have you seek first the kingdom of God. But a girl should keep her heart within her own power." I should never give it to Mr. Ned Plimdale if it were. I have already refused him. If I loved, I should love at once and without change, said Rosamond, with a great sense of being a romantic heroine, and playing the part prettily. I see how it is, my dear, said Mrs. Bulstrode, in a melancholy voice, rising to go. You have allowed your affections to be engaged without return. No, indeed, aunt, said Rosamond, with emphasis. "'Then you are quite confident that Mr. Lydgate has a serious attachment to you?' Rosamond's cheeks by this time were persistently burning, and she felt much mortification. She chose to be silent, and her aunt went away all the more convinced. Mr. Bulstrode, in things worldly and indifferent, was disposed to do what his wife bade him, and she now, without telling her reasons, desired him on the next opportunity to find out in conversation with Mr. Lydgate whether he had any intention of marrying soon. The result was a decided negative. Mr. Bulstrode, on being cross-questioned, showed that Lydgate had spoken as no man would who had any attachment that could issue in matrimony. Mrs. Bulstrode now felt that she had a serious duty before her, and she soon managed to arrange a tete-a-tete -tete with Lydgate, in which she passed from inquiries about Fred Vince's health, and expressions of her sincere anxiety for her brother's large family, 
to general remarks on the dangers which lay before young people with regard to their settlement in life. Young men were often wild and disappointing, making little return for the money spent on them, and a girl was exposed to many circumstances which might interfere with her prospects. "'Especially when she has great attractions, and her parents see much company,' said Mrs. Borstrode. "'Gentlemen pay her attention, and engross her all to themselves, for the mere pleasure of the moment, and that drives off others.' I think it is a heavy responsibility, Mr. Lydgate, to interfere with the prospects of any girl. Here Mrs. Bulstrode fixed her eyes on him, with an unmistakable purpose of warning, if not of rebuke. Clearly, said Lydgate, looking at her, perhaps even staring a little in return. On the other hand, a man must be a great cotscomb to go about with a notion that he must not pay attention to a young lady, lest she should fall in love with him or lest others should think she must. Oh, Mr. Lydgate, you know well what your advantages are. You know that our young men here cannot cope with you. Where you frequent a house, it may militate very much against a girl's making a desirable settlement in life, and prevent her from accepting offers, even if they are made. Lydgate was less flattered by his advantage over the Middlemarch or Landos than he was annoyed by the perception of Mrs. Bulstrode's meaning. She felt that she had spoken as impressively as it was necessary to do, and that in using the superior word militate, she had thrown a noble drapery over a mass of particulars which were still evident enough. Lydgate was fuming a little, pushed his hair back with one hand, felt curiously in his waistcoat pocket with the other, and then stooped to beckon the tiny black spaniel, which had the insight to decline his hollow caresses. It would not have been decent to go away, because he had been dining with other guests, and had just taken tea. But Mrs. Bulstrode, having no doubt that she had been understood, turned the conversation. Solomon's Proverbs, I think, have omitted to say that, as the sore palate findeth grit, so an uneasy consciousness heareth innuendos. The next day Mr. Fairbrother, parting from Lydgate in the street, supposed that they should meet at Vince's in the evening. Lydgate answered curtly, no, he had work to do. He must give up going out in the evening. What? You are going to get lashed to the mast, eh? And are stopping your ears, said the vicar. Well, if you don't mean to be won by the sirens, you are right to take precautions in time. A few days before, Lydgate would have taken no notice of these words as anything more than the vicar's usual way of putting things. They seemed now to convey an innuendo which confirmed the impression that he had been making a fool of himself, and behaving so as to be misunderstood. Not, he believed, by Rosamond herself. She, he felt sure, took everything as lightly as he intended it. She had an exquisite tact and insight in relation to all points of manners, but the people she lived among were blunderers and busybodies. However, the mistake should go no farther. He resolved, and kept his resolution, that he would not go to Mr. Vince's except on business. Rosamond became very unhappy. The uneasiness first stirred by her aunt's questions grew and grew, till, at the end of ten days that she had not seen Lydgate, it grew into terror at the blank that might possibly come, into foreboding of that ready, fatal sponge which so cheaply wipes out the hopes of mortals. The world would have a new dreariness for her, as a wilderness that a magician's spells had turned for a little while into a garden. She felt that she was beginning to know the pang of disappointed love, and that no other man could be the occasion of such delightful aerial building as she had been enjoying for the last six months. Poor Rosamond lost her appetite, and felt as forlorn as Ariadne, as a charming stage Ariadne left behind with all her boxes full of costumes and no hope of a coach. There are many wonderful mixtures in the world which are all alike called love and claim the privileges of a sublime rage which is an apology for everything in literature and the drama. Happily, Rosamond did not think of committing any desperate act. She plaited her fair hair as beautifully as usual, and kept herself proudly calm. Her most cheerful supposition was that her aunt Bulstrode had interfered in some way to hinder Lydgate's visits, 
everything was better than a spontaneous indifference in him. Any one who imagines ten days too short a time, not for falling into leanness, lightness, or other measurable effects of passion, but, for the whole spiritual circuit of alarmed conjecture and disappointment, is ignorant of what can go on in the elegant leisure of a young lady's mind. On the eleventh day, however, Lydgate, when leaving Stone Court, was requested by Mrs. Vincey to let her husband know that there was a marked change in Mr. Featherstone's health, and that she wished him to come to Stone Court on that day. Now Lydgate might have called at the warehouse, or might have written a message on a leaf of his pocket-book, and left it at the door. Yet these simple devices apparently did not occur to him, from which we may conclude that he had no strong objection to calling at the house at an hour when Mr. Vincey was not at home, and leaving the message with Miss Vincey. A man may, from various motives, decline to give his company, but perhaps not even a sage would be gratified that nobody missed him. It would be a graceful, easy way of piecing on the new habits to the old, to have a few playful words with Rosamond about his resistance to dissipation, and his firm resolve to take long fasts, even from sweet sounds. It must be confessed also that momentary speculation as to all the possible grounds for Mrs. Bulstrode's hints had managed to get woven like slight clinging hairs into the more substantial web of his thoughts. Miss Vincey was alone, and blushed so deeply when Lydgate came in, that he felt a corresponding embarrassment, and instead of any playfulness, he began at once to speak of his reason for calling, and to beg her, almost formally, to deliver the message to her father. Rosamond, who at the first moment felt as if her happiness were returning, was keenly hurt by Lydgate's manner. Her blush had departed, and she assented coldly, without adding an unnecessary word, some trivial chain-work which she had in her hands, enabling her to avoid looking at Lydgate higher than his chin. In all failures the beginning is certainly the half of the whole. After sitting two long moments, while he moved his whip and could say nothing, Lydgate rose to go, and Rosamond, made nervous by her struggle between mortification and the wish not to betray it, dropped her chain as if startled, and rose too, mechanically. Lydgate instantaneously stooped to pick up the chain. When he rose, he was very near to a lovely little face, set on a fair long neck, which he had been used to see turning about under the most perfect management of self-contented grace. But as he raised his eyes now, he saw a certain helpless quivering which touched him quite newly, and made him look at Rosamond with a questioning flash. At this moment she was as natural as she had ever been when she was five years old. She felt that her tears had risen, and it was no use to try to do anything else than let them stay like water on a blue flower, or let them fall over her cheeks, even as they would. That moment of naturalness was the crystallising feather-touch. It shook flirtation into love. Remember that the ambitious man who was looking at those forget-me-nots under the water was very warm-hearted and rash. He did not know where the chain went. An idea had thrilled through the recesses within him, which had a miraculous effect in raising the power of passionate love, lying buried there in no sealed sepulchre, but under the lightest, easily pierced mould. His words were quite abrupt and awkward, but the tone made them sound like an ardent, appealing avowal. "'What is the matter? You are distressed. Tell me, pray!' Rosamond had never been spoken to in such tones before. I am not sure that she knew what the words were, but she looked at Lydgate, and the tears fell over her cheeks. There could have been no more complete answer than that silence, and Lydgate, forgetting everything else, completely mastered by the outrush of tenderness at the sudden belief that this sweet young creature depended on him for her joy, actually put his arms around her, folding her gently and protectingly, he was used to being gentle with the weak and suffering, and kissed each of the two large tears. This was a strange way of arriving at an understanding, but it was a short way. Rosamond was not angry, but she moved backward a little in timid happiness, and Lydgate could now sit near her and speak less incompletely. 
Rosamond had to make her little confession, and he poured out words of gratitude and tenderness with impulsive lavishment. In half an hour he left the house an engaged man, whose soul was not his own, but the woman's to whom he had bound himself. He came again in the evening to speak with Mr. Vincey, who, just returned from Stone Court, was feeling sure that it would not be long before he heard of Mr. Featherstone's demise. The felicitous word demise, which had seasonably occurred to him, had raised his spirits even above their usual evening pitch. The right word is always a power, and communicates its definiteness to our action. Considered as a demise, old Featherstone's death assumed a merely legal aspect, so that Mr. Vincey could tap his snuff-box over it and be jovial, without even an intermittent affectation of solemnity. And Mr. Vincey hated both solemnity and affectation. Who was ever awestruck about a testator, or sang a hymn on the title to real property? Mr. Vincey was inclined to take a jovial view of all things that evening. He even observed to Lydgate that Fred had got the family constitution after all, and would soon be as fine a fellow as ever again. And when his approbation of Rosamond's engagement was asked for, he gave it with astonishing facility, passing at once to general remarks on the desirableness of matrimony for young men and maidens and apparently deducing from the whole the appropriateness of a little more punch. End of chapter 31